Western Australia, a vast and diverse land of untouched wilderness, clear ocean waters and majestic landscapes that inspire wondrous adventure. The soul of this dreamlike setting Margaret River is a slice of heaven along an idyllic coastline flush with breathtaking natural beauty and sweeping green vineyards. But even in paradise, pressure looms. The WSL Championship Tour arrives with the mid-season cut in full focus. For one third of the world's best, the season ends here. The pressure's gonna be on like never before. Dreams will be broken today. Both icons and newcomers need results. Who will conquer the raw energy of main break, make the cut, and continue to compete for the Rip Curl WSL Finals? The stage is set for jubilation, heartbreak, and relegation at the 2023 Western Australia Margaret River Pro. Good morning, a beautiful Saturday morning here at Margaret River. We're here for the Western Australia Margaret River Pro, and we are looking at beautiful conditions as the world's best get out there, get a taste of a pre-event warm-up. Jack Thomas on hand, one of the wild cards. He'll be hitting the lineup in the first heat of the day of the elimination round. He'll be up against Kyle Belly, who's had some big finishes here at main break in the past. That sun just coming up from over on the east and uh, setting light on what looks like a, an unbelievable lineup. Uh, that swell really starting to fill in. Here on the Harvey Norman host set, Ronnie Blakey with Felicity Palmatier and Richie Lovett. Felicity, it looks uh, unbelievable out there at the moment. You're excited and uh, yeah, that, that surf line forecast spot on. Yeah, absolutely spot on. Uh, we've woken up this morning on this Saturday morning and the swell is well and truly here. You know, I'm seeing some eight foot sets, maybe a couple of bigger ones. And yeah, I guess the surfers, are they've got to be stoked with this. Great opening day yesterday, Rich. Great performances, big numbers dropped. But today, you know, we really did want to see uh, that the conditions improve and a bit more size because there's so much on the line here. Yeah, it's a uh, make or break day to be cliche, but it, it's going to be amazing. The, the, the canvas is completely set. As Flick said, the, the swell's kicked up a little bit. Perfect offshore winds. It's going to be a bluebird day, and, and it's we're in for a long day of action. Yeah, we'll be uh, hopefully getting into some of those do-or-die heats early on here this morning. Let's get the, the full rundown on what's coming our way here. We'll check in with Stace. Morning, mate. Morning, Ron. Morning, team. Jesse, how's your morning been? It's been great so far. <laughs> Looking good out there. <laughs> going to be a great day in the office. What are we in for? Yeah, so we've got a really big day ahead. Um, we're going to be starting here with this men's elimination round, um, going straight then into men's round of 32. Those are going to be overlapping heats. And then we're going to have the final four events, uh, four heats of the day, sorry. It's going to be the women's round of 16. So massive day. It's a, it feels really good for us to have really good waves for these, for these important heats today. And uh, we're looking forward to see who comes out on top. Obviously great waves in front of us here today at main break. But how do you, uh, Pratamo and Renato, make the call to run here today when obviously there's good waves across the bay, but obviously Obviously, big consequence today for the surface in the water. Yeah, for sure. Like, um, you know, I know for I know there's definitely going to be a, a time today when uh, there's good waves at the box, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing everyone's free surf clips. Um, I love checking out Instagram as much as anyone else. Uh, the biggest thing for us today is we know that today's the biggest uh, and best day of the waiting period we're looking at. Really important to maximise that and to maximise the opportunity for everyone in such an important round, in such an important event. Lots of opportunity out the front. Thanks for your time, Jesse. Thank you, Stace, and the call has been made into the elimination round for the men to kick things off. And uh, as Jesse pointed out, you know, uh, a lot of consistency in the, the sets coming in here at main break. A little more fickle over there at the box, Felicity, and with those three-man heats and so much consequence uh, for the competitors, it, it makes sense to stick to main break today. Yeah, 100%. I know if I was in their position, I'd want to be at main break. There's a lot more opportunity out there and it is a lot more consistent. And yeah, I mean, there's so much on the line and yeah, main breaks, I think definitely the best option. Let's have a quick chat about uh, obviously 
missing Jack Robinson at this venue due to that knee injury, but the opportunity for some rising stars from this state to make their mark at the event this year. Yeah, we're actually going to see two of them in this first uh, heat of the day. We've got Jacob Wilcox and Jack Thomas. And, you know, they both surfed well yesterday. They just unfortunately were up, up against some better opponents. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing them open up. We've got beautiful conditions and, like I said, a lot of opportunity. So, yeah, and getting behind the home boys. And, uh, yeah, I know all of Western Australia will be behind them too. Yeah, good crowd on hand to get behind them in this very uh, first heat of the day. It's... Just after 7.30 a.m. here on this Saturday morning. And we uh, really haven't yet seen on camera, I think, just the potential out there at the moment, Rich. We're yeah. going to see an amazing surfing laid down by the world's best today. We really are. Um, I, I don't think you could really script Margaret River main break any better than it is this morning in terms of size. It's it's not too big. It's that perfect size where it's just going to be hitting the peak uh, and then running through those inside shelves. And, and uh, you know, that to me equates to high performance surfing. But there is the opportunity for some tube rides today, I think, as well, just with the jump in swell uh, and these offshore winds in the morning. Um, we'll check out the forecast soon, but I feel like the wind's going to be kind of light to variable all day. So we're in for a, just a classic Margaret River day. Bring it on. The first heat of the day is underway in the elimination round. Caio Belli, the Brazilian star who's sitting in seventh spot on the rankings at the moment, up against Jacob Wilcox. We've seen so much of him in CT events, getting a, a number of call-ups as a wild card to compete. And he'll be on the Challenger series. He had a good run on the, the CS last season. So that's about to get underway. But right now he's focusing on getting a, a big finish here at home. He's going to have a, a real edge, I think, with uh, the amount of time he's spent in this tricky lineup. But it's going to be Jack Thomas, who's from uh, a little further north at a little place called Yallingham, which you would have heard mentioned in CT uh, events for a number of years. That's where Taj Burrow is from. And we'll see if Jack can finish this one off to kick off his day. And he does nicely. Big kid. And uh, we saw him compete here last year. He, he did bow out in this elimination round last season as a wild card, but he'll look to go uh, a little further in the draw today. Bit of hustle here at the takeoff point to get into position for this one. Wow. And it's Kaio Belli who kind of withdraws from the contest and allows Jacob Wilcox into this one, drawing off the bottom. Nice hook out of the top. High impact turn to get started. Gets a little late to that second move. So uh, won't be expecting a monster score for that. And Kyle Belly's going to have an opportunity to win this opening exchange. Transitions through that first hit, out onto the open face, grinds through the carve, and loads up for uh, a couple of hits on the inside here. Very short-footed sure here. And <laughs> it's cold. It's, it's early in the morning. He's done well to stay on his feet. Jeez, he's just so solid, isn't he? Still going all the way through to the inside. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, Kai, well, this is, mate, he just does not go away. He's one of those surfers that you know is going to be on the best waves. He's going to perform on them. He very rarely falls off. You, you hardly ever see him make a mistake, and he's just opened with an absolute perler there. Uh, great wave, though, for Jack Thomas as well. Different approach. Uh, got a little deeper on some of these turns. Backside flick, what do you think? Yeah, there's a lot of hustle and bustle just before he took off on that wave, and he was lucky to get it, actually, because uh, he was widest, widest on the peak. But, yeah, stringing together three nice manoeuvres on his backhand, and he gets the finish. So, yeah, look, good opener for Jack. And uh, behind, out the back, we uh, saw Jacob as well. This first turn I really liked. Um, the wave sort of run off uh, in front of him. You can see he kind of get hung up there in the face and couldn't get around to that third section. So... Look, probably not a massive score for Jacob, but uh, this first turn here, I did really like the look of this one. Yeah, so he agree. Gets, oh, yeah, this. timing. Great oh, timing. He's a world-class talent, and he's been so close to qualifying before. We often uh, ha have seen him at this level, Rich. He's quarter-finaled before down at Bells Beach. Hasn't, I think, turned in the, the results here at Margaret River that we'd expect. But, but Kaio's sort of veteran status has seen him put up a, a pretty decent first ride here yeah. against these uh, these wild cards. Absolutely. He, he's really put this wave together well. Uh, timing again was uh, sensational. Kaio up into the lip here. And uh, just keeping the board pointing down the line. Didn't overextend on that one. 
And this is a beautiful wrap here. You can see that heelside rail just uh, brings it all the way around, compresses the body, resets the, uh, the board up and over this section here. Fantastic stuff. How tough has it been, that, that first heat of the morning, Rich, sometimes, uh, especially uh, when you have an early start at a location like this? Yeah, it is tough. And, you know, this wind is definitely a factor as well. And, and you saw on Jacob's wave, he got a little hung up. You know, this it's probably 25 to 30 knots offshore wind at the moment. So uh, that is going to play into it. But, you know, first heat of the morning, they call it the guinea pig heat. And uh, live action here, this is Jacob. Jacob just working one uh, off the top there to get started. A lot of patience off the bottom. Gets the timing right on that oh. hit. Just kind of falls out of the sky. Almost engineered that weightlessness then. Yeah, it looks like maybe on a slightly longer board than he was yesterday. Um, you'd have to think that a lot of the competitors are perhaps going to go for, you know, an extra inch or two uh, in terms of board size just to deal with that, uh, the increase in size and also the wind factor at the moment. Jacob does a, a fantastic job, Felicity, of not just chasing down his aspirations to be a CT surfer, but he also works really hard away from competition to put out mind-blowing edits. Yeah, he does. I mean, we'll get back to that in a second, but here's this replay of this last wave. I mean, nice carve off the top there, and he's just setting up this end section and... Uh, yeah, like he said, just <laughs> manufacturing oh. sort of that airdrop. Um, but yeah, he does an amazing job uh, and he keeps super busy in his time off when he's not competing on the Challenger Series. I mean, if you go online, you'll see some of his most amazing clips from up north, spent at Nalu. It's just incredible. Yeah, he just seems to have a, a really good handle on, on what's required to be the modern day professional surfing athlete, Rich. Um, you know, you, you can get lost chasing the tour sometimes. Jack Thomas started off beautifully with a 5.83. Talking to Taj Burrow, he said Jack's got a, a deadly backhand. He said he just has struggled, uh, in Taj's opinion, with confidence sometimes, and, and it really affects his performance. He said he saw some positive signs in his opening round effort yesterday, and he certainly started the day off well. So it, it was Kyle Belling winning the opening exchange, and he's up again here. Big section. Big hit, and it'll be a solid backup number for the Brazilian. Yeah, another good wave for Caio. Uh, opening strong, and just love how he's getting straight onto that bottom turn. Really confident off the bottom. And Caio setting the tone for the opening heat. But yeah, to your point, Ron, I think, um, you know, Jacob, he's, he's made all the sacrifices. He left WA, the beauty of WA, to go and uh, put his time in on the East Coast on the smaller ways because he knew he had to, to really perfect that type of performance in, a, in order to qualify for the championship tour. So we see the replay here, huge finishing turn for Kayo. But, yeah, that just he's really setting everything up with these bottom turns, leaning right into it. And, obviously, uh, just dropping out of the sky here. A little bit of hang time in the lip. Gets to the finish and just so important to come down that little millisecond before that lip explodes behind you. Yeah, dealing with the uh, elements there, trying to ride out of that one. It's basically a, a, a blinding sort of finish to the ride. You've got to just have a really good feel for where your equipment's at under your feet. And Kayo sticks it. So uh, with his rivals banking a couple of numbers, he, he was looking for a score, but he's well and truly going to make that jump you'd think up into the lead in just a moment just over 27 minutes to go here yeah Kaya has really sort of established himself as a a top order surfer over the past couple of seasons he's had amazing starts this year was no different semi-final finish losing out to leo uh, nato firavanti uh, at pipe sunset made the quarters so he's right back in that similar kind of position uh, well inside that final five. Just drifted out. In fact, you know, as far as his results go this season, it's kind of trending in a, a negative way. Uh, he's gone worse at each stop, but uh, he is well poised, I think, to make a, a run towards the five, top five again. Yeah, uh, he, he's, there's something different about Kaya this year, and he's uh, done the work in the off-season. He said he's trained harder than he ever has before. He's made... You know, sacrifices, I feel like he perhaps sat down and went, you know, am I doing everything I can do? 
to be the best I can and the answer was no and so uh, he went back to the drawing board what else can I do he got fitter stronger uh, worked on the equipment a little bit more and the dividends are coming you know he's he's definitely right up in that definitely in the top 10 conversation and just needs to break into that that top five um, but yeah again his consistency for me is one of his key assets yeah I, I, th I think he'd reflect on last year and you know basically point to his inconsistency as a, a major reason for not cracking that that final five and, and getting himself a, a title shot because you know anyone who, who kicks off the year at that top end you know really d is in a, a great position to, to carry through uh, unfortunately for Kyo it's almost been a, a mirror of, of what unfolded last season so he wants to get back into the final series just on 25 and a half minutes to go he's out in front again his last ride came through at a 5.97 Wilcox needs a 6.08 here to jump into first Jack Thomas is after a 5.35 Beautiful conditions. We're expecting some of the, the best conditions today for the event window. And it couldn't have come at a better time because we're, we've gotten through those uh, non-elimination heats and now it's you know, no second chances from here on in. So it's perfect, perfect timing and a, a really nice even playing field out there at the moment. Well, that's what you want, isn't it? You want all the surfers to have equal opportunity. Uh, you don't want anyone to get skunked and not really be able to ride waves. You want them you know, to really just dig in and, and put on their best uh, surfing performance in order to, to have the opportunity to progress. Um, and we're seeing that. It's, it really is lining up to be one of those uh, very special days here. Well, just on 24 and a half minutes to go here, and we love the opportunity to get to the west and see all the exceptional sur surfing talent from this region. And Stace has tracked down one of the best. That's right, Ron. Jay Davies. Morning, mate. How are you? Morning, mate. Good to see you, Stace. How's the coach nerves this morning? Uh, well, it's not too bad, really. I'm, um, I'm just on the, on the bruise. It's nice and warm today. It was actually freezing cold yesterday, so it's nice today. Sun's out, waves are pumping. Um, got a f few mates in this heat, so Jack's doing all right. He's had a couple of scores, but um, yeah, it's nice. <clears throat> You're working with Italo Ferreira and Jack Thomas here, two to opposite ends of the spectrum. What's what's it like bouncing uh, bouncing around between those two characters? Yeah, it is too. Like I mean, uh, Jack's kind of new to this like realm, I guess. So um, I guess a bit of nerves, like trying to calm his nerves, and then um, Italo's just kind of knows exactly what he wants to do, and kind of really, I'm just kind of giving him a little bit of local knowledge, I guess. Um, he knows what he's asking. Here's a little wave. Jack's kind of having a look. Bit of a three club win today. What's Jack riding? Um, Jack's like on a step up, like six one and a half, I think it is. But it's looking really nice. Just got to call it up a little bit. But um, uh, yeah, just like a six one that he's. Um, oh shit, pretty. Sh no. <laughs> Sorry, mate. Um, but nah, uh, the waves are. Waves are a bit bigger today, so he's just going a little step up and um, looks good. Sounds good, mate. We'll let you get into this heat. Thanks for your time, Jay. Good on your stage there, Jay. Had a magic run as a wild card some years ago now, but uh, getting himself all the way to the quarters. And yeah, he's a, a good, experienced head uh, from this region to have in your corner. Jack Thomas just unable to complete that final move there. And Jane understands the importance of that, especially when you're just ch chasing a, a mid-range five, Rich. Yeah, it's, it's weird because you can start going, oh, I'm just going to surf to a five rather than go, I'm going to surf this wave to its entirety, which could be an eight. But he got a couple of good backhand hooks done and then comes through this section here and just unfortunately trips up. Uh, the timing was off a little for the final turn. Felicity, at this level, you, you know, as a wild card, you can't come in and afford to to pace yourself through these rides. You can't surf soft. You've got to go really hard at it. Just felt like Jack wasn't putting his foot down quite as hard as he can because his first ride, there was some real positive signs there. Yeah, yeah. I think it was interesting hearing what Jay was saying. I mean, obviously, Italo and Jack are on two different ends of the spectrum here. And, you know, Jack's maybe feeling a little bit of those nerves. And I can sort of relate to that. You know, when you're a Grommy, you have posters of these people on your bedroom walls growing up and you're idolizing them. and you know, you look up to them and then all of a sudden, fast forward a few years, you're in a heat with them. And that can be pretty daunting, you know, and, you know, it's, it takes a certain type of person to be like, you know what, I'm going to take it to this person. And I'm going to, you know, maybe 
exactly what you said, Rich. I'm not going to surf this. <laughs> I'm not going to surf this wave because I need a five. I'm going to try and get an excellent score here, and it just takes a certain type of mindset. Here we go, live action now. Jacob Wilcox trying to uh, dump a 4.67. If he can get a 6.08 out of this one, he'll take himself to the lead. It's a, a decent start, putting a bit of distance between himself and that converging section, but uh, it tricks him up and he can't ride out. So just uh, on 21 minutes to go here. Still a, a chance Jacob improves on the 4.67 though, Rich. Yeah, yeah, he could for sure. And you can just see a, a slight difference between Jacob and Jack here. Jacob's accelerating out of the turns on the backhand a little bit more than Jack is, and that's why Jacob's scores are just a little bit higher at this point, but a mistake at the end of that wave. You just can't afford those little mistakes. You have to stick that final move if you're going to uh, progress through today. The Surfline forecast, it's been uh, spot on through the opening days of the competition. A little bump in the swell today, Rich, uh, but positive stuff and some more energy coming our way over the weekend. Yeah, there certainly is. Well, we're dealing with it with a very clean, primed southwest swell at the moment. Uh, that's where we're situated on the break here, and we've got offshore winds all morning. They might shift around a little bit uh, through the day here, and then... Uh, and then, well, Armageddon's coming, uh, no doubt about it. We're going to get a lot of uh, swell. We're going to get a lot of wind. Um, but what is right in front of us right now, morning, we've got uh, 8 to 12 foot faces, which are, are completely groomed with this offshore wind. And uh, in the afternoon, it, it's looking pretty good as well. So it's going to be an amazing day of competition. And then looking a little bit further, yeah, things things get a little bit ordinary. <laughs> we might be battening down the hatches. You know, 15. it's going to be 15 to 20 foot, basically, and, and a lot of wind. So we'll come down, we'll check it out. But perhaps on the back side of that, um, there might be some, some more glamour. Uh, so we'll just wait and see. Yeah, it's perfect timing for the anticipated, the hotly anticipated head-to-head -head matchups that we'll see through the round of 32 for the, the men. And also the, the round of 16 for the women. It's going to be all time. But uh, Surfline serving up a, a great deal for our audience. Surfline Premium, you can get 30% off by scanning that QR code on the bottom right of your screens and uh, stay in the loop. Absolutely. Matt, if you don't, it, I, I guess it works out to about 20 cents a day, if that. So, you know, that gives you access to all the premium cameras and the whole nine yards so that you're fully equipped to know where you can go and shred. Yep. And, uh, yeah, good thing to make use of as we go to some replays now. This was Jacob's last ride. Still waiting on the score to come through for this, but you can see the class in his act. Yeah, just jamming on these backhand turns. Uh, unfortunately, geez, he did well to just really put the gas on. Maybe we just put it on a little bit too much. It just got absolutely uh, crushed on that final section. Such a difficult section of this wave to navigate, isn't it, Flick? It's just, you've got this wall, wall of white water coming at you, severe direction change. Yeah, and you can have the right idea, and you, th well, you think you have the right idea, and it looked like Jacob was like, I'm going to, you know, get out in the face, and I'm going to try and approach it earlier, but it just didn't work in his favour, and sometimes that just happens, and it, it is such a hard section to negotiate. I mean, we're seeing a little bit of hustle and bustle out the back here, but it looks like Kaio is taking off. Yeah, got the priority. And it's an easy decision for him to use it on this big clean wall. The waves are a little flat to kick off. So he can save it with a big move on the inside. Goes to that layback jam, swings that tail, holding on, using that core strength. But he is going to run into some speed humps here on the inside. Can't ride out. So, so close. <laughs> so close. He nearly had it. Yeah, Kayo. You know, he, he's looked very comfortable out there, but there's sort of like a, a bit of a salty expression on his face at the end of each of his rides. I don't think he, he's feeling like he's doing the kind of surfing that, that he's proud of just yet. No, and I almost feel like the little tussle, priority tussle at the start might have maybe just put him off, uh, you know, just unsettled his mind. But you can see here, kicks the tail out, does the big layback hack. And at this point here, we thought, yep, he's got this. But then uh, this extra little energy of Whitewater just, uh, well, just blasts him off, trips him up. And uh, you can see they're bottomed out. This is all those little reef shells on the inside. So hard to navigate through. Such a gritty performer, Kayo. I mean, he came through the, the sort of junior ranks uh, alongside uh, Gabriel Medina. Uh, and, you know, he, he was always the battler. Uh, but he 
he always had a, an edge in, in waves of consequence. He was fearless, even as a little kid. He'd just throw himself into anything. And he kind of loves coming up against big names as well. Well, even, uh, you can see it in his body language now. He, he doesn't look too happy with himself. And if you uh, remember back to yesterday's heat, he had a couple of incidents with uh, priority, which he seemed to think didn't go his way by the body language we were seeing. And it looks like maybe that sort of similar energy is being carried over into this heat. He just doesn't quite look completely stoked with how this is going down. And um, Looks like he's the... punching, not yeah. paddling at the moment. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, look, I mean, even... Uh, but the wave choice too, I guess, maybe he's a bit angry at that. I mean, it was a bit fat on the takeoff and didn't obviously make that last manoeuvre. But, yeah, just seeing it in the body language from Kyo is just maybe not quite stoked with how things are going. Fifteen and a half minutes to go. Something standing up on the outside here. And sitting at the apex of the peak is Jack Thomas. He's after a 6.74 now to get himself up in a second place. Let's see if we can get a, a big section. This wave's actually going to break away, and he doesn't like what's happening on the inside there. Meanwhile, Kyle Belly having a look at one, opting not to go, wants to stay in that order for priority. Jacob Wilcox has taken control of this heat. Couple of mid-range sixes, and he's gliding into one now. Fades a little off the takeoff to set up that first turn. Nice extension as he drives harder through the second move and up into the pocket again. Bit of foam on the face. And it's no problem for the local who's just going to tap off the foam to finish this one off. That's a, a solid ride, very complete start to finish. And it should be another decent score here. I love it. Uh, you know, this we've been talking about this kid for so long, just saying he's going to make the championship tour. Is this going to be the year? As you said, Ronnie, he's come so close, but this is the style of surfing that this kid brings. You know what I mean? It, it's just solid. It's got all this power. There's none of that little jittery stuff that you sort of get from, from younger, less experienced surfers. It, it's CT level surfing in my mind and uh, a real mature way uh, that he put this wave together. And, uh, you know, at this stage in the heat, I think that was a fantastic ride for Jacob just to solidify that top position. We're waiting on the numbers to come through, but we do have some big elimination heats coming your way. Leonardo Fioravanti, Carlos Munoz and the local boy, Jared Forrest, are out there next. The Western Australia Margaret River Pro is brought to you by Tourism Western Australia, official tourism partner of the Western Australia Margaret River Pro. By Yeti, built for the wild. By Cooper's Brewery, the official beer of the World Surf League Australia. By Rusty, official apparel of the Western Australia Margaret River Pro. And by Shiseido, official sunscreen of the World Surf League. Welcome back to the show. Well, during the break, Kyle Belly tapped into this one. 
Big uh, hook off the top. Little lumpy on that opening section. Trying to make up for it with that second move. Falling out of the sky. And he does get the finish. But Kyle Belly just struggling to really set his rail on these first sections at the moment. And that's left the door open for this young man, Jack Thomas, from yelling up. And he's going to get slammed. Wow. <laughs> just too late there, wasn't wow. he? Wow. Up and under. And, uh, well, he's going to be uh, getting a flush of the sinuses <laughs> right there. Maybe a free chiropractic appointment. <laughs> <laughs> full body exfoliation <laughs> at the bottom of that one. Kyle Belly's got a decent score on the way, 6.53. And that sees him up into the lead. Jacob Wilcox on his last ride had a 5.97. I think uh, Kyle getting some credit for his finishes out there at the moment because he, his starts haven't been fantastic by his standard. No, and, and I think Kyle knew that. The second turn on that ride was, was really good and he got to, the, to that big finish over the whitewash section, but... Um, you know, it's the, the judges would be looking at this sometimes going, oh, you know, that turn was about 60% of what could have been done on that opening section. So already he's turned what could potentially be an eight or nine down into that six and seven range. And then he had to surf the rest of that wave to to extract all those points out of the ride. So, uh, you know, it's, um, it, it's, it's weird on a day like today when the waves are so perfect and you just expect that everyone's going to get fantastic scores, but the surfing level has to be up there. Otherwise, the judges are going to be super critical. Speaking of judges, Richie Porter, former head judge for the WSL CT, joins us now. Morning, Rich. Good to see you. Morning, WA people. How are you going? We're loving life, mate. You know what this place is like. It's magic. But, uh, Rich, yeah. just talking about this venue, uh, obviously, main break, it's situated so far away from where the panel actually drops their, their scores. What are the challenges uh, as a judge at this venue? Well, this is the joy of the replay because they watch everything on the replay because you have to nowadays, especially at main break, because as you've just said, it, it is so far away. And what you think is really, really good on some of the turns, turn out when you watch it on the replay, it's like, well, maybe not so good or vice versa. What looks okay um, on, the, on the replay looks fantastic. So the judges watch a lot of vision and that's why the scores take a little bit longer at this venue to come in because Pratamo, the head judge, is just double checking. And at the moment, he's, I know him well, and he's a little bit cranky because he's sitting there with a pair of six fives and a six six, and he's, he's just willing something to happen just to open this heat up a little bit. Uh, at this venue, we, we've spoken about it. Obviously, everyone wants to do big surfing at every contest, but there, there's a way to, to set a rail turn out here and an approach you can have to some of those steeper sections that really does kind of get the judges excited. As we see Kayo tapping in, finding a barrel, high line exit there, and finally sets a, a deep rail turn, grabs on that rail as well, and mixing it up nicely now with a, a more vertical approach to the lip and just finishing this one off beautifully on the inside. But, uh, yeah, talking about that, that big surfing uh, approach, even judges, you hear them say, just make sure you, you're really accentuating those turns, drawing those rail moves from the top of the, the wall right down into the, the trough of the wave to really maximise your points. Is it a focus for the panel too? And uh, who does it best? Yeah, definitely. And as, as Flick knows, being a local girl, board choice is crucial. And watching Jacob's board out there in this heat, he's, his board's perfect for these ways because the judges want to see the surfers holding those turns through the rail. And, and Kaio's sort of a little bit skittery and Jack's struggled a bit on a couple of waves. But, you know, you see even Kaio coming out of that turn then, he's, his board's not flowing as much as he'd like. And... He's a little bit cranky as well. Obviously, he didn't like what happened at the start of the heat with the grommets. He's going, get out of my way. I'm the CT <laughs> guy. You guys are just here for Phil. And, and it's shown through his, through his waves. He's not happy with his waves. He was splashing the water coming back out after that previous wave because he saw the set coming. But he, he's, he rips. Like, there's no doubt about it. But I think... If he had a choice of a different board, maybe he'd choose it. I know you guys tell me, but the judges want to see clean, solid surfing, and they want to see big, heavy surfing in the combos. You know, I, go, I always bang on about the combos, and that's what they want to see out at main break, especially at this size. 
because it, it allows you to tear the bags out of the place. And that's why we're only in the sixes so far, because the judges are waiting to see something a lot better. Yeah, I guess uh, when you think about individual turns, the sport's been pushed to uh, an incredible place. But as far as combinations goes, that's kind of the next big step, isn't it? Putting those massive turns yes. to, together, and that's the key to getting the, the biggest numbers. And that's in the criterion that's front and central at every venue that where turns count, because best surfers in the world do the most amazing turns. The judges and everyone else that's watching and you, as the surfers want to do it as well, they want to see turn to turn to turn that are flat out. And that's when the big scores drop. Rich, um, you had something to say? Yeah, I just, uh, on a day like today when the surf is so perfect, it, you know, I, I'm just wondering what a 10 might look like in the judges' eyes. Because I did have the, the luxury of chatting to some of the judges yesterday. And as you said, Richie, th they just want more. They're going, nah, we're getting frustrated with giving sixes and sevens all day. We want to give the big scores. Give it to us. So, Rich, what does a 10 look like today? Uh... If it picks up a bit more, maybe an amazing barrel. It's pretty hard on all the airs. Like, the turn, the combo turns on just solid turns might get you into those eight and nines, but it's going to have to be an amazing set of turns to get to the perfect number. And the judges will always, they feel the 10, so they're going to hold it until they feel it. And, and yeah, an air may get you there off the first section if it's a bit hard in the wind. I know it sounds easy uh, s sitting here at Snappo and there's airs popping out all over the place out the front here, I tell you. But it's really hard to get a 10 on, on surf like this because of the nature of the beast. And it's easy to, it's, it's, they can get eights and nines, but the judges always just, they're tight. You know them well enough. They, they hold everything back just a little bit, just a little bit because has to be perfection. Not just when they're judging, Rich, I I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, mate, thanks for your uh, insights. It's always appreciated. Uh, enjoy the show. I think we're in for a special one. Yeah, have a great day, guys. Enjoy, mate. Yeah, uh, I love what Rich is saying there. It's, it, it's hard to describe what a, a 10 might look like, um, but it, it's a feeling, yeah. e even for the panel. And that's... You know, the, the same thing that we, we had in Portugal this year when Callum took that unbelievable drop and got spat out of one of the darkest barrels you've ever seen to earn himself that Yeti cooler. Um, but, you know, it's always a, a feeling and, and you kind of get moved to the edge of your seat for those, those bigger numbers. And, and nothing we've seen so far in this heat has, has kind of shifted us in our chairs. So uh, that's the reason the, the scores are quite res uh, restrained at the moment. Kaipo's out there watching on, and Kaipo, you've been picking up on the, the energy of Kaio. Even though he's leading the heat, he's just looked like he, he hasn't really settled into this one. Yeah, he wants more, right? He's a feisty competitor, Kaio Belly. Um, but conditions out here, Ron, stiff offshore breeze. So you may want to see some of the surfers with a little longer equipment to deal with this stiff offshore breeze that we have out here. The swell, the swell is turned more of the westerly direction. So that's why it's kind of a perfect peak. Right now, Cowie Belly under priority. He's gonna take off on this one. I'm gonna let you call it, Ron. Oh, he just threw it, threw it away. I was gonna talk about the swell, more of a westerly direction. So more of a peak, longer walls on the left and maybe some barrel opportunities on the right. We saw that earlier in this heat with Cowie Belly. So uh, shaping up to be a great day. It is, Kai, but just quickly, uh, obviously uh, offshore conditions usually like grooms that face, but we are still seeing quite a, a bit of texture on, on the wall of these waves. Seems to be having a, a bit of an effect on, especially Kaya's equipment. Yeah, it's a, like it, it's a, there's a chatter out here, right? So as I spoke earlier, maybe some of these surfers want to ride a little bit longer board, maybe a little heavier board, heavier glass board, uh, to keep the board sitting in the water. We got more action, Ron. Yeah, it's going to be Jacob Wilcox swinging on this one. And he wants to better a 6.5, drives up through the pocket. Nice little snap under the lip there to get started. And there is a nice steep section to dig into. A carving front so uh, backside hit and just loses the finish. And he was on his way to a really good score there. Oh, 
So frustrating <laughs> to watch, and I know he'd be frustrating too because oh, he did so much great work on that wave. Those opening manoeuvres, fantastic, and just couldn't bookend it. He's 25 years of age, Jacob. This is his 13th CT uh, <laughs> appearance. And he really does want to turn in a, a strong finish at this venue. This second turn was awesome. Yeah, this is where the money's at. I mean, so beautiful to watch. And that technique is just amazing. It's so unfortunate that he came unstuck here at the end. I mean, we're just getting a replay now of what happened. I mean, he goes to lip line it. But this isn't the first time, too, that he's fell off on this last turn. I think he'd, he'd be feeling pretty, like, you know, maybe a little bit angry at himself, but kicking himself because... You know, I think he even got a 6-5 before for those two turns and then fell on that third one. So, I mean, this was a great two-turn wave. It's just, you know, it's not going to probably push higher than the scores that he maybe already has. So Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. I, I thought, you know, the first turn was a pretty good save on a, a tricky section under yep. the lip there. It just uh, is going to all hedge on how much credit they give him for that second move. Could could be his best ride, though. Wouldn't be surprised if it went a little better than the 6.5. Yeah, it could do. Uh, it's right there. And, and you could almost see him trying to wash speed off for that third one. And, uh, well, here goes Jack up and riding. Nice start. Just transitioning out of that first move, driving up into the pocket. Nice little backhand float there, but not, not as big a, a set wave. And uh, a tricky one to, to try and turn a, a 717 in on. And this one's going to come to a close. And uh, it feels like Jack is going to fall short of the requirement. Kyle Belly up at the moment. So it uh, tucks oh. into the barrel, finds some nice cover. A couple of visions for Kyle out there this morning. But, you know, I think he's going to really have a, a think probably about his equipment, Rich. Um, and, and also just look to, to settle in and just set that rail a little deeper. I don't know what it was in that heat that wasn't working for yeah, him. Yeah, it, it was a little weird. It's, I mean, like, as, as Kaipo said, there's texture on the water and it's like driving over gravel versus driving <laughs> over a beautiful, smooth bitumen road. You know, it's you've got to find your equipment that's actually going to lock in on those bottom turns. And Kaya was pushing them, but you could see at moments his fins were almost popping out on the bottom turn. So uh, equipment, we'll check in on it all day long because it's going to be a major conversation point. Yeah, there was a, a little change in the order with Jacob Wilcox's last ride coming through. It put him in front, so a victory for the local boy, Felicity. Yeah, I'd love to see it. Um, I'd love to see a replay when we get it of that last wave of Jacob's. But, yeah, just beautiful surfing on his backhand here. So well-timed, and like you said, Ronnie, he really does look like he should be on tour. And, uh, yeah, Kaya also having a good heat, but like we said, maybe that board just looking a little bit chattery and little bit small for these conditions. I mean, you really do have to be on as we watch the Harvey Norman Heat recap here, Rich, to overcome surfers who are at the top end of the rankings. Even when they're having an off day, you've got to do your best to overcome them. And that's just been proven here this morning. Oh, yeah. This is a great little confidence hit for Jacob. And, and just think if he'd actually made those final manoeuvres on a few of those scoring waves, he would have been, like, way out in front. So he'll take a lot from this. And, and, and this is the sort of surfing that got him the win. Just very critical, stable bottom turns on the backhand. You can see more in control. And just the speed here, trying to wash it off and deal with this final section. Uh, but, yeah, put together a great heat. He should be stoked. Oh, the hometown crowd, uh, they'll be bummed with one result, losing one here in the elimination round. But Jacob Wilcox showing real positive signs as he marches through to the round of 32. We're going to take a quick break. Stay with us because joining us next is one of this region's best storytellers.
Australia. Welcome back to the Western Australia Margaret River Pro. We want to acknowledge the Wadandi people as the traditional custodians of the Margaret River region. And we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And we love coming down here and just opening our ears, sitting back and listening to some of the great storytellers in this region. There is so much to learn about this incredible Buja, this country, which uh, we just feel the energy. Every time we come back here for stop number five each season, we just relish it. It's so beautiful, this place, and we're very lucky to, to be welcomed back each year. Kaya, good morning. We have a, a very special guest with us. Zach Webb joins us, and he led proceedings and storytelling the other day at the uh, opening ceremony. Great to see you, Zach. Yeah, good to see you too, Kaya. 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 Mate, uh, I mentioned it before. Um, you know, we, we travel to all these different regions and there's amazing storytellers and obviously those uh, amazing stories are a big part of your culture and they're passed down through generations and uh, obviously a, a story that you really connected with a, as a youngster and love spreading everywhere you travel. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, just been um, privileged, you know, and honoured um, to have that passed down through my family and through the generations. It's uh, what we call karajin. So karajin is the knowledge. So it's that knowledge that's been passed down through the generations um, that guides us um, on protecting and looking after country. Now, the budja here is, you know, really significant. And uh, there's a, a deep cultural connection uh, for yourself here. And and it's a unique story, yeah? and it, it really all is based around the river. Oh, yeah, definitely. The river is so significant to us as Wadani people. Um, it's a story of Woodwich and the creation of using Marabone, the magic, um, to create the river itself. And just the surrounding areas, really, um, like Budjadap and Yarrabap and Kilkarnap and all the beautiful places on Wadani Budja. Um, yeah, it's just great to yeah, have everyone here. Fill us in, because uh, this is... Uh one of the things I love about visiting the West is just all the indigenous names for all the areas and the the up is significant in each of those titles, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So in our language, up actually means place of and then you'll see whatever the word sits in front of um, of the up actually means a, a, the place of, of that um, uh, animal or plant or um, for, ex um, for example I guess um, we've got Quara up and Quara for us is the place of the purple crown lorikeet. So Quara is the purple crown lorikeet and then up meaning the place of or just over here we've got Budji and Budjid up. Um, that's a bit of our yoga, our women's song line which um, talks about them being Budjari and giving life or children back to the country. Love it. And uh, we're going to ask you more about the, the whale song, which is uh, really uh, important in this region as well. But let's get this heat set. Leonardo Fioravanti, the Italian, who's having a, a great campaign on the CT this year up against Carlos Munoz, who gets the opportunity again to uh, surf in a CT contest. The Costa Ricans just got that uh, incredible power. We'll see if he can bring it. But another local out there in the lineup this morning, Jerem Forrest, the new dad. Let's see if we can bring some dad power to main break here. A really popular surfer in this region. This is a replay of his opening ride, Felicity, but uh, everyone in this zone just so excited to see him get the call up. Oh, absolutely. I mean, here we go. We have a replay of Carlos Munoz's first wave and just falling off there. But, yeah, back to what you were saying, Ronnie, everyone was absolutely stoked. I mean, I think... Um, Jerem's been in these trials uh, for this event probably 10 years now and he's had some really close finishes. He's had second a few times. I think he even had a surf off against Jack once. So to finally see him crack it, everyone in Western Australia is so behind him. Well, here is uh, a ride for Jerem now, driving off the bottom. And uh, this guy, well, he spends a lot of time on roofs, working as a, a rooftop plumber. And uh, well, he's attacking the roof of this wave. <laughs> Some nice vertical hits there, flowing beautifully through to that inside. And uh, he only had a 2.83 on his first wave. That's a bit more like it from Jerem, and, and we'll see what kind of number he can drop here. Let's see if he can establish a bit of a lead over one of the toughest competitors in the draw, Leonardo Fioravanti. We've got numbers on the way, but let's get caught up now with Jacob Wilcox, who won through in the first elimination heat. Thanks, Ron. That's right. Jacob, that was a bit better, mate. Yeah, I found a couple then. Uh, I feel like my wave selection yesterday was pretty average and um, kind of didn't really allow me to do the surfing that I'd like to. Um, just rode a little bit of a bigger board then as well. Um, had a little 6.2 DHD. I think it's a sweet spot, um, 4.0. Went um, pretty nice and oh, it's a beautiful morning. Hey, it's so nice to be at home surfing good waves. 
hopefully we can get across the bay as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, you might have to take yourself over there later on. Good to ha have a good like heat like that in front of your friends, but talk to us about the start of the heat. You guys are all over each other. How do you kind of reset and then uh, you know come back with a really strong performance like that? Uh, yeah, the start of the heat got um, it got a little bit heated actually. I said sorry to Kyle on the beach after it because sometimes in the, the heat of the moment and the heat of the start of the heat, like, I don't know, it gets like dog eat dog kind of. Um, but I usually shy away from that stuff because I don't really like to start my heat up like that. But this year I'm trying to embrace it a bit more and bring a bit more intensity to the start of my heat. So, um, but uh, yeah, no, it was good fun. It's good to have a battle with Kyle. I really respect him as a competitor and um, it's good fun. Do you feel like that translated into the scores on the wave face? Um, the my scores? I don't know. I felt like after that I was just trying to just reset myself and make sure I'd do two good backhand snaps on two good waves. It's a um, pretty simple formula out here on your backhand. I feel like if you're just attacking it, it's, um, you're going to get some good scores. But I definitely left a little bit of meat on the bone uh, at the end of them, but try to tidy it up for the next heat. We'll see you later on today. Thanks, Jacob. Cheers, guys. Yeah, Jacob Wilcox there, Zach, and um, really cool to see him front and centre um, at each of the opening ceremonies that, that I've been to. He's right there, obviously, trying to learn a little bit more uh, about the culture of this area. Yeah, yeah, it's good to see Jacob, local boy, yeah, on country, um, representing Wadden the country, and yeah, um, yeah, like I say, him coming down to the things, it's been great. Well, here goes Jeremy, out of 5.5 on his previous ride. Starting to look like he, he's building some confidence on, on those attacking backhand hits. Yeah, I'm liking the way that I'm seeing Jerem surfing this morning. I think, you know, he's up to the level since yesterday and he's keeping busy already. I mean, that's his third wave surfed in this heat. And yeah, uh, yeah, I'm all for the West Aussies here. I love listening to that bit of insight from uh, Jacob, just about that tossle at the beginning of the heat and just how much respect he does have for um, Kaya. You know, he, he went up and he said sorry, and he, you know, he really respects him as a competitor and you know, and loves to have those moments. But, uh, yeah, that's in the water and on land's different. So that was a cool little insight. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, but, and for someone who's not sort of there yet to, to be identifying that maybe he needs to bring a bit more intensity at the start of those heats is really cool too. Zach, I want to ask you about the uh, incredible story that you told us uh, about the, the journey of the, the whales, how they used to be land-based and then uh, eventually got chased out into the uh, ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, that's one of the stories that goes back, um, right back into what we call Kora Kora, back in the dream time. And it talks about uh, Mamang, about Mamang the whale, um, when it was Bujarad Bujara, when it was born upon the country. And it used to roam the land and be chased by, by what we call Yogan, um, which was the wild dogs coming from the hills, until eventually, yeah, he made his way into the ocean where he stays up until this point and the only one that was left at the time um, back on country was what we called Kran which is the dolphin as well um, he was a little uh, snub nose kind of dog creature and then after a while being chased by the uh, other wild dogs eventually um, Jinnah saw the mamang the whale and made its way into uh, Warrington into the ocean as well yeah it's really cool to me because obviously there's uh, you know a lot of sort of questions are asked when whales beach themselves but for your culture you know it's something that your ancestors always saw and it was the return to land for the the whales yeah yeah that's it they were returning back to land they're returning back to Buja, back to the country um, and they believe that they're um, coming back to their original place of creation which was the Buja, which was the country so um, because they weren't created in the ocean and ocean creatures like a fish um, they're a mammal like us breathe breathe oxygen and um, yeah and like to show off as well just like uh, we've been seeing the quillens the dolphins showing off um, showing the surfers that they can surf as well we love that uh, there's obviously some special stuff happening around the event and today uh, there's going to be a, a traditional dance taking place tell us a bit more about that yeah well we've got um, some of the community some of the mob um, the Mork, the family come from Wajak country up in Perth um, um, some of them are avid surfers themselves and um, yeah they've just come down to um, yeah do a performance we're going to do a bit of a welcome to country and welcome the community to country and they will do a dance performance as well. So I love uh, having two uh, Indigenous communities from uh, around the world uh, getting uh, together and, and Kaipo led uh, the Welcome to Country the other day, did a fantastic job. He's out there and he's going to give us an update on the conditions. Yeah, we got a, a conditions report about six to eight feet out here, Ron. Again, I talked about the stiff offshore breeze. We're expecting that offshore breeze to settle down as the day progresses. But right now, it is a bit of a challenge for the competitors. We saw Leo Fioravanti trying to paddle into a wave earlier in this heat, unable 
to get into that wave. And uh, then we saw Leo surfing a wave, nice off the top turn, but the wind got underneath his board. He was brilliant to stay on board, airdrop back into the face. Uh, so the wind's something that the surfers are gonna deal with right now in the morning. The swell should hang in all day long. And um, hopefully we're gonna see this wind just die down a little bit as the day progresses. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kaipo, for the uh, Oakberry Surf Report there, conditions report. Jerome Forrest getting a, a rod. And uh, he's in the lead at the moment, right where he wants to be. He's, he's a new dad. He, he told me that he, he hasn't been sleeping too well, uh, taking on that, uh, that role of being the, the ears of the house. Any noise uh, when you've got a newborn will kind of wake you up. But have a look at this. Oh. Look at the left, ducking in and, and getting a, a long ride through the pit there. Jared Forrest, unable to find the exit. Yeah, he almost got there to the mouth of the barrel. Wow. You did see his board pop out there for a second. I mean, he'd had some serious trouble time in that left. And I love seeing it, love seeing him take advantage of that. And if anyone's going to know the left to pick, it's going to be Jerome. I mean, look, he, he, yeah, he's got so much experience out here. And um, if often when you're sitting uh, wider on the shoulder for the right, it puts you in the perfect position to be deep for the left on the barrel. And here we go. We're seeing a replay of that. You just see his board there. Oh, his board came out of the barrel almost, but his body didn't. So not quite sure what happened in there, but... You kind of sometimes, don't you get that foam ball and it can almost kick you out, but his board kind of right over the top of it. So he's got a, a replay here. He's 5.5 from earlier on. Love the way he's just setting up the, those more critical hits into the bowl. Yeah, I mean, uh, Jez is probably just loving being out at main break and it not being crowded. I mean, on a day like today, there'd be so many locals out there, so we've got to be pretty thankful for them letting us have the break today and, yeah, um, oh. these surfers being able to use it. And here we're seeing a replay of one of Leo's waves. And, um, yeah, this was his 6.67, uh, so nice surfing there. Yeah, just uh, the control that Kaipo oh. was touching on there. Just the commitment. Wow. Look, his back foot almost drifting to that outside rail, which can really throw you off. So th these surfers are just, just hell-bent on finishing off those really critical turns. Oh, just the recovery after something like that. The airdrop, his back foot slipped. Like, that takes serious skill. And, um, yeah, definitely rewarded for it. I mean, that 6.67, it's a good opener for Leo. And, um, yeah. Uh, Zach, let's uh, let's chat about this zone. Um, mentioned throughout the broadcast, just all, all the different sort of adventures that you can take and the, the cool things that you can get amongst. And one of the, the real popular things to do in this region is check out some of the caves. And uh, they're, they're just huge. They're, they're massive and they're big gathering places for the Wadandi people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we call them Yaling in our language, and Yaling is a cave system or a hole in the hill, which is a cave. And um, much while yelling up. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, so uh, um, so basically our old people would use these as a bit of a refuge from whenever we'd be in the um, Yeting times, which is the cold times, ice ages. They'd use them as a refuge to go in, the nice um, temperatures inside the cave, and um, use them, yeah, as a, like a, a dwelling at that time. I love checking them out. It's just uh, such a cool journey, and they have great guides down there. But, you know, there, there's also signs of, um, you know, the presence of uh, Indigenous people down there. There's, like, some, some teeth and artefacts and whatnot in that region. Yeah, for sure. And then some beads, um, some bone beads and jewellery that have been pulled out that have been radiocarbon dated um, up to 17,000 years old. Wow. Uh, yeah, and right through to places like in Burn Up Forest, you have uh, Devil's Lair, uh, which has occupation levels up to 50,000 years. So, wow. Yeah, great. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's 60,000 years of custodianship. So, uh, obviously, uh, an incredibly deep connection to the, uh, the country as we see Carlos out. And he's really looking to just get himself a, a decent ride that's going to put him in a position to make a strike for a, a top two finish here. And this is a, a bit more like it from the Costa Rican who hammers that end section. Uh, it's such a, a tricky one to, to get right. Felicity, you can overcommit sometimes, push a little bit too hard. And on that uh, 
occasion. Carlos yeah. struggling. Yeah, yeah, definitely coming undone at the end there. But uh, I did see before we had some footage of uh, Carlos preheat, um, getting a few words from Mitch Thorson. And if anyone knows this break and has experience out there, it's him. So, I mean, I'm sure that he's given the word uh, to Carlos on what waves to pick. And we're just seeing a replay here now of that last wave. I mean, he got three nice solid turns in here. But yeah, just came to this end section and uh, kind of looked like he went up there with one idea and then sort of changed his mind halfway through and tried to bring it a little bit more around. And yeah, maybe not quite the best decision there. But like, it's just, it's, it is a tricky section, you know, hard to make that right decision. And yeah, I mean, that last wave came through, it was a 4.17, so. Still gonna have work to do there, Carlos. It is Jerem Forrest out in front at the moment. Just over 16 minutes to go. We're going to take a Bonsoy brew break. More big rides coming your way right after this. What and the country? Well, I mean, the country's beautiful and the people are even more beautiful. Our bloodlines run through this country. To be welcomed is to having respect for the land you're on, the land you're visiting, looking after country like you would your own home. This is your home while you're here. That's why we're welcoming you to our home. Having respect for our cultural protocols, having respect for Aboriginal people here on this country, be able to enjoy this beautiful country that we live on. There is a level of respect from, from our hearts and our spirits to your hearts and your spirits. Our spirit is born of this country. It's all about heritage, it's all about the ocean and the forests. We're very grateful that you choose our land, our country, our heart, our Maya, to come and perform here. We're honoured to have you here, share the beauty of what we have here in this place. We're very welcoming, so welcome. And we feel that, we feel that uh, that warmth from the, the local area. And we're lucky enough to have a cultural custodian, Zach Webb with us here in the booth, has been sharing some great stories. And part of the, the welcome was asking to be accepted in, into the region and, and making an offering to the river and letting the, the spirits know that we're here, Zach. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, it's a bit of a, pr a, a process, basically, of, yeah, going down to the river. We use our mara, our hands, and we actually grab some of the quarrel, the sand from the beach, and, um, yeah, introduce ourselves to country so everyone had an opportunity to um, be welcomed to country by the community here, but then also, um, uh, I guess, introduce themselves to country itself as well. Uh, it was awesome, and, you know, pretty much everyone that could be there from the, the CT was there and taking part and, and enjoying that, those stories. Yeah, it's beautiful to see. And uh, 
I just I just love you know as surfers you know we're in the ocean all the time and we're out in nature and it's really beautiful to get involved in um, that ceremony the other day and <clears throat> yeah just pay our respects and pay our respects to the land introduce ourselves and yeah I just love watching it and I love watching it from all the different stops around the world most definitely. We've got some uh, action out there at the moment. Got some waves rolling our way. Leonardo Firavanti kicked off things with a 6.67. This is a guy with big committed turns who's uh, putting together quite a campaign on the CT at the moment. And he's driving into this one. Doesn't go all the way to the, the base of the wave because he wants to maintain some speed for some big rips off the top here. This wave not cooperating too much in the opening stages, but he does get a nice finish on it. Yeah, I mean, look, it's a good, it's a nice backup wave. That fight, it's come through at a 5.4. Um, I just don't think he's really had the right wave yet to open up. Um, and we even saw it a little bit on that first wave. I also think the wind's massively playing a big part into this. It, it actually does, look, I know because I've been out there a lot in these sort of conditions that it's hard on a day like today. I mean, you're watching it right now and it looks pristine, it looks clean, but when you're out there, th there's wind blowing up the face of the wave, there's water in your eyes, there's sun in your eyes here, and it's it's really tricky for these surfers right now. So, I mean, that's why boards are looking a little chattery. Waves probably aren't, you know, maybe being surfed to their, you know, what you think they can be surfed to. So, um, yeah, definitely a lot trickier than what it looks. And yeah, I can speak to that. Well, Leo, 25 years of age, sitting in 10th position on the ratings, coming into stop number five. So, uh, you know, after not making the cut last year, he's really turned things around. Had a runner-up finish at Pipe, the first stop of the, of the season. And, uh, you know, his hard work over there on the North Shore really paying off, as we see. One of uh, the winner of the trials up again. Trying to better a 3.07 here. He's... In a dangerous position, even though he's holding on to a qualifying spot at the moment, Carlos is well within striking distance. Yeah, he is. I mean, look, Carlos only needs a 4.4. Jezza took off on that last wave, and he knew instantly. You could kind of see it when we watched it, but he bobbled on that first turn, and he's like, you know what? I'm not going to get the score I need here. Let's get out of here. And often, the first turn at Margaret River really sets the pace for the rest of your wave. And look, we're getting a look here at this replay hard off the bottom and see he just gets caught up and that's that wind I'm talking about you know it's blowing up the face of the wave and he was just like you know what I'm out of here this isn't going to give me the next the, you know the backup score I need or potentially an even better score and yeah just he J Jezza knows that he just needs one more good wave and yeah do you uh Zach as a a, a fan just coming to, to watch it unfold do you sense the the kind of the energy and the nerves for the surfers with uh, what what we have now, the cut looming, where we lose a, a percentage of the field. Are, are you sensing that there's a, a real edge at this venue? Yeah, yeah, there's a little bit of an edge there, of course, because, you know, they've got um, put their heart and bodies on the line here. And, um, and yeah, I, I guess you see that, that sort of edge, but that, I guess that's what we do is try to have these ceremonies to help them uh, relax and take that edge off it, really, and just remind them to have fun out there. Most definitely. Well, someone like Jerem's going to have uh, incredible fun because he's not dealing with the cart. He, he's just the local who wants to put in a good performance. I think he'd have big expectations. Uh, from my experience chatting with local wild cards, you know, they, they have a pretty sleepless run of nights once they make the main <laughs> event because it's hard not to dream about what it might be like oh, for to sure, become for the sure. champ in front of everyone. <laughs> Oh, Jez is probably having double sleepless nights with a new bubba on the way. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, and um, yeah, big congrats to uh, Simone and Jerem uh, Kai, I think, their daughter. Um, they had a little girl not too long ago, I think just four months ago. So, uh, yeah, he's he's dealing with it all. But uh, you know why he, he doesn't have anything to lose on his road through this draw. He, He's after a big baby bonus at this <laughs> venue. There's some serious prize money that he can uh, he can rack up and really take some pressure off the, the fam. So that'd be awesome for him. Yeah, no, it'd be so good. And I, I just love watching him actually in this event for the first time. It's, it's really, really making me happy. And yeah, like I said before, he just loved being out there in conditions like this with hardly anyone in the lineup because days like this, it's chockers. You know, you've got all the locals out there and they're all out there on their big boards and charging and, and it can be really hard place to get practice in and even to get a wave so 
I think he would just be relishing in the fact that he's like, this is great. I've just got two other guys out here. I mean, you look at his wave count, it's a lot higher than anyone else's. He's like, I'm just going to make the most of this. The reason he's so popular too is Jerem's kind of like the wolf in Pulp Fiction. He's <laughs> the guy that you call when you're in trouble over here in the West. He helps sort things out for you. He's a great host. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Jez is definitely a great host. He's, you know, he's really tight with a lot of the surfers here. And like, um, I think Joe was saying yesterday, or you, you were, Ronnie, but... Um, yeah, he's put a lot of time in now that he's sort of moved a little bit more away from competitive surfing. But here we are looking at a heat recap and uh, yeah, Jerome Forrest on his backhand here. Nice first turn into the lip and straight back up into the second turn. Absolutely loving these conditions today uh, and uh, getting free rain on the lineup here at Mainbrake. Yeah, linking together some nice turns there. That was his 5.5, he seems. Always to drop a big number at some point. The flows look nice, but the commitment of Leonardo has fetched the, the best number of the heat so far. Amazing seeing it from that water angle, flying out of the sky, somehow able to just stay in touch with his equipment. But uh, even Leonardo, sort of uh, similar to Kyle Belly in the first heat, he's capable of so much more, but he, his status as a veteran in, in this heat is really helping him hold on to that number one position. Yeah, that's right. I mean, he it does look difficult. I mean, we've from the previous heat as well. I mean, Kyle, we saw it. You, you're waiting for them to do something massive on these waves, and they're getting good scores. You know, they're getting sixes, but really, right now, that wind I think is making it pretty difficult. And unless you're on the right board right now, I mean, a couple inches bigger is is really going to uh, make a difference. And we saw it in Jacob surfing. He just looks smooth and controlled. And um, yeah, it's really going to be the difference today. Qu equipment is going to be a big topic of conversation and yeah these guys are being put to the test this morning with this wind yeah just uh just vibing that that wind's starting to lay down just a, a little bit which might free the competitors up on their approach to those big sections talking about jerem not having that the stress of dealing with the cart talking about leo being well situated at the top of the rankings got to look at carlos who's had opportunities this year as uh, one of the replacement surfers and he's back in 30th position on the rankings and needs to, to crack the semi-finals, even to have a chance of getting above the cut line. As we get back to live action here, and it is the winner of the trials, just finding a, a nice flow off the bottom. Looking like he was able to, to kind of really just drive that board with complete freedom, not having to deal with those bumps on, on that, that ride. Yeah, look, Carlos actually had priority out the back there and he couldn't get into that wave. So Jerem looking at him and being like, mate, are you going or not? And absolutely capitalising on that mistake there from Carlos and surfing that wave beautifully. So, yeah, a bit of an error there for Carlos. He, you know, it's not a good feeling when something like that happens. So it would be interesting to see if he can turn things around after a mistake like that. So here we go. We're having a look at the replay and it's just speaking to that wind again. He probably thinks he's in the right position but misses it and... Jerem absolutely capitalising on this wave. It was a good-looking wave, too. It had a really nice bowly section oh. to it. And all about that second turn there, straight up into that third one, throwing so much spray. Nice little cut back there. And, uh, yeah, just bringing it through to the inside. So Jerem capitalising on uh, that mistake there from Carlos. Yeah, Carlos. I saw him chatting with Mitch Thorson. Uh, obviously, a, a really one of WA's best. And... Um, yeah, Mitch would be a little bummed that he wasn't able to get himself better position there. But it's going to be Jerem Forrest's best number, 5.77. And that's going to just push that requirement much higher now for Carlos, who's after a 7.1. So he really did a number on Carlos there. Carlos, I mentioned, he's got to get to the semis, just have a chance. But really his best uh, case of getting above that cut line is to crack the final here. He's well behind on the rankings. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a hefty task ahead. And uh, little errors like that, they can, you know, they can play on your mindset. And with only, you know, two and, two and a half minutes remaining in this heat, it's, it's a big job. And he's sitting out there, he's got, only got second priority, so he's not going to have first pick at the wave coming through. And he's going to need to uh, sell a wave to Leo, and then he's going to need to seriously make it happen on uh, probably a medium-sized wave or a set wave out here today. We've been uh, lucky enough to 
Just by learning from Zach Webb, who's still with us at the moment. Uh, you, you've dropped some real knowledge on us this week, mate, and uh, given us some great words to, to take with us on our journey. Uh, Kaya is a, a fantastic greeting. Uh, it, in some ways, it's like your version of uh, aloha. It, it means a few different things, doesn't it? Oh, it does, it does. It means uh, kaya can mean yes, it can mean hello, and it can mean welcome at the same time. So, yeah, much like aloha as well. Uh, and, and what about a, another one, mate, that you can uh, you can drop on us? Um, oh, well, look, uh, look, there's many words, but um, I guess the best one would be um, uh, with uh, Warrington. Warrington uh, is the ocean, so it's what we're here to do and, and, and celebrate today. So, and, um, yeah, so Warrington being the ocean. And this, uh, this particular piece of ocean is unbelievable. Always gives us big conditions, throws a, a whole lot of energy our way. There's a former winner, Adriana de Souza. And he's been working with Leonardo. And uh, that's a, a much better ride. Adriano liked it. Just a complete wave. And uh, Leo, with a minute and 20 to go, might just make his way to the beach. Yeah, it, it looked like he was maybe gesturing as if he wanted to go. But here we go. We're having a look at this replay here. And this was a really well-surfed wave. I mean, it just looked really well put together. No bobbly bits. Just beautiful surfing. Nice flow in between his turns. And variety as well, mixing it up with that layback there, bringing it through to the inside. And you can tell he's, he's I reckon he's got to be happy with that wave. Definitely, in my eyes, the best wave surfed at the heat, I'd say. Beautiful turn there. Yeah, it, just, it felt like he, he didn't oversurf this one. You know, I think everyone wants to, to go out there when they see the conditions looking so good and just get on the attack. But there is that texture on the water from that strong. Uh, offshore breeze this morning and Leo really settled into this ride. I love the mix up and the variation. Now, that is a really, you know, heavy back foot that he's thrown into that turn. Yeah, wow. I mean, scores coming through now, an eight point ride. I mean, <laughs> excellent in the excellent range and yeah, great variety on that wave. Didn't oversurf it, like you said, and yeah, he's got to be stoked with that. Yeah, an eight-point ride's put him well out in front. Jerem's still hanging on to that second position. Carlos is after a 7.1. Zach, uh, so love just being able to, to pick your brain, mate, and have you just share with us some of your, your magic culture. But uh, also, I've got to ask you, uh, being from this area, what's your favourite place or, or your favourite thing to do? Uh, in the region. Oh, look, I just I love the ocean um, and basically just getting amongst it. So um, especially down towards the burn up area, um, that's one of my favorites because you can get down on the beach, um, especially around this time because there's nyari, there's salmon on the way. So um, it's always good. And I've been promising myself to get out there. So yeah, I think I'll be doing that later on today. Beautiful, mate. Well, uh, thank you for the, the culture lessons and, and thank you for hosting us once again. We really enjoy your company. No worries, Yanka, and thanks for having me, eh? Yanka. And uh, we're going to take a quick break here. We've got more elimination round heats just around the corner. We're going to bring in Joe and Bugs for the call. Why I love Kuwapa Station and Nalu, this region to me is just so special. I had such good memories here as a kid growing up and 
yeah, I just feel like there's always an adventure awaiting around the corner. As soon as you jump in your car and you go on that dirt road, you never know what you're gonna see. So it's just an amazing getaway for me. I feel like uh, every time I get here, I just forget about everything else, really just focus on what's around me. What makes Western Australia so special is it's just such a unique place. There's always something to do. You're either surfing, you're diving, you're fishing. Everything is, is, that's here kind of captures your attention. Just the environments are completely different, all on one coast. I've been a lot of places, but I haven't seen a place like this where it just has so much energy and so much raw beauty, you know, all in one. That's why we appreciate Western Australia. So happy to be here in Western Australia as we get a great view from the Western Australia flight cam and seeing a beautiful Saturday that's already been underway with two big heats in the elimination round. A favorite stop on tour for most of our surfers that come here. Great things to do, checking out vineyards. Even in the Margaret River town, it's easy to find great restaurants like the Tuck Shop. A lot of great people welcoming the world's best as we welcome you all of you to the Harvey Norman host set, Joe Trapel with one of the biggest legends in pro surfing history, Wayne Rabbit Bartholomew. Bugs, your first trip to the West. It was, I imagine it was competitive and it might have been part of that Australian titles back in the day. Uh, yeah, it was the Aussie titles. Uh, you know, it started out, we we drive here from the Gold Coast, so uh, that's quite a mission in itself. And then you'd be here surfing 15-foot Margaret River, you know, no leg ropes, 20-minute heats. It was uh, it was pretty brutal. Wow. <laughs> Starting with the drive itself as we introduce this heat. Callum Robson representing Ev Evan said he dropped a few spots out of the top 10, suffering a loss in this round back at Bells, and he felt that seesaw moment and pro surfing where he finaled the year before as a rookie at Bells and then out in the elimination round. So he's trying to avoid that here. But look at this swell really showing itself right on the head on top of Jarvis Earl, the world junior champ. What are your options here, Bugs? Wow, this is just he's actually going to duck dive that. He might have just got under it. This, I mean, that's the beauty about having, you know, like a 6'2 or something as opposed to an eight-foot board. <laughs> exactly. The equipment has uh, dropped down dramatically since those Australian titles that you felt back in the day, Bugs. But there were a lot of changes. You guys were inventing a, a sport and going through what it took to compete at a high level and also picking the venues around the world. What are some of those early changes that were really significant that you saw? Well, I mean... Joey, it was a, it really was an evolution. Uh, but you, I'll give you an example. Like, I mean, for, right now we've got, you know, the WCL have given these guys a 35-minute heat. There's priority. Uh, it's best two rides with jet ski assist. It, you know, it's a fair shake. Back in the day, like, for example, um, you know, we'd say, say a far-flung place, say South Africa, would fly there from Australia. It's over a 20-hour journey from the USA. It's nearly like 30 or 40 hours, right? You'd get there, but first of all, we'll see if there's any action here. The number one seed would be in the first seed of the day at seven o'clock in the morning with a 20-minute heat with no limit, with uh, you know, knockout, no elimination. Wow. And, and, I mean, that's just how it was in every event around the world. We, I mean, our whole era, you know, we never experienced a, a, an elimination round, and, and, and it's really where that conversation began. Like you'd go, wow, like, you know, at least in tennis, you know, you get out there, you get to play three or five sets of tennis. So 20 minute heat and you know, you'd be against the, the local hot shot. I mean, that's why they moved the, the, the seating to the middle of the draw. And also the, the start of the conversation about uh, an elimination round to you know, have another crack at it. That sounds just cruel, doesn't it? Traveling halfway around the world, a 20 minute heat and you don't really have the luxury of a waiting period to wait for the best part of the swell. Oh, it was Thursday morning, whatever it was served up. <laughs> you'd <laughs> Unbelievable. A lot has happened since those early days. Proud to see where surfing is today. I'm sure you're incredibly proud, Bugs, for one, being a world champ, but also being the CEO for about a decade. And some great stories have come from that. Callum Robson, Michael Rodriguez, Jarvis Earl. What a great matchup here. For Michael Rodriguez, he is in a must-win situation. He's in a three-way tie on the live rankings, sitting on 26, so behind the cut, sharing that with Kelly Slater. And 
Also, Baron Mamiya. So he's got to make this heat. The man that came on tour in 2018 with a lot of excitement, made a couple of quarterfinals as a rookie, made a semifinal the following year, but didn't have enough points to stay on tour. So last year, got back on with a stellar Challenger Series performance, clinching that spot at Haliva. But you've seen all those ties behind the cut. Kelly, Baron, Emrod in the same situation. As I uh, just want to note a tough moment for Carlos Munoz in the last team. Eliminated in third. This year he was the injury replacement wild card. The first call up for injuries. And with guys like Ramsey Bulkiam out, Jadson Andre, he was able to surf in all five events. Unfortunately, didn't get the points to get past the cut. No, not this time round, but it, it was a great experience. Uh, again, he'll learn from that. And, and Carlos, he'll be a snapper. He'll go straight into the Challenger Series, where, where really he probably thought he was going to be anyway. Last heat was won by the Italian. Leonardo Firavanti is with Stace. Well done, Leo. Fantastic start to the day. Yeah, that was, uh, conditions are beautiful. And I'm just happy that I put on a good heat. Um, I wasn't too proud of my heat yesterday. I uh, made a few mistakes, and um, but, you know, it's part of the game. And, uh, you know, I woke up this morning, the wind was offshore. I knew I was in the limitation round, and in my mind it was like, all right, just a good warm-up heat before the the round of 32. So I get to surf one more time and test out the conditions. So you're working with Adriana here at this event. You, we know you love to wear your heart on your sleeve and your very uh, high intensity character. Adriano, very relaxed. Watching your debrief was uh, was great to listen in. Could you give the viewers uh, an idea of what you're talking about? Yeah, I'm so grateful for the Italian Federation um, to support me with you know everything, but also having Adriano part of the you know he's the the Italian coach, and um, they have him here with me and. Adriano, is, you know, he's won this event, uh, world champion, one of the greatest competitors of all time, I think. So being able to learn from him, you know, pick, pick out ideas, you know, pick his brain and, um, you know, see what works for him and see what, you know, what I can take for my um, agenda because obviously everybody's different. Uh, it's been a great, great learning experience and uh, I'm glad he's in my corner. Absolutely. Did you want to sing out to everyone back home uh, in Italy? Ciao a tutti, lo so che è tardi, però un abbraccio forte. Prossima hit, credo tra poco. Ci siamo. Dai, forza Italia. Bravo, well done, Leo. Thank you, States. Leonardo Firavanti in a comfortable spot. Turning in some great results this year. Another great heat. Here comes Countex throwing down a frontside wrap. Real full on the face. So that's going to slow down his pace a bit. He's hoping for a, a ramping end section. Still full, a lot of water over the reef, and just still a bit sluggish, just wave-wise, but he definitely looks connected. He's been trying a few different types of boards the last couple of events. Showed up with some JSs at Bells that he was trying out. Saw him on a Darren Hanley the other day, so really trying to work out his equipment. Sticking with the future fins, the Jordy Smith signature model, the large size, as he loves that hold that he gets off the bottom big power surfer and still so young I always forget that Callum's the, the youngest surfer on tour full time at just 22 years of age. Yeah Callum uh, is an amazing young surfer and his story is, is fantastic to for any aspiring young surfer who you know he, he, was, he won a Challenger Series the last one of the year I mean the QS a couple of years ago the last one of the year got himself into the Challenger cut through that into the CT and he stayed there ever since he made the cut really well last year he's well on track this year he, he's had a third and the ninth coming into Osby had a bit of a slip up at in the rip curl pro at bells Michael Rodriguez dropping in member must win situation has to avoid third or he's back in the challenger series great form nice clean surfing from Emrod Frames it up with a little layback, a tough move to pull off right there, and he will run out of space, so losing the finish. Michael Rodriguez was able to surf in a big QS event at Lowers, and that drew the attention from Matt Biolas. Matt jumped on to help his cause, giving him some incredible surfboards. As you get a nice view of the replay of Callum Robson. Yeah, he starts out here jamming that first turn, and then the wave goes really flat here, Joe. You, you think, OK, it's going to stand up on that inside shelf, but no, it stays pretty flat. These are kind of low-scoring manoeuvres he's doing, and he, he knows he's just got to finish it off. And as you said, it was a 
not such a crisp finish. It was. It's all in this first turn here. A four eight three. Uh, so that sets the scale. But that, that's a beautiful carving turn by Callum Robson. It, in this way, it looks like it's going to go into the six point range, and then it flattens out. Now the fade takeoff from Michael Rodriguez. Yeah, great fade there. He, he had to because again this wave it tapered off so quickly and he goes into a series of like just sort of snaps there. He gets it going a little crisper on that one. Finishes up not so convincingly. And you see the Red Bull skis activated there. Big thanks to Rabbit Bartholomew for introducing that. Jet ski assist back in the day completely changed the game. We wanted to see more surfing, less paddling. Well, it's all about entertainment. <laughs> That's exactly right, Bugs. Interesting moment for the young world junior champion, Jarvis Earl. Where has he been in this matchup, Kaipo? I want to do a little rattled, you know, at the beginning, I feel, got caught inside. Um, and then actually just like let these guys kind of paddle around them to tell you the truth. So he's been taking his time. He's got priority now, uh, but it is tricky out here. There's some wide ones coming through. Um, there's some there's a surprise set, so you can get caught inside. Positioning is going to be key. And again, dealing with the wind, but I feel the wind is getting a little lighter right now. So hopefully that trend continues. Uh, Kaipa, have you identified that a lot with the young wildcard surfers uh, kind of falling victim to the veterans that kind of establish dominance in these seats? Yeah, I mean, you got to, I mean, as a, a surfer coming up, these are your heroes, right? But you can't give them too much respect when you have the jersey on. And I think that comes in time. And I think that comes with different personalities in surfing. Uh, Jarvis, a quiet, unassuming, talented surfer. Uh, so we'll see what he does now that he has priority. Thank you, Kaipo. It's interesting when you're the grommet around veterans. It's, there's these uh, sort of unwritten rules in, in lineups around the world where you're constantly respecting your elders and you're never paddling around someone in the older generation who's put in more time than you. But you got to switch gears when you got a jersey on. Put that out the window because you got to win at all costs. That's sometimes a big shift in your nature of just surfing with respect in a lineup in a free surf and then changing gears, especially when you're trying to make heats at a high level. And it's probably even more so, you know, where even if you're a world junior champion, you're still a grom. <laughs> you certainly are. World junior champions, uh, great stories there. Andy Irons won back in 1998. And that was sort of that first edition of having that junior level championship series. And I, I really love that because they got to really feel what to expect when they finally made the tour. Yeah, I, I actually um, was a co-tournament director for that event. We had it out at Miley Point um, on the west side. It was a really cool. It was like where Sonny Garcia really uh, cut his teeth. And it was Andy and, you know, Paco. It was that crew coming through. And Andy Irons just dominated the event. And the stories I heard, Bugs, was about Parco being a two-time World Junior Champ. He had already won it once, and he said he had to enter the draw because his friend Mick Fanning was trying to win it. He just wanted to make sure that Mick didn't get one. And he held him off in a <laughs> final down at <laughs> Phillip Island. As we see the backhand serve for a World Junior Champ, Jarvis Earl going vertical. That lip line's going to just float him back down into the pocket here. And the man from Cronulla just using that whitewater well. And just keeps that board moving. A lot of activity there. I saw him sitting with one of the greats, Luke Egan, at the athlete welcome dinner at Lewin Estates. He was so happy for this opportunity. And it was cool just hearing Luke Egan going, pumping him up, saying, yep, you're going to rattle the cages of the world's best. He was giving him some just good key words to to get the grommet fired up for this big opportunity in his career. Well, you can't go wrong with Luke Egan in your corner, and it's Goofy on Goofy. <laughs> That's exactly right. What did you see here, Bugs? Well, that vertical turn, he got caught up in the wind there, but he managed to pull it off. Not sure if he'll get docked a little bit for not being super clean out of the lip, but it was a, a degree of difficulty, and he, he definitely cleans this wave up as it goes along. You know, the Jarvis... Joe, California, that World Junior title, as we see here, this the wind really holds him up here. He goes vertical, gets caught in the lip. Certainly a degree of difficulty, though. Do you see that approach? Well overhead on the open face, straight up vertical. Straight up vertical. So that's, that's a hallmark of his surfing. He's got a radical. I mean, that is wild. And uh, he comes out of that clean straight into a, a bottom turn. Now, that's the Luke Egan influence for sure. 
representing Cronulla. Hard to not to think of the great Mark Ocalupo when you look at backhand surfing like this as he jams that section down the line. This will help him trying to relax, settle the nerves a bit. Yeah, I mean, you think about Cronulla, this is a great start. You think about Cronulla, obviously world champion Mark Ocalupo, then, you know, uh, Richard Dog Marsh, we've got Conor O'Leary, uh, Jarvis, oh, goofy footers, Joe. Proud goofy foots. Here comes the world junior champ again. Jarvis Earl attacks it, air drops, but can't hang on. Bigger wave behind it for Callum Robson. There's that cool tracking, arcing turn for Callum. Little bit of a reset down carve. Now, jams it with the fins free. Good timing there. Nice, easy pace to watch. His opener of 4.83. And he'll be riding that one in for the Red Bull assist on the ski there. Robson just in his second season on tour. As we have a great longtime competitor, our co-commentator, Richie Lovett, that likes to roam around and check out everything on offer for these athletes. I know, Richie, you were well taken care of when you were on tour, but what do these guys have today? Yeah, you're right, Joe. Uh, you know, in my day it was good, but it's fantastic now. The Red Bull Athlete Zone is incredible. All the facilities you need for these athletes to be in prime, tip-top shape for their uh, for their upcoming heat. So there are zones within the Athlete Zones, and this zone here behind me uh, is kitted out with the sauna, ice bath, spa. If we just take a little uh, few steps this way, uh, and we'll pan into what's, uh, I guess, the preparation zone. And this is where the athletes can warm up, exercise bikes. There's wetsuit drying machines, all the massage facility uh, rollers. And you can see there, Kano Igarashi just starting to prepare for his heat. The locker room behind us, where all the athletes have their own personal locker. They can put all their gear in there. But this is the perfect vantage point as well, where they can see the surf and then the athlete lounge which is next door now that's where the real luxuries uh, start getting dished out all the food and uh, you know all the luxuries of home that they could ever want screens everywhere so that they can see all the scores coming in but this is where everyone hangs there's tension in this little zone behind me here the lounge it's a bit more relaxed but yeah the facilities that red bull provides second to none it's uh, it's all about the athletes oh we love it richie thank you so much for that tour I actually jumped in the sauna this morning. I thought it was a great idea. Jake Patterson went in there with Ethan Ewing. It was really cold before the sun came up. And I was loving seeing the sauna there. The ice bath has been really popular for a lot of athletes for a long time, as we'll get caught up here with last of Callum Robson. Yeah, Callum goes into his carve here. This is a very powerful surfer. And this wave here really sets it up beautifully. Awesome finish, three big moves here. Callum just carves down that first section. This move here, Joe, what a classic. Wow. And he finishes it up. Slow and Callum Robson just carves out of the lip there. Slow motion. You can just see the board just cavitating a little bit. Then he gets that second edge in. Resets onto that inside edge. Beautiful, clean, deep bottom turn. Again, big rooster tail. Carves down the face of the wave. He's looking down the line all the way here. Needs that big finish and puts it up there vertically. Blows the tail out and just had control slide down and stays in front of that white water. Great ride, 767. Well done to Callum Robson. You can see when you're on the right waves, it makes your job a lot easier. Those first two kind of snowboard type turns for Robson's ability, uh, pretty easy for him to do. That finish, I felt, had a lot of value in that score, increasing to that 7 6 7. A couple of judges even threw excellent numbers at that wave. Robson out in front, and he's rolling into this one. Looking yes, to better a 4.83, throws down that first turn. Speed bottom turn will get him way out in front, but there's not much left for him, so he's got to get out. Well, that was a speculator. He got straight off the ski into the lineup, super deep, had to race that one down the line, got away on him. Uh, that'll be a throwaway. So Callum with a nice pace in this heat. Jarvis Earl in the second spot. Michael Rodriguez holding priority in the must-win situation and already down to 13 minutes on the clock. Where is Emrod? This is Jarvis Earl, world junior champ who won that title at Seaside in San Diego over a fired up local boy named Levi Slauson, who's so talented. The waves are pumping 
in Southern California for that event. It was part of that that epic winter you were having, and you know that was just a, a, an extraordinary swell, big waves for the World Juniors, and, and the waves it was incredible surf. It was a time where big wave surfers like Felicity Palmatier were down at Todos Santos, just down south from that venue. Up north, all the surfers like Bobby Martinez were scoring Rincon and the points were firing and all of a sudden Seaside Reef hosted the best junior surfers. That was incredible to watch. And of course, uh, Cal I mean, Jarvis went on to be, I think, number two in the uh, Australasian uh, QS series as well. So, you know, he was just behind Reef Hazelwood. So he doubled up. I mean, the World Junior Championship gave him a direct entry into the Challenger Series, uh, which is a, a great incentive for the juniors. Oh, that's powerful. And then we should hopefully see him get on a nice run to potentially qualify for 2024. We're going to be following Jarvis closely as the Challenger Series begins uh, very soon at Snapper Rocks, which would probably be Bugs' favorite wave in the whole world as we've got some lines coming through. Priority was Michael Rodriguez. Just needs a 1.5 to take second off Jarvis Earl as he's in a must-win situation here. A uh, majestic lineup here at Margaret River, and the, and the guys just stroking for the horizon, having to duck dive that one, all got under it. There's more lines coming in there. You can see that wind just blowing the back off those waves. This is an awesome sight when Margaret River in full throat. It was amazing. Michael Rodriguez hasn't been here since 2019. It's an important moment for him right now. Setting that rail off the bottom, the Brazilian sets up the wrapping turn. Only needs a 1-5. Drills it there. He's done his job on that wave. He'll be out of the third place position. Good timing on that end section turn. A lot of face to work with. He's such a speedy surfer in smaller waves, and I, I loved his pace. He wasn't trying to rush too much on that two-turn combo. No, and he does look like he's, he's t chosen a, a slight step up of a board. This wave here, a good-looking wave. He, he just sort of flattened out that first session, didn't really get that big hook in, finishes it off pretty well. It's kind of like one huge maneuver and one setup maneuver. It's not going to be a massive score. As we see Kanoe Garashi preparing for heat number four, he's trying to get out of that four-way tie that he's sitting in 17th at the moment. We'll see if he can get it done right after this. in Australia as we are truly walking on a dream. I've been walking around on my breaks and there's been a lot of groms playing true surf, a lot of adults playing true surf. You could actually try to mimic your favorite surfers and surf just like them in real time at championship tour venues. You can download true surf today on the App Store and on Google Play and join in the fun. Pretend you're a world-class surfer and Bugs got to do that in real life. You know, everyone's dream of becoming a pro and 
there was kind of no such thing as that before you. Is that true, Bugs? I mean, were you kind of creating what it meant to be a pro surfer? Well, in, in 1973, I put a tax return in and the Commissioner of Taxation in Australia wrote me back a letter, a letter. Dear Mr. Bartholomew, there is no such thing as a professional surfer. <laughs> it was nearly like PS at the bottom, get a job, you bum. <laughs> is that a true story? Yeah. That's amazing. So many great moments just turning into this rock star lifestyle. Fashion was a big deal with your crew, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Everyone, there was a lot of different personalities back then. It was, it was really cool. Uh, join the personalities today as well that we have on the top 34. Remember, it's going to shrink down to top 22 after this event. Michael Rodriguez doing a good job to put himself in second as we look at the Harvey Norman heat recap. Solid surf. Callum Robson is loving it. 483 to open things up here. Steady rail work. He's not forcing anything when the wave went really full. He just managed to finish that 483. Just kept him in rhythm, and he uh, saved better moments to come right after this. He sure did. This wave here, this was a cracker. Really set up the foundation for this heat. He put himself in the box seat for Callum Robson, showing his power. And uh, this young guy could go deep in this event, Joe, if he gets it on a roll. Also, Michael Rodriguez getting involved here. 367, and then the 5.5 is what sent Jarvis Earl down to third. That's right. This wave here, the 5.5, five, he badly needed this. We've got a real cross section in this elimination round. We've got a bunch of dangerous wild cards. We've got journeymen like Michael Rodriguez, young guns like. Callum Robson in the next seat. Whoa, we got some crackers. Cool little version of a layback wrap for Michael Rodriguez. Throws down the cutty again, throws some water on that mid face snap and shuts it down. Saw a lot of that fire and passion and a lot of emotion when he got his spot back on tour at Haleva. He was surrounded by good friends and supporters and here in the West, he's got a great surfer named John Obello, who has a lot of QS experience behind him. Moved here to West Dawes a long time ago. And he's been backing him just with some local knowledge and insight. I ran into John and he was telling me about today being a, a bigger day for surf with great conditions. But he definitely wanted to put a lot of great energy all towards Michael Rodriguez. Bugs, what'd you see here? Yeah, well, this is a very important way for Michael Rodriguez. You can see he's surfing with a lot of intent, really making sure he, everything's in place. Just a, a series of nice cutties there, not, nothing too serious, but finishes it up. He knows that that wave has made a separation between him and Jarvis Earl. Uh, this is really important for him to get through this round, and he knows it. He's got that 5-5. Five, five. That's, that's going to better that 3.67. So the requirement for J Jarvis Earl is going to go up and not sure where Jarvis was in that because he he didn't really get a chance. Michael nailed that wave. Rodriguez 507 still second but Earl now needs a 6.14. So chipping away but still attainable for a world junior champ. Oh yeah I mean that's not safety for Michael Rodriguez but it's a, it's a, it's a little better off. Callum Robson out in front getting coached by Glenn Micro Hall in this event. Micro Surf Academy is what it's famously known as. Micro was formerly on the championship tour, won a lot of great events as well in the big QS series. Uh, we've got Bolito on the calendar this year for all the challengers. Uh, Micro was able to win that in a final with Nathaniel Curran. Also final that lowers. Uh, runner up to Gabriel Medina and created some big upsets when he was on tour. You know when he was a Grom him and Ace Buck and they came to this this rabbit camp I had and you could just tell like they were just they, they were really pushing each other these two goofy footers from the central coast <laughs> and uh, real characters and uh, you know Micro and Ace had great careers obviously Ace Buck and has just recently retired and what a great career multiple CT winner at, at epic locations and just one of the all round great guys of professional surfer. Oh, surfing. all time. We love you, Ace. Longevity on tour is incredible. There's a solid start for Michael Rodriguez. Really tried to lay into the pocket on that first section. Three on the clock now. 
If he can make any improvements, that's more pressure on Jarvis Earl. But yeah, quickly to Ace Bucket. I know Owen Wright was able to have the retirement party at Bells. For Ace, he kind of went away too soon for us. We weren't able to really have that big goodbye, but congrats, Ace, on a stellar career with the Dolphins joining in the party for Michael Rodriguez. How was that punt? Uh, yeah, well, you know, I think that was a pretty good comeback, but the whole crowd got up and, and then roared, and I went, oh, wow. But How cool is that, that Kaipo? Is you got a front row seat oh, for that. Oh. Wow, that was really cool, Joe. I mean, Emrod surfing this wave, and all of a sudden, two dolphins just leap into the air, breach into the air. It was like, that was like a painting. That was a moment out here. The West, I mean, talk about walking on a dream. And you're swimming in one right now. Got yeah, you. You're so lucky. How cool is that? And there was one shadowing Michael on the wave within the wave as well. So it was all <laughs> happening. There was there was surfing. There was aerials. And uh, I mean that's got to be worth an extra point and a half. It's got to be bugs. As we watch Jarvis, important wave. Nice little slingshot wrap. Quick little check on the second effort. More vertical under the lip. Great timing for Jarvis Earl. Throws down the wrapping turn again, and can he finish on his feet? This is a great ride, and he is able to put that one away. Well done. Luke Egan loves it. Along with Brent Power from Channel Islands. Earl now with a minute 30 to go has definitely turned in his best wave, chasing down a 6.14. Remember, if he gets it, Rodriguez drops to third. And if he stays there, he'll be sent to the Challenger Series. Oh, this is full on. I mean, Jarvis Earl, he, he, all he had was a 4.43. And this wave here, Joey, he puts it together. This first turn sets it up beautifully. Carves down, sets again. What's this move here, Joe? Vertical, free falls out of the lip. Get some air under his board and goes straight into his repertoire. Not a foot out of place there. And just finishes it up pretty solid. You know, just you kind of forget that little finish there. That's no worries. The the score was already on the on the board. That is an amazing look at that, the air under the board. And I love the way he just transitions perfectly. A very well surf, surfing beyond his years here. Love how he put himself in position with this wave. He, he wasn't really being too active, incredibly selective. That money turn was definitely the airdrop where he mixed it up and threw it straight up, air under his board, and stomped it right here. God, that, that is a slick maneuver. And look, the way he lands this, and he doesn't even flinch. He goes straight into the bottom turn. So you now know. we're running out of time, Bugs. It's coming down to the last wave for Jarvis Earl. And Michael Rodriguez has his career in the balance. We'll see if it's enough. If Jarvis gets it, Emrod will be heading to Snapper Rocks for the Challenger Series. What a moment here at the Western Australia Margaret River Pro. Remember, they can make comparisons, and they will do that the entire event. Richie Porter was on earlier saying how important it is with this venue being so far out to sea for them to look up at the monitor, check out the replay. They can compare Jarvis's wave to Emrod's best of 5.5. Earl chasing a 6.14. First score in, not enough. Incredibly close for this decision. A 6.5, that would be enough. So one judge says yes. And one just under. There's two yeses. This is heavy. Scores coming through. Jarvis Earl gets it. Michael Rodriguez gets sent to third on the last wave. And unfortunately for Enrod, he is eliminated from the event and also will be sent to the Challenger Series at Snapper Rocks. Where he'll join Jarvis Earl. Once again, unbelievable. Close decision there. And a tough one for Enrod. He did it last year, though, as he got himself back on the tour through the Challenger Series. So he's got more experience as he heads there once again. And what a clutch moment for a World Junior Champion. Not feeling the pressure of a cut, surfing on the main stage for the first time. And taking down a big name. Robson takes the win, moves on into the round of 32. He number four coming up next. Rio Waida, Kano Igarashi, and Reef Hazelwood right after this.
I'm Rio Waida. I'm from Bali and I'm 23 years old. I got into surfing, I think, from my parents. I'm really grateful for my mom and my dad. When I make to the tour, they just cry and they're just happy and they just say congrats and you did amazing. I'm proud of myself that I work hard and then reaching my goals. I hope I inspire more kids and then I hope just more Indonesian make to the tour. When I put the jersey, I'll be like, wow, it's happening. Probably I will get humble a little bit, but you know, I will slap myself and Rio, I'm here to win, so I'm gonna give everything to beat these guys. <laughs> One of the coolest additions to the championship tour, Rio Waida in his rookie season, coming into this stop number 16 in the world. Kano Igarashi equals 17th. There's about a four-way tie there. And also Reeve Hazelwood just took out the qualifying series season in his region. It'll be fun to follow him throughout his run on the Challenger Series. But first, he's got work to do out here at Margaret River Main Break. Let's get started here. What happened during the break? Pulling in on the hood was Kano Igarashi Bugs. Yeah, that's a, a nice little, uh, kind of a barrel, but probably more of a shampoo, but not bad. Certainly mixing it up, Joe. He means business straight away here. This is a, a great heat. Reef Hazelwood as well. Reef's a, a dangerous customer on his backhand, Joe. This is a pretty solid looking wave. Does he get the finish in? And he does looking really solid really cool to see the depth of reef hazelwood as you see the world junior champ yeah yeah that last one i was like that's definitely the score i hope they give it to me right and you did the end bit you're really clean through there yeah. especially when you'd already got the business done out there, so yeah yeah unreal, oh. mate. proud of you <laughs> cheers Got to be a great feeling to also, get through your heat. Like minutes, but also hear that Luke Egan's proud of you. And then the opposite side of that emotional moment for Michael Rodriguez. All the hard work that he puts in. Dropping down a third on the final wave. He had put together a great performance. And it was just that moment for the world junior champ. And he put it all together. As Michael Rodriguez did not make the cut. Getting started now with Rio, the rookie on tour from Indonesia. Great carve to start. Nice power hack on a big section. And Rio goes down, swinging for the fences. Oh, swinging. I mean, he nearly made that. So Rio winding up, missed opportunity. Would have started off with a huge score. But now working his way back out. Chose the number 45 for his jersey number, representing Indonesian independence. As we take another look here, Bugs. Yeah, well he sets his wave up really well. Nice carving turn there, looking down the line, looking to finish it up, and a massive, oh God, that, that, that converging foam balls just nailed him at the end, but that would have been a massive score. And he, the other two competitors, Kanoa and Reef, started out pretty solid. If Rio had got that, he may have got the best of the exchange. Rio comes from Surfer's Paradise. When you talk about the waves that he has out there, it just became the dream to head over to Indonesia and surf perfect waves. It's still the most common thing you hear about. People wanting to get on boat trips and experience all the waves that Rio got to grow up in. And I'm sure for you, Rabbit, you remember your first trip to Indonesia like it was yesterday. Oh, it's just such a magic place to go. We, you know, in the you know the mid 70s, Kuta was just such a small place. There was one BMO a day to take you to Uluwatu. It was just so magical. And uh, you know, surfing with Katut Mender and uh, some of those original guys. Uh, you know, there's always been great surfers from um, Indonesia. Yeah, there's and a lot of help to uh, guys like Rio Waida. You often see Rizal Tanjung on a lot of the broadcasts when we're at the CTs. Also TP Jabrik, who does a lot of hard work for pro surfing, not just paving the way for guys like Rio, but all the young talent. Rio wants to inspire the next generation to join him on tour. 
and there's a you know there's a, a massive following a lot of people in indonesia will be watching this because rio has really he's kind of busted down the door you know he's he's gone out there it was really difficult for young indonesian surfers to go all around the world because everywhere they went <laughs> wasn't quite as good as home and a lot colder and that was a lot to take on and rio's just really excited to learn everything he has to learn on tour even when he was freezing cold at super tubos he said that might have been the coldest water he's ever been in and wearing thicker suits than he's ever been used to but he's uh, up for the challenge rio with the fall in the finish gets a 283 kanoa garashi pulled in got that nice little vision on the takeoff 6.83 start and reef hazelwood wins the opening exchange the wild card 717 on the back end yeah that was um clearly the best ride of the heat Kanoa's not far behind him Kanoa had that wave where he mixed it up he got the little barrel a couple of good you know good slashes finished it well the 683 so right there on the money reef hazelwood with the 717 solid backhand rio how's that he got he got pinged so heavily for not finishing that ride you know he comes into this event he had a little bit of a slip up of bells. He's had a third, uh, he's had a fifth and a ninth. He's there about, I'm not sure if that's full safety zone. He, you know, he would feel a lot better if he got through this round because if he doesn't, he'll be, this will be a keeper, this score. It's only 265 points, it, it's nothing. This is the round that you're just trying to avoid at all costs. And if you end up here, you just gotta stay in the top two. So the third place finishes, that's a 33rd result. And really, really hard if you're trying to stay on tour past this mid-season cut. Kanoa's got a little breathing room on it, but there's a lot of ties where he sits at 17th. And then Rio's just one spot ahead of that traffic jam at 16th in the world. And, and as the surfers looking at this wave, it looks like a paddle from the outside. But will they get it? Yes, they will. It'll be Kanoa. Rolling in now with some speed. And the man that represents Japan on tour Growing up in Huntington Beach in Southern California, puts all he has into that carb to slide and fits in a finish. Real cool wave there from Kanoa. Nice surprising little layback carb with the slide and he held control throughout that entire moment. Moving camps a little bit these days and Spending time with the coach, St. Mitchell Ross. What did you see here, Bucks? Yeah, well, the first, this, this way is wind affected at the start of that first. He got a lot of cavitation. But this here, this one-two move here, great sliding slash. And then he gets his last section in. It's a complete one-two finish. And look at the wind and texture on the face, Joe. His board's cavitating here. Not much of a turn there. Not many points on offer there. But these two here, this is a great combination very difficult to get that board up and over that last section richie porter this morning talks about how much he loves the combination especially with variety and progression to be able to come out of this with control and get a follow-up with a turn that's big it is big his back foot just came off momentarily for him to recover from that and do that finishing turn he'll be well rewarded great execution for igarashi who's been dealing with the comparisons of what's different from last year to this year. Last year featuring in the Rip Curl WSL Finals, uh, going down in the first match of the morning. And then this year the talk was about just trying to stay on tour and get his momentum up to survive the mid-season cut. You know, it's a, it's a strange space to find yourself in after such a fantastic year. And Kanoa, you know, it's been a, a, a steady rise up the rankings uh, ever since his rookie year. And then to sort of kind of find himself in the basement again, it's, it's tough going. But, you know, he's a really cool cat. I mean, he's, he, he's been unfazed. He seems like he's still been going out there full of confidence in his heats. He knows um, his surfing's on, on point. He got a 6.93 there. That'll uh, put him in a safer, safer zone. So not bad, back to back, getting very similar numbers for Igarashi. 6.83 and then to a 6.93. So incredibly close there. He's sitting out in front, Hazelwood second with priority. And Rio Waida needing a 4.35 to move into the top two. And Rio was real open on his social media after his heat in the opening round yesterday, saying he's just expecting more out of himself wants bigger performances 
doesn't matter if it's the opening round or elimination round. So he left that to say, and he's excited for the work that's heading his way. We'll see how he recovers after the fall and the finish on that 2 8 3. I mean, the other guess, the other thing is the, the competitors, even though they're, they're looking out for themselves and where they are, it, it, their, their fortunes do fluctuate according to where others finish. Like the Michael Rodriguez situation going down in that heat, the, the guys just behind him, if you look at that, I mean, you know, Barron, Kelly Slater, you know, those guys go, well, you know, for his misfortune, perhaps, it, you know, it goes in their favour that they can move up. Yes, definitely. Keep We're keeping you posted on these live rankings. See what's going to happen with this cut. 22 minutes on the clock in this one. Let's catch up with the winner of the last heat. Callum Robson is with Stace. Well done, Cal. Great start to the day. Going to be a big day of surfing. How are you feeling? Yeah, not too bad. It's nice to get through that heat. Um, I found myself in the elimination round the last three events, so um, to get out of it is pretty nice. No 10 this time. Yeah, no 10, but um, got to rest. This all matters. Some fantastic surfing nonetheless. Mate, you're a big fella. You've got a great front side hack, but even someone like yourself looking like they're managing the wind out there. Talk us through how hard it actually is on the peak. Yeah, there's a bit of wind out there. I just think um, a few times I had, like, I was just, like, rushing to get into my waves. So, um, yeah, definitely the wind and um, just rushing into waves and kind of not being where you want kind of adds a lot of elements. And, um, yeah, especially when you, you find yourself on a good wave, it's hard to slow things down and just surf it the way you, you probably would if you're free surfing. But um, nonetheless, just, like, keep things simple. And, um, yeah, no, it's good out there. Any tips for Groms watching in? Um, just keep showing up, have a crack, um, and yeah, just have fun. You got a great matchup in the next round, fellow Aussie Jackson Baker. What do you make of that? The Baker. Yeah, we find ourselves in heaps of matchups, man, Jacko. So I'm sure it's going to be fun, and he's been ripping, so I've got to be on my A game for sure. Well done, mate. We'll see you a little bit later on. Thanks, Cal. We love it. Thank you, Stace. All Aussie matchup to look forward to in the round of 32. Callum Robson, Jackson Baker. Qualifying at the same time. Callum's was super smooth in that one. Jackson's got some explosive power. As we see this turn off the bottom, a beautiful wrap from Real White. A great start. Sets up that rail again for the second effort. There's the, the lips coming down. He meets it perfectly. Timing spot on for the Indonesian. And his best wave so far. Yeah, he needed this wave. He had to get in this heat. Kanoa has already got a 683 and a 693. Reef Hazelwood sitting out there with priority with that 717. There's a good looking wave, Joe. The Indonesian surfer carves down that first section. Beautiful beginning here. This wave here kind of flattens out a bit. He knows he needs a good finish and he nails it. Started off with a lot of size. I love how much water he used there, way off the top and as he started that carve. Yeah, that first carve was, you know, not without its challenges either. There's, look at the wind up the top of that wave. Beautifully timed here, right in the roof of the wave and just carves down the face. Board looks solid under his feet. Transitions back under that inside rail. So that first turn and the, and the finishing turn was the money turns in that heat, in that um, particular wave. And he really needed to get into this heat. So Rio has established the fact that he's looking good out here on the right wave. We know he came unstuck on that first courageous effort on, the, on that you know, finishing bowl. And we saw him do that yesterday in the opening round, an opportunity that probably would have seen him avoid this round, uh, just a fall on a wave that had a ton of scoring potential all over it. So trying to iron out those mistakes when you're trying to perform in a 35 minute heat. Got to be spot on from start to finish, especially at this level, being the best surfers on the planet. Igarashi leaves uh, Hazelwood. You know, he's not the just random wild card. He's had a few opportunities over the years. Remember he beat Julian Wilson Back when the event was at D-Bond, the Gold Coast to kick off the season, ended up with an equal ninth. He also got past Ryan Callanan at North Narrabeen when the CT went there in that shortened season. 
And he even had a wild card out here in the past where he did actually end up losing in this round. But he's improved on his entire game since then as we've witnessed that on his start with a 7-1-7. So many amazing surfers from this part of the world and a lot that had an impact on pro surfing. Bugs Wiki, can you tell us about the great Ian Cairns? Yeah, well, Ian, um, you know, he cut his teeth out here and obviously this served him well. Uh, going to, to the, the big waves in Hawaii, you know, he came from Western Australia and, you know, this is the land of the giants. This is Australia's Jurassic Park. And, you know, he was a, a really gutsy surfer, um, you know, a master at, here. At, he was the first guy that actually said you can, there's a right hand chip in at Margaret River. And, you know, you've got to remember back in the day, there was a lot of consequence of going right, you know, with no leg rope on a big day. First of all, you got that inside the bricks to deal with. But also paddling back out, you know, you've got to, you're getting bombing sets on the head a lot harder to hang on to boards with a, you know, a lot of leaderage, so to speak. Uh, so there was a lot of consequence. And, you know, everyone is quite, a, quite skeptical. And he was pretty sure that there was a good right. That's right. We love it. 16.50 on the clock. So many great stories from back in the day and stories that are happening now, especially with the Florence brothers, Nathan and John John. Love their surf trips to the West. These guys have been packing barrels and trading waves for a very long time. We'll take a break. More to come here in the West right after this. The motivation is, is higher than ever. You know, the, I guess that will and that want to win is, is stronger than I've ever felt. I was so close to victory, so close to a gold medal in Tokyo. That belief of being able to win a gold medal is, I have it more than I've ever felt it. Kunal always had a big future growing up on the south side of Huntington Pier. He was out there each and every day. I remember seeing a news clip when he was just about five years of age. He'd already been surfing for a couple of years and he was loving his life. His board was already stickered up at the time and he started beating everybody throughout the NSSA conference. Graduated from that pretty early and started traveling the world. Let's get caught up with last of Rio Ida. Yeah, this wave here was a, it was a fast walled wave without that A-frame peak. And, and then Reef Hazelwood as well, Bugs. Yeah, Reef on his back end. He is looking sensational today. He's been very patient, looking for this last section. To, is he going to get the one-two finish? He's really well known for that. A lot of poise on that ride, and he's going to get another. He's going to get another really decent score. Rio Wada got himself in with a six-eight-three, a six-eight on that previous wave, and he had to pull through. His last effort, but Reef Hazelwood <laughs> comes in with a 7-2-3, Joe. The two highest scores of the heat so far. We're on a run of wild cards being very effective this morning. Reef Hazelwood, 7-2-3, 7-1-7, back-to-back. 
Let's have another look. Yeah. The takeoff itself, he, he gets the, a lot of air, uh, wind underneath his board on the takeoff. He double pumps on the bottom turn, deep bottom turn, goes up and over, well close to the 12 o'clock mark, gets held up in the lip, free falls out, and scores a 7-2-3. Igarashi in motion. Clean searing carve. Another whip in the pocket. Jams it, slides out, and loses the finish. Tough one to let go of after a nice clean start. That rail work reminded me of what he did to win in Indonesia. And a really exciting final with Jeremy Flores. That's where Kanoa picked up that first CT win a couple of years back at Karamas. 12.15 on the clock. When you see big scores from the backhand attacker, Reef Hazelwood, you start hearing hoots from the water. Kaipo Guerrero, a proud goofy foot. Reef is really teeing off right now. Yeah, he is. Uh, I just, I love the goofy foot approach of Reef, Reef Hazelwood. Just being able to sit on those bottom turns on his heel and then placing his board vertically snapping. It's a point of difference, but it's actually that leverage that he's getting uh, to turn down with this offshore win has really been helping Reef and its proof is in the scores. Rio Wida upriding. Rio setting this one up. First section, quick whip. Stretches out the bottom turn, pushing hard on that forehand hook. Picking up the pace, he's searching. Where is he gonna put that board? He spins out, loses the finish. Definitely one of the hardest end sections to really line up. And he'll lose that last turn. His best wave is 6.8. It's chasing a 6.96 to avoid elimination. Yeah, well, that wave started out pretty good. Um, I really think it was no, no foul, no fault of his own there. The wave itself just didn't offer anything at the end, Joe. Even if he'd got that little bounce in, he wasn't going to get the score. There's the option for the Red Bull ski. As we continue with live action, Igarashi just up and out, world number five last year. Has some decent numbers, but doesn't want to feel the pressure of sitting in second at the moment. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a cruel nature of sport. You can, you can so easily go from the penthouse to the basement. You know, it's amazing how sport can, can be like that. You've got to maintain that self-belief. You know, everyone's got, human beings have got doubt within them. But Kanoa is, uh, this is his previous wave where. Yeah, Rio no, just Rio. searching yeah, this towards the end here, Bugs. It yeah. just got a little bit lost. But like you said, weren't too many points left on that end section. A 4.8 for last of Waida. Yeah. Still needs a 6.96 to move on. Yeah, I think even if he got that last turn in, it was a soft finish. He, he, maybe he would have got a 5-5. Five, five. He wouldn't have got the required score, the 6-9. It's going to come down to wave choice. He knows, you know, the board looks good under his feet. He's, he's solid. He just needs the right wave that's going to get, you know, give him those multiple major turns. Because he is not out of this. This is not a mega high scoring heat. But Kanoa is sitting pretty solid in second place. You think Rio, has he got a seven in him? Yes, he has. He certainly does. That's what makes these heats so exciting. As early as the elimination round. After this event, going from top 34 to top 22. We'll have some wild cards, so 24 in the draw. After we leave stop number five and heading back to the surf ranch, that wave system in the middle of California is back on the calendar, and that's where Rio wants to be. Sitting in 16th, so he's had some great highlights already. And I remember... Uh, Gosh, a couple of years ago when the world stopped for a bit and there weren't events, he just looked at social media clips to see who was doing the best surfing. And I think Italo was a big talk of the town, just every day, just dropping incredible highlights. And Rio Wido was right next to him, turning in unbelievable clips all up and down the coast in Indonesia, working out his equipment and really learned a lot about world-class surfing and preparing himself for the big stage. I mean, one thing about Rio, we're seeing some uh, solid forehand surfing. His backhand is phenomenal. 
you know, being raised uh, in, in those amazing left-handers throughout, you know, Indonesia. Last year at Manly, uh, his backhand surfing was just next level and in the, in the Challenger. Go back to back in the Challenger Series with huge wins. It was a big statement from Rio. Let's now catch up with Michael Rodriguez with Stace. Michael, very grateful for your time. A comment on that heat? Um, pretty hard one. Mags is an amazing place, but you know, yeah, you have to, to know exactly what you're doing. And right there was just super hard. Sometimes you have, you have to wait, sometimes you have to get everything. So, yeah, it is what it is. I've seen you have some fantastic performances here. Do you feel confident in the lineup? Yeah, I was. I was pretty confident. When I woke up this morning, I have a sesh there. I got some good ones. I was pretty, pretty confident on my, about my surfing. But, you know, <laughs> it just happens sometimes. Did you get to enjoy the moment with the Dolphins? Yeah, this uh, was super close, huh? Not bad. <laughs> and obviously, you'll be moving over to Snapper? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, right now, I, I need a couple of days just to, you know, think about everything and reset. But, yeah, I'm going to go to Coast, and next year we'll be back. Love it. Quick word in Portuguese. Yeah, sure. Um, obrigado a todo mundo que estava na torcida. Infelizmente, não deu. Uh, eu dei meu máximo, tentei, fiz tudo que estava uh, em minhas mãos, mas, às vezes, não acontece. Estou feliz de estar aqui, aproveitei esses eventos. Agora é hora de ir para Gold Coast, começar tudo de novo, e próximo ano estou de volta. Beijão para minha família, minha mãe, minha filha, minha mulher. Meus amigos, estamos juntos. Galera, vai, vai dar tudo certo. Thanks very much, Emrod. Michael Rodriguez, throwing out a big smile, saying hi to his family and showing a lot of just bravery there as he's moving on to Snapper Rocks for the Challenger Series. He's done it before, but I love the confidence that he will be back in 2024. Well, and he, you know, he was cool enough to say it is what it is. And, he, you know, he'll, he's got to reset, take a couple of days to digest this and then reset. One thing for sure, Joe, he is going to make the highlight reel. Oh. That, that wave of the Dolphins <laughs> yeah. will, will go worldwide. That was insane. It reminds you of uh, the Dolphin moment that Connor Coffin had at the box a couple of years ago. You saw a quick look at Felipe Toledo. The man just always has the game face on as he paces back and forth with the headphones on in the Red Bull athlete zone. But he uh, really cares about the Brazilian storm, so he even broke his focus to give a high five to Emrod. Last wave under the lip. Two times as Reef Hazelwood. Three times. That is an amazing ride. You could not get a more difficult situation here. That This is the finishing turn. But to come out of that second turn and, 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 and pull that off was, is just so... It, it's an exquisite ride. I'm wondering where the judge is going to go. And here's another one. Kanoa on the, the replay here. Great carve out of the top. Second turn. Looking down the line. Gets a bit of air into it. Quickly up there. And does he make it? Yes. He is so amazing at these short, you know, compact turns. Like he gets the full open carving on the upper face of the wave there. Brings it round. And now there's this section here that kind of nearly loses it off the bottom. Again, some air under his board. Look how quickly in the lip he goes, Joe. Adjusts his feet. Superb surfing. That was really special. What a great ride for Kanoa Garashi. A lot of different changes there. And then also Rio Waita. Yeah, Rio, he needs to cut loose on this one. The other two guys have gone berserk. Come on, Rio. Yeah, he's stoked. That was incredible. So much speed and kept it to two turns. That was brilliant. It's brilliant surfing all round. And look at this, he carves down the face here, gets into the nice double pump, bottom turn, triple pump, and then up into the lip, vertical. This is one of the cleaner finishing turns of the day. Gives thanks on the way down. An awesome exchange, all three surfers putting their best foot forward. A 7.93 for Reef Hazelwood, a 7.63 for Kanoa Igarashi. And suddenly Rio Wada needs a 7.76. And he had a, a, a darn good go at it. He sure did. Kaipo, unbelievable role for Reef Hazelwood. He improves every time he gets to his feet. Yeah, he was just surfing on the edge on that last wave, just barely in control. 
putting it under the lip, through the lip. Uh, I'm really enjoying the show from Reef Hazelwood, Kanoi Garashi. Uh, these guys are <laughs> performing right now, and the waves still outstanding out here. We got another set coming through, and it looks like it's going to be Reef. Let's go. Let's go, Reef Hazelwood. Can he improve on his fourth wave? Under the lip, going upside down. And you know what? That made sense for Reef's personality. He knows he's got to do something special to improve on his lower seven. So might as well try to pull off a crazy first turn, basically in the barrel upside down. Reef Hazelwood, <laughs> he looks like he belongs out here. This is an, an awesome heat, a 717, a 723. That last ride is. As Copo said, on edge the whole way. And this wave here, no takers. Still waiting for that score for Rio Wada. It is a critical score. There was only two maneuvers, but they were beauties. So interesting when you feel pressure at stop five as we see the glorious conditions today. Where you have wild cards just step up, take over. Guys like Reef Hazelwood. Remember, Cano was fifth in the world last year. And he's been having a tough time keeping up with his back end. Let's see what happened here. Yeah, as you said, Joe, Reef uh, decided to just go wild. And, you know, the, his last effort, he basically did that three times. It was on edge. It was a crazy ride. And now here's the score. It's going to be close. Two, score, two judges say yes, but right on the money. For, this is super close Bugs for Rio Wider. Score dropping for Rio Wider, and it comes through at a 7.7. .7. Stays in third, needs a 6.86 as we approach the final minute. Remember, Kanoa's way before was a 7.63. Incredibly close, Bugs. Well, I mean, he basically needed just a touch more. There's, there's quite a spread there. there. There's one judge giving an 8.3 and, and two you know, judges giving a 7.3, a 7.8, and then basically three judges said yes. That's a split decision. And unfortunately for Rio, it's not enough. Fortunately for Kanoa, Kanoa stays in second. But what a battle. Look at the numbers. 14 plus combined totals for all three of these athletes. Putting on a show here in the elimination round. Hazelwood free from pressure from the cut. W cell final five. Any of that here to just to shake things up. And he certainly did that. Three sevens in a row on his back end. Incredibly consistent. Especially for a guy that threw down big airs in his a young part of his career and almost could have been labeled an air guy and shown that he's built for the tour. Solid power game on his back end. Great in the air, above the lip, both directions. Solid two brighter. We're going to go into the countdown here. Reef's got the lead and he's not worried about priority. Kanoa Garashi is trying to keep Rio off any opportunities here. And he is effective into the horn. Kanoa moves on to the round of 32. And Rio Waida loses here in the elimination round as he's sitting number 16 in the world. Cano on a solid lap there, happy to be in second, trying to break that tie that he has with four surfers in equal 17th. And more goofy foot wild card hero stories. We had it from Jarvis Earl in the previous seat. Now Reef Hazelwood, Jerem Forrest looks solid. Goofy foot wild cards are heading right into the round of 32 where we're going to start the overlapping format. We're going to have a few minutes to have these guys catch their breath because Felipe Toledo has Reef Hazelwood in this first matchup of the round of 32. Back-to-back -back heats for the Goofy Foot. We're going to take a quick break. We'll bring in Ronnie Blakey, Felicity Palmatier, and Richie Lovett for the call.
everyone does their bit, our dunes and our coastline will be in a way better shape. To be able to give back to a place that's given me so much, it feels really special. Well, this is everyone's coast and it's obviously under a lot of pressure. We're helping to look after Gas Bay by stabilising the dunes and regenerating habitat. This is ground zero. We couldn't do it without collaboration. Do something really good on land, we see that positive just flow straight into the ocean. We're all connected to the animate and inanimate world around us. Without caring for country, the environment that we do benefit from now will diminish. Seeing the passion that these kids have, our coastlines are going to be in way better shape. They're probably planted more trees than anyone, it's so rad. Show us what you're doing to protect our one ocean by posting on social media with the hashtag WSL One Ocean and tagging WSL and WSL One Ocean in your post. New look, same mission. WSL One Ocean! Greetings once again from the Southwest. We're here for the Western Australia Margaret River Pro, and we are through the elimination round. Some heartbreak there, but the uh, the big heats are going to keep coming as we move into the round of 32. Head to head competition, no second chances anymore, and we've got some great matchups established. Uh, obviously, that last elimination heat, we had to see what unfolded there before we could establish these first few heats of the round of 32 for the men. Felipe Toledo, he's going to be out there and he's up against Reef Hazelwood, who just won through in that last elimination round heat. Reef looked good, Felicity. Reef looked on fire. I mean, he was just coming up to those sections so late and somehow pulling it off. So yeah, as a fellow Goofy footer, I love to watch it. And, you know, I think also the wind's backing off a bit. Conditions are looking pretty dreamy out there. Quick uh, jersey change up here, Rich, for, for Reef. These, uh, these surfers, though, super primed, uh, obviously very fit. There won't be any issues for him. He'll head back out there. Yeah, not a problem for Reef. And, and I almost feel like he's in a good position to go straight back out because he's just coming off a win. He's all got that confidence going. The, the, uh, the adrenaline's pumping, so straight back out there. But th there are a few little concerns with the board. He's just may have... Uh, on one of those late hits, just put a slight crease just in the tail. So it'll be interesting to see whether whether he rides that board. Sometimes if the surfers do have a, a, a little mild crease, but it doesn't break the, the fiberglass, they will continue to ride it. But you don't want that in the back of your head thinking, oh, my board oh, no, could snap. Right. So uh, we'll see what he does here. This is going to be a, a lot of fun uh, for spectators. Not a whole lot of fun for some of the surfers who are coming into this one at the back end of the top 22 and those still below the cut line chasing those big results. This heat it is a little different in that Reef isn't campaigning to, to get above the cut line at the moment. He's uh, here as a replacement surfer, the highest rated competitor. Well, he took out the regional QS ranks. So uh, he's about to hit the Challenger Series when the Gold Coast rolls around. But this is a, a fantastic opportunity for him to, to help fund that Challenger Series campaign by collecting some prize money. And, you know, a big opportunity for him to, to put himself up in lights coming up against last year's world champ. Yeah, absolutely. This is great experience for him. And uh, it really is about the experience and, and just getting time uh, at a CT level and just going, OK, what does it take to get through these heats? And he's got a massive one here. You know, he's up against one of the best to ever do it. Uh, the champ out here and, uh, in, well, Philippe Toledo, he's, you know, he's been pretty serious these last couple of events. Uh, he's gunning for some big scores. And uh, this is going to be a, a big ask for Reef to uh, to tackle the, the number 77 jersey. Toledo waiting patiently out there for this heat to get underway. Good energy out there in the lineup. Set waves pulsing at the moment. But we do have to uh, wait to, to get Reef Hazelwood out there. And, and while we do, Go ahead and scan that QR code and get yourself the opportunity to get tickets for the Surf Ranch Pro. Use the code RANCH10 for 10% off. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a fantastic contest presented by 805 Beer over the Memorial Day weekend. Expecting big crowds for that one. So get in nice and early and, and get your place. It's a, an up close and experience with the world's best surfers and always a, a hotly contested event. So Reef's almost out there now, and we're just moments away from getting this heat started. The first heat of the round of 32. So many great matchups that you can look forward to through this round uh, as well. Samuel Pupo, Geordie Smith in that second heat. 
It's going to be a, a lot of fun to watch it all play out today. We're, we're employing that overlapping heat format to Felicity, so we'll make good use of all the sets on offer. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, yeah, plenty of opportunity for them, and uh, we're going to have a lot to talk about. Yeah, it's going to be uh, intense, Rich. The cart, it's right there. Oh. <laughs> we, uh, we saw some serious disappointment through those elimination round heats for some of our competitors. Yeah, it was a shame, but, uh, you know, this is, this is the game. This is what we do, and uh, it's part of sport. There's always going to be a winner. There's always going to be a lot more losers, and today we're going to be sending people home uh, really unhappy, but, um, you know, this is it. This is why we do it. Definitely been an adjustment, though, in the attitude of the competitors, just uh, with this massive change to the way the season rolls on uh, and, and it feels like people are you know understanding of it now and, and they've digested that it's coming and, and they're ready to put their, their best foot forward and, and put inspired performances together. Yeah I remember last year watching this and there was a lot of emotion behind it. I remember watching certain people's heats you know coming in and you know they're just absolutely devastated and We've heard a lot of the WSL, those short pieces that um, have been playing during this webcast and how the surfers are talking about. They've, they, you know, they've learned, they've had to be more resilient. They've come back stronger and they know what it's about now. You know, this isn't their first rodeo. And it was nice, you know, to hear Michael Rodriguez come in after that heat and be able to digest it and be able to have a, you know, post-heat interview with Stace there and giving some valuable insights. Whereas uh, last year, you know, there was there was a lot more emotion, I'm feeling, that was behind all these. 100%. I feel like they've accepted it now more and they've just understood that, OK, this is part of the tour structure and this is how it's going to be. You know, last year, you, there was definitely some tension and some resistance from some of the surfers. But, uh, you know, they've all got on board now. They've gone, OK, this is how the tour is structured. The worst thing you could do as a competitor, in my opinion, would be to get negative about it and not accept that that's what's going to happen. Uh, you just need to embrace it and go, OK, what do I have to do to avoid it? And just focus on that rather than the fact that it's there. Yeah, 100%. I mean, that's one of the things you can't control. It's completely out of your control. You, you don't have control of the format of, of the WSL. But uh, one thing you can control is yourself and your mindset and how you approach it. Absolutely. Sets approaching. We're going to get this one underway momentarily. Surfers, maybe with that uh, last big set that rolled through, just kind of making them question their position in the lineup a little bit. We know that that, uh, that swell's going to hold pretty nicely throughout the day, and they're just sitting a, a little far out. So starting to charge back into uh, the inside at the moment. Felipe setting himself up for the first ride of the round of 32. Draws off the bottom, up into the section. A former winner here at Mainbreak Market River. Looking to claim a, a second title. He's had some amazing performances out here. Just such a an attacking competitor. Really does throw himself hard into each and every move. That's what we love about him. Super unpredictable. Kinetic with the amount of speed he can carry through uh, his turns. Just amazing how much he, he's sharpened up his power surfing over the last 10 years. One of the veterans on the CT and and breaking through for a well-deserved world title last year. Yeah, I think it was uh, it was a matter of time. No one ever questioned that Philippe wouldn't climb to the top and uh, got this heat underway. Pretty magnificent way, really. Driving off the top, there's that clean open rail turn. This one here, though, just, uh, well, it drops about eight foot down back into the trough, but complete control. Yeah, I almost thought that he was almost going to pull in at the beginning of that wave. It was kind of looked like he was like, oh, is it going to do it? Is it not going to do it? But he made the right decision. And, yeah, just looking at this first carve here, just absolutely laying the board on rail there as he wraps it around back into the pocket. But it's this turn here that, uh, yeah, just get some air under the board here as he's coming back down. And, look, just totally airborne as he reconnects with the face of the wave there. And... Uh, he did well to negotiate that section. Does anyone surf more on edge? Rich are on the CT at the moment? I don't think so. No. <laughs> um, you know, what Philippe does is, uh, it, as you said, he's worked on his power, but he has this uh, ability to really lean into those critical turns and, and put uh, everything, all these turns are just completely on edge and, you know, that adds this radical element that some people actually don't have uh, and it's one of his big draw cards. Jeez, he, he cops some, I think, cruel criticism for his performances in bigger conditions. 
Uh, what people aren't respecting is the fact that he's evolving in that realm. You just think about the, the high performance surfing that he's done in, in big conditions at certain venues on the CT and the turns that he's laid down in, you know, wave six foot plus. Uh, he's still the very best or put himself at the top of the pile. Can he get better in some of those heavy water locations? He can, but when you reflect on his performances, he's still in there catching set waves. Is he the best guy at some of those venues? No, but is he improving every time he goes out there? I'd say yes. Oh, 100%. And then on the flip side of that, you look at, you know, when the surf does settle down or even into that forefoot zone, he's almost untouchable. Mm. So, you know, he's he's just sharpening his tools at every aspect of the game. And uh, there's not really many question marks left in my mind. Yeah, I think it's, you know, you look at surf like this just based on what we've seen here in the past, and it, it's not a big day by main break market river standard. Uh, everyone's going to be, be free to uh, really attack these waves the, with complete freedom and really try and overpower some of these sections. But I'd say Felipe is like, you know, in the top five for performance surfing on big open faces like this too. Oh, 100%. And I think, you know, we're moving into one of my favorite hours of the day in Western Australia, it's mm. champagne hour. That, in other words, means that the wind is dropping off. You can see we have less texture in the face of the wave and that's probably only going to play to Felipe's strengths. Well, you said that early to me this morning. You said if you're Surfing a heat at main break today, you, you want to be out there about 10 a.m. Uh, it's about quarter past here at the moment. So it, it, it's really, I think, going to give Felipe a massive edge over Reef Hazelwood in this heat. Just the, the fact that he can whip through those big front side calves with, with no texture on the surface of the water. And uh, already... He's kind of uh, asserting his dominance in this one, 7.83 to kick things off. Yeah, great start. But, you know, when you think of um, the size of the surfer and their power output, you know, you think of Jordy, crazy power. Uh, John John, really powerful as well. And Philippe, he's obviously a lot shorter in stature, but he's so strong and pound for pound or kilo to kilo, I reckon he's all as strong as those other surfers for sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think it's something that you can criticise him for. The power's there. Um, yeah, he's amazing in my opinion. I don't even think it's a pound for pound. He's not a little guy. Uh, he he's came solid, on yeah. as a, a bit of a greyhound, uh, and there was a, a few surfers that you could, you know, probably um, compare him to. But he's not one of the smaller guys on tour anymore, and he's heavy set. He's trained really hard. He, he's got some serious... Uh, serious legs on him and it, it helps him really stomp some of those critical turns but he, he'd be somewhere i'd say in, in the mid 70s uh kilo wise maybe even pushing towards uh, 80 kilos these days and and there's a few guys who, who physically don't look like they're they're that heavy set but they are uh samuel pupo is uh, another one he, he's pushing towards 80 kilograms so you know Even a pretty Ewing? solid unit yeah Hey, Flick, is there, is there an optimum size for Margaret River? Are we seeing it right now? Uh, depends on who you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for competition today. For competition? How about that? This, this is mean, cute surf by Felicity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's super know. cute. Super <laughs> cute surf. Um, no, look, I mean, we are pretty much today. We have the best, the best out there in the best conditions. It's six to eight foot. And it, the wind's dying down. We're having, like, you know beautiful waves on offer and it's very peaky today too i mean there's a little bit more west in the swell and which is providing the right maybe to open up a little bit more we're getting a, we even saw kaio this morning was it kaio get the barrel this morning yeah. earlier in his yeah so there's a lot of opportunity out there and any bigger than this and you start to play cat and mouse out here a lot you there's a couple of different lineups, a couple of different bubbles in the water that you're positioning yourself on, and you kind of want to sit just inside the bubble. But the problem with sitting just inside the bubble, if it's any bigger than this, is you're going to be wearing sets on the head. Yeah. And right now, the surfers aren't going to have to worry about that. They're just going to be able to position exactly where they want to. There might be the odd rogue set, because that does happen at Margaret River. No matter how far out you sit, there's always going to be a deeper one. But here we go, live action. Well, let's see if Reef can get into oh. this heat the way he uh, surfed the elimination round. It's just not working out for him at the moment. Couple of throwaways, losing his footing. He did have a, a bit of a scramble. We gave him a, a bit of time to get reset, but it was a quick turnaround. I wonder if he's had that board change and it's just something, 
he was so in tune and getting used to that board that he that he surfed in the heat prior and he's on something new and just hasn't been able to adjust yet but he certainly needs to uh find a wave and just really connect find his feet let's see what happens here so at this point looks good maybe just a little bit too much weight on the front foot there the fins come out loses his footing oh, off the tail pad and uh oh yeah Ooh, just doing a wheelie Whee. gets on the merry-go-round <laughs> 30 minutes to go, a couple of throwaway scores, really needs to, to reset. The thing that's going to work in Reef's favour here is the amount of time that the competitors are going to have with that overlapping format coming into play. Yeah, 40 minutes is a long time out there today, and there's a lot of opportunity coming through. You know, you've got your set waves, but then you've also got your smaller ones that are moving through to the inside. And, you know, if you are in that um, second heat, you can sort of be playing around on the inside. There's going to be a lot of opportunity coming up. So, yeah, look. 40-minute heats. It's a long time. Toledo uh, really enjoying his time here at Margaret River, travelling with his family, his wife Ananda, their two kids, Mahina and Koa. I've seen them uh, out and about, looking at the wildlife, lapping it up. Back home, you know that the family's well and truly tuned in. Dad Ricardo, three-time Brazilian national champ. He'd be watching on. His mum, Mary, and his siblings, Mateus, Davy, and Sophia always getting right behind him and this is a you know an event where I, I think maybe that evolution I was talking about of, of Felipe surfing in, in bigger conditions uh, is really apparent breaking through for a, a victory here uh, upsetting people who've got more of a, a reputation in these open water locations rich he looks strong at this venue yeah he really does and um the year he won too it wasn't one of those small years it was we had some solid swell and uh even thinking about to you know solid j bay where he's done really well uh you know performances in hawaii just one sunset so um it, it's there it's it's developing you know I, I, if there was a question mark it'd you know be big pipe and big chopu but really he's working on that uh, and he's had some incredible waves out there now so it's it's the circle's almost complete wow we saw some incredibly close finishes in the uh, elimination round none closer than the uh, the last heat where rio waida he fell 0 0.06 short of, of getting ahead of kanoa igarashi and you know looking to, to really lock up a, a strong position on the CT. Let's hear from Rio now as we stay. Rio, fantastic surfing. Thanks for the entertainment. Uh, thanks to everyone and thanks to WF for the, providing us a really fun waves and I'm really happy how I surf and uh, and I guess, I don't know, I'm just going to keep learning and try to get better and uh, yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we love watching you. Your result remains in the hands of some other competitors today. Uh, we don't have any official word yet on your ranking. What do you do? Do you go home and sit in silence or do you stay down here and watch the comp? Uh, I don't know. I'm super nervous. I mean, the, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just going to go home and but I don't know. Maybe I should stay here and then watch everyone. I need to learn. You know, I have to watch all these guys. They surf really good, so I have to probably stay here and watch everyone. I don't really care if I don't make the card, I will go back to Challenger. And if I make the card, I'd be su super grateful and uh, I'm going to keep pushing my level. Inspiring attitude. Did you want to uh, say uh, good morning uh, to everyone back home in Indonesia? Hello semua, tem semua dan teman-teman saya. Terima kasih sudah dukung saya dan saya akan tetap semangat dan ya, yeah, saya akan lebih semangat. <laughs> well done, Rio. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Thanks, Stace. Yeah, a tough one for Rio. All our competitors that, that fall out of the, the mix. He's come into this event sitting in 16th position, but like Stace said, you know, that that's... He's the guy, I, I think, probably with the most to worry about at the moment because below him, there's a lot of people capable of, of overtaking him. Uh, but let's... Let's hope that he stays on. Incredible talent. Don't think we've seen his best just yet, but some, some really strong uh, moments for him already this year. Yeah, I, he was so dominant on the, the start of the Challenger Series last year. And uh, just that openness to learn. You know, this is, this is someone who, I guess, out of the whole field, th this is sort of foreign territory for him in terms of getting used to the different conditions and travelling and being away from home. 
uh, he really has, you know, it, it's been a, a big learning curve over the last six months for him, but he's doing really well. The surfing has been great. There's been some incredible moments. And, and uh, you know, if I had to wager a guess, I'd say he might be okay on the tour. Obviously, the numbers, we can't clarify anything. But, yeah, nervous times for sure. Just on 25 minutes remaining here, Toledo out in front on the strength of a 7.83. So many big matchups coming your way as we get through the round of 32. Surfing, it's been my lifesaver since I started. Just love the feeling of being out there and being in connection with the ocean, with Mother Nature. One day you're stressed and you just get out there and you're just like, okay, this is what I needed today. And you come back to the house, just like a lot lighter and happier. As a professional surfer, having a healthy lifestyle, it, it's really important. The three things, professional with you, helping you out, and separating professional life to personal life. What we do as professionals try to win events and being away from the family, it's super hard. The more prepared I am to do all of that, the more successful I'm going to be. Great to have Felipe Tolado getting behind Healthway, one of the strategic partners of the Western Australian Margaret River Pro. We had the Think Mental Health Trials, and uh, that was a, a really cool uh, initiative here locally uh, and spreading some great messaging uh, about just getting on top of things. And, and Felipe, he's been pretty open about some of his uh, struggles at recent times, but also coming to us there with some sort of key ingredients to overcoming some of those hardships exercising, eating healthy, and uh, just separating his competitive life from his personal life. And uh, that's something that he obviously uh, endeavors to do here, traveling with his family and a, a solid crew of friends. Yeah, he does. He's got a good support net around him. And, and uh, I guess always, if you've got those feelings of missing your family so much, you know, when you're away, the best thing to do, take them with you. And he has the ability to do that. So that's fantastic. Here goes Reef, a couple of throwaways, a messy start for him, but cleans it up with a good hit on the inside there. Unfortunately, that wave just fades away into deep water. So he's just not kind of able to, to really kick this heat into gear. And we just know when you're up against someone like Toledo, who's already banked a really good score flick, you know, you're going to really struggle. So uh, he's got some work to do. Yeah, I mean, so evident. He knew as soon as he took off, I mean, there was that one first section, he got that one nice carb off the top, but that wave died out really fast. I mean, it was a bit of a teepee, and by that, I mean, it, you know, it didn't have much wall, it wasn't running down the line, and it wasn't going to give him much more opportunity. So, and when you're surfing against the current world champ, Felipe, you've, you've really got to be posting excellent scores. I mean, Felipe's already sitting there with a 7.83, so Reef knows that, and you know, he did have a great performance in that last heat, but yeah, he knows that he's got to do more. It's pretty cruisy out there at, at the moment. Felipe and Reef just having a bit of a chat. But uh, Rich, Reef Hazelwood, uh, we were talking about Jacob Wilcox earlier on, um, a, about to start campaigning on the Challenger Series. Uh, Reef's uh, another surfer from uh, Australia that's gotten pretty close to qualifying by the old qualifying series system, but he did win the, the regional QS 
here in Australia this year. So uh, he's going into the Challenger Series with a lot of confidence and momentum. Yeah, yeah, he really is. And um, I don't know, these guys are a really good shot at making the tour, in my opinion. I, I think um, perhaps Jacob's, uh, Jacob Wilcox has the, the bigger, stronger, more powerful moves compared to Reef. Um, you know, and it's, it's a great chance when you put them in this arena here with the best surfers in the world. And you can actually see the real top echelon of the sport has this power element to their maneuvers that that really you have to have if you want to be successful on this tour so entering the second half of the opening heat and introducing a couple more competitors to the lineup as toledo goes after his second score just the absolute fire on the end section there, really throwing everything into it geordie smith's up against samuel pupo in the second heat of the round of 32 so Samuel and Geordie will be out there. They'll have to give way to Reef Hazelwood and Toledo and their priority, ultimate priority in that first heat through the second half of their exchange. But this is a good matchup for Geordie. It'll give him an opportunity to flex his power over uh, Samuel, who's you know, obviously got some, some sharp turns of his own. But... Geordie's one of the highest scoring surfers in the history of this event, so he, I think he's going to have a bit of an edge. Yeah, I've, I've actually also uh, seen a bit of Geordie surfing over the last few days in the lead up. Here we go. We're just having a replay of uh, Felipe's last ride, and it was a bit of a bigger one. Nice open face carve to start, and uh, lining up this inside turn, and just looking so strong on his feet there. And just a two turn wave, but I think it's going to be a pretty good score. Rich, you see the adjustment from competitors like Felipe when they don't get too much out of that first section. They, they really aim up to, to make up for the, the shortcomings on the last move. Oh, and that was one of the best we've seen on the end section today. Talk about that in a minute because here's the replay of Geordie, an opening. The, sort of Geordie's uh, current status as a, a title campaigner. And, and it was a, a fun conversation because there's only a, a, a small group of individuals who've reached um, just the, the lofty heights of, of title contention. And Geordie's one of them, and, and really for a long time was a, a perennial title threat, but just has drifted off the pace a, a little bit, searching for his first win in, in you know, six years. And um, I mean, he's, he's a proven, a proven winner. And he's had a, a lot of victories at, at spots all over the schedule, but also featured heavily in, in final series uh, all over the world. So. A, a very well-rounded surfer. And, uh, yeah, we're just looking to see him, I think, reignite his competitive fire this year. We'll see if he can do it here at Mainbreak. 4.33 to kick things off. As we see something standing up on the outside. And in the overlapping format, you can see that Samuel Pupo and Jordy Smith just have to give way to Felipe. We're back to 6.67 on that second ride. This one's going to take him a little higher, you'd think. Doesn't finish it off, but just a, a really sharp combination on the outside before the fall. <laughs> wow. <laughs> just uh, he's starting to warm up, which is danger signs. And uh, two great waves to start off here, the 783 and the 667. Uh, two turns per wave, four turns total, and he has 14 and a half points. So some pretty good mathematics there when you think about it. Uh, unfortunately, just missing out on the final hit on that last turn because uh, I feel like that wave would have su uh, surpassed the 667. But Philippe just looks so strong on these face waves, Flick. Yeah, we're seeing a replay here of this. And uh, like you said, Rich, I think he's going up another gear and he's really, really turning on. I mean, looking so fast and sharp. It was just super unfortunate that he didn't make that last turn here. but. Get to see it from the flight cam and it looks so beautiful from up there. You can just see the reef below him and yeah, just absolutely tagging that wave. But yeah, I think you're right that if he would have made that last turn, it definitely would have surpassed his 667. What I love about this turn, he goes right from the top, drags the turn all the way down to the bottom, straight onto the toe side rail again. And this one was different, jams it tighter, just stomps on the tail. Spray just uh, right up into the heavens, and it was just a little bit late. And I, and I feel like 
uh, Philippe's possibly taken a slightly longer board and maybe just not enough control to get up and into the lip on the on that third hit. But gee, some great surfing on those opening two manoeuvres. Still better as his numbers too. 7.23 for Toledo. Hazelwood with a whole lot of work to do, chasing a two-wave total of 15. And, and all that rhythm that he had in the elimination round is just lost at the moment. Totally different surfer to what we saw half an hour ago. Just maybe feeling like he's got to do a little more than uh, he has to at this stage. Geordie Smith just looking really sharp. Didn't bank a huge number on his first ride. But certainly, certainly looking like he's switched on here. We'll, we'll see what Samuel Pupo can do. Because for me, that was a... The 4.33 was a pretty decently served 4.33. <laughs> I, I think the, the scale set pretty low in that one. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pushing them, aren't they? <laughs> they're telling the surfers, we want to see you really uh, go right to the limit of your ability. Uh, bring us something dynamic. Bring us something to, to get us. Uh, get the emotions flying within the judges and that's what Richie Porter said you know it's a feeling that that you get and we feel it as well when we watch as commentators and Geordie you can't help but just get involved uh, through these turns you know critical uh, in nature uh, perhaps the wave just letting him down a little bit here but look Geordie's under priority at the moment so he's just trying to get uh, some rhythm going here feeling the board out but ah oh, so much power Geordie's, uh, you know, you like watching everyone's surfing at full speed, but the slow-mos kind of really do just give you the opportunity to appreciate the form and just how silky smooth these rail turns are. Yeah, I, I absolutely love those two turns. That, that first carve, just so much torque from his body, just throwing so much water. I really liked it, and they're, yeah. I think the judges liked it too, 5.5, smaller wave. I mean, at this point in the heat, I think Geordie's building nicely because he's not out there with ultimate priority. If you, you find yourself in a good size set in the, the opening half of your heat, it, it's a, an absolute gift. Um, but, you know, this is not a, a ba bad foundation for him to build on, and his feet are well and truly... Uh, locked in on, on the wax and the, the traction pad there. Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth. One thing I did want to highlight, and I was just noticed it during the slow-mo, was just how far back the surfers at this level put their feet and they jam it right up against the kick on their tail pad. And I know a lot of recreational surfers, you know, that they use that tail pad as a bit of a guide, but get it right back up there. Here goes Pupo, last year's Rookie of the Year. And he is uh, just a, a phenom. He's got some big moves. He's given us great buzzer beater moments. Big airs. And uh, Toledo behind him. Another big drawn out slice. He takes that carve so high in the face of the wave that his rivals see often three fins hanging out the back. That's in a carve. So he, uh, as we said earlier, always puts that board right on edge. Yeah, it's a different pathway sometimes, isn't it? It's not like he's coming at that section horizontally and then cutting down. He's actually going up to about as high as you can possibly put your board where it's hanging on by maybe just the inside fin and a little bit of rail. Geordie in and out, but then they drag it right from the top all the way down. John John obviously does it uh, exceptionally well, but, you know, Philippe's just... You can see the extension in the turn. It's bigger. It's bigger. He's explosive... He is ridiculous sometimes, Toledo, with, with the moves that he'll, he'll bust out. Super unpredictable. Um, but he, he also just ha has those fundamentals now. He's, I, th I think what I love about his surfing is how creative he, he is in the, the maneuver options that he chooses for different sections. Yeah, he's, it was so many, ver um, like, so much variety in one maneuver like the carve you know like and he can change his mind halfway through okay this wave's going to get fat i might bring it around some more but here we have a replay of pupo's wave and he's looking fast and he's looking like he's on a mission i mean it was a pretty well surfed wave it was a smaller inside one but it had a really nice bowl to it and just laying into that first section and yeah, maybe that that was just a good comparison to see the two rides Samuel surfed his wave really well, did great turns, but you kind of saw each of those turns coming for each of those sections. 
and, and that's where the, the magic of Toledo sort of really shines through. He, he gets a, a wave and kind of cuts a, a different line through those calves that, that sort of gets the attention of the panel each time. Toledo's continued to build here. He had a 7.7 .7 on that last ride. So uh, Reef Hazelwood with a lot of work to do to get himself back in this heat. Does well there. Stamps the finish on that one, but he's going to have to do more work on the outside because that's where Felipe's kind of dominating him at the moment. Oh, yeah, he's just... Um, well, the intensity of Philippe's turns, and here he goes again, live action. Yeah, he's very busy out there at the moment. Again, just digs in, pushes that board right around, knows that one's not going into his top two, but another seriously strong turn. He'd be winning this heat on his throwaway scores at the moment. But uh, the time's winding down. Gets out of that wave early, so it's a, an easy decision just to, to paddle back out. Yeah, and that's just a, a little sign of experience there. No need to bother if it's not adding to your score line. But, uh, man, some decent scores dropping for Felipe here. He, he's on, you can tell. Yeah, his last wave not factoring in, but he's going to probably turn in a four for a single move. Yeah, Toledo, you know, you, you, I'd imagine, Rich, that, that someone like Reef is going, OK, what are the, what are the weapons I can bring? to this fight and uh, this offshore breeze is going to kind of really neutralize one of uh, one of Reese most reliable weapons against these top surfers. Yeah, he, he is renowned just being a maestro in the air. And uh, unfortunately, with this offshore wind and on the backhand and such a treacherous end section to Margaret River, uh, we've seen some incredible airs there over the years, but just at the moment, you know, it's sort of the elements are working against him. Uh, it, uh, for me, he just needs to try and get one of those beautiful waves where he can just really cup out on the backhand and, and just get really high and vertical and, and just try and just put some good surfing together. Eight minutes remaining here. Let's uh, dive into the Harvey Norman heat recap. And Toledo's given us some great moments here, Felicity. Yeah, he has. He's just surfing with a sort of ferocity that we haven't seen from the other surfers yet. And yeah, he's on fire. Absolutely, lo absolutely love that two-turn combo here. And yeah, just driving through the lip and looking so in control of this heat. Just yes. power and amazing flow, Rich. Yeah, incredible. Just the transitions between turn. He seems to accelerate out of his turns and doesn't need to look for speed but it's a it's in a real sort of an authoritative style uh, of an approach that he's put together for this heat being in complete control from start to finish and uh, can't see him losing it from here so much focus uh, on the cart but obviously uh, that the race for the final five is well and truly alive and with Jack Robinson not here at the event Felipe sitting in third position Big opportunity for him to turn in a huge result and get himself back in that yellow jersey heading to stop number six. And the way he's surfing, he's a really good chance of doing it. Samuel Pupo there. He had a 5.5 earlier on. Geordie Smith still holds the edge on him, though. That one's not going to factor into it for him. But a, a pretty close start in, in that second heat of the round of 32 here. Yeah, and Samuel uh, actually reminds me of Philippe a few years ago six or seven years ago and uh, it's that real quick action style of surfing uh he's you can see starting to develop those calves more and more and the power is starting to get in there as well um but for sure you know uh sammy's taking in inspiration from the man that's sitting next to him yeah he wants to to put in a big performance too he's representing the his brother as well because miguel's been uh, trying to overcome a, an injury sadly sending miguel all the best but, uh, yeah, Sammy Pupo, he's uh, looking to make a, a big charge. This is an important heat for him uh, up against Geordie Smith, sitting in equal 21st position, so only just uh, above the cut line coming into this contest. And uh, he's going to need to make a few heats to shore up his position on the CT through the back half of the year and also into next season. Just under six minutes to go here. Reef Hazelwood's running out of time to turn this heat around. And Toledo is not backing down as he extends through that opening carve. Leans on the, the layback jam on that second move and now floating his way through to the inside. Another solid ride. Does it go into his top two? Maybe not, but he's just looking very freed up and it's been a confidence-building performance for him. 
Yeah, it really has. I mean, he's had four pretty good rides in this heat, three of them in, in the seven range. And, uh, yeah, I reckon shifting a gear since yesterday, I think he's gone up a notch. Well, he's uh, established himself as one of the most winning surfers of all time now. 13 CT victories. Felicity, there, there was a danger that, that this guy was going to fall into that category of being one of the best, never to get a world title. He's broken that curse and, and he's I think with the performances that he's given us over the years you know he's just so deserving of that honor yeah 100 percent and um yeah I I, I I never really I always thought it's just a matter of when with him um yeah he, growing you know similar age to Italo and Gabby and probably all surfing together and him watching them those two get their world titles he's like right you know my time's coming and and it did it was a great moment for him. Uh, of course, he also finished runner-up the, the year before. So it's been a magic couple of seasons. And he is looking to defend that world title. But Samuel Pupo is up at the moment, finding some cover. Hasn't been too many barrels today. So it's been uh, interesting to see where the judges will take it on, on the scale. But it always feels good when you find the, uh, the elusive pit on the right here. <laughs> Today's the day they're on offer. And uh, well, another big score drop for Felipe. 7.87, so he continues to build. And, and uh, you know, there are surfers that would just love to get his throwaways. Um, but yeah, what a, what a heat he's just put together here. New round, uh, obviously every heat, the, the scale is somewhat reset. Feels like there is a little restraint being shown by the panel in this heat. Uh, Felipe's got probably three more gears he can go to. Uh, to, to ramp up the speed and, and just the, the risk that's involved in tackling some of these sections. But uh, if he had a couple of 8.5s at the moment, you wouldn't be surprised. No, no, exactly. And yeah, it's the judges, are, uh, they're keeping a little bit of space there just in case something absolutely incredible happens today. And, and I think that's a good move. Yeah, I think the, the big factory is the space they're putting between Felipe's rides and Reef Hazelwood's. That's the, where the comparison counts. As we see here, Geordie Smith. Nice combination of moves here. And a uh, wow, big lip line float. Doing his best to hang on to the finish, but can't quite do it. So they haven't had their, their pick of all the set waves out there. They've had to sort of lay back and let Toledo and Hazelwood have their way with the, the back half of their heat, heat one. So Geordie Smith and Samuel Pupo will probably settle into a, a bit more of a, a wave selection battle uh, as well as a performance battle in, in the second half of their exchange. But let's have a, a look at, at the work that Reef was able to do on this one. Oh, that's a better turn there for Reef Hazelwood. So this is exactly what I was talking about. Just finding a wave that cups out and allows you on your backhand to get up into that vertical approach. And uh, gets to the finish, checking the watch quickly. Time is running out, but, you know, this was a better wave flick on the back end, don't you? Yeah, I, I love this wave. This, these first two turns were nice and tight in the pocket, and he'd be feeling it, you know. He, he knows he's had a couple of falls, a couple of dodgy wave selections. So, I mean, definitely got a good to probably get his feet in the wax and stick a few turns. But uh, this one of Geordie's I really like too. I mean, he's in that second priority heat, but uh, it was pretty well surfed wave, and three nice turns here he looks for the finish and looks like he kind of pulls it off but then that converging bit of white water just kind of gobbles him up a lot happening there on the uh, end section Jordi uh, unable to stick it but uh, as you said still just on his way to that final section like have a nice snap move some water it'll look good from where the uh, the judges are posted up but it'll be uh, interesting to see how high the judges go with reef hazelwood's number i think he breaks combination here but I just wonder just. how it will compare, Rich, with uh, what Felipe was throwing at us earlier on. Yeah, um, I, I, it'll be up there. They'll, they'll wow, an 8.5. Well, there was uh, something special in it that the judges saw for sure. Uh, you know, thinking back to it, why is it an 8.5? Uh, he, he did get right up critical in the pocket on the backhand. Says Richie Love it while he scratches his head. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a little perplexed, to be honest with you. I thought it was, um, I didn't think it was going to be that high, but yeah, I, I guess they're rewarding just the risk on the backhand and, and how tight he was in the pocket. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a head scratcher for me. I, I think Reef's surfing well. Reef's 
you know, again, the surfers are critical of their own approach. And Reese timing throughout the event at different stages has been a little late. Yet I think it just goes to show that the judges are liking the critical nature of his turns. So he's got an opportunity now. He's well and truly broken that combination. And he's after a 7.2 to get into the lead. And this is his last shot at it. The Hooter sounds. He's got to get back up there. And he gets swatted down. So, uh, again, just can't get to that, that final section on time. But that would have been a very stressful moment for Toledo, his fans and family who are, are watching on. He throws a thumbs up to the 2022 world champion. And these two uh, have surfed together plenty of times, obviously being on the, the same team. But uh, that was a nervous finish for Toledo when it looked like he was in total control. We've got uh, another big heat hitting the lineup right after the break. Gabriel Medina and Maxime Husano will battle it out in the third heat of the round of 32. My name is Samuel Pupo. I'm 22 years old and I'm from Marazias, Brazil. The mid-season cut was uh, definitely scary and as we started approaching Australia, I feel like it got a little bit even more pressure going on. The best athletes ever, they, they really deal really well with the pressure. I love feeling that pressure and, and actually uh, raising to the occasion. If you tell eight-year-old Sammy starting to compete that he would be where he is now, he wouldn't believe it for sure. My dream to be on tour was always to be fighting for winning events and potentially winning a world title. So I don't want to be fighting for a spot on tour. I want to be fighting for a title. So that's what I'm here for. Welcome back to the show. We've just seen Felipe Toledo progress through to the round of 16 and now we're seeing Samuel Pupo up against Jordy Smith this one during the break and the rookie of the year from last season just throwing himself into the lip with everything he's got Jordy Smith and these two managed to rack up a couple of reasonable mid-range scores in the first half of their heat now assuming priority out here we're expecting them to get on some better waves and and get the opportunity to drop some really solid scores on us felicity yeah here we go we've got a replay of medina and oh my gosh such nice surfing on his back end oh wow just falling off the horse there <laughs> didn't expect that he looks so in control in that first turn he's going to be up against maxime who's uh really on a mission to get himself a, a monster result here at main break margaret river maxime came into this one below the cut line in 29th position and uh, he's got to get to the quarterfinals just to give himself a, a mathematical chance at uh, staying on the championship tour. But, it, you know, with the way the results are falling at the moment, there is a chance that, you know, he might need a, a little bit more than that. Medina, on the other hand, just a, an interesting start to the year for him, Rich. Hasn't had better than a ninth this season. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? You don't expect that. And uh, I'm sure we'll see him turn that around. This might just be the event for it. But this is a, an exciting matchup. I love seeing these four surfers in the water now. And you can see Geordie just on that last wave as well, just to sort of uh, change direction. But he was thinking, OK, now get me one of those bigger open face waves and I'll really start to, to get that rail game engaged. And uh, I think we're going to start seeing some, some bigger scores drop. Looks like Geordie has just found himself a 6.5. 
Look at these uh, lines approaching. Yeah, there, there's been some some solid set waves. Samuel and Jordy, they just haven't really connected with anything just yet. But as you said, Jordy putting up the, the best number of their heat so far, a 6.5. Pupo up at the moment. Drives into this first section. Hangs on that rail. Recovers after uh, catching a, a little on that first turn. Bit of foam on the face. Adds some spark to that second turn. Looking for a nice little finish on. minutes remaining meanwhile uh, Medina and Maxine pretty uh, even on the opening exchange there a couple of low range threes but Medina had a, a strong performance yesterday in the opening round yeah he really did and uh, I thought it was interesting in his post heat interview he just said it felt good to actually have the opportunity have some reps have some waves where he had the uh, chance to really put some good surfing down he doesn't feel like it's the, the years really offered him that so far not a bad turn here just kind of skipped out towards the end of that carve and when you think about what Philippe was doing and a little off timed on the second one as well definitely hard to ride out through this foamy section but just comparing the calves on the open face here it looks like Samuel's kind of on edge in terms of his control, just hanging onto it. And the difference when I think of Jordi and Felipe and how d they're doing their cups, they're in total control. You never think for a moment that they're going to skip out. But, uh, well, you just saw that little trip up from Sammy, but he regains well, gets a bit of tail release there, quickly uh, redirects the board under his feet and goes down a couple little step ladders here. How's that and section? Just I know, it just sort of dropping. jumps, jumps off the roof of that one. Did well to stick it, but uh, it was probably his best turn on the wave, or the cleanest. 5.23, uh, doesn't get him into the lead. He's after a 6.5, Geordie holding on to that number one position uh, in this heat. And we know this is a, a crucial one for Samuel Pupo. And Geordie's up at the moment. He's going to try and get rid of a 5.5 here and increase that two-wave total. Oh, wow. Interesting uh, move option there. Layback jam. Getting a little disconnected to, from the face of the wave for a moment there, but hung on for the finish and liked the feel of it. I mean, earlier on, he did some really clean work, but, you know, there's credit for attacking a, a bigger wall out here. We're seeing that and uh, expecting that that will go into Geordie's top two. Yeah, I have no doubt that'll probably sit in his top two and... Out the back now, live action, Maxine. Yeah, this is a, a QS journeyman who's finally made the grade on the CT. Comes into this event below the cut line. Oh. And, oh, my goodness, just fell down the staircase there. Yeah, I, th I think he took off quite wide um, on that right because it ran off so fast into that shallower section. And I th I'm thinking he must have been positioned a bit further towards the channel when he took off because... Yeah, all of a sudden that brief was just there out of nowhere. I remember seeing Maxime Rich win the World Junior title down at Narrabeen and just thinking, wow, this, you know, he was 16 at the time, I think one of the youngest ever World Junior champs. And you just thought to yourself, wow, this guy's already got big surfing. Um, and he's come really close to qualifying a bunch of times. It's great to see him here finally. Yeah, it is really good and, and obviously a, a huge achievement, but also now a learning curve uh, just to, you know, figure out how to how to make it work on the championship tour. Let's see what happens here on this final moment. He gets a big oh. carve off the top and this wave just completely bottoms out. And uh, well, there's nowhere to go except down the gurgler. And uh, I, I was thinking back to your point, Flick, then on that wave. If he had taken off at the peak, he would have been doing his first turn where he actually took off. And then the second turn where he kind of did the wrap and the, the wave started to bowl out, he would have been doing his second turn there. So, you know, when you look at what could have been on that wave, the, the judges aren't going to go very high on this thing. All right, well, we're waiting on some numbers to uh, roll on through. Jordy Smith's up at the moment, seeing a replay of his last ride. And it was a good one. Oh taking him into the excellent range. Just two turns, but he does bank an eight. So he's well and truly in control of Samuel Pupo at the moment. They got a bit of time, but uh, the numbers didn't go excellent in that last heat, but 
making the call here in the booth. Uh, we thought it was excellent surfing. Stays Toledo looking on point. Yeah, Ron, I'd have to agree with you on the steps, and my Portuguese is not that sharp, but I definitely understand Sechi. <laughs> Philippe, a lot of Sechi. Yeah, yeah, a lot of sevens. Um, yeah, I felt great. Um, you know, conditions are just perfect. You know, that's, that's the kind of conditions that we dream of, and um, super fun. I chose to go on a little bigger board today. Um, I don't know, I felt great surfing the other day on my 511, but it was a little bit smaller, so I can, I could kind of perform, you know, like on this on, on shore conditions. And then today it was just perfect. And I felt like the bigger board was a good fit right in the pocket. And uh, that's what happened, you know, felt great. The board was really good. It was actually a, a copy of the Magic Sunset board. So um, yeah, you know, just happy to meet you. A hallmark of all the great champions, uh, that ability to reinvent themselves. We just watched Geordie there uh, throw down a double layback combo. It pricked your eyes up. Any changes in the heats coming up? Yeah, maybe uh, I'll just go for the laybacks. <laughs> you know, they're getting big numbers with the laybacks. I'll do the same. But um, yeah, it's just been fun. It's just, you know, that, that feeling of, um, you know, getting that big carve on this beautiful waves here. It just it feels good. So. Um, you know, kind of sticks the same strategy, but maybe you go for a lay back in the end. <laughs> <laughs> we'll like to see it. Uh, did you want to uh, say good day to everyone back at home? I'm sure they're tuning in. Yeah, I want to thank everyone who was watching. Thank you to my family, my family, my team. Another one. And we're going to continue doing our work, focused on my own, that the rest of the world is good and he does it. We're going to do it together. Thanks, Felipe. Well done. Yes, Dice. Thank you. Man, he seems like he's in a happy place. Uh, he, at different stages throughout this season, his, his feathers have been a little ruffled, oh, I think, with the numbers that he's been scoring. But uh, water off Duck's back in, in that one. You know, he still scored well. He almost broke into the excellent range. It was a dominant performance. Um, you know, Reef got a lot of credit for his best ride, and it eclipsed the surfing uh, on the scoreline that, that Felipe was doing. Uh, but there was... Also a lot of separation between his other scores and what Felipe had banked earlier on. So, you know, it, it was, like we said, a, a nervous finish to what was a, a really strong heat from last year's world champ. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Ronnie. And uh, it's pretty funny to see Felipe pretty jovial in that post-hit interview, you know, joking around, yeah, maybe I've got to do a couple of laybacks, you know. <laughs> and he'll uh, end up in that excellent range. But uh, he looks in good spirits and it feels like he's building throughout this event. I mean, he was surfing good yesterday, but it looks like today he's just gone up another level and hopefully we see bigger things come to come. Also going up a, a little bit with the equipment, Rich. And uh, oh, it just looked unbelievable. Looked like he, he had a lot of control through those big sections. Yeah, and uh, just just having that uh, little bit more foam under your feet allows you to confidently go into those bigger outside turns and have zero thought in the back of your mind, I'm going to skip out here. You get that stability when you're going through the calves. Uh, it, it obviously helps you take a longer line, just a bit more bit more rail in the water there. So I think it was a great choice from Philippe. And really, like, you don't miss that. You know, I, I know a lot of the surfers a lot of the time go, I want to ride the smallest board possible. But at Margaret River, it's a different calculation here. I think it's almost like you want to ride the biggest board possible uh, where you still feel confident that you can turn it. Big set standing up on the outside, and it's Pupo who's after a score. Remember, he is up against it, sitting at the just above the cut line coming into this contest, and at the moment chasing a nine to get ahead of Geordie Smith, who's been just building beautifully throughout this heat. That'll be one of Sammy Pupo's best rides. And uh, while he might not get the nine, it's likely that he's going to chip away at the requirement here. Yeah, he definitely will. <laughs> no doubt about that. We, didn't want, we weren't sure who was going to go there. But, um, yeah, no, I mean, look, I, I was entertained by just the emotion at the end of that ride. You know, that felt good. Look, it was a, a beautiful wave as it stood up. Kind of pumps down the line. Doesn't really lean on the long bottom turn. But a beautiful cut down to start things off. Gets up in the lip. Drives down the line here. And I feel like that finishing turn really was the was the moment where it felt good there was a lot of drama involved with it but uh just sort of m make a mental note of, of how sammy came off the bottom there on the first and the second turn they're not clean one stage bottom turns there's some pumping and there's a break in the line and these are little things that the judges are going to pick up on watch geordie maybe on his next waiver on a replay if we bring it up 
Jordy sits on the rail on the bottom turn, and that's what Philippe was doing as well. John does it. And the cut down as well, it, it's different to a carve. You know, when you we were talking about how high Philippe starts and brings it right around, and the actual line of that curve is spectacular, rather than going out, starting horizontal, and then bringing it down. Sorry I'm rambling a little bit, but I love breaking this stuff down. <laughs> Well, uh, 7.4 was the score for Sammy, so it's a, a big one. We've got some sets uh, approaching, but we're going to quickly throw down to Stace. He's got an update for us. Thanks, Ron. Jesse, some news. Yes, so I wanted to give an update on this heat coming up. We are not going to have Ian Gentile in the water. He's withdrawn due to medical reasons. However, we are going to still be running that heat because of the overlapping uh, heat format. So I think we're going to have Leo out there by himself, um, you know, getting a couple of waves. But unfortunately, yeah, we won't, we won't see Ian in the heat today. Uh, that's a real shame. We wish him all the best. Ian will receive equal 17th uh, points and uh, prize money for his showing here in West Oz. And uh, we wish him all the best. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you, Stace. Uh, what a shame. Uh, a, a big, you know, obviously a, a, a big opportunity uh, that he'll take uh, Leonardo because he, he was well situated uh, on the ranks coming into this event, sitting in 10th uh, and a, a free ticket into the round of 16. That's huge. That's a massive one. Um, you know, you'll take it, but it's not how you want to do it no. as a competitor. You want to get out there and, and have a good match, have a good battle. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, wishes go out to Ian Gentile. Obviously, you know, for whatever's going on, we wish him well and, and speedy recovery. So just over three and a half minutes remaining here. And Samuel Pupo turned in a 7.4 with that last ride. So kind of closing in on, on Geordie Smith's eight-point ride there. And the requirement now is 7.11. So he's done well to give himself a good fighting chance coming into the, the later stages of this second heat of the round of 32. Three and a half minutes to go. And uh, Geordie with priority. So critical moment in this heat. And... And uh, Flick, you can talk to this and you know through experience that it, it's a weird situation to be in, isn't it? When you're actually holding priority and you've got to make the right call. Yeah, look, sometimes I almost feel like it's better not to have priority <laughs> because the pressure's off and you, you know, it's not your decision whether you go away or not. You know, you're at the mercy of someone else and you can kind of, you know, get a bit aggressive and scoot around on the inside, try and make the most of what you've got. However, on the other hand, if you're sitting there with priority, you have to make that decision. Is this wave going to be the 711 that, that Samuel Pupo needs? Yeah. And sometimes that can be such a hard decision to make. Sometimes the wave doesn't look good. These guys are so good, though. The wave might not look that good, but you let it go, and they all of a sudden do a carb and then an error, and all of a sudden he's got the score, you know? So such a tricky situation to be in. Yeah, Geordie's... You know, big priority at the moment is getting rid of this 6.5 and pushing that requirement back up to a nine for uh, Sammy Pupo. Because, you know, if, if Geordie's thinking about his rival at the moment, he'd be thinking back to Portugal, what he was able to do against Kanoa Igarashi, uh, Hail Mary Air on a monster section and, and able to stick the rotation to save his spot in, in that event and go on to a, a quarterfinal finish. So uh, he's, you know, he's a, a proven performer under pressure, Sammy Pupo. So this is, you know, going to play into his favour if he gets an opportunity here in the dying moments. Yeah, and the other thing too is that the, the, these sets are coming through in, in threes and fours almost today. So, you know, if, if Geordie does kind of pull the trigger, there's every chance that, you know, Samuel might get the wave behind it and have a crack at it. But, you know, like you said, Geordie, he, he's thinking about that 6-5. And when he surfs on this next wave, He's got to make sure that he attacks it and puts some more points on the board. Here goes Pupo. After a 7.11, into the first section. Oh. And he was always going to throw everything at it. Well, Geordie obviously said, said, thought in his own mind, I don't think he can get a 7, uh, what was it, seven one one on that wave. So didn't even really look at it, didn't have to hold him off, didn't put his priority under threat. And uh, on the outside now, Jordy knows he wants to maintain that control, so he happily lets this one go to Gabriel Medina, who banks on the bottom turn for an eternity before unloading. A nice, big, powerful hawk off the top. A third turn is a, a strong one. And he is oh, oh. just bottoming out there and chasing him down the line. Jordy oh, Smith wow. can afford to throw everything <laughs> at it. 30 seconds to go here, I believe. Uh, Samuel Pupo still kind of on the inside. 
as uh, Medina just makes his way over the rock shelf here. But this is uh, going to be a, a really tricky situation for Sammy Pupo. Now Rich, because Geordie's going to get the victory here. And Sammy at the back end of the top 22 oh, in equal yeah. 21st position is going to have to watch the rest of the event unfold yeah. and hope for other results to go his way. I feel a little bit nauseous for him. Uh, it's just not where you want to be, but, it, uh, you know. Wow. Well, did he get up? Well, let's see what he can do with this one. So Geordie basically surrendered control of the outer section there. And Sammy Pupo, oh, he's got, he had work to do, and his back foot slipped off through that slash. So uh, Geordie is going to be sweet. We're not even too sure if Sammy was able to get up before the hooter there. But the uh, result is in the bag. Geordie Smith, he's building. He's looking strong at the moment. Sammy Pupo. He's, uh, he's going to wait to have to see what unfolds throughout the uh, the rest of the day to see if he's going to maintain uh, a spot on the CT through the back half of the year. We're going to take a quick break. More big matchups coming your way. We're going to bring in Joe and Bugs for the call. Western Australia Margaret River Pro is brought to you by Tourism Western Australia, official tourism partner of the Western Australia Margaret River Pro. By Boost Mobile, official telecommunication partner of the WSL Australia. By Bonsoy, official milk of the WSL Australia. And by Harvey Norman, official lifestyle destination of the WSL Australia. Welcome back to the show. Gabriel Medina, Maxime Houston the Priority Heat. And in the overlapping format, we have Leo Fioravanti on his own. Ian Gentile having to withdraw this morning. And we'll keep you posted on the rest of the round and his condition as this one continues here. As we've got a rider up, Maxime Houston setting up a big first turn, times it well. Off the bottom again, and a meaty end section hack for Husano, the rookie on tour, with his back against the wall, taking on a three-time road champ, coming down with an aggressive combination of turns. Yeah, I'm just wondering on that last turn whether they're going to give it the full Frank make. He, he definitely got to the base of it. Didn't quite kind of straighten out. He kind of kept veering off to the left and didn't have his full balance, but we'll see how the judges go. Still a solid ride. His best, it seems like. Definitely. 2-7-3-5 coming off the break in this overlapping format for Husano. As he takes on one of the giants on tour, Gabriel Medina, winning his first world title back in 2014. And these two would have seen a lot of each other, being in the same generation, almost the same age. And both with incredible junior careers as we take a look at that last wave for Max. Yeah, Max, look at the speed he gets on this bottom turn here. Comes up the lid, just slams out of the top. And it's this move here. It's a make, it's a make, it's, yeah. What are you thinking, Bucks? Maybe incomplete? I don't know, I'm, you know, the jury's out. I need to see this, you know, we got the luxury of seeing it in slow motion. But it's well timed at this point there, that's difficult. Comes down with the lip, amazing. He's, he's been swallowed by the lip, forces his way out in front of it. Now, he gets to his feet right there, and I don't know if he had full control. It, 
if he did, then he's, you know, maybe going to get up in the sevens. One of those close ones, Maxim Houston, a two-turn combination. Looked like his best so far. For me, I felt like he had enough yeah. to get credit for the finish. But, yeah, the judges are very consistent with that. If they think that you rode out and got bobbled off without control, they will deem it incomplete. And that'll reflect in the score, keeping you posted with that as we watch the three-time world champ wind up. Cole redirecting the pocket with some power, hits it off the lip. So two different turns and floats the next section. Sometimes tough to throw variety, but main break will sometimes force you to do it as well with the different types of looks you have on this wave. So Medina 7-6 on his way before, and how about these waves? Driving off the bottom is Husuno. Solid wrapping cutback using a lot of this wall at main break. It's already trimmed down to half the size, even less, as he'll punch out the lip multiple times. And goes into the end section and loses his final turn. And Firavanti again just on his own there. Just feeling his equipment. Leo having this as a warm up session for the round of 16. Unfortunately, Ian Gentile having to withdraw right before the matchup. And the Italian will take this as an opportunity to feel out his board, his equipment. Remember, he had to deal with the elimination round this morning. And he's back on the Red Bull ski. When did the first jet ski assist happen in, in competition and was it always a, a popular idea to bring that into pro surfing bucks well i mean first of all we'll see this replay of medina it took medina a little while to get into the come to the party in this heat but he certainly arrived now the triple world champion finishes with a a, a flourish there on that wave and here's max trying to back up that 6.33 this wave here just sort of tapers off a bit too much to get the big score going, but that was a nice slashing turn there. And uh, I think he'd be kind of forgiven for this finish here. It wasn't really going to be worth much more, but probably pegs him back a bit. Leo is just surfing by himself. Certainly a shame that Ian Gentile you know, couldn't, wasn't fit enough to surfing this hit. We don't know what happened. We'll get the inside on that, but hopefully he's okay. He's a great carve there, though, by Max. He brings it back around off the white water. Nice deep bottom turn. Just a nice slashing cutty there. Not big points, but clean as a whistle, Joe. Yeah, great conditions. He's loving that rail work on that CI. Husano changes gears, leans back and crushes it. So I love the mix up as the wave lost size. He went to town in that space. And maybe this finishing here, he maybe he did need to pull it off because he got a 6-3, which kind of doesn't help his cause in some respects. Because he had a 6-3-3. He was looking for a 7.6 because Medina's got that 7-6. They've both got a 6-3-3. So a great effort, but it doesn't really help his cause. Let's hear from Jordy Smith with Stace. Thanks, Joe. George, well done, bro. Thank you. Stoked. That was a tough round. Um, obviously, like everyone keeps saying, with uh, implications in place, got to make it. So stoked to make it. <laughs> well, I've got some good news, my bro. Oh, give it to me, Stace. You have made the cut. <laughs> stoked. <laughs> Means I can surf Surf Ranch pretty froth. And no, no, I'm just like, I want to get to J Bay, get some good waves there, hopefully. El Salvador, because that's like Jay Bay, so yeah. Mate, you can still uh, do the job here, I reckon. Yeah, got a lot to go. Some tough draws, but uh, yeah, stoked we got some waves. Waves are really good, so. You've always mentioned to me you'd like to be on the best waves in the heats, but I reckon at the start of that heat, you look like a fired up grommet. It's hard with under priority. Um, those other guys just kind of take all the better ones, so try and make do with the scraps. If you get lucky, stoked. If not, try again. Does it make your decision easier, uh, easier because Hazelwood was comboed? So he's quite clearly not going to take a bad wave. Yeah, he's definitely looking at for, for better waves at that point of the heat, but Philippe was also taking every wave, so... Guy's just a pig. No. <laughs> it worked out well for you, looking uh, magic on your craft. 
Ah, thanks. Yeah, my old boy shaped me a good one. Yeah, six two and a half. Uh, V12, it's working really well. Stoked. Did you want to say good day to everyone back at home? I guess across the world. Um, yeah, I'd say hello to my wife and my son Ziggy, my family. Thanks for the support, guys. Miss you guys, and uh, probably talk to you in like 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Brew. Well done. Cool. Thanks. FaceTime to FaceTime for Jordy Smith with the fam back home, but proud of that performance and officially making the midseason cut. You could hear the stoke factor for Jordy that he'll be back in Lemoore, California to surf in the Surf Ranch Pro. Right now, a great opportunity for you guys watching the broadcast. You can see the QR code on your screen. Walk up there and then use the code RANCH10 for 10% off. The ticket's now available, and we hope to see you in the middle of California. A wave called the Stoke Machine for good reason. Perfect waves on demand. Cali working hard with a team of masterminds to create perfection, a perfect right and a perfect left. And I've always enjoyed how Jordy approaches that place, a man that can do a rodeo on the end of the left. Let's get caught up here, Bugs. Yeah, well, Max has really get, got busy in this heat here. This turn here goes for the big layback, but just gets jammed up. The board got stuck in the lip, Joe. He comes unstuck and goes down quite heavily. So big moment for Maxime. He doesn't have any sort of opportunities to hold back. He's really got to bring everything he's got to with the next nine minutes against Gabriel Medina. Well, it's really only been that 7.6 of Medina. He's only his second ride it was that, that has been the point of difference between the two combatants. But just going back to Geordie, Joe, from where I sit, I would think that main that Margaret River and Jeffreys Bay are two absolute target events for Geordie Smith. You know, he's been a finalist here. He has been a multiple champion of Jay Bay. And as far as just hitting your, you know, your strong points, they're two for him. It's a great point. It goes into the whole idea of when he's going to win an event again. You know, when you look at a few seasons going by, I mean, I think around six seasons since he's held that number one trophy on the podium. He's just so talented. But the big man loves a big open face. I thought Sunset going away without him involved on finals day with it was a huge missed opportunity. But he's happy now. He's made the cut. And now he can really try to be pressure free to Try to pick up some wins this season. Well, one thing about Geordie Smith is in a draw, when conditions are, are right for him, you can see him coming. And he just gets this momentum going and that incredible power when he when he puts it together. He, he's, he's still got every, every move in the book and he's got that am amazing power base. And he was uh, being a bit cheeky in that interview, which is sometimes a good sign for his performance when he's happy and enjoying everything and not taking things too seriously. He's turned out his best. He had a series of claims when he won in Brazil that one year over to Sos in the final where he could tell he was just enjoying every bit of every heat and keeping things light. That's a special recipe for the big man. As the round of 32 continues, seven minutes, Gabriel Medina, 7-6 and a 6.33 is forcing Husano to chase down a 7.6 to keep his spot on the championship tour. Yeah, so going back to the, the, the introduction of the jet ski assist, I mean, I mean, first of all, there's two elements to it. One was the, you know, to get the rotation of the entertainment to, to keep the guys in the lineup and so there's not this paddling time. But a lot of these locations where you've got, you know, a five to seven minute paddle back to the lineup, that's a, a waste of time. And we see more action here. Looks like Max, Joe. Important ride for Husano. Needs a 7.6. Winds up. Grab rail, down carve. Leaves him underwater. And so on the safety side, there was there were several locations that it was an absolute no-brainer. The first being Cherpu, of course, with that 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 little reef uh, that you either get if you go across to it. There's the paddle back around that big finger of, of reef is about a 20-minute paddle. But the biggest factor was the safety factor, and for, you know for for you know Romano Poto and the, and that you know, Brock Little. They were really the, the pioneers of that at Chopu. And then, of course, on the North Shore of Oahu with uh, working with, uh, you know, Terry Ahui and uh, 
the head judge Perry Hatchett. Sunset Beach was a, another location that, you know, for firstly safety reasons, and then this massive paddle out. You know, you get caught inside by a West Peak, you were done. Uh, and then, of course, pipeline to, to be able to retrieve injured surfers. So there was a massive factor for safety. But then the other element was just to get that rotation in the lineup. It, it worked in with the, the, the introduction of best two rides, you know, and there was a lot of purists that went, no, you, you cannot do this. Uh, they're really skeptical. We did an experiment. I like to, you know, as part of the research and surveys, I'm big on that. And we did an experiment. We had, you know, JS, uh, Luke Egan, uh, Darren Hanley, I think it was Joel Parkinson. And we, we did one at Belinga. And, you know, I went down there with my late, great Peter Whitaker and a few others. We got some judges. And it worked. It, it just clearly worked that you could get the rotation quicker. It, it, the long paddle out was no longer a factor. And you could do it without, you know, you had to do it on a, a wide um, berthing so that you um, you didn't get the, the, the wake. There was all these elements that came into it. As, and, you, you know, we refined it as it went on. But, but that was the beginning of it. I love that story, Bugs. And look what we have today. Obviously, the safety is so important. But we're seeing these surfers surf more waves rather than paddling and spending time underwater on these big playing fields like we have at main break in margaret river let's watch the harvey norman recap gabriel medina maxime hustano down to four minutes the three-time world champ establishing dominance on the back end he is so smooth that board is just whipping through the lip not catching any rails punching it out with power and connection he's peaked at a seven six and maxime's been ripping he's been in the six range but needs just a bit more to keep his spot on tour. Yeah, he needs a bit more. Medina's just that 7-6 that has been the point of difference. Took him a while to get going, the champ. But he's uh, starting to feel it now. Only three minutes remaining. So Max is uh, in a situation where Medina has got control through priority. Gabriel Medina, first turn. A lot of water off the tail of the Cabianca surfboard. Nice clean motion off the top again. Passes the boil, chips it off the lip. Nice patience in this approach. And there's a little tail whip to shut it down with a bit of variety and progression. Medina's low score is 6-3-3. For him, you know, he's always focused on what he has to do to achieve his goals. He's looking for a fourth world title this season. That would then equal the great Mark Richards. You know, that's, that would be some achievement. There's been a lot of three-time champions. And just going back to that, that jet ski experience, the, the, you know, the, it was called the per personal watercraft assistance. It, it might have been Mick Fanning that it was part of that. I'm not sure. So apologies, Mick, if you were part of it. <laughs> uh, I thought it was Parco, but, you know, you guys were both, like, world champs. <laughs> yeah, from the same turf. What did you see on this one, Bucks? Oh, yeah, just solid Medina. Really um, smallish way for out there, but... He took priority. He's feeling pretty loose. Is he going to better the 6-3? I'd say it's um, it's thereabouts. Just probably right on the right on the button. Whether he improves, yes, it's a 6-6-7. Six, six, so Medina does improve, forcing Husano to get a 7.94 to keep his spot on tour. Remember, sitting number 29 in the world before the start of stop number five. So he knew he was going to be under a lot of pressure to perform here. Maxime, though, covered a little bit of ground at Bells, so got a bit closer, moved up three spots on the rankings. But when you have a low seed, you're going to get a tough draw very early. And one of the toughest ever is Gabriel Medina, a guy that's won a lot of events just on backhand surfing. Even when he was 17, backside snaps took out the event for him at San Francisco over Joel Parkinson in the final. He also beat Parco on Joel's home court of Snapper Rocks to kick off his first world title campaign in 2014. Into the final minute. Can imagine the emotions that Maxime might be going through, knowing that he has 50 seconds to try to keep his spot on tour. Oh gosh, it's, uh, it really comes down to a high pressured situation. Medina had control. You know, when he's got priority and there's three minutes left, you are in trouble. 
35 seconds on the clock, I will say, just running into Maxime these last few days. He hasn't shown any sadness, any challenges. He's been so bright and happy and focused on what he can control, always traveling with his dad, who's an incredible human being. He's been by his side since day one at all these events around the world, and I'm sure he's got so much left in him to take on the Challenger Series after this. Yeah, good call, Joey. And, you know, he had a good dig at Bells. You know, Max, he really showed a lot of potential. He has in this heat with Medina. He hasn't been far out of the picture at all. With uh, seconds ticking away now, it's going to get away on him. But he is going into his a kind of a comfort zone at Snapper, the Challenger Series, certainly not unfamiliar territory. That's right. Tough one for Maxime as he will be regrouping for the Challenger Series. And a nice clean win for Gabriel Medina, who's never won this event before. And he's on a roll into the round of 16. That's the round he's had trouble with this year. Maybe Margaret River will be the event where we see him make a finals day to start crawling into the mix of the WSL Final Five picture. Gabriel tends to get hot in the back end of the season. So dominant at waves like the Surf Ranch and especially in Tahiti. More big surfing coming up next with world number one hitting the lineup. Joao Chianca takes on wild card Jarvis Hurl right after this. Cola Pinto pulling in, big oh, section, oh, oh. absolutely Goodness. blasted out. Ethan Ewing, he's joined his mother's name on the legendary bell staircase. Felipe Toledo takes out the Hurley Pro here at Sunset Beach. Jack Robinson officially your Billabong Pro pipe champ. Joao Chianca is Rip Curl Pro Portugal champion. Joao Chianca, world number one, wearing the yellow jersey for the first time in his career. Jack Robinson, I actually just got a word with him briefly. He said he misses everybody, but he will be back. Coming into stop five, number two. We'll see how that affects his position in the final five, but let's get caught up. Yellow jersey moving quickly. Chianca getting this wave during the break. And Judge has already had time to dissect it because he started off with a tube ride, 7 8 3 out of the gates. Yeah, and it's a clean tube ride. He, he went into a clean, came out clean, then went straight into that big slashing cutty at the top. Great work from Joao Chianca representing Sakurema. He's lucky enough to have a world class wave in his backyard. And how cool is that? It happens to a lot of pro surfers where they've got a wave that's on the championship tour and soon enough they're competing on it at the top stage. He knows how much value is in it having that in his home turf as he takes on the world junior champion who made some noise this morning, Jarvis Earl. Back, at, back to business here, Bugs. Jarvis Earl, he just got out of jail on the last wave. Uh, I mean, we saw that interview, I mean, the debrief with Luke Egan, his coach, and... Uh, Louis was really stoked with how he, you know, managed himself out there. But, the, you know, how he surfed with the pressure of a, a final wave and requiring a big score. This is a nice little warm-up session for Fioravanti. So quick. Remember, he's got the lineup to himself. Unfortunately, Ian Gentile have to, had to withdraw right before the matchup. And with the overlapping format, Leo still gets some time in the ocean. 
So he's surfing pressure free. A nice chance just to feel out his boards, his lineups here at main break. And he'll be off and running into the round of 16. Well, this completely secures his spot. He probably already had qualified. I mean, he came in number 10. He's, he's at least got the, you know, a, an equal ninth. And we see Jarvis Earl on the replay. Looks like he got involved here. Yeah, Jarvis uh, just missed time that that wave. Um, didn't really stand up for him. It was more that the wave itself. He, he went to the bottom. There wasn't much left as a scoring potential. But yeah, I'm really feeling for Ian Gentile because he was sitting in that group on an equal 17th there with Italo Ferreira, Kanawa, Seth Moniz, who are all still in the draw. And then, the, you know, I mean, it was just, it's kind of a precarious position. So that's a, it's just a real shame that he couldn't take the water. He surfed so well yesterday. Oh, such a super talent. But yeah, that mix in that tie break situation. We've got Italo taking on Kano Igarashi in this round of 32. So that's going to be a big one to watch towards the end of this round. Remember, goals are to even get the women back out there for the first four heats of the round of 16. We love how much we can accomplish in that overlapping format. Bugs, we're so lucky to sit next to you, talk about changes in surfing history. Before we get there, opportunities heading towards Chianka in yellow with priority. Fresh off the 783 where he got barreled. This time he's going right into a frontside carve. Chianka digs in off the bottom and sets up that mid face round. Joao meets the lip well, well timed, nice pace. And he'll step off, and young Jarvis is going to be in a tough position. Jean Bello there, longtime competitor through the QS series from Brazil, but he's lived in the West for many years now. And he's often on the staircase supporting the entire Brazilian storm. Felipe there, too, to cheer on Chianca in this one. How about this one, Bucks? Yeah, what a great backup there for the the number one ranked surfer right now and he looks just super in great form a good touch and his timing is just exquisite on this wave what a great backup look at this raging off the top of that wave massive rooster tail yeah I mean look at that timing out of the lip he is just such an exciting surfer that he really deserve it obviously Jack couldn't take up his spot but and this finishing turn here so everything he does is is point scoring joe there's no in between it's all big stuff he gets in front of that that uh, descending lip there and just really solid surfing great to see that we came off solid surfing from a three-time world champ gabriel medina and stace he's looking really happy these days isn't he yeah that's right joe looking relaxed gabriel another fantastic heat yeah i'm happy to make another one uh yeah, um, it's kind of slow out there, uh, but it's a nice day again, and yeah, I'm happy with the win. What does the afternoon look like for you? There was a fantastic lunch that got thrown on yesterday. Did you get involved? I heard. No, I couldn't. I, I had my heat, um, but now I have time, so I will sit there and eat. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, there's a lot going on around you. Obviously, surfers you're matching up against fighting for their careers on tour, uh, obviously focusing on yourself, but do you let that noise get involved? Uh, not much. Uh, I have nothing to do with it. You know, I, I just gotta go surfing and, uh, but it's, it's good to watch, you know, the, the guys, uh, put it all in and, um, uh, yeah, but I mean, I'm focused on myself and I just want to make it <laughs> with Jack Robinson re re uh, removing himself from this event due to injury. Does that something you think about? Uh, no, I mean, they, he made a few finals. Uh, I'm just, thinking about myself I, I need to to get a few finals and yeah that's my focus uh, I need to win event you know and yeah I'm trying <laughs> what do you think your chances are at this one uh, I mean the waves are good I, I like this kind of waves uh, just powerful uh, lots of opportunities and uh, yeah hopefully I can keep going <laughs> would you like to say uh, hello in Portuguese Obrigado a todos por assistir e torcer. É, eu sei que tá tarde aí, mas agradecer a torcida e é isso, continuar indo. Valeu, obrigado, galera. Thanks, Gabriel. Well done. What a weapon this guy is. He made an impact on pro surfing at 20 years of age, winning a world title, and he's done them all in different ways. Three-time world champ, which is always his goal.
joins that class of three-time champs like Mick Fanning, Andy Irons, Tommy Curran, uh, who always wanted to be there. And now he's trying to break free of that and add more records to his name. In 2014, he won in Tahiti, Fiji, and also on the Gold Coast. 2018, he won in Tahiti again, the Surf Ranch, which is back, and also Pipeline. And then the wild three, uh, third title year was the shortened season, seven events in the regular season. He was in five finals that year and took out the first edition of the Rip Curl WSL finals. And he went into that with a lot of pressure because he was a, the number one ranked surfer. He, he probably would have won the world tour in the old system. Uh, so he, he yeah. withstood a lot of pressure. But the thing is, he was quite guarded in that interview and, and he focused on two things. One was that he, he needed to keep winning heats and two, he needed to win an event. And I, I think what was behind that was that he has reached this round of 16 five times and has yet to get through it this year, which is so uncharacteristic, so unmedina like And so I think, you know, he wasn't really, definitely not worried about what others are doing. He definitely has some big goals at this event. The yellow jersey bright and highlighted through the pit. Chianca can't find an exit this time, but that's exactly how he started off this seed against the Gromit Jarvis Earl. 7.83, then backed it up with a 7.17 looking incredibly strong, leading the tour into stop number five. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult wave. It, that first barrel that he got was clean. He pulled in immediately after the takeoff. He came out clean. What's difficult here is to is to backdoor the next loop uh, before it shuts down. You know, it pinches at some point. And he was just a bit too deep there. Love when you see that special moment where you could get barreled at main break you don't see it every year depending on the size and obviously conditions wind direction play a big part of it but there's been some special ones let's see it again here yeah and he just drags his arm in there so he wants to be deep but at that next section it, it well it, it pinched very quickly joe it didn't uh, you, you know you can't always tell when you take off but he speculated that he might get come out of a deep barrel you know he's looking to He's already posted two very good scores. Yeah, great to see. Chianca is a special competitor. Remember, fell off at the cut last year. He said it was an emotional day. That actually continued for a couple of months. Heartbreak in his career at Margaret River, and then kind of had to be uncomfortable for a little bit till he was reinvigorated and inspired. You think a wild card call up to represent his home wave in Sakurama would have helped his cause, but it actually kind of hurt him a bit, wishing that he was still on tour full time. He was still recovering mentally from the cut. Yeah, there's actually a different level of pressure that comes upon you uh, on your home break. There's definitely a expectation within yourself that just adds another layer. He's definitely going to be able to enjoy it this year. Gosh, look at these lines coming, Joe. There's really very little a-frame in this it's it's kind of big walls and an interesting takeoff here this could be a barrel again though looks like one big pump for chianca and it's staying open for a moment and you saw that end exit just clamp on him next opportunity is going to set up for leonardo firavanti who's looking great six six seven eight point six and just committed to completing this heat He's got a real cool, calm demeanor at the moment. Once again, on his own for the next 6.45 with the absence of the Ingentile. And uh, yeah, clearly surfing within one dimension of himself. A lot of excitement coming up from the local fans here, watching the big heats walking down the staircase. There's a backside turn, kind of getting hung up there as Jarvis Hero. Nice fan off the back end of that Channel Island surfboard. Such a happy kid, and why not? You're living your dream right now, surfing against your heroes. Remember, he had the buzzer beater this morning in the elimination round, which ended up knocking Michael Rodriguez off the championship tour. Yeah, that was wild, and you know, you would think that him and Reef Hazelwood, both goofy footers, um, in that elimination round, put on great shows. Reef just wasn't able to get going until late in the heat. And then he got an 8-5 against the 
the reigning world champion. Uh, Jarvis hasn't quite got going in this one yet. It was a nice moment for the Australians. Jackson Baker, Callum Robson, two good friends, but they can't seem to avoid each other in a draw on the championship tour. Jackson so fired up to show off his power at main break. Getting some great words from probably one of his favorite surfers growing up in Newcastle named Mitchell Ross, who's in his support crew. I was impressed with Jackson Baker. He's written for Channel Islands for such a long time. He's one of those special surfers that can pick up a brand new board, wax it up, sticker it up, and ride it for the first time when he's in competition. Not every athlete chooses to do that. He's a, he's a very aggressive surfer. He is not, he's fearless when it comes to just attacking the lip. And I think he's going to, this is going to be fireworks out here in the next heat. But now 4.45 on the clock. We'll see these guys drift towards the peak. John Chianka with priority and completely controlling the heat over Jarvis Earl. And looks like he does want it here. Here comes world number one. Big win this year in Portugal. He wants another one, lays into it. He's able to ride out, keeps himself tight in the pocket. Big carve, quick reaction to float it. And he points to that yellow jersey. He was pretty honest about his claims. He said he's actually prepared a few. He sits with Samuel Pupo. They decide what they might reveal in a big moment in competition. I like it, Bugs. Well, Sam Pupo really laid down a massive call in his heat. Uh, he came up a bit short, but <laughs> it was entertaining. I mean, seamlessly taking off in the lip of that wave there. He made it look so easy. Again, caught in the lip, but it's functional. And now he goes into his move. One, two, bang. Finishes just so flush. And he goes, yeah, I belong. Jerry, look at that. He just gets caught in the lip there, and he uses the lip to his advantage. So a, a totally functional move. And now he sets up. He's looking down the line. He has to do no bottom turn. Halfway up the face, part of the lip, and just gets in front of it. This, and he lands flush and just hangs his head. But he goes, yeah, this thing here, that's mine. I love the emotion out of Joachianka. And it's uh, so special to hear his interviews these days. Happy, in tune with uh, the tour, leading it for the first time. Last year, it was pretty emotional when he was getting knocked out early. He said the heat, though, that he did lose to Florence last year. He said that gave him a ton of confidence because it was the first time he felt he surfed out of his skin in a CT jersey where everything came together. Nothing felt forced. And now look where he is today, leading the entire tour with a shot potentially of being in the Rip Curl WSL Finals this year. He said he doesn't want to get too wrapped up thinking about anything too far down the stretch. Staying present in the moment and really enjoying his time at these venues that gave him a bit of trouble last year. Yeah, he had his troubles. Certainly put that behind him now. Great shot of the kind of a Saturday we're having here. Flawless conditions and Leonardo some great prep work into the round of 16. He's uh, had some success here at Margaret River in the past. And you go back to a wild card opportunity he had back in 2016. He beat Kelly. He beat Adriano, who's now his, is his coach. Man also ended up in the quarterfinals. I think that's when he went down to Julian Wilson. And that was a, just a promising sign of what was to come when he got on tour full time. Sure was. And, you know, the thing about Leo is he surfs in a heat with such intensity. In this heat, he's been kind of relaxed, and yet he's getting big scores. I wonder if uh, there'll be a takeaway. I'm really enjoying the size of the swell for Leo's style and approach. He's been very patient, like you've been noticing, and just tearing this thing apart. He's got an 8.6, a couple of mid-range six-point rides. And definitely just keeping it in cruise control at the moment, but still getting a lot out of the panel. As Leo is probably just enjoying having priority at main break. What a cool opportunity. As we know, pro surfers are dealing with quite a few people in the crowd in the lead up into the event. It's the ocean, so everyone goes out there and surfs. And the hardest thing to do is battling against 
the top 34 and top 17 at the same time. So Fioravanti understands how important this is to have priority here at main break and getting some extra work done before the round of 16 starts. Down to 30 seconds in the priority heat. We're watching João Chianca from Sakurama. Lost connection, but was still able to pull off that turn off the top. You know, going back to Leo, remember when he came in from his seat yesterday, Adriano D'Souza, former world champion, his coach now, absolutely remonstrating with him. Leo's gone out there today in a much more relaxed mode, obviously due to the circumstances. He's got the highest individual score of the day, the 8-6. Gosh, he's been impressive. There's De Souza, a champ out here at Margaret River, a world champ in 2015 in the same season, now working with the Italians these days. As Leo Firavanti will be moving on into the round of 16 and trying to get himself back into that WSL Final Five picture. Chianca still leads over Jarvis Searle and will bring in Jackson Baker and Callum Robson to start off their matchup. We'll take a quick Bonsoy brew break. We'll be right back. As a professional surfer, having a healthy lifestyle, it, it's really important. The three things that I've done to increase my mental health is exercises, having a professional with you, and separating professional life to personal life. The round of 32 continues as we'll get a chance to chat with Felipe Toledo as he's with Stace. That's right. Thanks, guys. Here with Philippe Toledo at the Healthway Think Mental Health Activation. Philippe, we've got the club presidents from uh, all across the state down here today. Uh, I don't know, you've been a big part of the program here. Uh, I know you're loving your time in the West, mate. Must be, feel cool to meet a few of the locals. Oh, for sure. You know, it always feels great to meet uh, really cool people and then um, people that actually, you know, come here to enjoy and look at the surf and then uh, get the support. So it's, uh, it's really cool and I'm really happy. And um, yeah, just just excited to, to be here and get to meet everyone. We saw a different side of you in the Make or Break TV series. Um, we're all very appreciative of your vulnerability. Um, how important is that to be? And uh, you know, what's your support network look like? Um, yeah, I feel like that's that was one opportunity for me to uh, speak up and actually show everybody that you know we're not robots. We're all humans. We all have feelings. We all have hearts. And um, with the biggest platform, you know, it was my chance to tell everybody that you know we have each other you know so we can trust in each other um, and we have a lot of things to be grateful for um, i know sometimes it's hard to look for that but um, once we have family friends and people supporting you're just like you just get so appreciated from people like that that you know that's that's what happened to me you know i was going through one of the most hard times of my entire life and then being able to come back and then winning a world title, you know, it was just extra special. So I felt like I had to go through that situation to be here today and uh, to be here to actually meet everybody as well and um, be someone that can support people that's going through the same thing as me. And uh, we always going to be here and then, um, yeah, just, you know, be yourself be real and um, there's there's as I said there's a lot of things that we have to be grateful for and we just got to keep looking forward well said mate we'll uh, let you get back to uh, the meet and greet thanks so much for your time thank you thanks, 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 thank you. what a champion in the water and uh, on land Felipe Toledo we appreciate everything that you do and inspired to tell your story you've impacted more people than you realize and great to have 
the Healthway activation right here on site. And Felipe spending his time with them after looking incredible in the ocean today. Remember, he's won this contest in the past. He's had a lot of great highlights. As we continue on with some big storylines, they're happening quickly in this overlapping format. I think the real focus right now will be Jackson Baker versus Callum Robson. And Baker specifically finds himself at the 21 seed mark coming into stop number five. Remember Samuel Pupo went down to Jordy Smith earlier today. Tied with Jackson Baker there. So is Liam O'Brien. Liam O'Brien comes up later against the GOAT. Kelly Slater in this round. Matt Young also in the 21st spot. He'll have Yago Dora as we see the man himself. Guy that impacted surfing more than so many. When you look at the all-time greats in surfing, you start with Duke Kanemoku and Kelly's so high on that list. Surviving multiple generations. All started in Cocoa Beach, Florida and was able to call him the best in the world for so many decades. He's coming up in an important heat. Remember, he's behind the midseason cut as he takes on Liam O'Brien, who's 21st. So a lot at stake for both those athletes coming on later on today. Oh, wow, well, that's that heat right there is uh, probably one of the most important of the day uh, for, you know, on several fronts, but mostly around they're both pretty much on the wrong side of the cut. I mean, Liam, right on the bubble. And, uh, you know, just speaking about Jackson, he he just came off a fifth. So before that, he had not got through this round. And then so he's sort of in a purple patch of form. And he was very close to creating an upset over Toledo in that quarterfinal over at Winky Pop. He had that big nine point ride, three turn combination, but Felipe's ability in small waves didn't even need to be on a set. Did a nose pick reverse to get into the sevens to take out Jackson Baker. And Jackson, that was his first CT quarterfinal, but he still left that day with a lot of confidence heading into stop number five as the whole pack starts to move. Remember, priority with Chianca and Jarvis Earl over Baker and Robson so that he is making a decision here Jarvis with priority over all of them but somehow it's Caltex getting started here rapid cutback to kick things off carves and then stops that one short to get down the line we'll see if it pays off with that big turn on the end section micro likes it well done for Callum it's always interesting how these guys are going to handle being non-priority. Callum's going to be happy. He got a nice start there. Well, all four surfers were in motion, Joe, and it ended up being the two surfers without priority, which meant man on the inside had right of way. You like that, just old school, getting position on each other. We've talked about a lot of introductions with the water patrol, water safety, getting the Red Bull ski assist. What about the overlapping format? When did that come into play? Well, that was the brainchild of Kelly Slater. You know, what a great contribution to add a, yet another dynamic element to, to professional surfing in the WSL. You know, we all went out to Fiji. It was a, it was a wonderful trip. You know, he had some of his buddies, you know, Perry Farrell, uh, Jackson Brown. And, you know, we all sat around, you know, the head judge, Perry Hatchett, Lou Egan was there, a bunch of us, and we sat around. And, and Kelly told us about this um, concept he had for the overlapping heats and, and how it would work and why it would work. And we had a fantastic arena there to play it out. Yeah, Kelly, that was awesome. And to play it out in those amazing waves of cloud break. And it just works so superbly. And, and it's been implemented ever since. It's been one of the most dynamic tools um, in the history of the WSL. What a turning point in pro surfing history. And I think more recently, in the last few years, it's been used more often than not. We saw it at Pipe a lot, but now we're using it at majority of the venues on tour. And this was the positioning work from Callum Robson to get started with a 5.5. It was positioning, Joe, and Callum got the inside on, on Jacko. And this wave here, the second section, he made the most of it. Just kind of lost it there and makes up for it right here. Great finish by Callum Robson. So he opens up gets away to an early start look just a 5-5 whether it will be a keeper at the end nice to have it 
uh, in the ledger. So Callum Robson with a lot on the line in this matchup. If he wins this heat, he'll be safe for the rest of the season and also qualify for 2024. So much involved in making the cut, challenging conditions through a lot of the events this year. But Callum celebrated a 10-point ride when he needed the most in the elimination round at Super Tubos and got himself that Yeti Tundra 110 cooler as we see him up and out. 5.5 start. And Jackson Baker holding down priority. And I'm just waiting to see if we're going to see more highlights from Jarvis Earl. I mean, the feeling he must have had from getting a wave at the end, getting rewarded for it, and then talking to Luke and seeing how proud Luke Egan was of him. That could just fuel his fire to pull off a miracle in the back end of this heat. Yeah, I know. You, you certainly can't count him out after the heroics of this morning. He's World got Junior the champ. Channel Island surfboards, and he goes with the AM1 honeycomb fin from Futures, uh, designed by Al Merrick himself. It's got a real balanced flex pattern to it. A wider base creates increased drive through his turns. And he's well looked after. Brent Power here from Channel Islands, making sure the grommet was prepared. And sometimes when you're comboed and the announcers are repeating it, you look at your Apple Watch and it could feel daunting knowing that you need two new waves. That could free up the junior to provide some fireworks that he threw down in his world junior title. He had so many nines in that event. 9-5 in the final. He had a 9-9-3 over Oscar Berry in the quarters. So let's see him just let loose here. Well, he, he won that World Junior pretty much dominating on his forehand. And we're, we've seen his backhand now on display. So it, very well rounded for a 19-year-old. Might only be 18. I'm not sure. So Chianca controlling this position, looking really comfortable. At Bells, I kept reminding him, hey, you're number two in the world. And back-to-back -back press conference invites asked him about being world number one and he, he's almost speechless about it and I think it's more he just doesn't want to think about it too much just to keep on progressing through big heats the priority heat lets it go that's going to open things up for Jackson Baker representing Newcastle lays down the cutty Baker hits it over the top of a big section and turns in his opening ride few ties there and 21st in the world as we'll see the goofy foot junior world champ in motion throwing some water there Jarvis trying to get something better than a 2.0 to improve his situation and whips it in the soft section still a lot of work to do for young Jarvis as he's compared to world number one yeah well he had a bit of work to do to get out of prior uh, to get out of combination so he's got to get, you know, basically, you know, like a 5.5 five just to get himself in to really need then a 9.5. What about Jackson Baker's start, Bucks? Yeah, he's got a wall wave here. So Jackson, he, he's only got the two big moves in. Again, uh, that wave, it's not going to go massive, but it, it's an opener. I mean, Callum started with that 5.5 five and he's had a short ride. Jacko, it's a bigger wave, but it was quite a wall. Didn't have that A-frame. This is a nice A-frame ta uh, tapered wave for Jarvis Earl. And Jarvis uh, showing his backhand wears now. Got a bit of a whitewash to deal with on this finishing bowl section on the bricks. No worries. Uh, now, it's going to go close. I'm not sure he's going to get out. Pro no, he's not. He's not out of combo yet. So he's still, the junior still remains in combo land. Six and a half minutes to go. So a perfect 10 will not see him in the lead. Both Jarvis and Joao on the Channel Island Surfboard program. Joao's on a 6-0 copy of the board that he wrote at Sunset Beach. The Sunset board was actually 6-2, but same model, just trimmed down a bit. And he'll ride brand new boards in, in heats all the time. He did it at Pipe against uh, Felipe 
He did it in Sunset in round one. He did it at Bells in round three. So Joao's got a lot of trust. And just like Baker on the CI equipment where they'll just wax up a freshie right before the heat starts. How's the Harvey Norman recap? Starting off with some shade from this beautiful sunshine. Bright yellow jersey looking solid. 7.83 for Chianca's opener. Yeah, he started out with a straight into the barrel. And this one here, Joey, comes down with the lip, gets caught up again in the lip, but uses it to his advantage, takes the airdrop, comes square off the bottom, slams down to the lip there, and then finishes with a flourish and goes, I like this yellow jersey. Something about being on a fresh board with a lot of pop. They build these boards differently for pros. They're meant to just perform, sometimes just use one day in a world title campaign. You hear the stories about some magic boards that survive multiple events. There's that famous board from DH that he made for Matty Wilkinson. Won back-to-back -back events and then just tried to save that board all season. Let's catch up with the Italian. Leo is with Stace. An interesting situation, Leo. Obviously, we're uh, wishing Ian all the best. Yeah, definitely. You know, never want to win heats with somebody getting injured. Uh, I've had it happen to myself here where I dislocated my shoulder and Jordy got a walk through. So, like I said, um, it sucks for Ian. I'm really, you know, I really hope he has a speedy recovery. I'm not exactly sure what happened, but uh, I really hope yeah, he has a speedy recovery. Nothing too bad and that, you know, he's hopefully he'll be fine. And uh, you had a good opportunity then to just, I guess, get even more familiar with this lineup. Yeah, I really wanted to use that as a really good opportunity. Um, you don't get that very often to basically have a 40 minute serve by yourself. And I also wanted to try my backup board to make sure that, you know, works as good as my good board, which it did. Um, so it was a bit of a game plan to just make sure that I used it the right possible way. Um, you know, keep, keep saying it unfortunately, but at the same time for me it was uh, an opportunity to work on my surfing. And in that indeed, 8.6 highest single score of the day. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, that felt really good. Just. Uh, it was a clean wave, had so much power, and I really wanted to rip in. And I'm glad that I was able. I'm glad that I was able to put on a good heat because I was like, okay, you know, I just got to make sure that I I got the lineup to myself. It's pumping. I better get some good scores. <laughs> and that you did well done, and I uh, rest up for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. The best in Gentile, having to withdraw, but definitely a smart competitor and riding his backup board and getting big numbers, including that 8.6. Joe, just as we, uh, you know, move into this priority heat with Jackson Baker, Callum Robert, so much on the line. There are four guys who are tied on equal 21st, like right on the bubble, like basically half in, half out, one, a, a foot on both sides. Uh, it's Nat Young, Jackson Baker, Liam O'Brien, Samuel Pupo. Now, each of them have had three 17ths and one fifth. Uh, Liam got a fifth at Pipe. Nat got a fifth at Sunset. Samuel got a fifth in Portugal and Jacko got a fifth in Bell. So all different locations. <laughs> uh, and so it's really on the line. Obviously, there's a bunch of guys below them and guys just in front of them. But what an interesting uh, situation. Yeah, a lot of those ties will be broken at this event. We might be left with a tie. Then it would go to first single high event placing. In their case, they seem to share the same results. So let's see the that change right in front of our eyes. Jackson Baker starts 617. Now back to the priority heat for just a moment. Jarvis Earl up and out. Jarvis got six brand new boards when he got the call up to the main event. With his bigger equipment, he's he's trying to learn quickly on how to manage it here at main break. But he's a very quick learner, very smart competitor as we got to witness on the junior series. You can follow Jarvis on his run on the challenger series starting off at Snapper Rocks. To showcase that back end attack, the the bank is incredible at the moment. As uh, Jarvis is just mixing it up, he's got a big combination. So why not give us a show on his final effort? Just a big flyaway, and looking forward to following his career this year on the Challenger Series. Yeah, sure is, and he's just having a bit of fun out there. <laughs> is you know, it's an amazing opportunity. Imagine that surfing against the the number one in the world. And this always gets uh, the crowd going, no matter if there's any chance of landing it or not. 
So a lot of big shots in magazines that were accomplished that way. Just ramp up with good lighting and you could get the shot and get a paycheck. That's right. <laughs> And uh, it's, a, you know, what would you expect from a, a junior in the last couple of minutes of the heat? Just go for it. The crowd pleaser for sure. Well, Jack O'Baker, meanwhile, has just got his nose in front on, against Callum Robson, 617 to 5'5". That is poised as we go into the priority for their heat soon. And here's, J here's Jarvis again on the lefts. There's a little end section that disappeared on him. Almost thought he'd get a ramp on that opportunity. But looking forward to seeing this young man from Cronulla continue with his career. And Chianca looking lights out into the round of 16. He even got barreled at main break. He threw away a score in the seven range. All systems go for the man from Soccer Emma. Even though he's one of the youngest on tour, he's surfing like a veteran. I think just looking at yellow, it's just validating all the hard work that he puts in. And he moves on to the round of 16. Some big heats already getting set up here. More to come from Chianca and the round of 32. When we come back, Connor O'Leary hits the lineup with Ezekiel Lau. We'll be right back. Why I love Quabba Station and Nalu, this region to me is just so special. I had such good memories here as a kid growing up and yeah, I just feel like there's always an adventure awaiting around the corner. As soon as you jump in your car and you go on that dirt road, you never know what you're gonna see. So it's just an amazing getaway for me. I feel like uh, every time I get here, I just forget about everything else. Really just focus on what's around me. What makes Western Australia so special is it's just such a unique place. There's always something to do. You're either surfing, you're diving, you're fishing. Everything is, is, that's here kind of captures your attention. Just the environments are completely different, all on one coast. It's been a lot of places, but I haven't seen a place like this where it just has so much energy and so much raw beauty, you know, all in one. That's why we appreciate Western Australia. Well, we've got a magic day on our hands here as we get into the round of 32. Overlapping heat, so plenty of action making the most of the sets on offer. Ronnie Blakey joined by Richie Lovett here on the Harvey Norman host set, Rich. Uh, we're seeing it. We're starting to see some of those heartbreak moments, but we're also seeing some surfers really establish themselves as the form competitors here that, that have a great chance at going on to get the win. Yeah, and we were always going to see that happening today. We knew it was coming, and we just braced ourselves for the emotional roller coaster that it is. Uh, we're only here in the booth and we're feeling it, but our surfers, they're really in the, uh, in the lines, Dan. And, um, but yeah, I, I feel like the, the performances have been uh, really great this morning and, and more to come. Yeah, definitely. Uh, maybe a little less intense than, than uh, this time last year. The surfers uh, just looking forward and thinking about maybe tackling the Challenger Series if they don't make that cut. This is a big heat between Callum Robson and Jackson Baker. Pretty decent scores for both these competitors. Also hitting the lineup now is Connor O'Leary up against Ezekiel Lau. We know Zeke's had a pretty tough run of it this year, so he's after a monster result. Connor O'Leary's had a really positive start to the season, coming off a couple of quarterfinal results. Yeah, he's on a bit of a roll, and, and we discussed on uh, Connor yesterday. It, for me, he's he's one of the informed goofy footers on the tour at the moment. Uh, he's really finding some mojo uh, at all the breaks that we're visiting, and, and certainly from what I've seen, 
uh, just in his uh, heats already in this event and, and just the free surfs, he's just been attack mode. Yeah, well, we knew for, for Connor just making the round of 32 was a, a big goal because he was going to be able to add to his points tally. So he's made the cut. He's shored up his position for the back half of the year. And next season, here's the replay of Callum's last ride. Really attacked that last section, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Uh, the, the first turn, uh, you know, he executed it a, a, a about two-thirds of the way up the face. But you can see here, this is the this is the second turn. This is where most of the points are going to come on this ride. And you can see just blasts the tail. So at that point right there, the fins are totally detached from the wave. Uh, he brings it back down, did really well to keep the nose of the board out uh, because that would have spilt doom. He would have gone over the handlebars. But uh, you can just see, keeps enough pressure on that back foot and then continues down the line, gets to this finishing move and, uh, well, not as threatening as some of the the sections we've seen today, but uh, Callum doing very well to uh, ride out of that. Oh, it's just magic out here at the moment. Really clean conditions, and uh, yeah, some some great attacking surfing unfolding. Callum turning in a 7.67. So in reply now, Jackson Baker's going to be after a 7.01. Still no waves for Connor O'Leary and Ezekiel Lau. Yeah, so uh, Callum Robson, he, he's off to a pretty good start here in this heat with that 7.67 and a 5.5. That's putting a little bit of pressure right on Jackson Baker here because, uh, you know, he, he's going to want to match that top score. We know he needs that 7.0, but he's going to want to do more than that to really uh, put some pressure here on, on Callum and get right back into this heat. Only 14 minutes on the clock now. They are in the priority situation where they do have right of way of every set that comes through. And Jackson, the top of the priority order. So, uh, yeah, still some amazing waves out here at Margaret River. Crowds are starting to really build on the point. And, uh, well, the temperature too, Ron. Uh, I had to shed my flanny and go <laughs> for a short arm shirt here because uh, it's up, a, a, I'd say, you know, high 20 degrees at the moment. Water temp just absolutely perfect. Need a little bit of suit, maybe a short arm steamer, long arm spring suit. I love this heat between Conor O'Leary and Ezekiel Lau, two of the, the tallest competitors on the CT, both six foot plus, pretty heavy set units uh, as well. Zeke Lau is looking to make a charge from below that cut line. Conor O'Leary well situated in 12th position coming into this event, already adding to his points tally as he continues through the, the draw here. But Zeke Lau, you, you think about some of his pet events where he's had good results in the past it would make sense that that this would be a, an event that suits him yeah it's weird that he hasn't had more consistency here and had had better results because when you think about you know what what really are zeke's strength it's that big open face power hack those big calves it's in the realms of you know geordie smith and even john john the way he approaches the wave so it's unusual that that uh, he hasn't had the results here. And, and, you know, let's talk about the results overall. It's weird. He's been on the tour, off the tour, on the tour, off the tour. He's been in and out so many times now. Uh, it, you know, obviously, to me, that just reeks of uh, inconsistency. Well, travelling with his wife, Jen, and their baby girl, and really inspired to, to put together a, a magic performance, the former Sunset champ who's definitely got the, the power to serve up some monster scores for us here. Here he goes. So this is his first effort. There is one of those big opening turns. Looks like he's changed up his equipment with the conditions uh, on hand as he hammers the end section. So pretty good stuff considering that he's in that situation where he's giving priority away to Callum Robson and Jackson Baker at the moment. Callum finishing off another way there, trying to better a 5.5. And the surfer from Merriweather, Newcastle, Jackson Baker, coming off his best ever finish in a CT event down there at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, a quarterfinal for him there. He's on the outside having a look at one. And he's looked really sharp in all the free surfs and in the opening round. Beautiful slice off the top to get started here and hammers the next section. So just two turns, but quite weighty moves. A lot of water being thrown around. And we'll see uh, how he goes on the exchange there. Needed a 7.01 to get into the lead. Well, he definitely needed that wave and, and a mistaken priority 
Uh, Jackson took the first wave of that set, and then uh, Callum got a good one behind him, and just by sheer luck, there was several waves in that set, and that allowed him to get on one of these final ones. Let's have a look at what Callum Robson got done. So an open face snap, doesn't overcook it, gets down the line here because that last turn, and again, the final manoeuvre is where most of the points are going to come. But in contrast, Jackson gets a better outside turn here. Attacking, swooping high off the lip. And uh, gets a really interesting, dynamic, kind of unusual snap to finish off here. But this, this opening turn, Ron, just had so much power and control. Yeah, when you really take a close look at the slow-mo, you can see how uh, where he starts that turn. It's basically under the lip almost. And again, great timing. Got a little drift of the tail on top of the roof there. But, you know, he was also able to move a whole lot of water, which from uh, right there on the point where the panel's lined up would have looked pretty impressive. So uh, expecting that he'll get a decent score. Will he get the 7.01 that he's chasing, though, to get into the lead? I think he will. I think uh, off the strength of the two-turn combination, go back to the conversation with Richie Porter this morning, and he said, we want to see these surfers stringing together two, three critical moves at a time, uh, you know, with, with minimum or no downtime between it. Uh, keep the speed, and i, I got to say... Uh, Jackson Baker's board, his channel bottom, uh, sorry, his Channel Islands board uh, looks amazing under his feet. Yeah, looking really sharp. Jackson made a, a really positive climb after that quarterfinal finish down there at Bells, but needs to make the next round st to start collecting more points because he's uh, dropping 17th as his worst result. So, yeah, this is a, a very crucial one for him because he's in that same spot uh, that we saw surfers like Samuel Pupo uh, earlier on sitting in equal 21st position. There, there's four of them there. <laughs> so uh, he needs to continue on. Callum Robson much higher on the, the ratings in 14th position. And uh, Callum already adding to his points tally just by making it here to the round of 32. Big jump up for him, obviously, if he can get through this one. So 6.27 for Jackson Baker on that last ride. So uh, you were wrong, Rich, yep. and uh, you fell <laughs> short of the requirement. I've been wrong a few times today. Yeah, well, it's a, a, an interesting event. One of the, the points that Richie Porter made earlier on today was the, the fact that, you know, the judges will take on their, their initial thoughts of the ride as they watch it live. But this venue, you know, the, that main break's a long way from where the panel is and they do have a, a look at those replays so sometimes you're, you're kind of waiting on those numbers to drop and they didn't see that one turning the heat well it did probably momentarily give jackson baker a, a chance of getting in front but callan robson up the ante with his last ride of 6.43 yeah so it's uh become a, a taller order here for jackson baker now needing the 7.83 still some sets moving through it looks like Conor O'Leary will pull the trigger. He just looks so on this season with those big backhand blasts. He's looked like one of the strongest goofy footers on tour. And the big result might be coming his way here. He's had a couple of quarterfinals to get himself well situated at, uh, above the a majority of surfers in the pack on the CT ranks. That should be a, a good score for him and, and a nice reply to the 5.67 opener from Zeke Lau. Yeah, you'd have to think it, it'll come close to matching it. And uh, good to see both of our competitors, Ezekiel and Connor, uh, outside of being the priority heat, picking up a couple of scores, and that always feels good. Let's check this, the replay here. So Connor, difficult section, but Jizzy timed it well, given how much foam and froth was on the face. Another clean snap and just takes his time here, doesn't overrush it, waits for that little section and just this little drop floater to finish off. But two great opening snaps on the backhand here. Board got to about 11.30 on that one. A little fin drift, but does so well, Ron, just to keep the rail in the, in the face of the wave through all these little bumpy, frothy sections. Streaks down the line here. Just avoids that, uh, that first section. Gets a little drifting floater here. Nice projection down the line. Just looking so powerful and strong at the moment. 
Obviously, uh, a lot of confidence behind each of those turns. Pressure's off for him. He's going to be on, on tour for the next year, basically, from this point. 6.83. And he is uh, getting the, the slight edge on Zieglau at the moment. But they've still got plenty of time. Just over 25 and a half minutes to go. Our focus is shifting more towards what Jackson Baker's got to do here to uh, potentially get ahead of Callum Robson. He needs a 7.83. Bit of movement on the outside here and under priority. Connor O'Leary says, why not? Back up to 6.83 and establish a bit more of a lead here over Zeke Lau. Just whipping that board through nicely. A lot of punch on that final move too. But Connor O'Leary's um, just really looking like he's got his timing spot on. He's not rushing anything at the moment. You know, I think uh, often we see surfers rich when they're not feeling overly confident in the jersey uh, they get a little front footed they rush their moves their timing gets a little bit off as a result and connor he just seems like he can sit back on the tail of that board size up the the way for what it is and, and pick his moment to strike yeah it's um eloquent is sort of the word that comes to mind with the way he composes himself off the bottom and, and just how beautiful he's coming off the top really uh accelerating through the backhand turns into the next one but, uh, but you're right, setting it up so well just on that backhand bottom turn. We see here, so this is that wave that he, he picked up, just pivots so well. Gets a little drift off the lip. You can see they're just sort of whipping the upper body too. That's when you know someone's feeling super connected when they throw the turn and the little kind of body exclamation point as they, as they whip out of the turn and gets that momentum onto the next, ra onto the next uh, rail. Big thing you always hear, uh, surfers, like Connor O'Leary and his Aussie counterparts screaming at each other when they're out in the surf is square up, square up. And he squared up beautifully on that first section. 6.67. That was uh, on a basically a scrap wave that the others let roll through to the inside. So he really made that count as we cut back to the takeoff zone and the priority heat. And Jackson Baker going after that 7.83. Arrives a little late to the first section, but has the control to get through it. And he's finished off that second turn too. It looked like that was he was driving up into the barrel almost. <laughs> well, but he somehow managed to get on top of it. Can't wait for the uh, for the front angle. It looks like it's a board change too. I feel like he's uh, possibly snapped his board here. Let's have a look. So a tall wave as Jackson takes to the lip on the uh, quite late, as you said, on the first hit. The second one too, up and under. So the timing was off a little bit, and uh, well, he just felt it go between his feet there. But this water angle really shows you how late he was hitting it. So it um, was perhaps a half a second behind. And right there, so much force coming down. And uh, just that focal point in between the two feet, it's... Uh, well, this is got a horrible timing here for Jackson because there's only two and a half minutes to go. Uh, he's buckled that board. And, and Rich, for, for people watching, the, the board's in one piece. He rides out of the turn. But, but what's happened there, there to the equipment? Yeah, so just, just the torque or the leverage between his two feet, it, it, the board's actually buckled the opposite way to the rocker. So there's obviously a natural curve we call rocker. So if you put the board on a flat table, the tail kicks up and the nose kicks up. But what happens is it gets in a situation where the, the lip actually just squared up right on the bottom of the board and it's creased it. So uh, sometimes they don't break in half, but there's like a, you know, a centimetre or a five millimetre crease that runs along for normally a rung right in front of the fins. A, a big part of the performance of a surfboard is obviously that flex and the crease completely changes the flex pattern in the, in the board, takes yep. the drive away. Yep, 100%. And it does take the rocker off its natural curve that it wants to be at, especially if it's broken the glass. And in particular, if the string is actually cracked as well, that means that it's been totally compromised the curve of the board the performance won't be there and i guarantee if if jackson took off on another wave on that board it would actually snap in half so a little bit like you when you're riding your razor scooter when you <laughs> put your foot at the back and apply some pressure it slows you down correct <laughs> if you want to talk about it that way mate for sure <laughs> <laughs> one minute remaining here jackson baker falling short of the requirement did well to, to pull off those late hits but that you couldn't call them well-timed manoeuvres. And that, that's one thing that he's just had on lock. 
in these past couple of events, ja Jackson Baker is impeccable timing. And it's helped him fetch some pretty big scores right up there in the excellent range into the nines. But he still needs that excellent score at the moment. A uh, 7.83. And he's on his backup board now. Well, the clock is going to be Jackson's enemy right now because with 30 seconds on the clock and his competitor, Callum Robson, with priority and not a whole lot on the horizon. This is going to be uh, very, very tense moments. Yeah, he's going to uh, be in that same position as Sammy Pupo earlier on coming into this one in equal 21st position. And, and people behind them are kind of closing in on, on their goals to, to leapfrog above the cut line and, and jump ahead of them. They really needed to both make the round of 16, Sammy Pupo and Jackson Baker to start adding to their points total and put a bit of distance between themselves and those chasing them down. A hundred percent. And then also you look at Liam O'Brien and Nat Young, who are also in that bunch. They've still yet to surf. So they've got the opportunity to pull forward a little bit and get themselves out of danger. But a uh, big result for Callum Robson. He'll continue his climb. Heartbreak for Jackson. Yeah, always close heats when these two come up against one another. Uh, two of the real blue collar workers from uh, Australia. But as we go to the Harvey, no Harvey Norman heat recap, you can see how Callum Robson uh, established a, a strong lead and got himself the victory here. Yeah, just very dominant in terms of his maneuvers and how he approached the wave. Look how low he's getting here. Just snaps down the line. This is the one that had that big finish on it. And always uh, a pleasure in the judge's memory when you leave a, a big turn there but this was a great way for jackson too I, th I thought personally this one could have maybe gone a little bit higher it was a fantastic two-turn combination but in the end it didn't really matter because it was uh callum who put the two decent waves together yeah i'm with you there callum robson what an important heat win for him he has now moved into the round of 16 and shored up his position on the championship tour for the back half of the season and also into next year so congratulations there to callum another great goofy footed clash coming your way in just a moment yago dora and nat young will hit the lineup after the break The Western Australia Margaret River Pro is brought to you by Tourism Western Australia, official tourism partner of the Western Australia Margaret River Pro. By Bond U, not for profit and not to conform. Bond University exists for you. By BioGlan, official vitamin partner of the WSL Australia. By GWM, exclusive category partner of the WSL Australia. And by Hydrolyte official oral rehydration partner of the WSL Australia. Welcome back to the show. Getting set to welcome a, a couple of great goofy footers to the mix here. Yago Dora, the Brazilian, been on fire this year up against Nat Young, who certainly can match him with big, powerful hits. It's going to be a fantastic heat, this one. They'll join Conor O'Leary and Zeke Lau out there in the lineup, who have now entered the second half of their heat, so they'll have priority. But it's Yago we're going to see. Ah, live action. What a start to this ride. Super explosive. And again, just pounce the lip on the second turn. Quickly becoming, you know, one of the strongest competitors on the CT. Yago Dora really has reached a whole new level of performance these past two seasons. Oh, absolutely. What a way to start off. And uh, these guys don't even have 
first choice over the lineup to find that under uh, the priority of of this heat here. This is Zeke Lauer, live action. Oh, that was great too. Yeah, really smooth slice there to get started. Really ripped it right through the turn. Got it back into the, the power source. Great combination. And Zeke, he's had a, a rough year. He had a couple of tricky situations with interferences earlier in the season. And uh, now just finds himself with a, a monumental hurdle to, to overcome. He's got to get to the semifinals to at least have a chance, a mathematical chance of jumping above that cut line. But his best chance is going to be by cracking the final here at the Western Australia Margaret River Pro. That was a good start for him, though. But I, and not that they're in the same heat, but I think Yago's maybe going to turn in the best number out there at the moment. Yeah, for sure he will. Uh, a great way for Zeke, though. Love that first turn, all the power. Watch this here, the big Hawaiian just, look how he's pushing through on that tail pad, grinding the board all the way around. It was facing the breaking part of the wave and then he's able to readjust the, the positioning. Gets a nice clean fan off the top here, directs down the line, quick transition to that final turn. And Zeke looking really steady, really sure-footed, but have a go at this on the backhand here. Yago Dora just blasts that first turn straight up into the second again. And you can tell it's a different approach by these goofy footers. They can just square up, like you said, square up, straight off the bottom, right up into the lip. And on the forehand, it always encourages you to get out on the open face to slice a bit more to carve. But these backhanders, it's just in that last top third of the wave, they can really stab it up there. Now, there's been some great backhand surfing in, in the contest already. But for me personally, there's been a, just a, a, a little bit too much reward for some pretty pedestrian kind of backhand hits. And, and that first turn that Yago did then, Kaipo, just displaced so much water. That was Yago in full flight. Yeah, not only was it the water displacement and the power, Ronnie, it was the fact that Yago got upside down. Like, he had his head pretty much below his feet on the, at the apex of those turns. So just upside down, inverted, two times coming through there, and, you know, gets that wave in an under-priority position. So well done by Yago Dora. Yeah, great positioning. Mad hustle to get that ride to begin with, but to make it count in, in the first half of the heat, you know, that's just such a massive advantage going into the rest of his battle here with Nat Young. Yeah, getting started early, right? You don't want to leave these overlapping heats to the priority part. And, you know, because you end up with just a 20 minute heat. And we've seen that over and over again. You know, if you don't get busy in the non priority part of your heat, then you're just left with a 20 minute heat to make things happen. Well, Kaipo, we've just seen the number drop here for Yago, and it is a nine. So, really well rewarded. You were uh, spot on. I love the way you turned that, that first turn upside down. Yeah, good surfing. Beautiful conditions out here. A little bit of puff, maybe oh, the wind getting a little bit from the north, but pretty much calm, glassy, dreamy. Oh, man, we, uh, we envy you today and uh, probably won't be the case <laughs> when, the, when the weather kicks in here over the next couple of days. But what a, a start to, for Yago Dora. And we kind of made the point, Rich, in some of his earlier performances, he was scoring pretty well. We were like, each of these competitors knows, you know, what level they want to reach and what they're capable of. And, and there was no way he was surfing to his full potential in the early rounds uh, of the event or the first round, I should say. But that was, you know, spot on. That was just such a, a well-timed hit. And, uh, man, a really deserving nine-point ride. Yeah, let's have a look at it again. You can see here just, you know, it, you can't help but, but just appreciate what he's doing here simply by the emotions that it, it stirs up inside you when you're watching this kind of surfing. It, it makes you move, like you said. It makes you get on the edge of your feet here. I love how he just sort of feels the, the face of the wave on the backhand turn. And then uh, it, you've got to remember, too, these goofy footers, there's a moment of blindness when they actually look up into the lip and then they start turning. He's coiling up again here, Yago. Wow! Throws his board up there so late. That wave was actually already impacting the, the flats. And Yago somehow got his little hiking boots out and, and climbed that section. Super impressive. Uh, just reserving his fins there, preserving, I should say, and, and make his way across that rock shelf. That's going to be a nice little backup number to go with the nine. Let's see what Conor O'Leary can do on the back end now. Whoa, almost bogs down a little bit through the 
pocket of the wave, but recovers. Oh. He's got a 6.83 is his highest scoring ride. He's trying to get a rid of a 6.67 here to, to get the jump on a Ezekiel Lau. This is two of the most informed goofy footers on the tour right now, just going wave for wave. And uh, great to see Connor O'Leary just answer back. Uh, if something will keep the score down on this ride, it'll be the second turn because the first one had so much spice on it. The second one, you could see there, just the, the wave wobbled out on him. There was a bit of a wobble to it. And that uh, sort of upset his line on the bottom turn. He got a little bit stuck, but that first turn there actually went to 12 o'clock. Uh, look at the fan of spray. Get out of the way, drone, so we can see this clearly. And you can see there just a little warble, but Jizzy did well to kind of disguise it and make up for it. Just super compressed over the front of his board. Now he lets it fall under him. Very similar approach, Ron, how these guys open up the wings on the bottom turn. And it's this front hand. Watch it sort of see how it, it touches the face of the wave, but more down the line this one for um oh, for yago and that was an impossible possible section he had no business climbing up onto the roof of that thing seemingly impossible he somehow got it up there and brought it back down that was you know a committed desperate hit there but we know that uh, felicity palmatier is absolutely lit up at the moment because uh flick three goofy footers out there uh, and that's what you really want to see let's be honest <laughs> yeah you know it I absolutely love to see goofies going to town on the right out here and uh, I've been doing a little bit of digging around on the stairs and I actually got a moment to talk to dog who is Connor's coach and yeah he gave me three little nuggets that he said to Connor before he went out and one of them was uh, less is more especially for the goofy footers wave selection and put pressure on Zeke. Zeke is already feeling the pressure of the cut and uh, sit close to him, put that pressure on him. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And uh, yeah, I guess Connor's feeling safe. He's already made that cut. So uh, yeah, there you go. He's gonna be putting that pressure on Zeke. Yeah, that's uh, that's gonna be crucial here as we see the uh, Oakberry surf conditions. Uh, you said that, that Champagne Hour is gonna be about around 10 a.m. flick. It, it feels like it's rolling on into the afternoon. Yeah, that's right. So the Oakberry surf conditions right now, I mean, it's still light winds. We're seeing like 8 to 12 foot faces. Uh, we've got, it's about 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Don't know what that converts to in degrees. And uh, yeah, we're seeing a light wind out of the northwest. It's hard to see on the broadcast, but um, down on the stairs, you can really see it. So um, that might be playing into the athletes' minds a bit. Yeah, hey, Flick, uh, just another quick question. H how's the vibe down there on the stairs? Because we know this is just a, such a critical round in the scheme of things. The, the, the coaches look nervous. How are the surfers looking as they're heading down the stairs? Yeah, look, I mean, coaches are definitely nervous. Um, but at the same time, they're sitting quite close to each other as well. We've got a few people chewing their nails. Uh, and then I just saw uh, Jezza run down for his heat, local boy, West Australian, in the, in the next heat. And I also saw Griff run down as well. That they were looking pretty excited, pretty fired up, and um, I'm pretty sure that uh, Jerome would be really excited to get out there and surf these waves because it is pumping out there. Yeah, Jerry's beaming. He's got his family on hand, his little boy, Kai, and his partner, Simone, uh, uh, right behind him, to ready to watch him take on one of the, the form surfers on the planet. Uh, but this is going to be a, a lot of fun. Watching what unfolds here in the final seven minutes between Conor O'Leary and Zeke Lau. Zeke's place on the CT is on the line right here. We know Conor's sweet. And Conor has uh, just put away uh, another solid score. Didn't go into his top two, though, uh, 6.23. So Zeke right in striking distance, doing great surfing and a real chance uh, at overcoming Conor here. Yeah, he does. And he's got, actually got the highest single ride score uh, of this heat. Here we go, live action with Nat Young. And that second wave, he's got a, a lot of work to do. He needs a two wave title of 16.67. This one's going to get away from him. Oh, it's a buffet of goofy footers out there at the moment, and the sole uh, natural footer, Zeke Lau. Nat right. Young, strong backhand surfer as well. Waiting on the number to come through for Nat. Don't really think it's going to have much of an effect on his chances here. Let's hear from the winner. Of that, that last heat, the current world number one is with Stace. Ciao, Chianka. What a difference 12 months can make, my friend. <laughs> Thank you, Stace. <laughs> you look good in yellow, mate. Thank you. I'm just really happy. 
<laughs> what a difference in emotions. You know, you're, uh, you do wear your heart on your sleeve. We love the way you surf. You put it all on the table. How hard is it to kind of ride all those emotions in, in one compact year? It's hard. It's hard, but I also, I'm also like on a, such a good side of the, the, the life that I've been living, you know, like I'm just really like, I just wake up every day feeling that I have like so much room to improve. So yeah, that's what I'm focusing on, like just living day by day and like growing. Like to shout out your sponsors, Matt Bemrose, Brent Power. They took a chance on you over the last couple of years. It must feel so good to be doing such a good job for them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Brent, it's incredible, and Bemi and Volcom, Volcom and CI has been incredible for me this year, and uh, just really good team and really good people behind my back. It just keeps me confident. How badly do you want to be number one in the world going into the surf ranch? What's it going to do to keep that jersey on you? Um, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a cool thing. You know, I'm just like really trying to get all this momentum and I don't know just growing growing um, day by day I just just really think I can do better uh, and I really think um, the next heat will be better so yeah I'm just like really looking to my very like very next step not looking too much ahead you know I know you like to get barreled you've been getting barreled over here uh, Man, I wish to get more barrel. Uh, maybe some of the box, may, and, but yeah. <laughs> I got better in the heat. My first wave was a little too, but yeah. No, nothing like the box, and the box has been firing all day. Like, it's a lot of emotions. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a lot going on over here. Did you want to say good day back home in uh, Portuguese? Uh, claro, eu quero dizer obrigado a todo mundo no Brasil. Obrigado a todo mundo que tem me apoiado. Eu tô, tô vivendo um momento muito especial da minha vida. É, hoje já está sendo um dia difícil. É uma vitória muito importante para mim. Mas o meu melhor amigo perdeu uma bateria importante. Eu não sei o que vai acontecer no final do dia. E é isso. Tamo junto. Obrigado. Bora, Mar. Thank you, Stace. Man, looking so comfortable. In that leader's jersey, the yellow, it doesn't seem like he's feeling any extra weight. He's dealing with the, the pressures that come with that number one position really beautifully, Rich. Just a, a force at the moment. He really is, and uh, settling into the role quite nicely. And, and we know that it actually weighs heavy on some people, and they automatically go, hang on, I'm at the top here. I'm the leader. I'm, I'm being chased by everyone. And that can add a little bit of pressure, and sometimes people come unwound by that pressure, but he's taken it in his stride, obviously in a really good place. And uh, uh, one of the guys who takes a lot of emphasis on his equipment. Let's dive into the Harvey Norman heat recap here. Connor O'Leary has dropped a couple of great rides in the six point range, high six point range. Looking really switched on, great float to finish this one off. Yeah, really good match up between uh, Connor O'Leary and Ezekiel Lau. These guys are just going wave for wave, turn for turn, but it's the uh, it's the goofy footer who has the slight edge at the moment. I, I, I just feel like it's that vertical attack and the power that he's putting into the turns is the difference at the moment. Zeke's finding some great waves himself, doing some of those big power hacks that we're used to seeing. I guess his trademark move uh, but I feel like the end sections maybe just aren't holding up quite enough for him. So uh, it's almost wave choice would be the only thing really separating these two right now. Zeke leaning into Jake Patterson's knowledge, competitive knowledge once again. Uh, always love it when the coaches have a, a little internal head-to-head -head matchup as well. And two of the best names for surf coaches added at the moment, the dog and the snake. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Richard Dogmarsh and uh, Jake the Snake Patterson. I I've had a, a lot to do with both those guys. Travelled, uh, well, I went on tour my very first year with Richard Marsh. He showed me the ropes and then uh, spent the best part of my career travelling with Jake. And, you know, he, he, was, he was almost our coach among our crew as well. So he loves this role. He does. Yeah, I, I like to ask Rich, uh, different people I'm commentating with, if you had to Here put a go. breed to uh, the dog that is Richard Marsh, what kind of what kind of dog would he be? We'll come back to that. We've got live action here. Zeke Lau's up. And let's see if he can channel his coach, the Serpent, who had a lot of success 
at this venue over the years. Well, dynamic blitz on the final section there, but not sure he's going to ride clear of that white water as Connor just whips that board so quick in transition and then really drives through that second turn, lining up the finish, banking off the foam, stays on his feet, <laughs> celebrates with a fist pump and just under a minute to go here. Likely that one goes into his top two. Oh, what a matchup. This is, uh, this is great surfing here. And you could see Zeke Lau just put everything into that final wave. And then behind him, well, this is, uh, this is the replay of Zeke. Comes off the bottom. Kind of had to really force the issue on that carve. It's a little slippy through this section. There doesn't have that speed to it that we saw on his other waves. Where he was uh, really, you know, projecting down the line, doing the turns with speed. Oh and Jeezy's... Man, that is impressive. I mean, he throws his arms up, but here's the thing that whatever light that uh, Zeke was able to shine on that rod was just completely snuffed out by what Connor did on the wave behind it. Uh, Connor just completely teed off on his one. Watch this first turn here. So squares up, bang, hits the lip with so much authority, and then straight onto the bottom turn again, puts a little uh, release. A little bit of a slide on the second one and then the third one. Just, you know, he knew at that point, I just need to make this wave and I've got a huge score in the bag. Well, the thing that was working in uh, Conor O'Leary's favour is the fact that he had a much better wave. Zeke's rider kind of broke away for a, a moment, sort of detached from the breaking on the, the shallower part of the reef. And, and it just meant that he had to go to sort of more rounded cutbacks. He wasn't able to really attack that lip. So the score's coming through. It's only a 4.17 for Zeke. Not going to be enough. And Conor O'Leary still has another number on the way. Yeah, so I think this one, uh, it, it, we can confidently say uh, Conor O'Leary will progress through, which is, uh, you know, it's it's heartbreaking for Zeke Lau. Uh, but Conor's on some special sort of roll at the moment and uh, just looks so great. Yeah, Zeke, he's going to be uh, extending his trip with the family here in Australia as he sets his sights on the Challenger Series starting at the Boost Mobile Gold Coast Pro. It's only a couple of weeks away. But Conor O'Leary at 7.6 on that last ride. Plenty of highlight moments. And we got plenty more coming your way as we continue to roll through the round of 32 here at the Western Australia Margaret River Pro. Western Australia Margaret River Pro is brought to you by Shire of Augusta Margaret River, strategic partner of the Western Australia Margaret River Pro. By Oakberry, fuel yourself with the official acai of the World Surf League Australia. By Bailey Ladders, official ladder partner of the WSL Australia. And by Healthway, strategic partner of the Western Australia Margaret River Pro. Welcome back to the show. Zeke Lau just digesting that result. It was a crucial heat for him. He needed a big run through the Western Australia Margaret River Pro to, to get himself above that cut line. That run has come to an end. And uh, the, the person who ended that run was Connor O'Leary. Great performance from him, saving his best for last. Heat score total of 14.43 for Connor O'Leary as we get set for another big clash. Griffin Cola Pinto. Well situated at the top end of the CT ranks in fifth position coming into this contest going up against Jerem Forrest. A local tradesman who's finally cracked his spot in the main event after battling away through the trials for almost a decade. 
Here goes Nat Young, looking to get into the mix here. Just gets blasted off his board on the final section. Nat's trying to make up some ground on, on Yago Dora, who just had a, an extremely strong start to his round of 32 heat. Yeah, it's uh, it started with a bang, a nine and a seven six seven for Yago Dora. Nat Young has has uh, been sort of behind, but um, you know that was a, a definite step in the right direction. That last wave of of Nat Young, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's going to be a fantastic ride. Unfortunately, coming unstuck on the final hit. You can see here Nat, another strong goofy footer, just drifts over the lip on that one. It just gets detonated on that final turn. Yeah, uh, an awkward fall at the end. But uh, the thing that's working in Nat's favour is the, the clock. You know, he's still got time to chip away at this hefty combination. I mean, in the first half, half of the heat with no priority, Yago Dora turns in an excellent heat. Uh, so he's in a, a really commanding position at the moment. And Nat's got to, he's got to flare up here. And it's the first goal is to, to break this combination. And he'd love to do it with an excellent score just to make life a little easier in chasing down the lead. Yeah, it's pretty daunting as a, as a, a competitor when your opponent uh, posts a, a decent score. But in this case, you know, Yago Dora has posted two uh, incredibly good waves. One right up in the excellent range, a nine-pointer. And uh, when you look at the average there, you know, the 16.67 total, anything on a 16 is just an excellent overall heat total. So a mountain of climb here. And really, um, you know, he, ne he needs something in that 8.85 just to, just to get into the heat. Only John John Florence in the opening round has applied the same kind of pressure to his rivals here at Western Australia. Western Australia's Margaret River Pro this season. As we see Griffin Cola Pinto up here, Looking at his first ride up against Jerem Forrest. Wants to, to put the pressure on the winner of the trials early. Just looking to be in just never seen before form this year. He's coming off a, a couple of strong years campaigning on the CT, Rich. But, but this year he just looks a, a step ahead. He looks a little bit sharper, a little bit faster. Yeah, there's something going on here. Uh, and you touched on half of it, I feel like. His surfing has, has definitely gone up a notch as we watch the replay here. Some fish just jumping out of the, the face of the wave there. But what a beautiful swooping turn to start things off. And another one cutting back into the power source. So uh, just a series of cutbacks here for, for Griffin just to get his feet in the wax, as we say, and really start feeling the momentum of this heat. But a great bottom turn, holding the rail. See how there's no extra little direction changes he holds that line and now look griff just uh, switches the the direction of the eyes it's following the turn comes out of this one and then already looking to where he's going to position the next cutback and where he's going to start this line great extension in the upper body that helps with the uh, the actual momentum of the turn. I, I feel like Griff's stance is also wide, just ever so slightly, perhaps an inch or two. What that does is just creates uh, a better platform, a more stable platform to work from. And you'll definitely see him uh, just widen it even more if, they, uh, if he does take to the air. Yeah, if he gets that opportunity for... Uh to ramp up, he'll certainly go for it. A couple of CT wins for Griffin Colapinto now, chasing uh, his best ever result here at Margaret River this year to solidify a, a place in that final five. He's been heartbreakingly close to getting into the Rip Curl WSL finals these last couple of seasons. Good event for him to, to really lean into the, the knowledge of his coach, Tom Whitaker. This is where Tom had his best ever competitive uh, finish. It was in a QS event, 2008. He was victorious here at main break. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's, it, you could see that, that Griffin was devastated last year when he didn't make that five. He, he convinced himself he was going to make it. He didn't. And it, and it feels like that that's fueled his fire a lot more. And, and maybe that has something to do with this new look riff that we're seeing here. Yeah, he's a fun character, Kaipo. He's super 
sociable. Uh, he's always engaging, but he can also really just put the blinkers on and enter a, a pretty special zone competitively. Yeah, in the water. I mean, his paddle back out. I've noticed some competitors are very frantic. They're, they're sprinting back out. Uh, Griffin, in contrast, paddling just slowly paced. We know Griffin already, his new uh, approach to heat preparation, meditation. He looks like he's in the zone. Taking off right now, Yago Dora. Let's go. Well, Yago trying to add another excellent score to his tally. Trying to better a 7.67. Just fully climbing up over those, those tricky sections. That one's not going to factor in, though. That's not going to be uh, better than his 7.67, but he switched on. Also limiting Nat Young's opportunities out there. He took the words out of my mouth. I was just about to say what that did was actually uh, steal a score away from Nat Young, and that's the beauty of priority. As we see up and riding, this is live action. Love the cut down there from Griff. And throws everything into the final section can't stick it gets sucked over the falls and ragdolled around in that white water so much push here it's it's not unusual rich We're, we've been opting for south side which is a much <laughs> friendlier break but yeah. occasionally you, you'll duck dive a wave next to someone and just the white water will just grab you and you can end up 30 feet apart yeah it's got so much power uh this ocean here as we see yago tour up and over that was a, uh, a crazy little rock and roll floater there and just gets caught in the lip. But let's see what happened with Griff. So again, under the priority, gets a nice swoopy carve to start off. And this second one right up high in the lip. I almost feel like he didn't overcommit to that final turn because, you know, it could be disaster for your bodies, your ankle, your boards. And he's right there just going, you know what, I, let's just hit the eject button. I'm out of here. Well, he looked pretty committed to me. He just kind of took the, the shock out of the uh, the impact there. But he hit the section hard. He gave it some. Yeah, it was just a little off balance, a little off kilter when he came down. And, and you know, it was going to take a miracle for him to sort of pull that one back together. But I think he's going to have ample opportunity. They've still got so much time on the clock here, 29 minutes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just, you know, at some locations, the water just seems a little harder, a little flatter, and a little bit harder to, to kind of tap into a transition to ride out of those moves certainly the case here at main break yeah yeah totally and and uh you know back to your point about just how much energy is here a lot of the surfers when they're actually paddling back out and they duck dive they will actually open their eyes and look for these plumes of water that are exploding down and you can you can either do one of two things you can try and sort of sneak around them or at least brace yourself for what's to come uh, and sometimes that means a full cuddle on the board you've got to wrap it right around there so you don't lose it well, let's quickly hear from the winner of the last heat, Callum Robson, getting the jump on Jackson Baker. Cal, always hard surfing against a good friend. Mixed emotions in that one. Yeah, for sure. Going into it, I've got to do what I've got to do to make my heat. But um, when it comes down to the end and you're on top and um, your good friends just showing the emotion that, he's, that he showed and he's just upset, it's just heavy, especially with the cut and obviously the implications. It's, um, yeah, it's not nice, but it is what it is at the end of the day. I have some good news to share with you. You have officially made the cut. Well done. Oh, cheers. Got a job for the rest of the year. How good's that? And the next 12 months, I think. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> what do you get up to for the rest of the afternoon here on this beautiful West Australian afternoon? Yeah, I'll just probably just go hang out with my family. I've got my grandma, my auntie, um, mum and dad over here. So just go cruise with them, probably watch some more heats. The waves are pumping. So um, enjoy this beautiful day and, um, yeah, just have a relaxing day. Cheers. Good on you, Cal. Thank you. Strong performance from uh, Callum Robson, who has confirmed his place on the CT for the back half of this season. So really, uh, really backing up what was a, an incredible rookie year, Rich, with a, another strong performance through a, a few of the events in these first five stops. Solid, so solid in the approach. Here we go on the outside. Jaron Forrest, nice bottom turn there. The wave kind of backing off on him just a, a little bit. He wants to really keep pace with Griffin Colapinto, who hasn't sort of extended his lead too much. Just there in his failure to land that last big hit on his previous ride. 
Jerem's going to need to ramp things up here. He's going to need to ramp things up, and he doesn't want to get too far away from Griffin. He wants to stay with him here because uh, if Griffin keeps chipping away uh, under the priority, uh, you know, you can just bet your bottom dollar that when it comes time for their priority rotation, Griff's going to really settle into some of these sets and put some big numbers on the board. Time's running out for, for Nat Young here. This was during the interview with Callum Robson. He needs, a, needs to break this combination now, Rich. Yeah, he really does. Let's see if he can do it on this wave. Uh, gets the hit through the inside, hits the eject button. Just knew he was way too late for that final section. And uh, well, this is a wild card up on his backhand. Some nice big swooping turns. And uh, you can see really strong in the thighs. They breed them thick over here, mate. We've seen uh, some surfers get absolutely slapped down by that final section. Even Nat Young there he tried to eject, but he still had his seatbelt on and uh, just got swamped by the thing. It's all part of it. It's not unusual here to, to be halfway through dinner and just have half the ocean fall out of your nose. <laughs> it's the, uh, the big sinus flush out, the southwest flush out, the sinus cleaners. Five minutes to go here, and uh, our heat holding priority out there in the lineup. It's just been dominated by Yago Dora. This is going to be a really fun Harvey Norman heat recap. Oh, have a go at this. is uh, really a display of what's possible on your backhand here at Margaret River main break. Yago Dora just uh, sizzling through these turns, getting so vertical and just, man, just coming out with so much acceleration and speed, just keeping it on the pedal the whole way down the line here. Every single move is critical, right on the edge of what's possible. And now we see the great, the go. Oh my God. Kelly Slater. He's still got it. Slater mania is still alive and well. And Kelly, he, he was getting these kind of reactions, Rich, when, when you were traveling with him on tour and nothing's changed. Look, it's even, it's kind of a fan moment for all the surfers too. We'll get back to that. Here goes Yago again. He's got a, a real comfort level, a, a love of this part of the world. This is where uh, we saw turning point performances for him in his career during the 2021, that shortened season. He just started to look like he was, he was finding his best surfing with the jersey on. And since then, he's been a force. Uh, he really has. And, uh, you know, he, he's fast becoming uh, one of the equal strongest goofy footers on the tour. Uh, with backhand performances like this, you've got to start thinking, man, he could he could get a victory here. Only 26 years of age, too. Uh, really kind of came on late as a competitor. When you, you think about his contemporaries, he was more regarded as a, a free surfer uh, from Brazil. And he'd spend long stints uh, on the North Shore and, and really focus on pipe. But once he sort of tapped into his competitive mindset, you know, we saw this sort of animal come to life. He's just been on fire. As we see now, the winner of the trials, Jerem Forrest, wanting to stay in this heat. He had a 4.33 on his first wave. So he is maintaining pace somewhat with Griffin Colapinto, but that wave's not going to work in his favor at all. Yeah, so no major scores on the board yet for the Colapinto. Uh, Jerem Forrest heat yet, but uh, you know, there's some great sets approaching. Yago Dora's not been past this round at Margaret River ever before. You know, his big result that I was talking about uh, back in 2021 was actually over at Wajamup on Rotness for the event there. But here we go, Nat Young. Can he break this combination? We just saw Yago put on another excellent number. So Nat has a lot of work to do here. And he's just falling apart at this stage. On the outside, Griffin Colapinto up. The best he's served up so far is just a five. So certainly has given Jerem Forrest an opportunity Gosh. here, but this is going to help his cause. A tricky section to read, and he does well to stay on his feet. And here we go. Forrest up at the moment. And this one's going to get away from him. Yeah, just a single turn there. But have a look at the, the set rolling through. And uh, Felicity Palmatier, she called it. There's, ever, there's going to be these rogue ones that come through throughout the day. So these sets are in the sort of in, in the order of eight, maybe 10 feet. So we see our uh, co-commentator, Kaipo Guerrero, just getting out of the way there on the ski. Yeah, there's some energy out there at the moment. 
Yago Dora has been tapping into it. One of the, the most impressive heat score totals that we've seen in the contest this year. A nine to kick things off. His last ride was an eight, Nat Young. You know, a whole lot of pressure on Nat here. He had a better pace to this wave, Nat Young, I, I felt like. And these first two turns were looking really good. And it just maybe just overcooked it. And then outside, Griffin on a nice, tall-looking wave here. And uh, the face just backs off a little bit on that one. So Griff's got to go to these cutbacks. But then this final turn had pocketed out. And uh, Griff just launching off the lip. And then Jerome on this uh, one behind here on the backhand. I like the first turn. Really critical. Committed under the lip, but uh, the wave just walled out. So uh, plenty of rides for the judges to, uh, to lock in here. But uh, 30 seconds to go, Ron, and then we'll be seeing the GOAT. Big story unfolding here at the moment with those surfers that came into this event. Stop five, the cut looming in equal 21st position. Sammy Pupo out of the mix. Jackson Baker is out of the mix. And also we're uh, seeing Nat Young who's also sitting in that equal 21st position in danger of falling out of the comp here. Uh, and it's obviously very likely seeing though he's chasing two rides. So... You know, that, that means that the task for those surfers just below the cut line, you know, it's a, a little bit more within reach now. Just that getting yourself through a couple of heats could mean that you're, you're getting above that cut line. Absolutely. And there's one man who, who could break that four-way tie there, and that's Liam O'Brien. And, uh, well, he's coming up, up, uh, up against the greatest we've ever seen. And it's a big heat for Kelly Slater. If he can get himself into the round of 16, he'll be overtaking. The likes of Nat Young, uh, Sammy Pupo and Jackson Baker uh, on the points tally and getting himself above the cut line momentarily. Obviously, we've got a lot more of this uh, event to watch play out. But that was a great heat for Yago Dora. Unbelievable surfing. Up next, Liam O'Brien, Kelly Slater will hit the lineup. We're going to bring in Joe and Bugs for the call. I'm Kelly Slater. I committed my life to this, you know, all of this. There is so much pressure now. It's really do or die. He's not coming here to participate. He's coming here to win. Her career is at stake. You want to perform in the big stage? This is the biggest stage you can have. Oh, my goodness. This is sport history. Make or break season two on Apple TV Plus. You can enjoy a behind the scenes look at the best athletes in the world competing in the title race. And it's quite a show, especially the first episode that features Kelly Slater through his 56th victory as we watch him live. The 51 year old completes that big first turn. Down the line, a huge carve releases the fins, but a lot of power and control from the 11 time world champion. He's just entered the lineup to take on Liam O'Brien. And looks like Liam's found himself an answer. First turn, solid. Can he match Kelly on the opening exchange? Setting up his bottom turn and exploding with an exciting finish. A fair back and forth. Kelly first, then Liam O'Brien. Felicity, take it away. Yeah, straight up into the lip. I love that approach from Kelly Slater. And slicing into that second section. I can't believe the wrap he, and torque he got just to bring that board around. I mean, beautiful first turn there. And uh, 
He regains quickly and then just goes straight back up into this carving turn. And he almost can see that this wave is a little bit fatter, so he knows he can bring it around, and he does. <laughs> Brilliant finish. All the fins exposed there, but always looked like he had control. And Bugs on the comparison with Liam O'Brien. Yeah, Liam, uh, another medium-sized wave, and he has to race this one section. But he, he gets a pretty slick finish too, Joe. Not quite as committed, I feel, as, as Kelly's. Kelly's was the, probably the most committed rap I've seen today. As we slow that individual maneuver down, his timing brilliant, Felicity. Yeah, and I think we saw with Liam yesterday too, I, know, I mean, he scored that nine point ride and his timing was impeccable on that one. And we're kind of just seeing that fo flow through into this heat there. And that nine point ride from yesterday had a similar finish to this turn here. Just so much finesse on the tail as he finishes. Solid back to back. Kelly wins the opening exchange 617 to a 5.17. And remember, Liam O'Brien entered this stop number five in a tie break type of situation, but everyone he's been tied with has been knocked out of the contest. So he's got a big opportunity here, sitting 21st in the world. But he does have his hands full with the goat. And Kelly in a must win situation further back behind Liam O'Brien. It's hard to even think that we could be calling his last heat full time competitively on the championship tour when you talk about Kelly Slater needing a result to make the midseason cut. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely uncharted waters. We are here. It's a, a historic heat. The young line against the all time greatest. And you, you've got a feeling that the 617 and 517 won't be there in the end. <laughs> Yeah, just getting started with all the time that they have on the clock, 40 minutes to enjoy this lineup for Liam, an opportunity to battle with the greatest to ever do it as we focus on this insane career that goes with Kelly Slater. Every record to his name, most CT wins. He got past Tom Kern at Bells for that record back in 06 and kept on going. The 56th title was at Pipeline. Got his eighth title at Pipe. He's got that record. 11-time world champ, that 11th title was back in 2011. He actually clinched early, well before the season finale, which was pipe back then, when the celebration began in San Francisco. Triple crown a few times, won the Eddie Cow event back in 2002. The man that broke all odds coming from Cocoa Beach, Florida, became a big wave surfer and the most well-rounded athlete for a few decades and looks like he wants more. Solid bottom turn. There's a vertical climb. He's done that a few times out here at main break and a little bit deep, so he's got to get out of there. So a short ride there for Kelly. For you, Felicity, is he showing any signs of age? I mean, with a brilliant start against Liam O'Brien. No, I don't see it at all. If anything, I just see him more fired up than what I ever have this year. And it's exciting to see. I mean, that for that term we just saw then, uh, I had shades of yesterday when I don't even know what kind of uh, time it was that he was hitting that lip. But yesterday we saw him do this turn where it was about 1.30. He hit that lip at 1.30. You know, usually we say 12 <laughs> o'clock, which means straight up. But he went past 12. And that turn then, that reminded me of that. As we watch the priority heat, Griffin Colapinto from San Clemente greases the first section. Wide open face. There's a cool looking wrap. Colapinto whips it. And looking to stay on his feet. Nice clean finishing move as he still has his hands full with the trials champ, Jerem Forrest. Griffin's been putting in a lot of time in his warm up sessions. He bounced off the tabletop shelf in a free surf, and his coach Tommy Whitaker's like, okay, something happened there. He never comes in this early. But Tommy was just making sure his board was okay. Nice clean and redirect off the top from O'Brien. Throwing a lot of water, making it look smooth, and he will ride away. O'Brien just got a lead change over Kelly Slater. And now going for the carving three. Kelly, famous for that maneuver. Not every surfer has that in their repertoire, and he's gotten a perfect 10 for that in the past. Jerem Forrest trying to find his feet off the top. Unfortunately, it looked out of control once he got to the lip as he's still chasing Griffin Colapinto at this stage, Bugs. Yeah, it's a big chase, too, because Griffin, you know, 
for sure just uh, added to his score with that ride. It was way better than a five. It, super strong. He's really asserting himself now. Colapinto, most definitely one of the most improved surfers this year. He's just come out charging. He looks like he's just really confident. First connection was perfect, Felicity. Yeah, straight into that second carving maneuver and uh, just looking really polished and really smooth, I think. And yeah, I've just got to echo what you said, Bugs. He looks like he's, yeah, he's improved um, since last year. And here we're seeing a replay of Liam's wave. And I really like this wave. It was really smooth, controlled, and uh, he got straight back up into the lip really quickly for that finishing turn there. You're really lucky to have a wave like this in your backyard. <laughs> yeah, so lucky. I mean, look how, look how deep he gets on his bottom turn there and just arcing through that section. It's just mastery. Yeah, this is a pretty steep wave, Joe. And as, as Flick said, he'd be able to come square off the bottom. Kind of nearly look like a bit like Burley this wave. <laughs> Certainly, his home break, beautiful right hand point break. And his connection with Flo is brilliant. You see the best surfers in the world when they're given a world-class wave with size and power. You can see them just take a little bit of a break. They don't have to rush anything. They know how to really put on a show, making it look so easy. Kelly going for this carving three. Just gave me a flashback of a lot of the versions that he's thrown down in his career, Bugs. <laughs> well, the, the carving three was a, a fantasy move for us on a single fin. It really was. And Kelly Slater, when Kelly Slater did a carving three, in such dynamic style. That is the day we went, there is a new world upon us. <laughs> <laughs> I it, remember one at the US Open in Huntington Beach, it was pumping, like real big for Huntington. And he did just that one single maneuver, but it was giant. He got a 10 for that. Everyone lost it on the pier. Yeah, wow. I mean, I've tried it and it's really hard. So hat goes off to Kelly and yeah, he really is the master of that carving three. Yeah, you don't see it very often. Really cool. There was one clip at Lowers where we saw Tori Meister and Kelly do them back to back on a right. As we see Kelly up again, throwing the fins off the top. He'll kind of re-engage with the wall here, lays down that rail, a full roundhouse with a big rebound. That's just that classic move that's been around for a long time. He's been featuring it at main break the last couple of days. Let's uh, get into the numbers though, Felicity, Liam, 7.33 on that last wave. Excuse me, 7.83. So Kelly's got some work to do here. Yeah, he definitely does. And uh, yeah, that first turn, he's really loving it, taking it past 12 o'clock. And I really love the way he does that turn. He really emphasis, uh, it puts emphasis on his, uh, re like the carving re-entry on his backhand as he hits that section. I mean. You know, a lot of people do those uh, those carving cutbacks, but no one does it quite like Kelly. And here we go. Look at this first turn here. Just absolute mastery. 12.15. 12.15. What time is it? Everyone always references the clock when you see the vertical motion of the board off the lip. And what a classic turn that's been around for a long time, Bugs. Well, ah. you'd know, say Kelly wow. Slater and Joel Parkinson were the two masters of that turn. Would they, t would they actually score points on them? Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. The roundhouse cutback, you know, it's sort of a transitional move, but these guys have changed it into an actual scoring move. You know, the, the way Kelly came up and hit that rebounding section, like we're not seeing other guys do that out here, and it really is impressive, and you're right. I mean, another guy that does come to mind is Joel, and both of those surfers really have it on tap. And um, totally unappreciated there with a 4.67. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice to watch. It really is. You always uh, hear a reaction when you see a roundhouse like that. It's like you miss that type of turn. And when it's done well, like the way Kelly does it, he could do it with power and authority with an aggressive rebound. At the moment, he needs a 6.84 to catch up to Liam O'Brien as we flash back in history with Kelly Slater. First title was in 92, and this is a, a great example of the errors that he's crossed. Uh, his runner-up in the title race that first year was Damian Hardman. And then when he won his second title in 94, it was Shane Powell who was runner-up. Then into Rob Machado, Shane Beshin, Mark Ocalupo, who just had the hair to cheat with Tom Curran. So all those names, you know, from a different time, and he's still on tour today. Yeah, it's an amazing uh, history. It's a, it's a history of two parts. It's, it's, it is definitely like the Michael Jordan story of surfing. Liam O'Brien, though, still controlling this heat, setting up a nice rapid cutback. Pushing hard off the bottom, vertical with the fins out. 
for a healthy combination of turns. He is unaffected by having the goat in this matchup. Kelly now trying to force the wrap. Nothing happening there. He's got to get out of there. And meanwhile, Liam O'Brien could be improving on his 5-1-7. Yeah, look, I think, I think it's going to go close. That uh, It was a two-term wave of Liam's, and he did go... It was a dynamic last term, but he did get ever so slightly hung up in the lip, and it's going to be interesting to see whether or not the judges take that into consideration. Just uh, really impressed with the amount of waves ridden from the non-priority side of the seat bugs. Yeah, they got busy and it really came down to, well, this wave here is, uh, as uh, Felicity said, it's just two big moves. But this second one, a powerhouse, a very difficult maneuver to pull off. He had to just burst his way through that white water. This is a, a pretty extraordinary ride for being a, a two maneuver wave. I really enjoyed it. I might have got a little carried away, but the vertical and then the blow tail, super compact and stayed centered over his board. Liam, such a treat to watch on any venue on tour as we see Cola Pinto with the fade. Wow. Hitting it hard off the oncoming section. Rapid cutback again. Can he shut it down? He will just style his way <laughs> through. Fair enough. That thing was going going down quickly. Yeah, that was a hard section to approach and uh, probably a little bit annoyed, you know, probably looking for that end section being like, come on, give me something, you know? <laughs> the judges are really deliberating on that, Liam O'Brien. You know, it, I know it probably won't be able to see it on the replay and that, but if we go, if we did go back to the, the second uh, exchange here when Kelly and uh, Liam were both paddling for a wave and it looked like Liam was going to go at the last minute, Kelly very casual took it. It actually changed the momentum because it put Liam in the in the good priority momentum to get that seven eight three. And Kelly's wave, you know, we really didn't turn out to be much. Oh, great, great, great eye there, Bugs. It's those little things in between sets and just the nature of Kelly Slater and how he tries to compete. Liam O'Brien getting a nice little rhythm against the goat. Kelly chasing at least a six eight four, but we're still standing by for last of. Liam O'Brien. We were talking about the 90s era and the rivals he had in the title race. He took a break a few years off, and when he came back, he had a new rival named Andy Irons. Andy went three straight, and then Kelly came back. Andy was runner-up the following seasons. So 05, 06, Kelly started adding world titles again, creating one of the best rivalries we've ever seen in pro surfing. No doubt about it. I mean, that first time, as we spoke about it yesterday, Kelly, he won his first world title at 20. Uh, next year, Derek Ho won the world title. And then Kelly did five in a row to eclipse Mark Richards, four in a row. Then he took three years off. Uh, in those three years, though, he, he made a couple of guest appearances and won Chopu. And, you know, he was still not too far away. That's true. He still was entering events that he wanted to be a part of, which was really exciting for that era of his career. Connor O'Leary looked inspired, took a big win. He's hanging out with Stace. Connor, strong performance. Well done. Yeah, thanks, Stace. Made a few mistakes, but, um, you know, we can uh, pick them up and roll them into round of 16. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. How quickly does your focus go from making the cut to, hang on a minute, like I can go deep inside the top 10 here? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I got ninth last year, and um, I guess that gave me a lot of belief to, to be able to, you know, crack into the, the final days consistently. And, um, yeah, the last two events I made the quarters. So, yeah, there's no shortage of, of confidence in me thinking that, you know, I can make the final day over and over again. So, yeah, just kind of sticking to that mentality of surfing how I want to surf and, um, yeah, trying to play heat strategically. <laughs> Working good so far. Did you want to give a quick word in Japanese? Yeah. Um, Nihon no Thanks, Connor. That was wonderful. Connor O'Leary looked incredibly strong. Remember, that backhand just took out Ezekiel Lau. And unfortunately for Zeke, he's got to deal with the Challenger Series again. But Connor's just been heating up. He's been there before, fallen off tour, requalifying, and definitely having his strongest start so far this season on the championship tour. Looking at, we're down to two minutes with Jerem Forrest, the goofy foot wild card that's a tradesman. Finally winning the trials as he's 33 years of age. So happy to represent this region of Margaret River. 
But as we watch the Harvey Norman recap, it's been the Cola Pinto show with that big 7.5 Felicity. Yeah, I'm absolutely loving what I'm seeing from Griff. He just looks so polished and just slicing into the Margaret River on that right hander and just a lot of flow between his turns, variety and yeah, I'm, I'm loving what I'm seeing from Griff surfing. Such a fun athlete to watch. He's missed out on the title showdown. It lowers the last two consecutive seasons by about a spot. Trying to turn that around. This is Jerem Forrest using a lot of the open face. A couple of backhand carves. He needs something real meaty down the line. Set up work. Here comes the lip section. He'll end Ooh. up going down right on the rock shelf. And Cola Pinto's on the wave behind him. Little aggressive rebound on the mid face. Just feeling his way through his points and capitalizing on a big moment off the top, but he can't hang on. The challenge of the end section continues here at main break. That's a repeat story every single year, Bucks. Yeah, I really feel that Griffin surfed so within himself on that wave. He wasn't going beyond the lip. Even that last move, he, he, he let it go. He, he didn't need to, to pull it off. I just felt that it was not a victory lap, but he, he just served very conservatively. Just taking it nice and easy. He understands the game. He checks out the Apple Watch, and he was familiar with the situation, which is nice for him. He knew Forrest needs a big number of a 984. It looks like he's checking his ankle there. It looks like a bit of blood on his ankle. Checking his hoof. Kind of looks like he might be in a little bit of pain, too. So maybe, maybe he either did go down there or... He went easy on that wave from a prior. Yeah, we'll see what happened with Griffin. He's still checking that foot. And man, I saw him yesterday. He was he was already pretty banged up from surfing the box in a free surf and also that end section. But he's built tough. Cola Pinto, 7-5 and a 6.67. Eliminates the trials champ, Jerem Forrest, and gets a spot into the round of 16. Well done for the California moving on to the next round. We'll take a Bon Soy brew break. More with Kelly Slater and Liam O'Brien right after this. Margaret River is a beautiful part of the world. It really feels like you're out amongst it when you're here. The wineries are great, the food's really good. I like to golf, the beaches are amazing. Each year before I get here, I welcome that challenge. I started out kind of slow in this event. It feels to me like I'm building a little bit and you just have to pick it better than the other person you're surfing against. And the coastline's amazing. There's so many headlands here. It would be a great place to have a helicopter. You could just go check all the spots each day. You could go for some hikes and get some of those beaches. Margaret River it sticks out and captures a lot of swell, and there's a whole variety of different ways to surf from big waves to small waves. Uh, there's some great waves, mostly reef breaks, but a few beach breaks as well. Pretty much any wind condition, you'll find something that you can ride. Here you feel like you have some space to breathe. Just a beautiful place to be, and we look forward to coming back here every year. Kelly Slater always enjoying his time when he comes to Margaret River as he's in position now to try to come back against Liam O'Brien. Kelly needed to make this heat to make the cut as he snaps over the foam on the first section. Stretches it out with the roundhouse again. Needing something solid here. Late climb, and that bounces him off. So he's in a little bit of trouble against Liam O'Brien. 
important one as well for Liam being 21st in the world, but Kelly's the one that's in the must win situation to get over to the surf ranch and beyond. One more look here, Flick. Yeah, I really like the start of this wave. It was a really nice first turn, busting the fins through the back of the wave and straight into this roundhouse. It's just pretty unfortunate, this last section here. I mean, he tried to go up early, but the wave was already kind of crashing down. So I don't think he was ever going to really make that move, that last one. Kelly Slater chasing Liam O'Brien, needing to make some heat today. Has to get out of the round of 32 and move on to the round of 16. It's been a long time for Kelly since he made the final series out here. 2015 was the last time he made the quarters at main break. He had a semifinal before that. As we have a brand new heat just getting started and then non-priority heat, Kiowi Belly versus Baron Mamiya. Baron equal with Kelly on the ranking, so he can't lose at this stage. And Kiowi Belly is still having the time of his life on tour, Bucks. He sure is. He's having a great year. He's had a bit of a rough start to this event. He had to go all the way back into the uh, elimination round. But he's back and he's where he likes to be in the, the knockout. Exactly. Kiowa Belly, just a quick warm up wave. I was really impressed with Liam and Kelly when they're non priority. They took a lot of the attention. And we'll see last of Liam O'Brien here, Flick. Yeah, absolutely love that first turn straight up into the lip for that second tail release and uh, finishes so smoothly. Just love to see it. Yeah, if there's if there's one point of difference, it's it's the second turn of Liam. Kelly's waves have not allowed him this section here. Liam's been able to do three complete maneuvers, full blooded maneuvers. Kelly's been doing roundhouse cutties. Such a great call, Bugs. Liam able to go vertical, and he's going to be rewarded for it as he shuts that one down a 7.7783. Kelly needs a 9.36 to take the lead under pressure. 14 and a half on the clock. Let's now hear from Yago Dora with Stace. Yago, a career best performance here at Margaret River, finally breaking into that round of 16. Yeah, yeah, it's good to have a good heat out here. Uh, I've struggled in this, in this place in the past, but uh, I've, I have worked a lot on my surfing and I've, I feel like I'm in a different place right now than, than the last time I came here. So yeah, I feel confident and, and ready to keep going. What do you think the biggest thing you've worked on is? My backhand, of course. Uh, uh, as a kid, I, I surfed frontside a lot and, and coming on tour, uh, we, don't, we don't get to go laugh much. So I, I had to step it up on my backhand and that's what I've been doing this past two years and it's been paying out. Well done and we'll see you in the round of 16. Thanks, Yago. Stays caught up with Yago earlier today, right after that win that he had over Nat Young. Remember, Nat was tied with Liam O'Brien. Now he's got to wait to see his destiny for the rest of the season. Kayo now kicking out as he's in the heat with Baron Mamiya. As we have now 13.20 on the clock to see if Kelly can really produce a change of momentum in this heat. Liam's been looking real comfy and just cruisy, picking out the better waves as we see what Kelly just did, Bucks. Yeah, Kelly's got a, a wave here again. He starts beautifully, comes around the section. He's the second section for the world champ, 11 time world champ. And this wave doesn't have an ending to it. He kind of needs one, I feel, to get up in that seven range. It, it peters out. Two slick moves. He, uh, oh, he needs a massive score, he needs a 936. He really probably needs about a, a, at least a 7 or a 7.5 to get back in this match. He certainly does. Kelly trying to find his flow. He's been real active, catching six waves so far. His best is opener at the 6.17 where he let go two big turns. So he's probably feeling that. He's got the tempo and the rhythm of the scale. He just needs the wave, kind of like Liam's wave where he's got a big wall that stands up from start to finish. He's had some rivalries over the years with basically everybody. His last few world titles were B. Dervidge, Jordy Smith was runner up in 2010. That's when Kelly clinched at the search event in Puerto Rico. And then Parco was runner up in the world in 2011. And that's when Kelly won his last world title when he was 39. That's a record. He's uh, the youngest world champ on the men's side and also the oldest to wow. ever do it. Wow. 
think he won his w first world title the year I was born. That's 92, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> and isn't it wild that you can say that with his competitors? So oh. he's won world titles before some of them were even oh, before on the ja planet. Before Jao was born, before Jack was born. It's just insane. <laughs> and he's still so relevant. Numbers starting to drift in from the last ride of Kelly Slater. He's getting in the mix, 7.83. Now needing a 7.7 to take the lead. Well, it did come down to those first two sections. He got him in. I mean, even though that weight petered out the end, I, I do feel it's those first, you know, you've got to get that second bowling section in where he comes square off the bottom. He was able to do that. Yeah, I think that's a really good pickup. And uh, I mean, if that wave would have given him an end section, I mean, that score would have been pushed up. It's almost an excellent score just as it is now. But, I mean, if he would have had that end section to properly finish it off, uh, he, you know, looking at an excellent score. Kaipo, this is a crazy moment. You've been watching Kelly closely for his entire career. What's the situation at the moment? Well, I mean, it's a tense situation for Slater, right? He's got the information on the Apple Watch right here. He knows he's got 10 minutes and 35 seconds counting down. He did reduce his deficit. He did reduce his requirement. He needs that 7.7, .7, like you said, Joe, but he can also see that he's in second priority right now. So he's gonna need to do some sneaky work. He's got some time to do it. He's reduced the need. Let's see if the GOAT comes through this one. Thanks so much, Kaipo. When you're a guy like Kelly or world champions, Tom Curran had this to his nature. He could create moments for himself. He needs this moment to happen. Flashing back to a 10-point ride at main break back in 2015. Absolutely incredible. I remember watching this live and just being like, wow, that's probably up there with one of the best barrels I've ever seen at main break, Margaret River. That was unbelievable. Everyone's like, where are we? Are we somewhere <laughs> in Indonesia? Everyone's like, nope. The locals are like, this is main break. But even the locals like Flick reminded us that was a definitely a very special moment in surfing history. Let's see if he can get a 10, but Liam's responding well. Smaller wave there and moving a little bit quicker there, Bugs. Well, kind of surprised that Liam would use his priority on, um, on a smallish wave. He surfed it well. We'll see if he adds to his score, but a very interesting situation now because they've both got seven, eight threes. If Kelly were to get a seven, seven, that would go would be going back to that first exchange and kelly would get the tie break well we've got richie lovett roaming around this beautiful place richie i know a lot of people here at margaret river today showed up just to watch kelly slater compete yeah joe kelly slater, kelly slater mania is in full effect it looks like he might be uh, up and riding now so i'll let you take it through it wrapping turn from kelly great start so far for the goat little setup snap needing more and ends up laying back does not recover very important finishing move he lets go of he can't afford to go down in this seat or he won't make the midseason cut richie lovett still standing by but always great energy whenever he has a chance to watch the 51 year old compete yeah absolutely and i just wanted to uh, you know pay tribute to the to the man that really has been the custodian of professional surfing over the last 30 years 51 years of age he's still inspiring us you know has the performance levels uh dropped over the last 10 years well you know you can argue that section you can argue that uh comment maybe not i don't think so you know there's not much change between 40 and 50 from what i can see uh but it's certainly inspired so many people uh, to really further the sport. When he came on the tour, he was clearly the best. Uh, the point to note here is that everyone else has risen. They've come up to his level. Uh, one thing's for sure, Joe, if I had to put my life on the line, if I had to send someone into battle uh, for me at places like Chopu and Pipeline, it would still be Kelly Slater right here today at 51 years of age. For me, he still surpasses anyone in those, uh, you know, those really critical realms and those gnarly waves. So uh, all tribute to the 51 year old the greatest of all time to ever do it and will never be matched richie love it wow you had to compete against kelly during his dominant era where he was winning almost every event on the calendar what was it like to have to try to believe that you could take him down when he was truly unstoppable uh, uh, joe it was almost an impossible mountain to climb and one that i never did i had several matches with kelly and i never beat him so uh you know that that's how good he was um you know and uh, he really was inspirational and, and you would never want to miss a heat because 
because, you know, he was the guy that we looked to to go, OK, well, where are we got to go? What's our level that we need to get to uh, in order to try and match and compete with this man? He was that dominant. Uh, and the 11 world titles, well, that speaks volumes, doesn't it? Yeah, it certainly does. Thank you so much, Richie. Love it. Ra Wayne Rabbit, Bartholomew, I bet you have a lot of memories flooding in your mind of just special surfs that you've had with Kelly over the years. Yeah, we, we went on a lot of great trips together. A couple here up in the northwest of uh, Western Australia stand out as um, absolutely epic, epic trips. You know, two weeks of surfing together, you know, very special. As you look at the CT event wins, 56, and look at the spread, Tom Curran with 32, Tommy Carroll, 25, Fanning moving on with three world titles in 22. It's such a gigantic spread with, when you compare the grades, completely timeless. And I was always kept us on our toes, guessing what he was going to do next. And I, you know, knowing his sense of humor, I think he, he likes it that way. Yeah, I, I get the sense that he enjoys it. He enjoys knowing that we have no idea what's coming next. And that's part of the reason why we love it, too. I mean, he's just, he is unpredictable. We can't really guess his next move. And yeah, I mean, I've certainly loved watching it over my time that I've been involved with surfing. And that's why at this moment in time, you know, say this clock runs out, we're still not sure what his next step will be. So we're still waiting with bated breath to see <laughs> what he might be doing at this stage of his career. As we enjoy this Harvey Norman recap, Liam O'Brien versus Callie Slater. This one got going very quickly, Bucks. Well, this is a wave here that really set Liam apart because he came square off the bottom. The waves turns into a three powerhouse maneuvers for a 7-8-3. Here's his back up, a 7-7. Seven, seven. It's put him well in the lead. Look how square he's been able to come off the bottom of these waves. This kid has got a, a big game click. Yeah, I've been absolutely loving watching him surf, and uh, here we go. We've got Kelly. I mean, I've loved watching him during this heat. Um, he started off with that 6-1-7, uh, but he's come firing back with that 7-8-3, and he's right in the mix now, only needing a 7.7 .7 to get back into that first position. Now with 4.45 to go, we'll see Kaiwi Belly in the non-priority heat going straight up. Great connection there on a smaller wave. A lot of foam in the face. But he still be able to track into the pocket. And just a little tap to shut it down. Well, Joe, four and a half minutes remaining. We're in the yellow flag. Are we in the yellow flag of the greatest career in the history of surfing? Or what does the future hold? You feeling OK, Felicity? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, biting my nails in this chair right now. I mean, we, we don't know. I mean, but he is Kelly Slater, and he has pulled it out of the bag many a times before. He does only need a 7.7. .7. We've seen him get 10s out here before. We know it's doable. It's just whether or not the time's going to be on his side and whether or not the ocean's going to be on his side. When he was knocked out at Bells, he did start telling us about the injuries that he's kept quiet this season. And he's been trying to surf through some pain, trying to provide himself with some special moments. And at the moment, he still needs a 7.7, .7, so well within his range. Oh, he got, I think he got Liam onto this wave. And Liam taking it. So that'll give Kelly priority. Not much for O'Brien, smaller section, and uh, that's the mastery of Kelly. Yeah, there was one last piece of mastery for this heat because he definitely sold that wave to Liam and Liam's going to get about a two and a half point ride but it's what is out there for the Kelly Slater with priority flick three and a quarter minutes remaining you've been out in these breaks many times when you're sitting out there can you see the sets coming look you can't you can sort of see the sets coming but a good indicator for the sets is to look to south sides and south sides is the break that just sits just to the south of main break if you can see lumps breaking there first or out to the horizon that's generally a good indicator because the swell sort of wraps around and into the bay you get a bird's eye view you can kind of see it a bit more but south sides actually sticks out more so you generally know that you've got maybe you know maybe 30 seconds up your sleeve before those sets then start to hit main break. That's the telltale sign looking around the corner to south side. All action at main break for Kelly. 2.30 to go with priority. He created that opportunity for himself and when he was emotional with his 56th win, he told us he dedicated his whole life to all this, all the ups and downs. But I think that's something that was just surreal for him even in that 56th win was when moments just create themselves. His relationship with the ocean 
when his back's against the wall in matchups and a wave pops up when he needs it and a performance that sometimes I feel thinks that it's beyond him. It's that, that special relationship and rhythm that he's had with the World Tour. Let's see if he can turn it on now. Kayo throwing down a wrapping cutback. Still building his program against Bear Mamiya. Stalling and looking for something big down the line. He connects well with the finish. He's talking about threes and fours as the energy's just starting to grow in the non-party matchup. But now we're down to 90 seconds, Bucks. Well, we're down to 90 seconds, and you've got to think about how special this is for Liam O'Brien to be in this seat. But he's in this seat trying to stay alive and in, in, on the, you know, the, the tour. Yeah, 100%. He's got so much member coming in equal 21st with about four competitors, or three other competitors, him being the fourth. All three of those have been knocked out of the event. Will it be Liam O'Brien who is in the last heat of Kelly Slater's career. This is like a version of Survivor. <laughs> <laughs> Whose torch will be snuffed. Yeah, that's right. Kelly, maybe his last chance to survive this cut. He's in a must-win situation. Hard off the bottom, there's a vertical. Has to dance down with Whitewater. Hits it again under the lip. Bit off balance, but recovers. And now throwing down a final snap. He will ride away. Well, Kelly needs a 7-7. He has left nothing on the table. That ride, the previous ride where he went all out on that last section, went down hard. He's left nothing on the table. Kelly Slater looks like he might be calling it a heat. Not sure what's <laughs> at stake. I don't know if he's sure if it was enough by that reaction. Yeah, look, he's looking pretty jovial right now. He kind of get, you know, did a little head nod like to the guy on the ski. What do you reckon? I mean, maybe it could have been. Maybe it's not. <laughs> I don't know. I think we have a lot of versions of sevens in this seat to make <laughs> comparisons. Doesn't really stand out like a guarantee as Liam's been on fire. O'Brien will get his last wave of the matchup. And now we've run out of time. Let's see what the destiny will be for Kelly Slater. <laughs> will he stay a full-time competitor on this tour? We're about to find out if he did enough to try to keep himself alive in the midseason cut. Flick, what did you see? Yeah, I, I liked the first turn. It was straight up into the lip and bugs. Like he said before, you need those waves with those. That's going to offer you those first two sections. So he got two big belts there and he got the finish. I mean, the judges are still thinking about it. So what do you make of it, bugs? Well, I think there's a lot of drama. You know, it's just really cool that Kelly Slade is coming in. That there's a score that they're deliberating over. That first turn was dynamic. The second turn, Joe, he, he sort of overcooks it. it, it it's an awesome 12 o'clock sl lip slam, overcooks it a little bit, but what a great recovery. Really doesn't lose much, goes onto the inside rail again and down the line. So true, even though he was off balance, he was able to stay connected with his rail work. And how many times have we seen him do that in his career? It's can't even keep track. There's Kelly thinking it over having a laugh so taking this uh, experience pretty lightly at the moment remember we don't know his plans and we're still waiting for the outcome from the panel and remember you know, at bells he was saying like he's, there's been heats he's had all year where he's only been missing by half a point you know uh, three quarters of a point which means he knows he's still at that level where he can compete with these guys scores coming in for kelly it looks like it's going to fall incredibly short member chasing a 7.7 .7. And now the score's coming through. He has been knocked out by Liam O'Brien. And Kelly Slater has not made the cut. Liam O'Brien keeps himself alive and moves on into the round of 16. And now there's going to be a, a very important moment to hear from Kelly to see if he has any idea of his plans. Would he show up for the Challenger Series? How is he going to handle this point? in the best career of all time. Oh, and Liam might just sneak up the cliff and not even go up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for Liam too. I mean, what if he is responsible for having the last heat in Kelly Slater's career? Oh, man. I mean, it was a big, he a massive heat for Kelly, but a really big heat for Liam as well. And um, it's going to be interesting to see if we get some insights here and see uh, what the future holds. World title in 92 to kick things off, but a lot of highlights before that. 
A lot of question marks if he was going to retire even in the late 90s and still competing here today in 2023. Stand by for words from Kelly Slater as we continue on here on Saturday at Margaret River. We'll be right back. What a beautiful Saturday, still continuing here at the Western Australia Margaret River Pro, walking on a dream in this beautiful Margaret River region where adventure and indulgence meet. So many great things to do. Our favorite, watching pro surfing at stop number five of the World Surf League Championship Tour. As our mind is just spinning, thinking about highlights and what an impact Kelly's made competitively on pro surfing. He just lost out to Liam O'Brien as he chats with Leo Fioravanti on the stairs. That other one you opened up really nice. That was really good. Yeah. Good back at surfing. Proper open knot, like that was like, yeah, that was good. That last one, just the thing that you open up. Yeah, the first section was like too far back here. I wanted to I wanted to go more down the line and carve it. Yeah. It keeps speed for the second one, but the first section was behind, like yeah. I had to go back up to it. Yeah. So slow. Uh -huh. you no, know, at the beginning of the heat, it was fast, and he even walked all those two waves. Like, even, 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 his legs were pretty, his second wave, is 7-7, was pretty small. I, I, yeah, I but he picked them off the inside. I didn't, I didn't not look at it, but I was like, oh, it's pretty small. I'm not going to change it. Honestly, he ripped that one. Like, he made that score. Yeah, he said, that, he, said really that, well. he said that it pulled up on yeah, him. He threw the tail, like, he served it really well. Yeah. Same as yours, like yours wasn't a big one, you just served it really well. Kelly Slater chatting with Leo Fioravanti. Leo would probably call Kelly a, an uncle to him. Uh, Leonardo's stepdad, Stephen Bell, famously was in Kelly's corner for so many years, so many world titles. And also Kelly's girlfriend, Kalani, on the stairs talking about the activity and the non-priority side of the heat. We love that. Start off with a bang. Things continue. We still wait to chat with Kelly as he digests that last heat. Not making enough heats this year to make the midseason cut. So waiting to see what his plans are with another important heat for the midseason cut just getting started with Ryan Callanan and Kolohe and Dino. Yeah, I'm excited about this heat. Um, I'm excited to watch Ryan again and, and also Kolohe. Obviously, Kolohe needs a result here. and But Ryan's fresh off the back of a good performance at Bells. So this is going to be a really good heat. Ryan versus Kolohe, Goofy versus regular, Australia versus USA. And Kalanen's turned in big results, coming off a major final at Bells Beach, runner-up to Ethan Ewing. His back end's been highly scored here, especially on big sections. He can simplify the system. He's been surfing a lot with Connor O'Leary as well, who's been on fire. And the Goofy Foots found some space to get things started. There's the bottom turn, swinging off the lip, and he loses it, Bugwa. Yeah, a lot of a lot of lump and bump in that wave. It was never really going to offer much. He just wanted to, to get going. I mean, this heat here, Kaya Belly, Ryan Callan, they're in different heats, but they look pretty safe. Joe Barron and Kaloha, they need results. That's a big situation. Remember, Barron tied with Kelly coming into this event, so he's got some work to do. He's in the must-win situation, and just like Kaloha and Dino, which... People are still scratching their head on how Andino has found himself in this position this year. Yeah, I mean, he's always, he's, Andino has been one of those surfers for a long time with a lot of hype, and he's always surfed so good. He's put together so many amazing video parts and edits, and to see him in this position right here, it's, um, it's almost shocking, but 
I mean, they, the cut is kind of forcing our surfers to really put their best foot forward straight away in the year. You know, you can't just cruise through the start of the year and, you know, cut, expect to come back later on. You know, you've got to put your best surfing um, all on the line at the very beginning of the year. And um, here we have Kolohe now finding himself on the raw end of the stick here. So 32 minutes on the clock, a tough day for USA Surfing. As we look at the bottom turn from Kiowa Belly, a guy who's got a great shot to potentially win this whole contest. Mid-face bottom turn and slams it. Good timing there. Played the non-priority size of the heat. Well, just stand warmed up. Not a real score of consequence, but that's probably his best so far. Yeah, that's his best ride so far. You think about a 497, you only need to get a five-point ride to take the lead. It's, it's been a relatively low-scoring heat. We're setting up big matchups in the round of 16. Felipe Toledo has Jordy Smith. That's been a final at the CT level in the past. Gabriel Medina and Leonardo Fioravanti. That's guaranteed to be feisty at the start as we check out this last wave from Kiowa Belly Flick. Yeah, swooping carve off the top there, just rebounding off the foam and looking for this second section here and all the way through to the inside. He hit that last um, section with a bit of ferocity, which I liked. Um, just another two-turn combo, and I'm not sure where the judges are going to go on th this. And, you know, there's still lots of room to move. This heat's still wide open. It's just waiting for someone to get one of those waves where they can string a couple of nice turns together and sort of take this heat um, and run away with it. Well, one man that's making the USA proud is Griffin Colapinto coming off another big heat win. Griff's hanging out with Stace. Griffin, who won out of you in The Rock just then? The Rock, for sure. I got so smashed, hit, hit my, bruised my foot, bruised my ass, uh, my back, did it all. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, not the best way to win the heat, is it? Yeah, I mean, a win's a win. I'm psyched to win, but, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just like, I probably didn't need to go for that last turn. I was already winning, so. But uh, I guess that's just the pure surfer in me. Got to hit every section. 100%. Talk to us about having those big performances, but then uh, strategically, you know, doing what you need to do to get through every heat after that. Notice in Bells, you had a massive matchup with Kanoa, but then kind of looked a little off your mark in the next round. That wasn't the case today. No, yeah. I, I learned a lot from that event, especially going from that Kanoa heat to the next one. I, um, my headspace was, it just, I kind of immediately went to like, oh my gosh, I could be in the final and win this contest. And as soon as I did that, I like lost the moment and, um, just got caught up in the whole thing and, and I started falling on my waves. So now it's like I really got to just treat each heat as if it's the final. And um, I'll just take that lesson and uh, hopefully it'll pay off throughout the year. Certainly hope so. Well done. We'll see you tomorrow. All right, thank you. A student of the game is Griffith Cole Pinto, writes his lessons down and rarely repeats those mistakes as he is maturing quickly on tour as we see the end section hack there from Baron Mamiya. And Baron trying to keep his dream alive of staying on tour. Had the most amazing trip to qualify for the championship tour by winning an event called Sunset Beach as a wild card. And back then, well, just last year, you got points for that. And he was able to continue on to make the cut and beyond. Catching up with a nice wrapping turn as well from the start of this wave from Baron Mamiya Bugs. Yeah, he gets caught up in a little bit of whitewash there, but the, the, the end of it is, is pretty solid. The wave lines up. He didn't need a big score. Kaya Belly got the 527. He took the lead. If you look at it now, a 4-5 four, a four on that wave would get it for Baron. Not much happening in the middle of that ride, but not a bad, not a, a good start and a good finish. Our cow is in motion. Throws down the arcing cutback to kick things off deeper off the bottom. Nice placement of that backside snap. Now chipping away towards the inside and comes down with the white water one more time as he's trying to build over Kolohe and Dino. And Dino just holding priority. And just one previous look for Callan in, in this heat so far. So slow start to the non-priority matchup. Kolohe just in a must-win situation. I think he'd probably be thankful when he looks back in history at Margaret River and all he's accomplished. 
making a couple of big CT finals out here in Main Brick. It's been one of his most consistent venues in his career. Yeah, well, I mean, he's, which, yeah, he's just being super patient right now. So we need to wait to see if we can, uh, yeah, if he can open up his account. I mean, it looks like we're going to get a bit of action here. He's having a look. But uh, it's going to be Kayo having a paddle. And remember, Kayo's allowed to take that wave because he's in the priority heat. So Kolohe's got to wait. Quick over the top for Ibelli. Wrapping turn and sets up the finish. Taps it. Two sections collide. And looks like he maintained control as we'll finally see the start of Endino. Throws down the car of the California and just rips it in the pocket quickly. Patience on the inside ball. Times the bottom turn and is able to stay on his feet to kick things off. Well, still waiting for that wave for Barron, but of course, Kaya Bella's had another one since then. Barron's score looks like it's about right on the money. Need to 4.5, and he's got something very close, but Kaya Belly is yet to uh, have his last wave scored. Let's take another look. What did you see here? Yeah, I, I like this opening wave. I mean, he waited a while for it. Nice carve off the top into this second cutback. And, you know, you're just bringing it through to the inside here. And um, nice finish, you know. I think maybe mid-range score, I've got to say. But uh, I'm just looking at another replay of Ryan's wave here. Nice carve off the top. Ryan's wave just a bit more, offering a bit more of that blue face. Kolohe's wave had a little bit more of that white water through the face of the wave. Um, but both surfers getting a finish, so uh, it'll be interesting to see where the judges land with both of those. Yeah, Bally also on his last bucks. Yeah, well, this is the wave that answered Barron, and his first two maneuvers pretty solid. And this one, whoa, he hits it now. Does he ride out of this, Joe? We, we kind of cut to the next one. Yes, he does. So Kaiwa Bally did ride out, scores coming through, and what a moment for a young surfer named Liam O'Brien. Did he just knock the goat off tour? We're still yet to know what Kelly wants to do with his career, but Stace, that's got to be a big moment for the young kid. Yeah, massive moment for Liam indeed. Liam, you nearly let him uh, get away with it there. You had him, had him against the ropes and then gave him a wave. Yeah, I feel like I got more nervous when I had my scores. <laughs> it's like I think I've done what I can do, and then it was just like you know that Kelly's going to come with something, so... I was trying to just really pick a good wave and I let him have one that I thought was a little shouldery but it turned out it was a nug and he ripped the bag out of it and got a 7-8 so that was a mistake and then from there I was just like anything that looked half decent I was like I just got to keep him off even though they turned out to not be that great but yeah and then obviously at the end he had he had a chance again and I was just like oh no I could hear the whole beach erupt when he finished it off and yeah luckily I snuck through but yeah he's yeah, such, a, such a good competitor and yeah obviously he's one of the best <laughs> to ever do it must be happy with your own performance though and uh, you know moving up the ratings there with that result yeah yeah really happy to make that one I knew that was a pretty crucial heat we've lost in this round every comp except this one in pipe so it's nice to get through the heat, through that heat again and um, yeah I just I don't know I tried not to think about the ratings thing too much and just focus solely on the surf and what I had to do out there to get a couple good waves and um, yeah it worked out that time so hopefully I can keep doing that well done Liam Cheers, guys. Well done, Liam O'Brien, looking comfortable and uh, l identifying a few mistakes against Kelly Slater. I'm sure he'll take some time to digest that moment where Kelly needed a result, and he's the one to get the big win. And the one that's still standing in that tie break sister situation, we had a 21st in the world, the only one that got a, a victory today, Bugs. Yeah, he was. A, 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 we had four on that 21st mark, and... Gosh, Liam, he, he, his interviews, it, it so reminds me of a young Mark Richards. <laughs> it really does. Uh, Mark Richards, a four-time world champ, showed up at the Callanan household when Ryan uh, officially qualified for the tour the first time, had a great chat. MR is always still involved with the next generations that come up and represent Newcastle on tour. And Ryan, so far, just waiting for his second scoring ride to come through. And the opener as well from Kolohe and Dino. 2.55 left to go in the priority heat. Baron Mamiya still in a tough situation. He can't afford to lose this heat or he won't make the midseason cut. Little wave running through the inside. We'll see if we have any takers and that one's gonna roll through. 
Yeah, well, Baron on his last wave, he needed to 4 4 at that stage. He only got a 4 3 7. Then Kaya got the 5, five 4 7, as we see in the recap here. Yeah, solid luck here at this heat. Harvey Norman, heat recap. Kaya with Belly and Baron Mamiya had a quiet start on the non priority side of the heat. A bunch of threes and fours, and now we're just talking about fives. Kaya was the only one that built on his score line, but it's still incredibly close. Baron Mamiya still chasing a 5.84. Yeah, uh, look, I, I still think there's a lot more surfing to be done from these guys in, in this heat. I mean, I'm liking this start of this wave from Kayo. Um, straight up into this next section, nice carving maneuver. And he gets up there and he finishes. But yeah, they're still sitting there with some relatively, you know, average range scores. So I still feel like there's just room for someone to break away. This is the time. Baron Mamiya needs a 5.84. Wave look, it's solid so far. Clean arc to start. Well done for Mamiya. And the North Shore of Oahu local boy throws down the arc, trying to keep his spot on toward big vertical with the air jump. And he's feeling it. I'm thinking it's his best so far. Great timing for Baron to get that wave. Was it a 5.84 to turn it? It was definitely his best ride, Joe. And he only needs a, like a six-point ride will see him there. But here's Kaya Belly. You know he's going to answer. And he's looking incredible. Wow. What a connection. Rail to rail surfing for Ibelli to <laughs> really send it to the panel. They might need some time to work this one out. Well, prior to that last wave of Kaya's, Baron actually needed to get the highest wave of the heat so far. So they'd be looking at that and look... Prior to that wave of Kairos, I would have said maybe he might have got that score and he might have jumped up into first, but we're going to have to see what happens once this last wave of Kaya drops because that one looked really nice to me. Well, that's the second time there's been a counterpunch by Kaya when, when Baron, his last two waves have been followed directly behind by Kaya Belly, and that was definitely Kaya's strongest wave. I think this is close. This is, I, I thought this might have got the score. I agree. I think so too, especially the way he set up these wraps and then it went vertical for him. Yeah, you can, you can tell too, he came down from here and he felt good, he knew it. Oh God, he could easily get the score on that. Yeah. So he was chasing a 5.84 until Kayo did this. If he improves on a 5.27, then Baron needed more than that. Do you think Kayo improves, Bucks? Well, on that, that last move was super dynamic. The other two, I don't know. Uh, I think um, Baron had the edge on him on the, in, in the work in the middle of those ways, but the finishing turn, definitely. So running out of time with Kai Belly and Baron Mamiya, but they both have very important numbers locking in. We're feeling definitely Baron's best wave when he needed it the most. But if Kai improved, Mamiya might be in trouble since he was carrying fours. Mamiya surfed well, created himself, created a rookie year for himself with his wild card win at sunset last season. Ended up regrouping in the back end last year, missed Brazil. Wanted to get to 100% mentally, physically. And this year, just struggling for big results. So last score coming in for Mamiya, a 6.83. He did get the lead. So Kyle was less chasing a 6.27. Yeah, well, that's going to be his biggest score yet. And as I said, his finishing turn was unbelievable. But his middle work, I don't think, was as good as Barron's. Numbers coming in for Kyle Abelli chasing a 6.27. Not enough. Kyle ends up going down to Baron Mamiya. And Baron behind the cut is still keeping his dream alive and hopefully moving up in the live rankings. Wow. Clutch performance from the Hawaiian. Wow, that was super, super exciting in the end there. I loved how they had that double exchange and we got to see from Baron and then straight away we got to see from Kyle. And yeah, what an exciting finish to a heat. Big moment for pro surfing. Let's now get a chance to talk to the greatest of all time. Kelly Slater is with Stace. Yeah, thanks, Joe. First things first, Kelly, exciting heat. Yeah. Really great wave under priority there. Yeah, that was a good one. I felt like I was, I felt like the, all the energy shifted my way there. I thought it was going to turn and then I, I got that big one with the chance to do it. I got a big first carve. I was like, all right, this thing's starting out really nice. And then the wave kind of bent away from me and I couldn't figure out, it was it, it was a wave where I couldn't take a bunch of downtime and wait for the last turn. So I tried to kind of find an angle and it didn't set me into the last turn with a lot of speed. And then I fell on that last turn. And, um, but I thought that was gonna be the wave for it. And in, in fact, the wave prior to that one, I didn't take off on. I was like kind of in the foam on the lip. And it was a really good one too. I, that would have been a good enough wave to get a score like that. But uh, 
I decided to wait and I got the next one, which, which I thought was going to be better, but it, it sort of bent away a little bit and I fell anyway, so <laughs> you got to stay on your feet. <laughs> You've done that over your whole career, switched momentum in a heartbeat. Was that feeling any different to the start of your career? No, it, it really just felt like one of those heats where it was gonna, the magic was going to happen. You know, Baron was in the water and I was like kind of drawn on, okay, I got only three minutes left, but you know, I did this with Baron and, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I just, I was just kind of thinking back on that moment, you know, you just, if you're within a, if you're within 10 points, you got a shot if a wave comes, you know, and that's how you got to think. And um, I felt pretty good. I, I've been surfing a good last couple of days and I felt loose. I didn't feel stressed about the situation. I just was, I was actually really enjoying the day and it's like perfect day. So <laughs> whatever, you know, we're breathing. Absolutely, we are. Some of us are breathing a bit faster than others up here, Kelly. Tell me, plans for the future? Plans for the future? I want to get really barreled somewhere. I'm looking over your. I'm not even looking at you. I'm looking over at the box right now. It's barreling like six feet still. Um, actually, there's a there's a perfect wave. So I don't know. Figure it out. Let's see how things let's see how things uh, turn out. Pretty good relationship with the next event on tour, eh? What's that? Oh, is that Surf Ranch? <laughs> oh yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I know the I, I know a guy, you know, but uh, we'll see. I mean, Medina and Felipe got a pretty good relationship with that place. It's funny. I've, all these years, I've heard people, oh, it's unfair. He designed it. I'm like, I haven't won the thing. I didn't even make the they let top uh, eight last time. So I think he designed it for a goofy footer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It seems like it. But uh, Felipe broke the uh, curse finally after Medina won the first two or three events there. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah. look, it is what it is. The, yeah. Everyone's surfing good on this tour. Everyone knows how to surf a heat. And, you know, I'm really stoked to see where surfing, where the level of surfing's at. And it's, yeah. it's awesome. Cool. Really appreciate your time, Kelly. Speak to you soon. Thank you. Still not sure what Kelly's plans might be uh, for the next event. Even talking about the surf ranch. We'll see what happens there. And unfortunately, didn't make that heat to make the cut. But just uh, looking to get barreled and moving on. So we'll continue to hunt down Kelly for the rest of the day and figure out what his plans may be. I, I don't think we'll ever figure it out. There's always <laughs> a lot of mystery with Kelly. He wants to get barreled. He's, uh, he's thinking about the surf ranch. He's, uh, you know, it, it definitely was no goodbye speech. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, still hanging around, enjoying life, breathing, looking to get barreled. So we'll keep you guys posted if we hear anything about Kelly's future few decades on tour, 11 world titles, but did not make the midseason cut. As we get underway with a carve and tail release, Ethan Ewing, fresh off the Bells title, is taking on the local wild card, goofy foot Jacob Wilcox. One of the coolest carvers in the game. Great style, great tempo, and having the time of his life with that victory at Bells, moved up to number four in the world. In a great spot, Flick. Yeah, absolutely amazing. I, and I'm absolutely, I'm loving seeing where he is uh, on tour right now. I feel like it's sort of been, I'm saying, gonna say a long time coming, but not really, I guess. He's just had a lot of hype around him from such a young age because he's got such a beautiful style. But yeah, I'm loving where he's at right now and really coming into his own with what, being one of the best Aussies on tour. And here we're seeing another amazing Aussie on tour. We've got a replay of Arkal on his backhand, absolutely smacking that last one and riding out. And I reckon he's going to be pretty happy with that one. Ryan loving his backhand and main break. He's always so trusty out here, Bugs. Oh, he's so awesome out here. Ryan has got one of the big backhand turns on the 12 o'clock turns. I mean, he just powers out of everything. He's got the greatest finishing turn. Last year when it was 10 foot, it was unbelievable. Look at that one. Massive score going to come in here for Ryan Callanan. Shutting it down. Brilliant performance. Callanan's done it so many times. He'll get an eight for that effort. This was Ethan Ewing on the snap to slide flick. Yeah, I loved it. I mean, it was very smooth, controlled. The wave was a bit small, though, and it had a bit of foam through it. So. Um, you know, a smaller one, but he's going to be feeling good about that. He's got his feet in the wax, and um, I mean, yeah, nice way to start off. So now setting this one up off the bottom, throwing down the wrapping cut back, and Dino greasing that bottom turn. There's that rip, all that power. And now he'll just carve down over the whitewater. Great turn selection as he saw that section with that angle towards him. Knew how important it was to ride away clean. Chloe has a 5 1 7. 
and hoping for at least a 7-1-7 to get the lead off Ryan Callanan. Well, he needed to respond on that one, Ryan, posting that eight-point ride. He, uh, I mean, Arkell, he needed a, a score. Kolohe has answered. Let's see how that one goes with the judges, but maybe not the eight, but it's going to be a good score. Great start off the bottom here, Flick. Yeah, beautiful wrapping carve, first turn, straight up into the second section, and another wrapping carve, slightly faster than the first one, coming out of it with speed, and gets to that end section before it gets to him and rides out in front of that foam. And now Wilcox getting started representing WA Bugs. Yeah, he's the wild card. He surfed this wave many times. Look at that wave. It just squares out, Flick. He knows his place. Yeah, he knows it so well, and he gets the finish there. He, oh, little bonus section on the end there. Absolutely smashing it. So he's got to be happy with that one. Wilcox has had some incredible sparring partners he's lucky enough to grow up with, including world number two, Jack Robinson trading waves at the slabs around the area. Wilcox, an amazing barrel rider. Doesn't have to be frontside either. Unbelievable technique and square pits on his backside. But enjoying rippable main break today. As we'll now see Ryan Callanan set up that backside snap. Nice and easy on the start. Little slingshot carved to set up the end section. So nice, cool motion for Ryan Callanan, who just kind of went through an energy overload, making the final at Bells. There's so much excitement there, all Australian final there. And then his sister got married, so went straight from Bells back to Newcastle and enjoyed just all the celebrations of love in his family. Got over here, and there's all these uh, welcoming dinners, and he's like, I just need a break. <laughs> he just had so much, uh, so many great things happening. And he wisely just took some downtime. He said the last couple of days, and he's feeling fantastic. Bugs, how'd you like this one? Yeah, another solid ride by Ryan. It's a smaller wave, but kind of a medium wave, but he's only looking that that 4 3 tree to get rid of it. The finishing move, typical signature, ARKL, and a great recovery on his haunches. And he's just famous for these last. Usually, sometimes when the wind is bigger, he, he turns under the lip at that time, just takes it on. Such a solid competitor who's had some big moments. Remember the final at Bells, but he had a final before that at France as a wild card when he was runner up to Julian Wilson. So, coming really close to getting a first CT win, which has been the story for Colohan Dino, a man who surfed in over 100 CT events and been in a lot of major finals. And he's come close to winning his first CT, especially in the West. Two-time runner-up in this contest. Numbers in for last of Kolohe. 6.5. He's improving. He's still in second at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Look, uh, it's a good thing to be sitting out there and knowing that every wave you're catching, it's getting slightly better. I mean, the 6.5, it's a nice ride. Uh, but he's, you know, he's still going to need another 6.84 to uh, look at taking that lead spot from Ryan. Ryan's sitting there with that excellent score and Kaloe is probably thinking you know what like I've got to do something pretty good if I want to have a command in control of this heat. Baron Mamiya was clutch got the win on his last wave. Baron's hanging out with Stace. A heat win's a heat win well done Baron. Yeah that was a pretty sketchy one for sure. <laughs> What's it like I feel like you see surfers find themselves in heats that are scrappy and it just sort of seems to be the theme and then the other heats like underneath you is just going off. How do you adjust like that? Yeah, I don't know. I kind of was having a shocker at the beginning of the heat. I just got a couple of little fours, and I just felt like I haven't really, like, sat into my, like, surfing, really. And a lot of the waves I was catching, they were really bumpy. And then, uh, yeah, on that last wave, I kind of just, you know, I was like, all right, well, I need a score, and I need to deliver. And, yeah, I kind of just it, like, had a nice, clean face, and I got to put in a couple good turns. Yeah, that must have felt really good. Yeah, I was stoked. <laughs> <laughs> Big day of surfing for you. Well done today, mate, and we'll uh, likely see you tomorrow. Cheers. There, Mamiya, staying alive in the live rankings. Equal 26th with Kelly coming into this event. Kelly went down. Baron still swinging to try to get on the right side of the top 22 cut line. What a great finish for Baron. I mean, that last wave, and it was a full exchange there with his opponent. And Baron just really ripped into it. He got some big turns in. The high score of the heat was only a seven. It wasn't a massively high scoring heat, but Boy, oh boy, did he pull that out at the right time. <laughs> that was so clutch. 
So a few guys in the draw were in that must win situation. And it was easy to read if you check out WorldSurfLeague.com. Anyone that's past that 22 mark. So we'll check the live rankings. Remember, we lost Michael Rodriguez in the elimination round due to a wild card named Jarvis Earl today. So M Rod focusing on the Challenger Series. We lost Maxime Houston as well. A man coming up later, Jake Marshall. He's still in the mix. He's in the round of 32. However, he's got the best ever at main break in John John Florence. The thing is for Jake, he has beat John John in the past, and he's beat him in Hawaii. Let's see if he can do it again. Here we go, back to this one. And Dino, 30th in the world, trying to keep his spot on tour. Nothing left for him on that wave. Yeah, look, wave selection maybe letting him down there a little bit, but uh, straight out the back, live action, Ryan. Ryan up and out. He's the one leading Kolohe and kicked out to see if he could regain first priority and really control the next six and a half minutes. I would think that's the game there for Ryan. He's got that eight point ride. He's only got a 5 3 3 backup. That wave might have offered something, but unless he gets that square bottom turn straight into the lip, 12 o'clock, he's going to flick out. Plus, he knew his opponent made nothing of his ride, and all eyes are really on Kolohe. We've got a lot of uh, surfers above him in the rankings that have gone out. So there's a flicker of hope here if he can win this heat. And he only needs a 6 8 4, so he basically needs to do what Baron did and get a 7. Kolohe and Dino has always been a classic, classic human being, loving surfing his whole life. Uh, his famous surfing father, Dino and Dino, is rookie of the year on tour, putting so much passion and love into Kolohe's act, was always by his side through those early amateur titles. Hard to see Kolohe in this position, Kaipo. Yeah, this is true. I mean, it's such a heralded. You know, surfer from his early teenage years up into his pro career. Um, but right now, Chloe and Dino definitely feeling the pressure of that white jersey, right? As the uh, as the lower seeing this a must win heat for him, Joe. And you know, really, when we look at the context of this heat, he's turned this heat into a 26 minute heat. Remember, he didn't take off until the 26 minute mark. So uh, the pressure's on and Dino. Let's see how he responds in these final five minutes. That's right, Kaipo. We're feeling the energy. Uh, Kolohe and Dino's been around for a long time. He qualified. His goal was to qualify at 18. Started off at Snapper Rocks. He was still 17. Uh, turned 18 later that season in March. And he's been around. He did double duty through those QS years in the different format as he grew. When, see those early highlights of Kolohe when he was a rookie. He was just a young kid. Now he's so much bigger. And right now he's trying to pull off a comeback. As uh, we have waves on the way. No takers on that one. All tied on the peak trying to set up position. Maybe one possibility here. Good cut at the takeoff bowling section. It'll go to Jacob Wilcox. Wrap to start. Big float and an aggressive airdrop. Way to land that one out of the sky. Wilcox will take the lead with that over Ethan Ewing. As we'll look at the Harvey Norman recap, Ryan Callanan versus Kolohe and Dino. Our cows made the cut. And Kolohe and Dino, if he loses this heat, he's off tour. The goofy foot threw down an eight-point ride to really get out in front. Yeah, I mean, he's surfing like he's made the cut. It feels like he's opening up. He's got that eight-point ride. But it's, uh, yeah, Kolohe with the work to do. He needs to get a 6.84 to move up into that advancing position. He's surfing good. He's already got a 6.5. Um, kind of needs to do what Baron did that, what Baron did in that last heat and try and find a seven. Our cow makes so much sense here. Maybrank, he loves power. He knows how to throw it up vertically. And fresh off that final at Bells, he's still in sync with the rhythm of the ocean. Shuts that one down, eight and a 5-3-3. Three, three. As we finish the Harvey Norman recap, now it's pressure on Andino without priority to find some room. Kolohe had one of the most successful amateur careers of all time. Bobby Martinez held the record with most, most NSSA titles forever. Kolohe was the one to break that. Winning uh, the Open Men's National title at an incredibly young age. I think he was just 15, uh, comparable to like a Clay Marzo type of youth explosion there. 
and then would enter junior events and sometimes win the main event. He uh, was such a young kid when he won in Huntington. It was the final with DeSouza, Taylor Knox, Damian Hobgood, and remember the look on his face. He's like, I just won the pro event? <laughs> yeah. He was just Dino, surprising himself at the time. Yeah, well, Dino had to build another, another level onto the house for all the trophies. <laughs> he certainly <laughs> did. Here comes Will Cox in the non-priority heat. Long time wild card. Throwing down a vertical, enjoying these glassy conditions. Another vertical whip for Wilcox. So he's building against Ewing. Six yeah. eight three and a six one seven already. Yeah, he's really taken it to Ethan Ewing. But Ethan, being you know, he's the, one of the hallmarks of his serving is his patience. Looks like we've got Andino looking for something to ramp up. Now he's back to turns, nails that first section with a solid hack off the lip. He's got a bit of downtime here. Needs something more. Throws down a big wrapping. Oh, cut back and steps off on the shallow section of the bricks there. Wow, that was a that was a wild dismount. Um, dismount. I mean, look how shallow it is now. It's the afternoon tides going out. Flick. I mean, it's not low tide yet. Yeah. Not yet, but uh, it definitely got shallow. You can see here. He knew this wave was going to go fat, so he wiped off that speed with that little stall so that he can really lay into that first turn. I love that layback he did, but yeah, the wave kind of just dying out and then uh, he had to negotiate this uh, really tricky end section here. He does, and uh, you just see, look how dry that reef is right there. It's just not really where you want to be landing. Look, a super well surf wave, but he probably just needs one of those waves with a full bodied wave where he can, um, you know, stay in the pocket with those, you know, massive. He's got to, he's got the moves. I just don't know if he has time. 50 seconds now for Andino, mm -hmm. and his last score is falling short. A 5.43. Ryan's up again, late on the climb. He's down. But where's Andino? He was still on the inside a bit. Now just on the Red Bull ski. And this might be it for his chance to try to get past this midseason cut. Tough results all season long for the longtime veteran. The one thing about Kolohe is being asked about this cut and the tough results he's had this year. He's never said he's moving on from competition. He's never said that's it. He's never sounded sad or depressed over the situation. He said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm getting ready for the Challenger Series. You know, he spent uh, 10 days at Snapper before he came here. You know, I saw him surfing. He was, you know, he just loves those conditions. And the last time he fell off tour when he was really young, he he won a bunch of QS 6000s and 10,000s. So, you know, he goes kind of back into a comfort zone that where he could rule. Yeah, he's had such great longevity on tour. Qualified, always backed himself up, turned in some top five performances. But tough to see a name like Andino fall out of the mix and get knocked out of the midseason cut. And the highlight side of that was Ryan Cowan still in connection after his final at Bells takes out Andino and he's moving on into the round of 16. He'll ride that left like Goofy Foots like to do as a little bit of a victory lap. And we'll catch up with Kolohe soon to see what his plans are. But he's already told us that. He's ready to go if it means that he's on the Challenger Series. And you never know. Sometimes that's all you need to build up your program to come back even stronger. The round of 32 continues. We'll take a quick break. We'll bring in Ronnie Blakey and Richie Lovett for the call.
Well, welcome back to the show. This is the Margaret River Pro. And uh, we've been lucky enough to have uh, a great cultural experience at the event, courtesy of the Wadandi people. We want to acknowledge them, the traditional custodians or owners of the Margaret River region and thank them for welcoming us to Buja. And we had uh, just earlier a, a great spectacle for the fans here, a great opportunity to take in some of that local culture, paying our respects to elders past, present and emerging and now shifting our focus out there to the lineup where we've got the round of 32 unfolding and the winner of the last event is up at the moment, Ethan Ewing, super patient. And it's sort of been the recipe for his success throughout the uh, the past couple of uh, events. But he's got his hands full here with Jacob Wilcox. The, the wild card's been pushing really hard. He's got a couple of six-point rides, high-range six-point rides in the bag. And Ethan was looking to respond there. Ended a 6.7 to, to get ahead of the youngster, the local boy. Yeah, this is a, a good matchup. And Jacob's just, uh, I don't know if he's got him in the corner, but he's maybe just having him bouncing off the ropes at the moment a little bit. Uh, very uh, evenly matched when you look at their, their top scores. 6.83 versus 6.93. Uh, Ethan Ewing just with the slight edge, but we've got a score to come in for Ethan Ewing. This was his backup score. Let's have a look at it. A nice peak from the takeoff. And Ethan, uh, in uh, sizzling fashion, just uh, ropes. A nice snap off the top. The second one, total tail slide and release of the fins. He gets it back under control. But uh, that low gravity bottom turn and uh well the surface texture on these waves ron somewhat different than what they were this morning there's a few more lumps and ridges but uh, no problem for ethan watch this releases the tail all the weight over the front foot now it re-engages he brings it straight back around and wow. uh, just a little bit late on that final turn but those first two turns very nice yeah He's, uh, he's cooking at the moment, just looking so hot, so fresh. Uh, so Italo looks to get things started. He's up against Kanoa Igarashi out there in the lineup at the moment. Good match up this one. As Italo finishes it off on the inside, a bit of bump on the face to deal with. Kanoa also getting in on the mix. Yeah, Kanoa gets a, uh, a nice pockety wave. Out behind Ethan, uh, sorry, out behind uh, Italo, excuse me, goes for the air rev doesn't make it so uh, look it's uh, you know pressure situation here for Kanoa Igarashi and uh, we'll have to wait and see whether he can really free himself up because his opponent Italo Ferreira one of the most tenacious dogmatic competitors on the tour always really busy in heats always uh, a very frantic but aggressive approach to to his waves and uh, Again, one of the uh, standout goofy footers here. Different approach to, say, Conor O'Leary and uh, Yago Dora. He prefers to, to be a bit more, get more trickery involved. Kanoe Garashi looking to really click into the form that's seen him go on to claim a, a CT win. He needs a, a big result. This is, has not been one of his better hunting grounds. Four big finishes at Margaret's. He's never made it past the, the round of 16. And he really wants to, to elevate his position on, on the ratings, solidify a place above that cut line as we see Jacob Wilcox up again. We do have a number on the way for Ethan Ewing, who's up right now, live action. This wave is tapering off somewhat. So there's a good battle going on here. And the current uh, oh, the surfer, one of the surfers sitting at the top end of the rankings has some uh, work to do. Ethan Ewing sitting in fourth place. Big opportunity with Jack Robinson missing from the event draw here and being one of the strongest surfers at this venue, arguably uh, right up there uh, ahead of the pack just behind John John Florence. A big opportunity for surfers like Ethan to, to really start to collect some big points towards a, a final finish. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, well, well, you know, Jack won the event uh, last year. So we look at some of the replays here. This was Kanara Garashi. So you can see just all that bump. And uh, Kanoa getting through it. Tricky section here. But uh, that's a better way. Puts the two-turn combination down. This was Jacob Wilcox on the backhand. Right up into the hook to start things off. And just deals with this soupy section here. You can see just pumping the legs, trying to get to this final section. And 
and uh, gets through that one. Not sure if that'll go into his best rides, but have a look at this wave here for Ethan Ewing, showing something different. The layback hack. And, uh, the wave gets a little slopey here, but offers him a little bonus section. So a quick tail release snap, and this final move here, bang, really tricky. But Ethan in perfect control. So uh, there's maybe six inches of water under this wave. As Ethan comes down, resets the fins, just dealing with that plume of white water behind him. Yeah, hanging on there. So his previous raid, ride came through at a 6.93. That was enough to jump him up into first. Still has another score on the way here, but Jacob Wilcox already playing catch up after a 7.03. Italoa and Kanoa yet to really come to life in Heat 14, the round of 32. We do know that things are starting to, to come together when you consider the rankings. There's a, a bunch of surfers below the cut line who've fallen out of the mix and not made the cut. The two surfers that are still alive in the mix at this stage of the game, Baron Mamiya. Uh, Jake Marshall's coming up against John John Florence a, a little later on, but they're the only two. So, you know, there's not going to be a, a whole lot of movement now. It's Becoming a little more clear, but we'll have to wait till the end of today's action to, to get a better look at who's in danger of falling out of the top 22 as Kanoa Igarashi almost rides out of a high-risk finish there. He would have loved to have gotten out in front of that white water. Yeah, uh, you can see he's really starting to open up and, and put a little bit more risk into the approach, which I feel like he needs to do. Uh, I think that's when Kanoa's doing his best surfing is when he really is on the front foot. He's going through the gears, getting in attack mode. And, uh, you know, when, you, when you're holding back, that's when you, you can performance can slump. Well, let's check in with Stace. He's tracked down the winner of the last heat who got past Kalohe and Dino, Ryan Callanan. Ryan, well done. You're on fire, mate. <laughs> yeah, um, it actually didn't feel that good to me. I mean, getting big scores is great, but felt real nervous for some reason. I don't know, I guess just, uh, you know, getting a big result and wanting to back it up. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just didn't feel that good on my feet, but it still kind of was nice to see it convert into some big numbers and still throw it at the waves and, you know, capitalise on the opportunities I got. But, uh, yeah, they don't always feel amazing, but uh, I'm stoked to get through. Bizarre sport we choose to participate in when you're ripping and you lose. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's... Um, yeah, I guess just... I guess I'm trying to chase the feeling of, you know, feeling free and loose and... and uh, that wasn't it, but, but um, yeah, I guess I've got another heat to try and, you know, redo that and, and, um, and figure it out. And, and I guess that's the challenge of this sport is just trying to make the most of every opportunity you get. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm loving the challenge, but yeah. <laughs> We'll see you tomorrow, mate. Well done. Thank you. Good, honest appraisal there of his performance, Ryan Callanan. And, you know, I think it might have, wave selection might have had a bit to do with it, but it just looked like he... For me, Rich, I don't know what your thoughts are, but it just seemed to be washing off a lot of his speed. Um, maybe just fading a little hard on before those bottom turns. Uh, he cleaned it up. I mean, he, he got through that heat on the strength of an excellent ride. Yeah, yeah. You can, uh, I guess, be guilty on your backhand of going sort of too deep and too square at times when you lose speed. You can see here, Jacob, he's always down the line trying to keep that board uh, in a thrust position where it's just keeping its speed. Uh, through the turns. If you go too deep, there'll be a point where you go right out in the trough of the wave and, and you will actually start losing speed. Now, yeah, well, Ethan Ewing turned things up on the, uh, the wild card on his last ride. It's their first head-to-head -head heat at the CT level. 7.57 for, for Ewing. That means that Jacob Wilcox is after a 7.67 now with eight and a half minutes to go. Talking about head-to-head -head history, quite a bit between uh, Italo and Kanoa. And really even, uh, and they've always kind of gone blow for blow in, in their battles. They first met head to head at the 2017 Pipe quarterfinals. Kanoa got the jump on Italo there. Another quarterfinal heat, they battled it out at J Bay 2019. Italo got one back. Kanoa um, got a, a second win over Italo in the quarterfinals at Jeffreys Bay the f last season. And uh, obviously, Italo. Got the, the, the important one at the Ripkel WSL finals on his road through to a runner-up finish to the world title and stalled Kanoa's run um, at Trestle. So 
You know, I'm sure Canella has, hasn't forgotten that. Uh, that was a, a painful result for him. Yeah, and, uh, well, Italo was on some sort of tear at that event for sure. This is live action with Ethan. Ethan trying to better a 6.93. Just uh, throws the, the axe into that first section and cuts a, a deep gouge out of the wave, but uh, not much else on offer. No, and, uh, you know, you don't need to expel energy uh, where it's not necessary. So Ethan just getting out of there, understanding that, you know, 6.93, that's a decent sort of ride with, with at least two or three manoeuvres strung together. Obviously, we're, we're seeing a, a bunch of surfers, Rich, fall off the, the CT, get relegated back to that second tier, the Challenger Series, which is going to kick off in, in just a... A fortnight up there on the Gold Coast, the Boost Mobile Gold Coast Pro. Uh, Ethan Ewing, you know, interesting to note, he was a, a junior phenom when he, he joined the CT ranks in 2017. Didn't have much of a year, but uh, I think getting pushed back to the qualifying series did wonders for him in the long run. Yeah, and sometimes it takes a little uh, spell on the tour and then uh, you know you lose your ticket go back to the drawing board to really appreciate what you've what you've lost you know you work so hard to get there uh, and it really is uh, it's a different sort of competing when you're on the championship tour but as we see the recap now this is Jacob Wilcox the local boy on the backhand he started strong with this 6.83 courtesy of these strong backhand turns just uh, connecting four of them all the way through to the inside great surfing yeah, the locals willing him on to a monster result here at his hometown, at his home break. And Ethan Ewing, though, just going to be so hard to overcome at the moment, just with the form that he's carrying. Looking at every bit, uh, a world title contender on his run in 2023. Just uh, so quiet in between turns in terms of the, the board movement, so efficient in how he goes about his manoeuvres. You know, when I just sort of pay attention to the board and the body, uh, it really does uh, remind me of how John John approaches the wave as well and just how connected they are. Uh, you know, uh, Ethan has that sort of vibe. Here we go. Igarashi up live and he is just looking to uh, get rid of 4.17 out of this one. Of course, he still hasn't moved into that, that second half of this overlapping heat. So he's going to have time to really jack the numbers up. But that was a, a nice sequence of moves on a medium sized ride here to try and really uh, apply some pressure to Italo, the 2019 world champion and an Olympic gold medalist. Oh, what a magic run Italo uh, had there. He's looking to kind of reclaim some of the form that, that saw him just go on. You know, obviously a, a magic run of winning events and dominating the CT. You know, the, despite the fact he finished second last season, you know, it was really sort of a one day of truth it's a low form that saw him get to that result. Wasn't a, a, a masterful campaign through 2022 for him. No, no, I tend to agree with you. And, um, you know, he was so dominant for a couple of years there where he was just winning everything. He was such a hard uh, competitor to come up against. As we see the replay of Kanari Garashi, uh, you know, th that is really textbook front side slash. And then he goes to the air rev on the second turn. See there, just bring the fins around. So not a lot of rotation in the air, but here we go, Italo. He's setting the pace though, Igarashi now, 6.33 on that last ride. But Italo finds a, a much lumpier, thick piece of water to tap into on the final section there and stomps it. He's pretty short-footed, this guy. I think just his aerial prowess really comes into play when he, he's in these chunkier conditions, just has that amazing control when other people sort of lose contact with their equipment. He can uh, often ride out of those tricky sections uh, as Jacob Wilcox goes after that 7.67 here. He, he needs to do something out of this world on this final section to get that score, and he goes for it, but ultimately goes down. Yeah, oh, look, I'll, it was a bit of a throwaway. Hail Mary at the, at the end of that ride. It was never going to uh, be the score unless he did something exceptional. Let's take a look at the replay here. So this is Italo. Just uh, stabs a vertical hit to start things off. Bumpy section down the line, up and over, drifts the big, long, lip-gliding floater. But pretty remarkable how he could just change direction there off the bottom turn, throws it up skyward. But it's a different sort of backhand approach, isn't it, Ron? The way uh, Italo 
attacks a wave with a lot of energy. You know, rather than uh, really lean on the rail, he, he tends to sort of keep pumping and driving for speed. This is Jacob Wilcox's wave again. Series of nice manoeuvres on the back end. And was never really in control in the air. Big set rolling through on the outside here. Two and a half minutes to go for Jacob Wilcox to turn this around. But Ethan Ewing's going to be holding that priority, really looking to control the, the later stages of this heat. And uh, we, we focus a lot on the, the cut and, and the importance of progressing through heats. Not really uh, in the conversation when we think about Ethan and Jacob and their stories through this uh, event. Jacob Wilcox coming in as a wild card, just wanting to go as deep into the draw as possible and, and really put on a good performance for this hometown crowd. If he does get bumped out here, I'll... I still say it's probably one of his better wildcard performances, and he's had a few. This is his 13th effort in a CT, and he has quarter final before, but it just looked like he settled into the kind of surfing that can win him some heats through uh, out the, the first couple of rounds. Can't help but agree. Uh, I, I feel like he's still maturing as a as a surfer, as a young man, uh, and obviously these these little tastes of of getting. CT uh, reps is, you know, this is what he wants to do. This is what he's striving for. And, uh, yeah, he'll be uh, heading over to Snapper Rocks in a couple of weeks' time. And for me, one of the favourites, really. Yeah, he had a, an amazing run on the Challenger Series last year. Jacob Wilcox got well within the, the top 20. And uh, as a result of that, uh, he automatically qualified for the Challenger Series this season. So he didn't have to come back and do the, the regional QS. Um, he, he did turn up and and surf a, a couple of events anyway, but that was really just to, to stay sharp and uh, get familiar with who he's going to be probably uh, knocking heads against. with when he hits the, the CS this season. But some really uh, strong highlight moments. We'll see if he finds uh, another opportunity. We know it'll be difficult here with uh, Ethan's just competitive strategy just so on, on point these days. Yeah, uh, you don't often see Ethan make a mistake now. Uh, being in the position of power that he is, he'll take this uh, under priority. And he's going to surf this wave hard too. Medium-sized set, digs into that first turn, wraps it right into the bowl. Banks on the rail again. So just transitioning now, hoping that he can get a big stand-up hit in. Wants to push hard. Jacob does get the opportunity behind him. A little sticky off the top there. Not sure what he was able to do on the outside, but this wave standing up a couple of times. He gets some nice work done at the end. But we'll have to uh, get a replay of, of what he was able to do on the outside. Did need a big score, though. The surfer's body language is something to go off. Uh, you know, we didn't see a fist claim. We didn't see a stand tall, which sort of tells you that in a clutch moment like that, perhaps it's not uh, not the score. I think that was actually the first maneuver on that wave. It was a sleepy little cutback. That was a better turn down the line and did well to, to get the final turn in. But, you know, clearly wasn't the score. So Ethan Ewing coming off the back of a victory down there at Bells Beach. He is looking good for a spot in the round of 16. The wild card, his run here is going to end. Jacob Wilcox, though, can hold his head up high, putting up a couple of high-range sixes here against the current world number four, who could be charging up the ratings. We're going to take a quick break here. Matthew McGilvray will be taking on Seth Moniz when we return. It's a Bonsoi brew break. More action coming your way right after this.
migrants. The end of the earth. The tip of Australia where everything passes by. The ocean is big. You feel very small when you surf out there. I remember growing up, I would always ride my bike up to this one spot on top of the hill, and it would be a little tiny view of the box. And Margaret's is out to the left. I think one of the first times I ever surfed the box, it was a real pinnacle moment. You just get to see Mother Nature in raw beauty. It takes a lot to be calm in the chaos. You feel this this aura, this energy. Mother Nature is always bringing something new, especially on the West Coast. And I think when I'm out of my comfort zone, that's also when I'm most alive. Well, welcome back to the show as we take in the view from the Western Australia flight camp. And it has uh, just been beautiful down here today. Incredible conditions, big performances and some uh, heartbreaking results, but also uh, some surfing that I, I think we can be very proud of. But we've also been taking in everything the WA has to offer, including the amazing produce from the Margaret River region and Felicity Palmatier. She's down there tapping into it all. OK, so I am down here in the Red Bull Athlete area and let me tell you, Western Australia is putting on an absolute feast. The food down here looks sensational. Check it out. One thing I always get asked um, when I'm travelling overseas is, what is your favourite thing about Western Australia? And I quickly say the landscapes, the waves, the wine and the produce. All this food here is caught within the two capes, between Cape Lewin and Cape Naturalist. Uh, and the seafood here is the star. I think it's already been all eaten, though. Um, uh, the seafood, uh, the crayfish is caught off Augusta. They're two kilo crays, so they're really big. They're caught from 600 foot deep, and uh, yeah, everyone is absolutely loving it. We've got world number one right now, Jiao, Chunk, uh, Jiao Chanka, tucking in. And let me tell you, it smells pretty good down here, guys. Oh, can't wait for this, uh, this shift to end rich in the booth so we can get down there and enjoy some of that uh, incredible produce. But right now on the outside, we've just seen Italo finish off uh, a ride. He's up against Kanoa Igarashi. Needed a 5.44 out of that wave. Italo to, to get himself ahead of Kanoa. We've also got a, another stacked heat hitting the lineup here. Two surfers who've had a couple of clashes in the past at the CT le level. South Africa's Matthew McGilvray who's looking good uh, at the moment on the CT ranks, Seth Moniz. He's, uh, he's a superstar. He's had some solid finishes here at main break in the past, and he might need a, a solid one once again. Yeah, yeah, Seth, uh, he, he pulled it out of the bag yesterday, but we'll, we'll uh, discuss that down the line because another man screaming down the line here, and that's Italo Ferreira. Big, tall wave here, two-turn combination. It's been the order of the day for Italo. He's picking these waves that are allowing him to get two big turns. And uh, he's dropping some decent scores there. Needs a 5.44. And you'd have to think just on the intensity of those two turns, he just might do it. Yeah, there's uh, just so many things that we have to really look to confirm before we start. <laughs> announcing that people are safe but Seth coming into this event in 17th position you know he doesn't want to leave it to to chance uh, that there has been a, a few surfers below him that were in the top 22 that fell out of the mix uh, and there's only a couple of surfers below the cut line still alive in the mix so you'd think that he's probably pretty safe but he wants to get a big result he wants to reboot uh, the the kind of campaigns we've seen him put together as a CT surfer, in particular 2019 when he came on as a rookie and got all the way to 12th place. The last couple of seasons, he's been outside the top 20 and he wants to change that. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny, isn't it? A lot of these rookies, they come on with so much energy. They come on with a bang and so determined and they often have a really good year uh, in their opener, but then they fall away in, in, the, in the years after. So... Um, you know, Seth sort of, I guess, struggled for a little bit of form over the last few years, but I, I, he's starting to find it here. But he's got good energy at Margaret River in particular. Yeah, he also has, has had some injuries that he's had to overcome. And, and you know, that is kind of a, an underlying story uh, that 
you know, you can overlook sometimes when you're reflecting on, on where people have been finishing on the rankings. One thing's for sure, for me, Seth is part of one of the best CT finals that I've ever seen. Um, and that's after watching a whole lot of heats. What he was able to do in, in the final with Kelly Slater last year was just mind-blowing. Um, you know, turning in a near-perfect ride in, in the late stages. But uh, just his guts throughout his run to that runner-up finish at Pipe was next level. He, he took so many heavy beatings. He just kept paddling back out, asking for more and, and delivering just the most amazing barrel rides, especially a backdoor. Yeah, you'd have to um, say he is one of the most accomplished watermen in, in the big stuff. You know, he's he's not the biggest guy either, you know, but he's super, super strong. And obviously with that, uh, you know, Hawaiian blood, uh, super determined and, you know, gutsy sort of uh, experience is what, is what he shows us. And even yesterday, you know, he, he had to dig deep on his final wave through caution to the wind, big opening turn, saved himself basically. And uh, well, that may have set the tone for what's going to happen in this heat. Yeah, well, when, when you're the youngest of five siblings, you know, you're going to learn to take some punishment. Uh, but obviously those siblings get right behind him now. I'm sure they're all tuned in and watching along with mum and dad and Seth. He's uh, yet to put a big score on the board, but just holds a narrow lead uh, over Matty McGilvray, who, who's got to rate Margaret River as his favourite stop on tour, other than J-Bay, just for, for what it's given him. Uh, over the past couple of seasons, some yeah. big semi-final finishes. Yeah, big, uh, big results here for Matty McGillivray. And again, it's when you come back to these places where you've already done well, uh, there's a certain level of expectation and, and comfort you feel when you're surfing this wave. This is live action, Italo. Yeah, Italo just building at the moment. He, he's had a, a run of six-point rides, but... He wants more. He wants to start getting back up into that excellent range. Oh, my goodness. Can he ride out of this thing? Hanging on. That is just a wild set of rapids that you have to uh, try and power through. And he can't get back on top of his board. But, you know, he, he's a master at executing that backhand rotation. Felt like a, at one stage, you know, Italo would go to that turn so frequently that you kind of saw it coming from a mile away. But here at main break, going for that turn when the, the rock ledge is dry and you can't even really see where you're coming down. It is pretty impressive. It's another level of commitment. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's probably one of the hardest sections in pro surfing where you can attempt an air. Uh, just have a look at this. Matty McGillivray, will he ride through it? Nope. Uh, detonated with all that whitewash behind him. But, um, yeah, you could tell there, there was no hiding what uh, Italo's intentions were screaming down the line here looking for it just uh, uh, the speed of the rotation in the air was something to behold as well this was the opening carve you can see right here hits the brakes now he looks down the line okay there's my section i've got to get to it i've got to get the speed takes to the air front foot comes off gets it back on here somehow shoves the board back under his feet and was just laying back a little bit into the foam for a second there, we thought he was going to ride out, but uh, an incredible effort nonetheless. And out behind here, Matty McGillivray. Just a uh, big open face carve to start things off. And again, nothing for the judges to get overly excited about until this moment here. And they would have gotten really excited if he was able to negotiate through that whitewash. Not to be. Yeah, just uh, looking at that, you know, heat 15, uh, amazing just uh, thinking about uh, the, the incredible performances of, of Matty McGilvray and Seth. I, I think they had probably the, the two best waves of the 2022 season. Seth's uh, near perfect ride in the final against Kelly and then Matty McGilvray with that 10 uh, in Tahiti last oh, year. Yeah, that was, um, that, that, that Tahiti ride of Matty was just something to behold. He, he slid down the face of what must be a, a 10 to 12 foot Chopu beast and uh, was about as deep as you can get. Gone for all money and then he came through it. Here we go, Kanoa Igarashi up at the moment, trying to get ahead of Italo. Kanoa, he did so well down at Bells to elevate his position a little on the rankings, but he expects a lot more of himself and that's not it. Not on that final so section. Characteristic, man. You just don't see Kanoa do this very often. And uh, I just can't help but think there's 
there's a little seed of doubt in his mind just in terms of the way he's performing on these waves and the way he's approaching these waves that's that's starting to blossom and it's not blossoming in a good way yeah well he hasn't been past the round of 16 at this venue so that to come here looking for a big result is always going to be difficult he's had moments where he's looked like he switched back on like right there but then when he, he was just typically so strong at, at reading tricky sections and and getting his timing spot on he, he's kind of been dropping the ball more often than we've ever seen before he's normally so sure-footed in those situations and, and you know he's a closer he normally just puts two decent scores on the board starts to build and, and really just put he's the master at putting pressure on his opponents but um yeah I, i'm not too sure what what's going on there you know it's um you know chatting to mitchy ross he said he's feeling confident the equipment's feel, feeling good um i've been you know working with him personally on, on a couple of um you know different fin templates and just dialing that in with him when he seems happy in, in all elements there but i don't know it's weird when you just put in this situation where there's this tiny little bit of doubt in your mind i really feel like the uh, performance or, or lack of performance at the rip curl wsl finals last season kind of rocked him a bit he, he really wanted that opportunity to go after a world title he, he's always talking world titles and he finally put himself in a position to, to seize one and, and he just didn't turn up on that day no, it wasn't a, a, a typical Kanoa performance by, by any means, and he knew it as well. Um, but, yeah, in the lead-up to it, he was very vocal in saying, you know, the, I want the world title. That's why I'm here. That's the only reason I'm here. So, um, you know, it's, it's a big statement to live up to, and, and uh, you know, maybe momentum's just off a little. Yeah, the, the good news for him at, at this stage is it's pretty tight he's actually got the highest single rider of this heat so far 6.33 so uh, he's well within reach here only needs a 6.11 and no one's kind of really lit up heat 14 just yet italo hasn't had a a move that sort of moved us to the the edge of our seats or made us sit up here and, and kanoa igarashi's so capable of turning this around yeah, Kanoa just having a look at this set coming through. And, and with um, with Italo, I'll get back to this point in a sec because it looks like uh, Kanoa is actually going to take off here. Well, let's see if he can clean things up. He's had a, a, a number of average rides. And this one's looking a, a little cleaner through the inside. Falls off the roof of this one. Stomps it, gets back out in front again. So a, a cleaner sequence of turns. But again, didn't really find the, the space to truly open up on that ride as Italo comes flying down the right. And you know what he's thinking. Massive backside reverse. He's hanging on for the finish. Gets out in front. And he sticks it. And Woo. that is like a whole new level of commitment. That's a, a dry section. He's celebrating. <laughs> pointing to the flag on his shoulder. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so the point that I was just about to make when I said I'll get back to it was it's been a couple of events <laughs> as we see just... Mate, he's been looking for excellent scores for a while too. So he's uh, another guy, much like Kanoa, trying to surf his way into form. The thing about uh, Italo is he's... Uh, you know, he's, he's probably looked a, a little more switched on than Kanoa has. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, I look at the, the just the difference in speed, but have a look at this thing. Takes to the air, covers about 10 feet uh, in the projection of that backside rotation, and I can't even begin to explain just how turbulent this water is that he lands on. Does so well to get the projection here, Ron. Unbelievable. The, the thing about this ride is if he just takes a straight line out in front of this wave, it's still treacherous what he's attempting. You're basically surfing out over dry reef. But the thing is, he launches himself into the sky. Uh, we know he's got a high strike rate with that move. And there is, a, you know, times when, Rich, we've looked at that manoeuvre and said, yeah, we've just seen it so often, but we haven't seen too much of it this year from him. And that was a, a stellar version of the move again the point i was going to make is you know i, I feel like a, a couple of years ago we were always going how did he make that how did he do that oh my god he was surprising us every single heat and, and that's the thing that has been lacking until this point right now so you know uh, in terms of where the judges can go with this it's got to be up there it's got to be in the excellent range 
But just think if he does a couple of big old turns out the back and then does that. Yeah. I think um, it, it's fair to say he's getting back to that zone which saw him go on to, to win the world title with a move like that when he was fully stokehead. And, uh, you know, he sort of changed up the, the way he uh, approaches heats. He, he kind of, the past couple of seasons, has had this, like, crazy intensity pre-heat. We'll see if uh, we can get a, a good ride out of Seth here to uh, ignite what's happening in, in heat 15. Just swings the tail, loses control of that one. But let's try and dial up a, a replay again uh, of that big 9.03 for Italo. Because he just looked like he was having a whole lot of fun uh, after executing that move. Just oh, had so much speed. Yeah, uh, yeah. He was just hunting down the line here. Takes to the... It was so acrobatic uh, and, and gymnastic sort of form in, in how he did the rotation. And here's a better slow-mo angle of it. You can see here, OK, once he's in the sky, you can see the head rotation is almost ballerina-esque, the way he uh, <laughs> brings the top body, you know, top half of his body round, and then the lower half follows. And, uh, yeah, that's just sheer determination, the way he just muscled his way out of that landing. And uh, it, it's, it's that type of move that will just get all that Red Bull blood flowing <laughs> inside of Italo forever. He, he will feed on this like you wouldn't believe. That is one jacked-up ballerina, Rich. Uh, just looking so psyched and that was a big celebration super worthy too. 9.03 and Kanoa Igarashi you know, He's going to really struggle now to, to turn this one around. He's after an 8.98 and he had this one During the replay of that big backside air a couple of big blasts. Oh, <laughs> yeah, just two very solid maneuvers connected on the backhand and uh, an incredible wave stood right up for him and you can see blast the tail out it's a little drift on the coping the top of the lip there sits back on the heel side rail and again you know the, the backsiders they're, they're in a moment where they're sort of they're riding blind because they're looking back into the foam they're not looking down the line like the natural footers do a hyperactive high risk performance here from Italo and still pushing it on that final ride wouldn't be surprised if it goes into his top two as well and Kanoa Igarashi finds himself, you know, out of reach uh, of even getting in front here. This one is going to come to a close. There won't be opportunities for Kanoa by the looks of things. But what an amazing performance from the 2019 world champion. Looking uh, like he's getting back to his best, Rich. And it might be a big turning point performance for him. Yeah, this could be a, a moment in time uh, for this year where we really see Italo start to dig back into that performance where he's at the uh, at full sixth gear, high energy. You know, the turbo boosters are on because, uh, mate, that air was incredible. And Italo just confirms his position now uh, above that cut line and he'll be campaigning once again. And we know that if he gets to fifth place, he's a really good shot uh, chasing down a, a second world title. But that was a, a stunning performance and the move of the contest has been thrown down here in the round of 32. Yep. And, uh, well, it's it's come at the expense of Kanari Garashi, unfortunately. But uh, the man, he's all pumped up. Italo Ferreira moves through. Well, buckle up. We've got another big heat to round out the round of 32. The master here at main break, John John Florence up against Jake Marshall next. We'll bring in Joe Bugs and Felicity for the call. Everyone does their bit. 
our dunes and our coastline will be in a way better shape. To be able to give back to a place that's given me so much, it feels really special. Well, this is everyone's coast and it's obviously under a lot of pressure. We're helping to look after Gas Bay by stabilising the dunes and regenerating habitat. This is ground zero. We couldn't do it without collaboration. Do something really good on land, we see that positive just flow straight into the ocean. We're all connected to the animate and inanimate world around us. Without caring for country, the environment that we do benefit from now will diminish. Seeing the passion that these kids have, our coastlines are going to be in way better shape. They're probably planted more trees than anyone, it's so rad. Show us what you're doing to protect our one ocean by posting on social media with the hashtag WSL One Ocean and tagging WSL WSL One Ocean in your post. New look, same mission. We love the mission of WSL One Ocean, a lot of the world's best helping out the cause in Felicity Palmatier's backyard. I ran into everybody there over by Gas Bay and that Grunters region. It is oh so special and what a great reminder to everyone globally that they can also do their part as well. Felicity, I know you roam those trails a lot looking for perfect waves. It's got to mean a lot that the world's best showing up in your town are, are helping the cause as well. Yeah, 100%, Joe. I mean, as surfers, you know, we're custodians of the ocean, but not only the ocean, the beaches as well, and we spend so much time there. So it's great to see our World Tour surfers giving back and using that platform and, you know, spreading that word to our younger generation that we've really got to look after what we came here to enjoy. Wayne Rabbit Bartholomew looking comfortable on the Harvey Norman host set because it's party time. John John Florence just hit the water. Oh gosh, we've had some great heats today and we're always looking for when John John hits the water at Margaret's. It's uh, always a treat, but he's up against Jake Marshall who is surfing for his existence on the tour. What a big task to take on. Remember, we still have the priority heat of Seth Muniz and this man, Matthew McGillivray, who got the news yesterday that he had officially made the cut which was a big relief for him last year. He was so stressed out. He was so worried about missing out his, on his home break at Jeffreys Bay. He survived with some critical surfing last year, but definitely felt a little bit more comfortable in his second lap on tour. Yeah, I reckon you can definitely see that. And I love seeing that post heat interview yesterday. And, you know, when he got the news that he made the cut, just like the, the, the feeling of relief. And I guess now he gets to surf with a bit more freedom. So, uh, yeah, excited to see what he can do up against the best at main break. John John Florence setting up for Jake Marshall. This is a huge matchup. Jake in a must win situation to keep his spot on tour. And John John's the guy that throws down a master class at main break every time he competes. Well, one man just threw down a 17.53 combined total. <laughs> Italo's with Stace. Thanks, Joe. Italo, you are a maniac. That was crazy. Oh, yeah, that was a good hit for sure. And uh, I tried to uh, build a score in the beginning of the hits, you know, and because it's hot, you know, um, and it's overlapping when we have, like, not opportunity to get, like, all, like, the best waves, you know, because the other hit had priority. But um, I tried to... Um, get the little one and get a score and and start to move in, you know, and um, in the last minutes I had like a good opportunity to do something, you know, and I remember one before I missed the priority and then I missed the air and then in the next one I was like, okay, let's go, let's try something crazy here because um, I saw like a big wall and I was like, okay, let's do it again and they made it and then I go back again and I, I had like another one so I just want to say thank you God for everything and that was a good heat and I love surf you know I love how, how I can like build a score and, and try to create you know and sometimes I just need to catch a wave and surf you know. Absolutely and some even better news you have officially made the cut that must feel good. <laughs> that was so good you know because I was like so sad in the last couple of days and I've been talking with a lot of people you know and everyone just say, um, be yourself, Italo, and just surf, you know, no matter what's happening, you know, and, um, but it's, it is what it is, you know, and, and just, I just, this, this, I just do this for love, you know, and, um, and, and that's it. Awesome, brother. Congratulations. Fantastic performance. Thank you, Stace. Congratulations, Italo Ferreira making the cut. He is going to be fighting for a spot in the Rip Curl WSL finals this September, where he showed up every single year. 2019 world champ has a lot to celebrate as we see this man in motion John John Florence no matter what the size of main break he turns in a big performance that one he'll start off over the falls 
as he's battling with Jake Marshall. Priority Heat shows Matthew McGillivray with that famous frontside attack. Growing up surfing, maybe the best point break in the world in South Africa. Not afraid of heights at all. He jumps out of planes for fun <laughs> in his spare time, even in between events. <laughs> it's really cool to talk about all the highlights that he's had in his career, but it's kind of hard to go past his 10-point ride last year in Tahiti when he was upside down and on the foam ball. The look on his face was sensational, knowing that he got one of the best waves of his life while in the CT jersey. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be a really amazing feeling. I mean, it's really, really hard to do these days. I mean, it's always hard, but it feels like now more than ever, it's really hard to get a 10-point ride. So, I mean, those things, uh, that's a core memory. I mean, that's never, ever going to leave your memory. It's got to be up there with one of the, the best things in your life. Let's see what he accomplished on this one, Bugs. Yeah, well, he's been in a, a really low-scoring heat, and to me, this is he, you know, by far his best wave. So it's been a bit of a scrappy heat, but he finishes this one off and he'd be happy with that one because before that, his high mark was a 3.5. As we see that explosive layback carve and he extended through that turn. Always follow the board and the angle, how long it's engaged on those laybacks. You can see smoke screens sometimes when the board doesn't move. It can fill in kind of slopey sections, but that was a great version of a lengthy carve in that lean back fashion. 6.0 for McGillivray. 3.57 is his low score. And priority with the Hawaiian Seth Moniz. His father, famous Tony Moniz, competed on the tour for a long period of time. A big wave charger as well. Big part of the Eddie I Cow event. Seth was so happy to support his big brother Josh this year, who got to compete at the Eddie. As we'll see, this wave set up now. A little bit of room to set up an open face hook and potentially going for the air again. Wow. A solid rotation for McGillivray. He saves those punts for special moments. And he loves that ramp here at Main Break Flick. Yeah, that was really, really, really impressive. And I guess, you know, knowing the news that he's made the card, he's surfing with a lot more freedom and it's beautiful to watch because we get to see him open up. We get to, and here we are, we're watching a replay of this right now. So just the one section here and he's lining up for it, hits it beautifully and just absolutely stomps that. So look, that's got to be feeling good. One more look, wow. almost late to this section, but he hit it so perfectly, Bugs. Yeah, I think he's, uh, I think Italy Ferreira has just inspired Matthew <laughs> and maybe turned the, the tables here. You know, with, with one big maneuver, obviously this heat, it only ignited in, in the 30th minute with that six point ride. And then Matthew got basically a wave under priority and just went to town. Now seeing the wrapping turn to start things off for Jake Marshall. Nice cut back, looking connected to the face and ends up sliding out on a very important finish. I mean, you're thinking already it might be being Captain Obvious right now. You've got to be perfect against John John, especially at main break. An unfortunate fall there for Marshall when that wave started off really well. It did. And the thing, I, I totally agree with you. I think that wave uh, was pretty good. It was a smaller wave. I think he felt he had to do something really special at the end. Let's see what happened here, Flick. Yeah, so uh, nice deep bottom turn, wrapping around off the top there. And looking for the second section, he gets it. So he's done the work there, but uh, it was just this end section here. He really needed to make that last turn. But yeah, I guess that converging bit of water and yeah, just falling off. But live action out the back. Now setting up the bottom turn is the Hawaiian. Beautiful turn, Seth Moniz. Looks really solid so far. Through the first two power turns on the open face. Things slowing down a bit. So he's hoping for an end section to hack and he slips off again. So falling on the last turn, already looking to break down a 9.93. McGillivray for the punt, the big rotator, 6.93. 6.0 on the wave before where he featured that layback carve start. And now more action here. McGillivray sets up a beautiful bottom turn, explodes on that open face hook. 
straight up on the next section. Nice combination of turns. Nice, easy, stylish pace on the wrap. Fourth maneuver is going to be a little chip off the white water. Avoids dry docking himself. And looks calm and comfortable and remains in control of this heat bugs. He sure does. I mean, the, a six and then the six nine three really put him out front. It's not a massive score, but Seth is really yet to get his teeth into this heat. He hasn't had the completion yet. I think he's, uh, he waited a long time for that fourth ride, uh, and it just really didn't pan out for him. It, it fizzled, and then he went for a crazy move and didn't work out. Such a unique style. I love how he's starting off these waves. Yeah, I feel like uh, since that last wave, the 693, uh, for that one big air, if you, you can see it here. He's just surfing with confidence. After sticking a maneuver like that, that, that carries on that feeling, and you can see it in that turn right there. I mean, he just absolutely laid into that first turn and uh, with so much confidence. Well done for Matthew McGillivray. And then Seth's wave bugs. Yeah, Seth's wave. It starts out good here. It tapers off pretty quickly, Flick. I mean, it, those first two turns are good, and then this wave just gets um, loses a little bit of, amp you know, no warmth in this wave at all. Yeah, I, I really think you need that exclamation mark at the end, and that wave really didn't have it. I mean, those big scores are coming from those way, those you know, those big turns or big airs done on that critical part, and that wave just didn't have that end section that Seth was probably hoping for. Let's catch up with the the situation in the water. We've got Matthew McGillivray on the back of the Red Bull ski, six nine three and a six point zero. Last score five point seven, but just filled with so much confidence. Representing South Africa, giving Jordy Smith some backup. There's been some years where Jordy's been the only representative of South Africa. And every time I think of that, I think of one of Bugs's true rivals from back in the day, Sean Thompson, a world champion. Boy, that guy was hard to beat, wasn't he, Bugs? Oh, he sure was. You know, you put a you, you, you turn up in a wave with a barrel, and you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the evolution of tube riding. What movie was kind of the one movie you guys were a part of that kind of changed everything with turning in the tube, would you say? Oh, free ride. I had a feeling you were going to say that. Yeah, and it's coming out again. So uh, many generations haven't seen it. Uh, and it's um, it's been not remade, but it's been found. Uh, <laughs> you know, and back in those days, I think there was an issue with, you know, just a little issue with music rights and things like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing I love about your generation, guys like yourself, world champions like yourself and Sean, is they're so involved in pro surfing today. They really care about the next generation, and for Sean, especially the South Africans on tour. Oh, uh, Sean's so proud of um, uh, Matthew McGillivray. You know, he, he, you know, Jordy Smith. I mean, he's still, you know, Sean is so still backing Jordy Smith to win a world title. He, he believes in him, and uh, Matthew uh, is really waving the, the flag proudly. Well, Jordy Smith has Felipe Toledo in the round of 16. Medina will have Leonardo Fioravanti setting up his first turn as Florence. Absolute dagger in the pocket, big vertical, all kinds of variety, and this one a messy end section, but keeps that Paisel above water. So 1.5233 as he's getting started. John was famous for getting on tour in the rookie class of Medina Miguel Pupo. And he kind of had a little bit of that Ethan Ewing start where he'd have a nine or a 10, but he was getting knocked out early. And uh, before Ross Williams, he even started working with B. Durbage to work on heat strategy. A lot's changed since then. Here we go, Flick. Yeah, massive layback jam in the pocket, straight up into the lip on the second turn and just looking for an easy finish, but that wave wasn't easy. I mean, you could see the nose of his board just got stuck underneath the wave. But here we go, We're having a look at this first turn again, and absolute mastery in the pocket there. I love watching this romance, John John Florence and Margaret River Mainbreak. What a relationship. Laybacks look solid from John. He puts so much power into it, but shows that he's able to mix it up as well in that second turn, Bugs. Oh, he sure does. I mean, this way, when you see it live, you know, on his standards, it's a kind of ordinary ride. You slow it down, and it's a surf movie. <laughs> it certainly is. And the whole story for John is just having a completed season, trying to stay injury free because he pushes things so incredibly hard. Wrap to kick things off for Seth. Another wrapping turn. Moniz 
Needing an 8-9-3. Fits in another nice carve off the top of the wave and punches out the finish. Stays on his feet this time in a tough finishing section. Yeah, and he's looking, he's deciding whether to take the jet ski or paddle back out because that's his first really decent ride. You know, he was probably not going to get the nine-point ride in one chip, but he needed two goes and times against him. Two and a half minutes is still time, but he's really just only got himself into the heat at the 27-minute mark. I mean, the 37-minute mark. So this year it already started, and he made the switch to Sharp Eye Surfboard. So Seth Moniz has been working on just trying equipment over at Bells on some lay days. He just spent just tons of time just working out his quiver and found a lot of boards that he was really connecting with. And sometimes that's a big shift when you've had basically a lifelong shaper of Takoro and decide just to get a new feeling. And we'll see if he can come up with a big score. Now one minute 55 to go. So yeah. Waves on the way. Looks like some sets coming. It's been a, a, a bunch of sort of medium sized waves. I feel that Seth's been waiting for one of these big bombs. And here they come now. He, uh, I think he might be paddling back out. But there's uh, two guys in the lineup. Two guys are definitely going to get caught inside, it seems like. <laughs> Remember Seth coming in equal 17th with a few other surfers. Italo, one of them who got through his heat, but Cano was one of them who Italo knocked out in the previous matchup, heat 14. First wave going through unridden. Now a great shot of the lineup. Priority with McGillivray. Conditions flawless. Oh, wow. Here comes a bomb. And look at this yeah. wave. You can see that bubble in the face of the wave on the left-hand side there. When the when it gets a bit bigger, like that set wave, that's the takeoff spot. And uh, you can see that one just caught those surfers out there. But yeah, that bubble uh, up in the top right, that is the takeoff spot when it gets a bit bigger. So one of those surfers sitting pretty close to that bubble right now. And Flick, it, it's a, this is where it is tricky because you can have a, a period of time when you've got these medium waves, you, you kind of do the, the paddle onto that inside shelf. Uh, and then suddenly the big set comes, so you have to paddle out, you may be duck diving under it. Then you find yourself out the back uh, and you've got to go, well, do I come back in as they are? And it's an in and out sort of deal. Yeah, and if you're on the other side of the bubble, like too far out, you're not going to catch the wave. They're just going to kind of sneak underneath you. You're going to think you, you're going to turn. You're going to think you're going to catch this wave, paddle hard, and all of a sudden it's just going to scoop underneath you. But the ones that usually scoop past the bubble are usually the best waves because they have that bowl and they sort of double up and they hit the reef really nicely. Kind of like the ones that Liam was getting, Liam yep. O'Brien, yeah. Yeah, exactly like that. He is really noticeable on his waves. It looks like he's got a really good read on main break because he really was getting those ones that scoop underneath and are really bowly. Run out of time in the heat with Seth Moniz and Matthew McGillivray. McGillivray getting the jump on Seth and moving into the round of 16. And Seth Moniz will wait to see what will happen with his ranking. Coming in equal 17th himself and Cano went out. Ian Gentile was in that tie. Unfortunately, had to withdraw earlier. And also Italo breaking that tie in a positive direction, moving on into the next round. Round of 32 continues in heat number 16 with John John Florence and Jake Marshall with the lineup to themselves. Hopefully more big punts like we saw from McGillivray right after this. John John Florence, the man to beat, master class every time he performs and one of the coolest tens we've seen at main break as we flash back to 2021. 
He has such an amazing relationship with the ocean and finds barrels on demand. This one stretched out, had so much longevity. And look at that, one judge threw a 9-8, that's not even fair. <laughs> Waves like this don't happen every day. And just to note, he earned 41 excellent waves. He has earned 41 excellent waves in his career in just nine starts. Remember, if he gets another 10, he's going to get a Yeti 110 Tundra Cooler for earning that. Remember, Callum Robson got that back at Super Tubos for packing a cave. One man could get a 10 today. It's definitely a guy like John. He's had a lot of serious nines. He's basically nine this wave to death for so many years. I think that 2017 domination day, I don't even know if he reached that 10 because they kind of had to keep something special. He kept improving round by round. Let's get caught up in this one. Important heat for Jake Marshall as he digs in, Bugs. Yeah, an important ride for Marshall here. And he finishes this one. Does he ride out of it? He has to. And he hangs on. So this will get him into the heat. Jake is so powerful. Love the execution of that layback hack flick. Yeah, it was really well placed on that wave there and uh, bringing around into the second section, more of a transitional turn into this last section and he needs to make it count. Like Bugs said, he needs to ride out. This is an important heat for him and um, he does. Jake Marshall working with his almost a lifelong coach really and Chris Gallagher. So he's in good hands because Galley won this event when he was competing on tour. Such a smart human being. Uh, I live in the same neighborhood as Galley, and every time I walk next to him, I feel like I've learned something. You know, he gives you some knowledge. He's kind of a constant life coach, I think, for a lot of us that live close to him. He has great theories. He, he really understands uh, how to perform at a high level because he's been there. And for Jake, gosh, he, I think they met each other when Jake was probably about 10, 11. The cool about, about Galley is he's also a shaper. And so when you're growing and coming up through those amateur ranks, it's really hard to keep up with your dimensions because you go through a growth spurt. <laughs> Jake uh, said, you know, Galley said Jake wasn't shy. He'd order six boards at a time, you know. And <laughs> he'd get his 4.11s, 4.11 and a halfs, 5.1s. And the cool part about that was they ended up being hand-me-downs for, for Jake's younger brothers as well. Yeah, it's cool. And, uh, you know, Chris Gallagher is such an amazing character. He's like, you know, as a person, there's no zigging and zagging. There's no double pump. Him. He just cuts straight through it. <laughs> yeah, totally. 15 on the clock here. Let's hear from Ethan Ewing with Stace. Does your surfing feel as good as it looks? <laughs> uh, I'm not really. Sometimes I look at the, I mean, I feel good and I look at footage from like, my dad shoots and I'm like, far out, <laughs> having a shocker. But uh, yeah, I'm just uh, having fun and yeah, try and surf good all the time. So Yeah, Ryan Callan had mentioned a similar thing. Obviously your scores weren't through the roof then. Little texture on the face out there. So how do you kind of match your performance to the conditions? Uh, yeah, I kind of had a feeling that uh, watching this morning I was howling offshore but I had a feeling that I was going to go on shore, so I was kind of preparing for that. Um, but yeah, like second wave of the set and things like that kind of make a difference. It's not usually smoother. Um, but yeah, there's still some really good waves out there. So yeah. We saw an air from Italo a few moments ago. Uh, comment? That thing was huge, right on the end section too. So that was really sick. <laughs> Thanks for your time, Ethan. Well done. Wondering if Ethan was going to react to that. What a great question, Stace. You know, are you allowed to celebrate your competitors? and? Ethan obviously wanted to honor that big punt from Italo. And we'll see if he uh, ends up throwing it down in the same heat because Ethan and Italo are going to be competing against each other in the round of 16. Oh, wow. Talk about a contrast of styles, Bugs. Oh, fireworks. Setting this one up. Jake just looks, doesn't have priority. Here comes the man to beat, Florence. Nice, cool roundhouse cut back. Resets off the bottom. There's a cool version of that layback. So even the layback that he relies on has variety to it. Sat on the rail a bit, then punched the fins out, highlighting that finishing section. Yeah. Jake Marshall's last wave, a 6-8-3. Got himself out in front, but the previous wave for John was a 7-8-3. And with John getting that last wave, we'll see the lead switch once again. Yeah, we'll see it switch, but Jake Patterson, he's got himself into this heat. He's, he, he's uh, just trailing by a point leading into this wave here. And it really comes down to this one last turn. This is sensational. What do you get for one incredible layback? 
Pretty cool how he could sit on it and distribute his weight all the way to his back foot when he needs it, Flick. Yeah, it's, it, you talk about the variation there, and he did the layback, but then he let the fin slide across the top of the lip. I mean, that takes some serious technique and skill. So, look, I think it's going to be a pretty good score. So for John, it's been all about staying healthy. It was so tough at G-Land last year when I thought I saw a knee brace. I almost didn't even want to mention. I was like, this can't be happening again. The amount of surgeries that John's had in a short period of time on both knees has been heartbreaking for him and also for his fans around the world. The whole goal is to have John at 100% level, Medina fully engaged, and I'll both experience the Rip Curl WSL finals together. You know, add Italo, all the in crazy world title threats that we have this season. So for John, it's just a, the amount of water he pushes. And he's kind of testing what your body can handle at this level. He's learned a lot about his, about his body and how to take care of it. But also at Hall Eva, one thing I notice is he goes through a lot of fins. He pushes so hard, he's, he explodes his fins off his board. <laughs> I, you don't see that every day. No, you don't. But with uh, layback hacks like John John's, I can see why that would happen. <laughs> there's a lot of water dis being displaced, and there's a lot of power behind those turns. And he's got a lot of signature models of future fins. That solid base that allows him to drive. And when the waves get bigger, he'll often go to a smaller fin, a medium fin in bigger surf. And I, I guess for Felicity, yeah, that's pretty common, isn't it? Actually getting a medium fin on some of the bigger boards. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I even look, if I even look at some of the big, big boards I ride, like a 10 foot board, those fins, they're not actually that big. You know, they're quite small. At the back, we're seeing maybe some action here. Jake Marshall's turn to answer back. Needs a 787. Climbs and shows the frustration of that wave going flat under his feet. Yeah, well, John John really, you know, had a, I think he sold him on that one pretty well. He, he got straight off the ski, came across and really looked at that one with a lot of intention. There was a bit of back forward, back forward, and, and then Jake went, I'll go. So Jake Marshall is probably trying to remember that heat that he had with John at sunset last year as a rookie when he was able to take him down. Florence, though, is setting going up off the bottom. How about that? Lay back, but extends the carve in the pocket, drills the timing off the lip, and shuts it down nice and easy. Two-time world champ, feeling good at main break, as expected, as he's looking to ditch a 687. Wow. And once again, we get to see another variation of the layback hack. That one was different again. Bugs, why is it so reliable, that technique on that layback for John Florence? I actually think if you really watch closely, I mean, you know, he puts, he, unless you do it technically wrong, you're going to put so much pressure on your lower back. But often he puts his, his back arm into the, into the lip of the wave. And uh, that was a different one all ago <laughs> again. <laughs> wow. Amazing approach from Florence. So much variety, so much torque, so much speed and power. It reminds him a lot of home, and you can tell how comfortable he is. Yeah, you really can. I mean, there's so many similarities between here and Hawaii. We, we talk about it all day long, but yeah, look at this hack. Absolutely laying into that. The back arm is in the wall of the wave and slides the fins. Yet again, another variation of that layback hack. We love to see it. And that back arm, he really did have it in there for a long time, and he pivoted it on that. Second turn, just as solid, just as dynamic, and he's able to pick it up to just grease the finish nice and easy. Wow, you could watch this all day. You know, I'll tell you what, I mean, that, that, the shoulder there, it's, it's under immense pressure when you're doing that kind of maneuver. Then we saw Jake Marshall here throw down the snap, back it up with a carving cutback. So after he took the wave that he ended about the back, he found a couple of nice sections, but He's got some catch-up work to do. Florence just locked in an 8.5. Let's now make it 42 excellent waves in his career at main break. Marshall needs a 9.5 at least to keep his spot on tour. And he's down to eight minutes. Let's catch up with McGillivray with Stace. Matthew McGillivray taking some uh, inspiration from Italo Ferreira there, mate. 
Yeah, and no, I was stoked to stick that air um, with the light variable winds and a couple of big sections. It's always in the, in the back of my mind that I want to go to the air, and then that wave just provided the perfect section. <laughs> You're not scared of anything, are you? Uh, some things, for sure. <laughs> yeah. How's the heart rate compared to jumping out of a plane? Uh, it's pretty high at the moment. It's such a hot day down here, and I'm still in the 3-2, and I should probably be in like um, board shorts uh, with a wetsuit top. Um, so I'm sweating, but yeah, I know, stoked. Yeah. Um, gonna have to go wash this off. Go jump back in the ocean. <laughs> jump up in the ice bath. Uh, a quick sing out back home, mate. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to give a shout out for someone, a uh, South Coast surfer back at home, um, Jared. Uh, he found out that his mom has cancer and has a year left to live and um, unfortunately they're not in a good financial situation so he's actually having to leave her to go work overseas to get income to send back to her and they're not able to spend time together so uh, we've set up a GoFundMe page and the links in my Instagram bio and it'd be awesome if people can support him so that he's able to spend time with his mom uh, for the next year and yeah we can make it a really comfortable year for them um, so check out the link in my bio. On you Maddie. well done. Matthew McGillivray surfing for a great cause sending all the love to all of his friends and family back home. Definitely jump onto Maddie's Instagram and find out more information on how you can help his cause. What a great punt. He's got so much variety, and I love that he saves those ramps for special moments. It's pretty common we see him do it at main break, but it feels so good to see his depth. Big carves, big airs, great balance in his repertoire as he moves on to the round of 16. He will be taking on the winner of this heat. At the moment, it seems like John will be there. 8-5 on his last. 7.83 is his low score. And Jake Marshall searching for a 9.5. We talked about the challenge today for USA. Kelly Slater going down as well as the greatest of all time. And not making the cut. Uh, Kolohe Andino as well. Longtime veteran. Former top five athlete. Knocked out earlier today. Jake Marshall trying to get into the next round to join Griffin Colapinto. Nat Young also lost to Yago Dora. So a tough one for the Americans at main break as we check out the Harvey Norman recap. Here's the John John show flick. Yeah, it's just been layback after layback, different variations of that, and absolutely stealing the show. I mean, such great surfing that we've seen with him. Also, Jake Marshall got involved with a 683. Still his best score of the heat. So not comboed. Just needs to pick the best waves of the matchup and try to form out a way to pull up a big upset. If he takes out John, it'd be the biggest upset of the season, Bugs. Yeah, well, a lot of variety shown on this wave by John. And it's an 8.5, well within his wheelhouse, but it's scintillating surfing. It's party time with John John Florence. Gosh, it certainly is. I mean, this is a venue where he'd travel to even if there wasn't a contest on. Talk about all the great movies, parts that are filmed here on your coastline, Felicity. And John's always loved it. He's even brought guys like Bruce Iron, some of his heroes of the past, to come free surf with him up and down this coast. He's one of those guys, if the contest ends early, he doesn't really want to leave. He just wants to stay in this ocean and, and feel the power. Yeah, it's, it's one really amazing thing about Western Australia. You know, we it's the biggest state in Australia, and we have got such a big coastline, which means a lot of opportunity for waves, and especially within these two capes here, Cape Naturalist and Cape Lewin, there is hundreds of waves, hundreds of opportunities, and that all break, you know, on different uh, conditions. So no matter what the conditions are, you're guaranteed to find a wave. How good is that? John Florence, seventh in the world, moved up a few spots. His best result of the season came at Bells. Ended up losing in the semifinals there. He hasn't featured in a Rip Curl WSL final yet just because he's gone through some injuries. So looking on point to get there. When you look at this venue on tour, you look at Tahiti, those look like serious strengths. And remember, his first CT victory ever was in Brazil when he did a big backside full rotation to beat Joel Parkinson back in 2012 marking his official arrival to the title race. 315 though, pressure on Marshall, especially without having priority bucks. Oh, it's a very difficult equation here for Jake Marshall. Three minutes, John John Florence with priority, Jake needing. It's a one shot 9-5 now. He's gotta be thinking 
Italo Ferreira channeling Italo. <laughs> Certainly. Italo was lights out today. Kind of using that move that can get him out of jail at all times, whether it's a closeout beach break or the ramp on the bricks at main break. Big backhand full rotator. As Italo is off and running to take on Ethan Ewing in the round of 16. Dreamy conditions. We'll get this one going with Jake Marshall. Important ride. Carves it off the top. Member needs a 9-5 here. Nice snap, looking comfortable, not in a rush. End section approach, attacks it off the top and stays on his feet. He's down to 2.15 on the clock. Does he have time for another shot? Well, if he could get a seven-point ride even and then get the miracle ride out on the jet ski and then paddle across and John John's not in the lineup, yes. <laughs> so the challenge is there, isn't it, Bugs? Two minutes to go, Marshall. Probably just looked like he wanted to stay within himself on that one. Didn't try to over-surf any section. And it probably uh, how he started off this heat with a fall. He was probably going for broke in the beginning and trying to settle himself down. Yeah, yeah. When you have a couple of falls in the start of a heat, it can sort of rattle your confidence. But uh, here we go. We're having a look at the replay of his last wave. Look, I don't, it's not going to be the 9-5, but it is a nice way at chipping away at the score. But... It is going to be a hard task ahead of him. Like Buck said, he's got to get the amazing jet ski right out the back, and then he's got to hope that John John has uh, taken a wave and the lineup is free. Which in itself is dangerous, John John taking a wave. That means something. <laughs> <laughs> so for Jake Marshall, he'll head back out and just see if he can pull off a miracle. A 5-9-3 on that last wave, so still needs a 9-5. Yeah, I mean, it's a, look, it's a respectable performance, though. I mean, he's got a 12.76. It's still pretty decent. But uh, he's really come up against uh, someone who's just in another class in uh, at, at this break. And for John, he's in his happy place. He's probably pinching himself. He's by himself in the water at main break, <laughs> and it's firing. It's a rare occurrence out here, especially when it's this good. His younger brother, Nathan flew over to join him just like he did last year Nathan does that a lot a talented free surfer absolute charger yeah he's been I'm a slab specialist forever oh. and I think anytime he's like okay John I'll help you out in an event and be your support crew I'll, let me pick the West Oz event I'll be there <laughs> yeah and on the way I'll get a couple of slabs in Sydney <laughs> then I'll come over here get the box get the wave of the day <laughs> uh, and Nathan's one of the funniest guys to talk to he really enjoys his life as a pro surfer super unique and it, just planning his road as a pro surfer and super proud of his big brother, just like Ivan is as well, the goofy foot. And they'll close this one out. Another all-star performance from John John Florence. Always the man to beat when we come to the West. Unfortunately for Jake Marshall, he'll have to be packing his bags for Snapper Rocks. The bonus for Jake, he will get to surf one of the best rights in the world at Snapper Rocks. Florence moves on into the round of 16 where he'll face Matthew McGillivray as this one continues. What a round to digest. So many scenarios, and I think we might be getting really close to kind of closing out the whole story of the midseason cut for the men, but a lot more stories to round out for the women as the round of 16 is coming up next. World number one, Molly Picklum taking on main break against one of the best out here, Courtney Conlog. We'll bring in Ronnie Blakey and Richie Lovett for the call.
sneaky one. And uh, you see him in the beer tent, say hello. She's like a spicy one. So I think she's going to be the main driver in the sense of like just spicing it up of like, she don't care. She's like, he's going to do whatever she wants to get what she wants. And then all of us are like, well, we will, we will do that too then. This new generation don't lack confidence and we're all going to push each other like crazy. Looking forward to watching the entire conversation between Joe Tapel and Molly Picklam in their one-on-one -on -one chat. You can catch it and more on worldsurfleague.com. Some really good insights to be gained from uh, those deep dives into the, the mindset of our championship tour athletes. Ronnie Blakey and Richie Lovett here on the Harvey Norman host set. What a day, Rich, and it's not over yet, mate. No, no, we're far from over. Uh, we're switching uh, into the women's tournament now, but uh, what a day of competition. Just flawless Margaret River main break this morning. Uh, wind's puffed up a little bit, but just some of these rides, so it's gone way into the excellent range and uh, incredible action. Yeah, and I know the, uh, the team's working overtime to try and get a, a really clear picture of what's unfolded with the cut on the men's side because there wasn't a whole lot of movement from below the cut line. Uh, from competitors, Baron Mamiya, I think, is the only surfer still alive that was coming into this event below the cut line. So uh, that suggests that someone who came into the event above the cut lines anxiously uh, waiting to hear what their fate might be. But let's now switch our attention over this first clash. The current world number one, Molly Picklam, is out there in that leader's jersey. Looking sharp in yellow down at Bells Beach. Another strong result for her down there. A runner-up finish to Tyler Wright. She's up against Courtney Conlog. And these two, well, they've got some head-to-head -head history. Don't worry about that. Just one heat, but pretty interesting. It was actually here at Mainbreak last year. They met in the quarterfinals, and Courtney got the jump on Molly in that exchange. Yeah, I feel like uh, this is a, a pet event for Courtney Conlog just by the sheer nature of it being one of these bigger open ocean swells events. She just rubs her hands together whenever there's a bit of juice involved uh, loves the bigger waves and uh, really on her forehand here we know she can throw down some of the biggest moves uh, in the women's side of the draw here she's up against it the youngster molly picklam sort of coming in uh, pressure free really even though she's welling wearing the yellow uh, leader jersey just feeling no pressure at all she uh, she talks the talk, Molly, but she she backs it up with really strong performances. You know, this time last year, Molly was really uh, in a precarious situation. She needed a big result. She fell short. Courtney knocked her out in the quarters, and she was uh, bumped off the CT. But she did have two quarterfinals in her rookie campaign. Uh, the the interesting thing is that it didn't take her long to to tap into winning form she came back quarterfinal at pipe and just uh, her seventh ct event she broke through for a victory and, and she hasn't missed a final series this season so uh, a win a second a couple of quarters the surfer from the central coast of new south wales is just a light at the moment yeah yeah full of confidence and uh, the results are coming as well a little bit of jockeying going on here you can see just uh using each other as a, a priority buoy at the moment and uh, Courtney going around Molly, Molly going around Courtney, and at the moment it's it's Molly with the inside track here. So a little bit of cat and mouse, and the youngster just having none of it. She's just saying, "Yep, I'm going to go where I want to go." Just that little soundbite then we got from the the one-on-one -on -one conversation with Joey, and you know Molly, you know it's it, it's not a uh, a show. The the confidence is real. You can tell uh, she really believes in, in this next generation and just how keen they are to push these veterans who've had their way with the tour for a, a really long time, over a decade now. And uh, Courtney, one of the most winning surfers on the CT. But, you know, the, the heat wins and, and the event wins have been a little few and far between these days. Yeah, and for a while now, those um, the household names, they kind of had the, the women's tour on lockdown, didn't they? And, and things are definitely shifting up. You know, you're talking about the, the, the new breed coming in and the youngsters sort of... Uh, wanting to get their place well they're getting their place right now but they're gonna have to just wait a second here and navigate through this big set wave that's uh, approaching the lineup as confident as molly picklin might be i do feel like this is one of the more dangerous draws that she could face in this event courtney loves the power of this location 
doesn't ever uh, hold back from, from stepping onto a, a step up board. She's probably more inclined to do that than any other surfer in, in the CT ranks. And, and when there's a bit of push out there, she's never undergunned. No, and uh, further to that point, I feel like Courtney's one of the women who who matches the power as it gets bigger too. She doesn't shy away from it. Uh, sometimes you'll see a surfer just, you know, going with the wave, not really sort of pushing into it. But uh, Courtney, she really stands up to it and matches it power for power. And, and if that means jumping on a bigger board, she certainly uh, takes those opportunities, but feeling very comfortable here in the West. 30 years of age, Courtney Conlog, a two-time runner-up to the world title has uh, always finished inside the top 10 and a lot of finishes in inside the top five as well. Just a, a force, one of the most winning campaigners we've ever had on the CT. 13 championship tour wins uh, at events all over the schedule. Margaret's has been a, a real pet event for her, uh, especially uh, when it was at, at a QS status. She came over here and just owned it. Yeah, and uh, traveling over here with, with her mum, Tracy, and uh, they sometimes do it a little differently as well. Just uh, opting to stay in, in you know, the local uh, parks and, and caravan parks and, 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 you know, houses that are closer to the beach, closer to the action, really tapping into nature here. So Courtney, uh, a, a victory here in 2015. She also had back-to-back -back victories in, in the QS event 2011, 2012. There's a, a few surfers that kind of have multiple wins here and they did them at uh, the different grades of the event. Tom Carroll, he had a couple of victories, also won it as a lower rated event. John John Florence as well. As we see Courtney up here on her first ride and she's just victim to that, that vice like uh, finish to the wave here at main break. Can really catch you out sometimes. You see people trying to outrun it and, and you know, a, a surfboard simply isn't fast enough sometimes. You, you, you need a motor on your, yeah, your boat. Absolutely. And, and, you know, sometimes it's it's two and almost three different swells meeting in one place. As we see Courtney, she'll just navigate over this rock ledge here. And great technique there. She keeps uh, the fins at the bottom of her board. Out of danger here, but here we go. On this opening ride, it was Courtney who uh, managed to get the inside track slopey uh, face here gets some roundhouse cutbacks in through to the inside and jams his final turn but uh, just an avalanche of whitewash comes down behind her yeah waiting on the scores to come through and while we do we're going to hear from the winner of the last seat of the opening round for the men getting the jump on jake marshall was john john florence and he's with stace Getting pretty late in the afternoon here, John. What do you prefer, early morning, midday, or Arvo heats? Uh, I think I like midday heats the best. Um, gives you time to kind of sleep in, go for a surf, and then go for your heat. But the afternoon heats are not bad to you. They're, they're just, uh, there's a lot of time from when you get up in the morning to that heat, a lot, of, a lot of time to think about it. A lot of time to think about squaring up the uh, the match card with uh, Jake there. He got you in Sunset a couple of years ago. And uh, pretty similar wave here to Hawaii, a lot of power. Did you take that in consideration to today? Um, I kind of just took take the heat as I take all my other heats, just kind of went out there and tried to, to, to do my best. Um, it's actually a little tricky right now because it's, uh, it's clean, but it's got a little bit of a lump on the face. And so it's kind of tricky to fit the turns in and find those ones that double up. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I was, I was stoked to get Jake back for that heat because he got me in Sunset. And he's just such a good surfer in these types of waves, real powerful. And, um, so it's always fun to win heats like that. Absolutely. Well done. And we'll uh, likely see you tomorrow. Cheers. Thanks, Dice. Yeah, John John, just looking supremely confident at the moment. Didn't uh, put together the kind of performance which saw him top score on the uh, opening day of competition for the men, but just looked in control throughout that battle with Jake. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, uh, John, John's a bit of a surf rat too, you know, when there's perfect waves around, he'll tap into it. Uh, knowing that he has a heat on in the afternoon and, you know, comes back for it there, but... Obviously didn't expel too much energy because he really did put in a, a fine performance against Jake Marshall. And we're used to seeing that from the man who has uh, just an incredible tally of excellent scoring rides here. And I don't think he's done just yet in this event. Well, just on 35 minutes to go, Molly Picklam 
She's already confirmed, uh, obviously, uh, as having made the cut, not missing a final series yet this year and, and taking a win and a runner-up finish. But Courtney Conlog, she came into this one in a pretty stressful situation, sitting in 14th place, despite the fact that she uh, did have a runner-up finish to Katie Simmers over in Portugal. So she's getting the job done at the moment, just keeping herself alive in this draw. But, you know, for someone like Courtney, uh, surviving the cut is one thing. She wants to get back to that high end uh, of the rankings. As a, but this is a, a must-win heat for her, Rich. She's got to get through this one. Yeah, she really does. And, and uh, you know, I, she, I think she handles pressure well. I don't feel like she's really, you know, watching the ratings and thinking about them too much. I feel like she's just gone back to the default of, OK, let's just take this heat by heat, wave by wave. Don't get too... Uh, caught up in the hype around Molly Picklem. Let's just stick to the guns. And, you know, when it comes to finding those big open face waves, she's going to lay down those big turns. That's always been her ammo, and she's going to go to it. I expect more from you. <laughs> okay, I expect more truth. You're a former competitor. Are you <laughs> telling me when there is a mathematical... Uh, equation that you've got to figure out or a, a goal that you've got to get to an event that you're able to block out what that goal is and go and compete and surf wave for wave. I'm not Did saying that? that I could do it. <laughs> what I'm saying is that Courtney's probably Courtney done do that because is, I think... Is any competitor honestly ever in that situation though where they're able to block out where they need to get to in an event to keep their place uh, on tour? Yeah, look, honestly probably not. Like it's a little, it's a little worm in the back of your mind there but... I, I, my point is that she is so experienced uh, and, and perhaps not experienced in being in this situation, but I feel like she's got that much confidence in herself and, and especially at, at this break here, that if she gets the wave, she's not going to hold back. She's going to jam a massive turn. But Thank yeah. you for coming clean. Yeah. <laughs> because that, that was uh, about as honest as Kelly saying, oh, is the Surf Ranch the next event on the schedule? <laughs> You're like, come on, mate. Come on now. Fair go. Uh, but this is, you know, certainly an important one for Courtney. And, you know, she has been in that situation and, and survived it. So uh, she, she, I think, has the belief that, that she can still win events. I don't, I don't think she's reached the point in her career where she's no. thought, oh, this next generation's got me covered and whatever happens, happens. I, I think she's in this fight. Well, I, I, that's what I'm, I, I believe that for sure. You know, she's... Uh you know, having conversations with her at Bells and even here, it, it, there's no hint of, of a sense of not belonging. Uh, there's no hint of uh, doubt in, in the way she was talking. And, you know, it's all about what's going on out there. I've had the free surfs. Equipment feels good. Doing saying and doing all the right things. So, um, you know, the, the moment you let too much of that noise in, you've kind of finished. You know, that's when the cracks really start to expose. We were really talking about how great this matchup was before coming into the booth, we but were. we can really look forward to some amazing heats in the round of 16 for the women. Unbelievable. Uh, close battles that I was having a really hard time deciding who might progress through some of these clashes. Yeah, well, this next one with uh, Betty Luce, Akuta Johnson, and uh, Bronte McCauley up against the local. And Bronte is, you know, she's had time on the championship tour. She's been a regular there and uh, certainly will have some hometown advantage. Carissa Moore. Sophie McCulloch, that's a, a really good one, but have to maybe give the edge to the more experienced Carissa Moore out here. Tyler Wright, Joanne DeFay, that's a cracker. Yeah, that is uh, a really gnarly heat. Plenty of uh, heat surf between those two in the past. 15, in fact. 10 going Tyler's way, 5 going Joanne's. Uh, and Joanne looking to make a, a big return to competition during this uh, Australian league. We've got some uh, time here at the moment. Just the one score on the board for Courtney Conlog. It's a 3.17. Stace keeping himself busy, roaming around the site, and he's down there in the Red Bull Athlete Zone. Here in the Red Bull Athlete Zone with Griffin Colapinto. Griffin, you had a bit of a war with uh, the rocks this morning. Pretty good way to sort that out up here in the uh, sauna ice bath combo. Oh, yeah. Got straight in there, did a three minutes ice, and then jump in the sauna, and you just overlook and main break and the box. and sun's beautiful really it's uh the dream scenario i always thought like if i were to own a house somewhere the dream would be have a sauna and ice with an amazing view and that's what we have here so um yeah just soaking it in you've sold it i might have to go plunge thanks griff all right thanks Dave. <laughs> in the zone and just start uh, looking out over main break on a, a beautiful afternoon and get those classic sunsets here rich over the water
And uh, yeah, it's just just magic. The sky lights up and. You know this lineup's going to come to life too after we finish competition today because everyone's going to get want to get that that extra little surf in before uh, we move into the next rounds. But this has been a, a pretty slow heat. I mean, Courtney's got one ride, a 3.17, and we're going to see just how composed the current world number one can be here. The youngster, she's uh, out there with priority, and not much has come her way. No, no, it's uh, gone to sleepy time in the afternoon here. But I feel like things are about to heat up, uh, just sort of gazing over my shoulder. I can see a set starting to roll in. So, uh, yep, yeah, only a matter of time. Well, it's not just a set, it's a huge one. It's a bomb. They're actually going to have to scratch for the horizon here. Now, they've, they've experienced such whopping conditions here over the past couple of seasons, Rich, but for the competitors, they wouldn't be too frazzled by the the size of this one even even though for someone surfing main break for the first time you're, you're probably paddling a little harder than these two are at the moment yeah for sure uh it, it's definitely a challenge surfing this place but have a look at the line on this thing kind of wonder whether you could have been right in deep there surfing along this wave so perhaps just uh molly and courtney just a little out of position here maybe uh with such a long lull and and the and, uh, you know, you heard Felicity talking this morning about the boils and the bubbles in the lineup. And that's often used as a, as a gauge on where to sit out there. And, uh, you know, when it goes flat, those boils tend to go a little bit quiet. So perhaps just drifting out of conditions. And that's why it's important when you, whenever you're surfing, not just here. Doesn't matter if we're at a beach break or a reef or point, whatever it is, you've always got to have a lineup on land where, where it's possible. Uh, and have maybe two, and then you kind of get your little triangle going. Uh, and that's how you know you're in the right spot. Love it. Just over 27 and a half minutes to go here. 3.17 has Courtney Conlog out in front. We're yet to see the current world number one come to life in this round of 16 heat. We're going to take a quick break. We've got more action coming your way right after this. Margaret River is a beautiful part of the world. It's one that stands out. It's just fresh air, clear water, tons of swell, lots of different ways to surf. Today, just had some golf with the guys. We actually had a great match on our end. In my foursome, it was myself and Joe Trippel against Ronnie, Blakey, and Rich Lovett. They started out beating us from the first hole. We tied them up on 17. They had to make a putt on the last hole to match us day we had today was amazing. Golfing here, uh, just being on a course with kangaroos is something different. It's, it's definitely not normal to a person like me and someone from Hawaii. We went to Xanadu and had amazing wine. Pretty cool experience seeing the, the whole process and how this wine's created. The wineries are great, the food's really good. Not much bad to say about this place to be honest. Just a beautiful place to be and we look forward to coming back here every year. There is nothing bad you can say about this place. The Southwest has it all. We've had incredible waves through the opening days of, of competition, and this has been uh, all time, but it's gone a little quiet for this first heat of the round of 16 for the women. Molly Picklam, she's had uh, this priority for some time now. The good news for Molly is Courtney didn't really post a, a big number to kick things off, so she still has a, you know, a, a chance to win the opening exchange and take control heading into the, the final 25 minutes here. Ronnie Blakey with Richie Lovett. Richie, a big day with a lot of highlight moments and some huge individual turns. Uh, thinking back to what Italo was able to throw our way. But uh, when I think about big moves at this location, 
I think this is where Molly sort of tapped into her potential uh, as a competitive surfer last year. Uh, early on in the event, uh, surfing against Tyler Wright in the round before the quarters this round, she dropped a 9.17 for, for a single carving turn. And she might need one of those against this competitor. Courtney Conlog up on her second ride here, driving up into the section. Nice flowing hit. Doesn't really uh, get much more out of it than that, though. And there's some waves standing up on the outside. Looking into the sun, we see Molly Picklam cut a nice line in the pocket. A solid carve. She climbs up on top of the section. Oh. Wow, throws the tail right straight over the top. Courtney Conlog there. And uh, you you got to wonder if, you know, that had a, an effect on her riding out of that move. Yeah, you'd have to think that, um, you know, she would have seen her out of the corner of her eye. Definitely would have had an effect as we just uh, check out the replay here. This is Courtney's ride first. So just sets the board in motion and uh, it's a bit of a snap off the top to start things off. And then that second turn on the steeper section. So it's a good two turn combination. And Molly's wave cupping out a little bit more. Slices. Nice cut down here. And then goes up for this real radical late hit. But, um, you know, Courtney was positioned directly under. Really not too many. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure what Courtney could have done to get out of the way. But this opening carve was uh, really on rail for Molly Picklam here. And this section was setting up so well. And right there, she's got eyes on Courtney going, whoa, and uh, Rao, just a really dangerous situation there. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, you can't intentionally get in the, the line of your competitor, and you've got to do what you can to get out of the way. But you know, there, there's not a whole lot of room to move in that situation. There, there's, you know, a shallow reef shelf on the inside. Courtney's trying to get back out into the lineup. Just an unfortunate situation there. But, uh, yeah, we're waiting on the numbers to come through for Molly. I think she'll get some credit for that opening carve. She's one of the most well-rounded surfers we've had join the, the ranks. And she's, you know, capable of drifting that tail on a, a heavy section and riding on out. Yeah, well, the golden rule when someone's coming down the line at you and you're paddling out, you always go to the whitewash. You always try and go behind them. You never try and outrun them. And... Uh, yeah, oh, I just feel like in that situation, Courtney really didn't have anywhere to go. Maybe just turn around and paddle the other way. Um, but it was a 3.9 for, for Molly, 4.67 for Courtney. And uh, no, no calls being made from the panel. So I think they saw that as, you know, a, a very unintentional situation, obviously. And uh, these two will battle it out in the back half of their heat now, uh, assuming ultimate priority over these two surfers who have entered the water now. Betty Lou Sakura Johnson, the Hawaiian, who gave us uh, some great moves in, in the opening round. Maybe the turn of the opening day for the women. Big fin three. Uh, slicer across the roof of the wave. And she uh, got herself an 8.83 for that turn. Bronte McCauley, capable of some uh, great stuff here at main break as well a former semi-finalist in this event. Yeah, and uh, another goofy first natural matchup here. And uh, Betty Lou really strong on the forehand. And, and I guess there's, I guess, some similarities between decent size Hallie Eva and the right-handers here at Margaret River main break. And just we know how well that Betty Lou can surf out at Hallie Eva. But uh, she's up against it here. Bronnie McCauley, one of the strongest uh, backhand surfers in the women's field. And uh, surfing pressure free here, not not actually part of the the tour right now. So um, you know, Bronte will be just uh, really looking to put some good scores on the board. Definitely first heat between these two. Obviously, uh, Betty Lou fresh on the scene, and Bronte McCauley. Well, uh, she's looking to get back there. She'll be on the Challenger Series this year. But Bronte's coming into this event with a lot of confidence. Uh, she didn't need to uh, to hit the regional qualifying series because her results were pretty strong on the challenges last year but she went over and surfed the last regional qs event at surfest and got herself another victory there in newcastle so she's got that winning feeling uh, again and we'll see how far it can take her in the draw but this is a you know as we saw on that opening day competition 
Betty Lou's got a, a lot of talent, a lot of power, and, and can throw some really high risk moves on this this wave. Yeah, she sure can. And uh, another one of these matchups where it's one of the young surfers on the tour matching with the more experienced competitor. And here we go. Betty Lou up and riding. Yeah, so uh, getting started quickly. And this wave standing up pretty nicely through the inside. Betty has to overcome a bump there, but recovers beautifully and just hammers the end section. What a finish. Sensational final turn. And an opening ride for Betty Lou that's going to really set the tone for her performance here. Great feeling when you all when you start with a strong ride. Feel like a decent score is going to drop. And it sort of pumps you up on the way back out. Check the replay here. Opens with a beautiful carve. Just stays in front of the whitewash section. But all these points are going to come on this third turn here. Stands right up on the reef. Betty Lou just uh, pivoting off the tail. Almost trips up on the bottom turn. She did so well to extend off the lip right at the peak, right at the apex of that section. And then you can see here, she just uh, put the guns on so that she could uh, outrun the whitewash. Yeah, it's going to be a, a really strong opening ride for Betty Lou as we see Courtney up again, trying to get rid of a 3.17 here, committing to the big end section, hoping she can turn in something impressive. Wow. Really threw everything at it. But it's still been a low scoring heat. I, I think Betty Lou's going to, you know, sort of blow what we've seen from uh, the surface in heat one out of the water with a, a big number to kick off her campaign here. As she makes her way back to the takeoff zone, let's check in with our man out there on the scene, riding high atop of the Bailey ladders. Let's get an update on the leaderboard with Kaipo. Thank you, Ron. Yeah. Women ripping out in there right now in pristine conditions at Main Bank. Earlier, we finished off the men's round of 32. I'm at the Bailey Ladders leaderboard, and let's take a look at some of the round of 16 matchups for the men. I kind of want to highlight a couple, Ron. Felipe Toledo, Jordy Smith, we're going to kick off the round of 16 in excellent fashion with that matchup right there. That's one to tune in for right off the get-go. Then, heat number four. The Battle of the Goofy Foots, Connor O'Leary, Yago Dora. That's one of my favorites coming up. Men's round of 16, next day we run. And again, always reporting to you from my sturdy Bailey ladder. Strong cops. And uh, yeah, I think you're spot on. That heat with Yago Dora and Connor O'Leary is going to be the a heat that no one should miss because these guys have been throwing down some monster backhand hits here at main break. And they're in uh, rare form, I, I think, reaching, you know, peak performance levels for the two of them. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll look forward to an epic battle there. But look at the number here for Betty Lou to kick things off against the local surfer, Bronte McCauley. 7.67. Really strong. Molly Picklam on the inside, kind of scrapping around. It's a, it's a, a really tight tussle between Molly and Courtney at the moment. No big scores just yet, Rich. No, no, nothing substantial on the board as we see the replay to Molly Picklam. It's only 16 minutes on the clock now. Let's see what work she got done here. A little sweeping cutback to start off. Now she patiently waits for this section. Another carving cutback. Hits the final section here. And does she ride out? Yes, she does. Hits the eject button before that rock shelf exposes on the inside but uh yeah opting not to get on the ski gonna charge back out the back maybe pick up one of those insiders yeah i think with just the the slow start there and molly realizing she was going to have room for multiple maneuvers she, she held back just a little bit and uh paced herself through that ride made sure she got the finish because she didn't need a whole lot to jump up in the first she's just turned in a 6.5 and that's i think that just the class and you know, uh, amazing sort of competitive knowledge this youngster has. You know, she didn't get flustered. She has more to give, but uh, at this point, with, with Courtney not really hanging on to any substantial numbers either, she just sort of had a, a measured approach through that ride. She really didn't even get to look at a wave for 20 minutes. Uh, so half the heat had gone, and uh, she just readjusted and went, okay, well, this is going to be a 24-minute heat. So 
Uh, she's starting to build. First ride, 3.9. The next one, 6.5. So she's she's heading in the right direction here. And uh, there's a, just a pace to her surfing that's a little bit faster than Courtney's at the moment. And Courtney's waves have had a bit more bump on them, haven't really allowed her to just really tap in and hit those critical sections. Exciting 15, 14 minutes coming up in their heat. Yeah, we'll see how Courtney responds in just a moment out there with priority. Right now, though, let's hear from Stace with Liam O'Brien. I'm here in the Red Bull Athlete Zone with Liam O'Brien. And uh, Liam, can you take a guess at what I'm going to say? <laughs> I hope you're going to say I made the cut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you made the cut, brother. Well done. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm stoked with that. I didn't, I didn't know what to expect coming into this event. Just watched it last year on TV and it looked so nerve-wracking and full-on. People making it, people getting cut. So I knew it was going to be one of those situations for myself and uh, very, very happy to get over the line. I reckon that's the best I've seen you surf on tour. Do you think that pressure brought the best out in you? Yeah, I think a little bit. Um, I've definitely just been trying to figure it out these last few events and, and not to any success. So I think over here I just really tried to strip everything back so far. That's what I've been doing and um, keeping everything really simple. And yeah, it's been working. And yeah, I just I love it over in the West. So even if, I've, even if I got knocked, there's so many good waves here to go and chase. So I think it was going to be a little bit of a win-win either way. And um, I'm definitely glad with the outcome I've got. <laughs> <laughs> you can do both now. Well done, mate. We'll see you tomorrow. Cheers, Dave. Oh, that's a massive one for Liam O'Brien. That is huge. Uh, obviously, tragically injured himself before the CT got underway last season. Did so well to fight his way back uh, on to the championship tour. But we can report that these surfers have made the cut. So this is huge. And uh, that's it. Rich. All she wrote. Unbelievable. So uh, Baron Mamiya was the surfer below the cut line that made the jump. Uh, above uh, at the expense, I believe, of Samuel Pupo. So um, it, it's an incredible field. You know, we, we didn't see any major heroics from those surfers below that cut line. It, it's a lot of pressure to deal with, and, you know, we can look forward to, to watching some serious talent on the Challenger Series. Yeah, it's a reset, uh, no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, that, that was a gnarly heat for Liam O'Brien too because there was so much outside distraction going on with, with Kelly involved as well. But, uh, you know, th that's, a, that's a pretty stacked field of surfers in my opinion. And now we're going to reset and turn our attention on who's going to make the final five. And, and that is going to be a battle. One of the great things uh, about the cut is the fact that you start seeing form surfers meet very early on in, in championship tour events and these this cast, this top 22, is going to be going all out. Uh, of course, we've got some wild cards that still need to be announced and considered carefully by the Office of Tours and Competitions, but we'll bring you that news uh, as soon as it comes to hand. But congratulations to all those competitors. Yeah. Great job. Awesome stuff. So now uh, getting back to the lineup, and it looks as though we've got Betty Lou up once again here, looking to back up this 7.67. Nice hit off the top. This wave did really stand up the, the way her first ride did behind her, Courtney Conlock. She swoops off the top. Nice drawn out hit there. And again, just sinks that rail maybe a little too much through that turn and then has to deal with this last section with not a whole lot of speed. Oh, that was such a critical moment for her to come unstuck on that final turn. That was uh, Courtney, you could see she was really starting to find some form and flow on that ride. It was a bigger wave, a bit steeper, allowing her to um, you know, really tap into that power that we're used to seeing from her. It's probably going to be an OK score, regardless of the fall at the end. And well, it's dropped in at a 5.4, so uh, she, she's kind of getting closer. Well, it could have easily been the number she needed to take it to the lead too. Um, you'll, you'll see. But uh, first up, we're going to get a replay of Bronte McCauley's first ride. Oh, there's a first hook there for the goofy foot up. Great looking wave as this one stands up. That second turn just on the backhand, allowing her to just pivot tight right up high in the pocket and uh, gets to the finish and then hits the eject button. This was, uh, this was Betty Lou's ride. Nice flowing cut back on the face, setting up the final section, tags the lip. So a two-turn combination there. Not quite as uh, dynamic as the first one, 
But Courtney Conlog, this wave stood up nicely. A nice free-flowing wrap to uh, to get things started. Perhaps a little caught just on that second turn, and that maybe just uh, was the reason why she got to that sec to that third turn just a little bit late. Yeah, just wiped a bit of speed off her, her attack on the end section, and we know that you do need some momentum to match the power of that final hit. But uh, scores coming through for Betty Lou, a five, so she ups the ante. Bronte gets herself in the heat, though, uh, with a seven. Bronte able to lean into the, the competitive prowess of her old boy, Dave, who had a victory here in the CT event back in 89. And, uh, yeah, obviously featured at the top end of the ranks as a CT surfer. Got as high as third in the world a couple of times. He's a champion, still ripping. And, uh, yeah, there's a, a break, a left not too far from here, Rich, which Dave McCauley is just, just owns with his big performances. Yeah, he does, and uh, we'll refrain from opening up the names of I've those already, places. I've already given it the, uh, <laughs> the big clue. But he... Yeah, he's still around the events, obviously super proud of Bronte and the surfing she's doing. She's had an incredible lift in her performances of late and really uh, just looking like she should be back on the CT for me. As we see Molly up again, she's trying to get rid of a 3.9 to extend her lead over Courtney here. Did she do it, Rich? Oh, look, I, th I think she probably did just on the strength of those three opening calves. Uh, she didn't get to the finish on that one. Uh, you could see that she was sort of holding back, though, uh, even on, on that wave that was allowing that big open face, that those big open face sections. And, and you can feel that Molly's not in you know, prime form in this heat right now. She's sort of just surfing uh, for the win rather than just in full attack mode. But a great wave here, stands up. Nice, long carving cut back here. And then you'll see a second one. Cuts that one down. And then a nice little layback hit there. And then this final, uh, this final wall of whitewash that just knocked her off. When you're watching a, a big day of competition and you've got a you know, basically wait to, toward the end of the afternoon before, before you get out there and you've seen so much clean wall. Can you get a almost sort of like a, a track in mind that, that isn't necessarily the right one for the, the conditions? Because there's a bit more texture and bump on the face out there now. Oh, absolutely. And that can be off-putting, especially on your forehand. And I think uh, we've definitely seen a trend today where the, the goofy footers have been scoring high because that bump ha hasn't really affected the way they're coming off the bottom and off the top whereas on the forehand where you want to go out on the open face and do those nice rail calves that that bump sort of upsets your line so um you know this morning it was pitch perfect it was so groomed there was uh you know barely any texture on the water it was easy to to really lay in that rail and hook it in um, but now it's definitely difficult. So you you've really can't preempt what it's going to be like in your heat. You just need to have done the work prior to the heat, having surfed it in these type of conditions so that you're familiar with it. Uh, you, you can't really sort of anticipate what it's going to be like until about an hour or, or, or half an hour before you actually paddle out. Yeah, just uh, Molly surfing for me is, you know, just despite the fact she's upping the ante and adding to a total, it's looked a little more rounded. Than, than what we've seen from her throughout the, the first four events of the season. She's had a, a couple more harder angles in her approach and got that board on a, a bit more of a vertical line into the pocket at, at different times. But she's doing what she needs to do at the moment. And um, you know, the thing that she's got to be careful of, I think, is that Courtney Conlog has the power to turn in an excellent score, even with the bumps. You know, Courtney, while well, she can certainly go rail to rail, she can also shorten up. The, the work that she does between her moves and get to steep parts of the wave and, and still really just big big numbers out, out of those sections. Yeah, really strong uh, in the legs, Courtney, and the bumps really don't affect her as much, I, I feel. Um, uh, definitely both women appear to be on slightly longer equipment, and, and so they should be. There's still decent-sized sets coming through, and it looks like there's one of those sets approaching now. Yeah, Courtney's in a position here to make a strike for the lead in the final five minutes. Got that priority 
And she's looking to get herself into position here and really make the most of that opening section. We talk about, about it all the time. You know, the, the setup for that first move starts with your positioning and, and your paddle into the wave. And she got a good entry into this one. Out onto the open face. That section does flatten out just a, a little bit. And Courtney at this point is opting to commit to the end section. So she's going to throw it all on the line on this final move. Doesn't quite have the, the control to ride out of that maneuver. And she's just probably let go of a whole lot of energy and just getting slammed by the end of that ride. Oh, she's going to have to work hard here because, um, you know, that, that definitely wasn't the score and I don't think she'll better one of her scores either. And, uh, well, it was a good looking wave from the outset. Here we go. Here's the inside section. Gee, she was courageous putting it right up there into the lip. She gave it everything, but unfortunately just couldn't uh, manage the power. And here's Betty Lou now. She's trying to get rid of a five. She's opting out of this one. So now Betty Lou at this point with a 7.67 isn't thinking about throwing everything at the end section to convert what would be an average wave into a decent number. Whereas Courtney, I kind of don't mind what, what she's thinking. I think she's going, you know what? Nothing unbelievable has been executed in my heat against Molly just yet. And if I can go on the inside and, and do a full blown Hail Mary onto a, a really heavy section. I might turn in an excellent yeah. score. But let's dive into the Harvey Norman heat recap now with the first heat of the round of 16 for the women. This is a must win heat for Courtney Conlog, but she does face the most informed surfer on the women's tour at the moment, Molly Picklam. Yeah, this is Molly Picklam, and this is why she's got the yellow jersey on at the moment. Just some really strong surfing, but uh, Courtney's been chipping away here, trying to fight back. Finding some good waves, doing some good turns. But there's been a couple of falls, Ron, at the end of these rides, and that's it's sort of costing uh, costing these scores going from the sort of fives and sixes right up into the sevens and eight zone. But Molly, she's been pretty consistent. As you said, drawing these turns out, definitely on a slightly longer board from what I can see. And that's uh, really showing here in these more carving, uh, longer lines that she's taking. Yeah, always uh, assessing her surfing. Uh, all the competitors are really, but uh, you know, really looking at where she's placing those turns, uh, Molly Picklam. I think she can get those calves tighter to the the bowl on that first section. That'll help just add to that that critical element of the criteria. But she's in a a position of power now. She's got the lead, but also got that priority. And Courtney has work to do. She really does. With two minutes to go, and uh, Courtney needing a six. 0.93 to advance and uh, well the troubling thing as well is that Molly Picklam has priority here so it's going to be uh, even harder so a two wave set is what Courtney Conlog's hoping for here you can see the wind just backing off a little bit again 12th year for, for Courtney on the CT I mentioned it earlier hasn't ever fallen outside the top 10 She's had a couple of years where she, she got toward the back end of the top 10, but she also overcame some injuries to get herself, you know, back up there and not have to, to lean on a, a qualifying series rank. But, yeah, two uh, amazing campaigns, title pushes that went right to the final event for Courtney. Just such a, a fierce competitor and dedicated athlete. Yeah, one of the fittest uh, women on tour, without a doubt extremely strong both mentally and physically uh, but this is a tough situation for her to be in right now yeah a must win heat and uh, you know what she's gonna have to call on all that resolve all that metal that she's displayed throughout her career especially on those big end sections she's got to really sell molly picklam on a ride get her out of the way make her use that priority to, to give herself a shot here in the last 40 seconds yeah absolutely so she's either got to push molly into it or take this and do something spectacular molly well she uh she stayed with her on that one so crafty too molly there uh, understanding that they were both probably too far out to get that wave so didn't make a, a concerted effort towards it still maintains that priority but here she might have to make her move she's sizing it up and she pulls the trigger here molly picklam up trying to better a 5.83 to shut down courtney's chances as she drives up into the section she's going to somehow hang on to it this way it's going to get ugly as she rides on out <laughs> wow that was a wild turn to finish that ride Got the job done, but not one of her most convincing 
heat wins. No, I, I think, uh, you know, when we do get the post-heat interview, she'll be like, well, you know, I got the win, but it perhaps didn't feel like a victory. And, and as a surfer, you always want to come in going, that was an amazing performance. I did everything I could. She might be able to speak to just how the conditions have changed too, if it's a bit more tricky. Just it felt like both Courtney and Molly weren't able to get on, on the, uh, their typical uh, attack. But uh, Courtney, a, a tough result for her in a, a must-make heat. And uh, she's got a lot to digest as we wrap things up here. But we've got a lot to look forward to. Still got some big heats coming your way, including the five-time world champ. Up next, Carissa Moore will take on Sophie McCulloch. We're going to a Bonsai Brew Break. So we're here for the Western Australia edition of Rising Tides here at Surfers Point in Margaret River. And we've been blessed today with really good waves, it's beautiful conditions, big waves out there actually. It's actually really solid out there today and they are suited up, ready to go. We never get waves like that where I'm from, so to see all the girls out there and actually taking off in the peak, it was really cool to see. Like you have to sit deep to um, catch the like good ones. So then you risk getting pumped by a set. I think it was fun and a little scary, but not too scary. Rising Tides is such a good opportunity. You get to surf with girls and pro surfers. I was a young girl once and I also had great heroes, great role models to look up to and yeah, it means the world. Yeah, that was a fantastic event for the uh, the Rising Tides movement. A lot of swell out there, and the Groms got out there and absolutely charged alongside their heroes. And one of their heroes, uh, well, two of their heroes, you'd have to say, are out there at the moment. But Carissa Moore, so celebrated, has had uh, big performances here in the West before. And she's looking for a second victory this season. Up against Sophie McCulloch, who's made a, a return from injury and really wanted to give herself the, the best chance at getting above the cut line based on, on strong performances. She had a magic run in Portugal, her first event back after having ankle surgery. Probably came back a, a little earlier than she would have liked, Rich, but you know, she's got a dream to compete on the CT. She, she made that happen by uh, winning the last Challenger Series uh, event of the, the 2022 season. And uh, yeah, she wants to get some reps in. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, i, I got to say, she surfed uh, incredibly well down at Bells Beach as well. You know, just some of the individual wave scores were were uh, really great to see. And, and, you know, Sophie's really finding some, some great form again. And, uh, you know, difficult decision to make a comeback after being injured. You know, you really want to get back to it. And, you know, I, I, you know, while it mightn't have been the smartest decision, you know, you can't deny her the fact that this is where she wants to be. And, and uh, a great match up here against Carissa Moore. Probably, you know, one of the hardest draws in the women's side for sure. Yeah, she's still doing daily physio and rehabbing that ankle. Uh, there's still some pain there, she told me the other day. But uh, ultimately, with the, the surgery that she had, she said that the ankle's just so reinforced. And even though it's painful, it's probably even stronger than her, her good ankle now. Right. And uh, she can afford to to really attack these sections and she's going to need to against carissa who's you know no doubt going to put up some good scores in that that battle but what's unfolding here in heat two of the round of 16. 
Uh, well, Betty Lusakura Johnson started with a bang at 7.67. She backed it up with the five, but Bronte McCauley, she's got that seven point ride sitting there as well. So when you just isolate the two top scoring rides in this heat, there's only sort of 0.67 between them. And, uh, but Betty Lou's got priority there. So, you know, she'll be looking to uh, take the best wave, really put a high number on here and uh, apply some pressure to Bronte. Yeah, for, for Bronte and Betty Lou, it's their first heat. Same story for Chris and Moore and Sophie McCulloch. First battle for them. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how they size each other up. Fresh and numbers. And create some fresh history here. Head-to-head -head history. But uh, Carissa Mora, just so impressed with the, the way she, she turned things around after losing out in the Ripco WSL Finals to Stephanie Gilmore last season. You know, obviously she had to, to mourn that result. And uh, it, it took a lot. But oh, just came back at the, the first event, put a lot of work in, surfing backdoor and pipe in the lead-up to stop one to get herself in a great position to claim victory and, and reclaim the, the leader's jersey. She's a true champion, undeniable. And, uh, you know, very honest and open uh, with her feelings and emotions around the, the title, uh, you know, campaign last year. And uh, it's done, no doubt about it. And she needed that time to, to go away, regroup. And she's done it, she's done it very well. And, uh, you know, some of the most highlighted celebrated performances have come from her over the last couple of years from the air at Newcastle to some of the big calves we've seen her do it at Bells and J Bay and you know she we're, she really is one of the most well-rounded female surfers on the planet and that's why she's got all the world titles. When it comes to performance you know we see uh, incredible moments from, from all the surfers on the CT but it's still Stephanie Gilmore and Carissa Moore for me that, that set the pace and the bar for you know the highest quality surfing that we see on the, the women's tour. So it's going to take something exceptional for this next generation to, to step up and and take the reins from those dominant forces. Late drop there for Bronnie McCauley. That wave just ran off without her. So she just had to uh, do the lobster dive, try and penetrate under the foam. A little bit of a paddle tussle out here. Oh, and a surfer getting stuck a little deep there. Might have been... One of those competitors in Heat 3 who don't have priority over those surfing in Heat 2 at the moment. 14 minutes to go, and all the action between uh, Betty Lou and Bronte happened on the opening exchange. It's been pretty quiet since. So there has been some, some lull moments, and, you know, Carissa Moore will want to be aware of that surfing against someone like Sophie and vice versa because there, there is a, an edge to be found with a quick start. Yeah, there's an edge to be found and, and, it, and it applies pressure to your opponent and, and instantly puts them on the back foot where they have to match that wave or, or they, their plan at that point is, OK, she dropped a seven. I really need a seven just to back that up and, and go uh, toe to toe. So, um, yeah, interesting start to this one with, with Carissa and Sophie. Carissa just being a little bit more patient, but maybe having a look at one of the waves starting to roll through here. She's so experienced, knows which wave she wants to take, but she's going to have to let Bronte McCauley take this one. Well, Bronte's driving around the bowl up into this first section. Just swoops off the top. A carving approach through these first couple of turns and now driving towards the lip. Just missed times that final hit, though. She did need a 5.68 out of that wave. And I think she needed the finish to even get close to that score. Yeah, uh, she definitely uh, can't afford to fall off. Not against uh, Betty Lou, because she's got two decent scores there. And uh, do we see a little paddle here? No. Nope. The surfers starting to think about cracking the quarterfinals here at the Western Australia Margaret River Pro. And we're starting to think about cracking a bottle of wine and <laughs> tapping into a, a, another good feed. It's been awesome to, to get into. Just the, the smorgasbord set up down there in the outside the competitors area. Just boasting all, all the amazing produce from the Margaret River region. But Rich, we've treated ourselves at Xanadu Winery, Lewin Estate, uh, the Tuck Shop, great restaurant in town. A couple of nights we've uh, ripped into that. 
Yeah, we promised our friends at Mass Felix we'd go and see them again after last year. We had a beautiful uh, feed out there, but we really have been walking on a dream, mate. So, um, well, here we go. Bronnie McCauley up and riding on the back end. And uh, nice swoop to start off. And the second one. Let's see what happened here. Just the final turn. Just got on the heels. Always so difficult when you get on that heel position with the legs extended. Uh, it, it is next to impossible uh, to, to really get yourself centered back on the board again. But, uh, you know, Bronte, the, she's definitely looking good. I feel like if she connects with that one wave that just stands up perfectly, uh, she's going to get a good shot at it. In my opinion, the goofy footers have got the judge's eye at the moment. They're really, uh, you know, paying that, that sort of deeper bottom turn, top turn approach. Well, the current world number one survived the round of 16. And uh, Stace is with her now, and she could probably speak to how tricky the conditions were and maybe break down her own performance. Yeah, absolutely. Pickles, how was it out there? You know, there was some lulls, but there was definitely opportunity. Um, Courtney, I know she tends to sit out off the peak and wants the big wave, and um, I just played that game at the start and let a bunch go underneath, and as you saw Betty Lou in the under-priority heat, she kind of rolled the dice on small ones that are super rippable. Um, so, yeah, we just didn't roll the dice as much as probably what we could have, but, um, yeah, I was really happy to make it. Do you profile the whole tour like that? Your in information on Courtney? <laughs> nah, definitely not. I just, it wasn't even in the plan. I just knew once she got out there, I was like, yeah, okay, this is what I would see that Courtney would do. But um, she's so gnarly too. She's such a great competitor and um, you're never safe with her, especially when there's the cut on the line. She wants to be on this tour as much as all of us and she's going to give it absolutely everything. And I think it was just unlucky. I kept hearing the commentator say she kept falling off at the end turn. So um, it's a tricky end section to navigate, but yeah, unfortunately there's a consequence to that. Speaking of the cut, what 12 months can do for you on the cut last year, now you're rolling up to these things in German sports cars. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, for sure. Life changes, definitely. But um, I'm embracing it all. It's fun. It's um, definitely new for me. Obviously, I was on the cut, I was on the challenges, but I definitely think there's something about it, making us athletes really rise to the occasion because Joao and I are now number one in the world. So um, whether we do need to be pushed because of a cut or not, but um, yeah, definitely happier being in this situation than last year. <laughs> There's a good saying that I won't say. Well done, Molly. <laughs> yeah, strong performance. You know, I think that's the, the mark of a champion, Rich, when you're not at your best, but you can still find an edge over your rivals. Uh, Molly's got so much more to give, and I think she'll, she'll tap into that as she moves into the quarterfinals and, again, goes another event this season without missing the final series. Yeah, yeah. And uh, sort of back to the point I make about, you know, as as athletes and competitors you want to put in a really good performance and feel like you've sort of satisfied your own uh, your own you know performance levels and also put on a good performance for the crowd and well that's what uh, Sophie McCulloch did on that last wave there great turn to finish things off look at her leaning right into this thing oh wow and uh, just right on the edge <gasps> oh, driving she did so through well. that one she did so well to hang on to that you made that point before about getting kind of stuck on your heel side rail, how easy it is to get bumped off your board in that situation. She was in that precarious uh, position for a, a second, but quickly got back over her board, over that toe side, and found an edge to, to ride out of that final move. Probably going to be a pretty decent score there. Things are uh, intensifying a little bit in heat two here. Just over eight minutes to go, and the situation hasn't really changed uh, for some time. Bronte, she uh, still needs a, a score of 5.68 to get into the lead, but just really comparable scores on their, their best numbers. Yeah, only three tenths of a point separating uh, the two competitors here. So Bronte's still right in this. Seven minutes to go. Here goes Carissa Moore. Well, let's see what kind of re reply we can get out of Carissa because Sophie McCulloch has a, a decent score on the way, you'd think works uh, the rail of that board as hard as ever and then finds the finish on the end section so uh, a positive start from her that that wave was ridden with with confidence and that's probably one of the better rides we've seen uh, in terms of flow and connected maneuvers uh, in you know 15 or 20 minutes or so so uh, you know Carissa she was after a special sort of wave she's waited it out uh, she's picked an absolute gem and you know 
didn't do anything overly high risk, but it was just good foundation surfing for me. Drops to the bottom here. There's a nice little snap to start things off. And another one, a bit more further out on the face, the final hit. Nice and tight in the pocket, pivots well. You can see here, Carissa, you can't miss, uh, you know, that body language that she shows throughout these turns. Drives right off the front foot and, uh, you know, gets so much speed. Such a class act. I mean, can she do more? Absolutely. Yep. You know, but, but was it still very good surfing? You know it. Uh, here we go, Sophie now. So we've got a, a couple of numbers on the way in this third heat of the round of 16. Sophie McCulloch's, I think, uh, going to put herself in a fantastic position here. Definitely going to put some pressure on Carissa. That was a, another strong ride from her. That was a fantastic ride, actually. You know, she uh, picked a really good wave there that offered a number of smoother sections where Sophie could really start jamming on the tail, really getting a bit more aggressive with the turns. Waiting on numbers to come through now. I want to send a, a big shout out to the Western Australian Dream Team board caddies. They've been doing an awesome job throughout the contest, of course, with the, the dry rock section on the inside here. We do see some busted equipment and the uh, the Dream Team caddies have done a fantastic job throughout the event so far, and they're going to have more work to do, Rich. Oh, yeah. They've got uh, a couple more days of of uh, board caddying to go, but what a thrill as well, you know, getting to interact with the best surfers in the world and carry their boards down, get a really up look, uh, up, you know, close up look at the equipment and just checking it out. What a thrill. Yeah, mad buzz. We were both lucky enough to have major CT uh, events near our uh, home homes when we were groms so you got to get down and have a look at the world's best but caddying for them that's just a whole nother level as we see bronte here finishing one off and she's still after that well she got the score she needed actually uh, on her previous ride 5.93 so bronte did jump up ahead of betty lou betty lou though still in this heat it's a really close tussle between these two betty lou only after a 5.26 she has a look at one there, but opts out of it. Numbers starting to roll through for the competitors in heat three. Sophie McCulloch on a previous ride at a 6.67. Great start for her. Carissa's got a, a reasonable score on the way as well. But I, I think the judges really loving uh, the attack of Sophie on the end section. Yeah, yeah, they really did. And uh, that was a better wave. And I, I think she still may have one score she to come in as well. And and uh, just from memory, I, I think that wave might even be better than that one. So it, she's really going to put a bit of pressure here on Carissa Moore. Still plenty of time on the clock in their heat. 25 minutes, but the other heat, Betty Lou and Bronte. This heat's ticking down. Betty Lou with priority here. And she needs a wave, uh, at least a 5.26. She wants to uh, to take the lead, but this has been a great seesaw battle. Betty Lou starting strong, then Bronte bouncing back. Good test for uh, just the, the confidence and nerve of Betty Lou here, because this isn't a, a huge score, one that she could easily turn in with a, a single move, in my opinion. Dave McCauley watching on. Well, you'd think that... Uh, you'd oh, think have that, a look at this. Wow. Rich, Betty okay. Betty Lou needs a, a little more now because Bronte, she had a score on the way as well and, and it's bettered her situation, a 6.23. So she's built really nicely through her last three rides. She's and, just jumped uh, off the ski too, so she'll get back in the lineup. Yeah, this is this is going to be uh, an interesting finish. It's not a, a much bigger requirement that Betty Lou needs, but she's got work to do. As we dive into the Harvey Norman Heat recap, she had a magic start, still holds the single best ride of heat two yeah have a look at this inside section here this thing stood up so tall just uh connects with the apex but uh bronnie mccauley on the backhand she brought these tighter turns up into the pocket a more vertical attack but really confident and just driving off the bottom off the top keeping the speed flowing all the way through to the inside that was her best score
I think the judges have been spot on with it too as we see some replays here. Bronte McCauley getting more turns in on her wave, but Betty Lou getting the credit for hitting a, a section on the inside that was standing nice and tall. So just holding that edge with that best score and that's got her in a, a good position to turn this heat in the final stages here. But uh, there, there's the McCauley family, <laughs> the twins on hand, Bronte's mama as well. Watching this one nervously. Uh, you can't even imagine what it's like watching your, your kid compete at this level, oh, at no. any level. Yeah, it's uh, it's more nerve-wracking for friends and family watching on than it is for the actual athletes out there. But, uh, well, minute and a half left. It's all going to come down to uh, one more wave for Betty Lou if she gets the opportunity. Bronte found space out there too. Yeah. And she built her way into the lead here. And, and you know, it, it's, it's pretty impressive. I think it's just her experience coming to the fore here. And when you think about wild cards, you know, they don't get more dangerous than someone that, that's had some time on the CT. Uh, Bronte comes into this one. It's, it's not like she's an unknown quantity. Uh, Betty Lou would have been really aware that she's going to be dangerous, especially here surfing at a break that she's had a, a lot of experience. Yeah, for sure. You know, totally comfortable out here. She surfed this break hundreds and hundreds of times through her career. And uh, you would know it like the back of her hand, knows which wave she wants to get, where she can put that backhand attack on display. We're down to 40 seconds here. Is the ocean going to produce an opportunity for Betty Lou? Well, she was one of the top scoring surfers on the opening day of competition. Had the second highest numbers, or two wave total, I should say, behind Tyler Wright. But at the moment, she needs a score. It's not even a big one at this stage. 20 seconds to go. She is in uh, a shaky position on the leaderboard in eighth spot at this stage. So she really does want to get herself out of this heat. The time is ticking by as this one comes to a close. Is Betty Lou going to get to her feet in time? They're counting it down. She needs to make a move quickly. And it, it feels like she's up in time. She needs a 5.56. We are squinting as we watch her make her way through to the inside here. Nice hawk out of the top. Needs more. Digs into the carve, releases the tail. This wave just tapering off, though. So it is, uh, it's It's going to be difficult for the judges to, to give her the number she needs just based on the fact that that wave, you know, has basically had no wall on it, Rich. No, nah, there was really no sections for her to dig into and and it was a smaller inside wave i think you know our gut feeling straight away is that it's not the score but uh it's pretty remarkable that she got that 767 in the first couple of minutes of the heat there was 40 minutes for her to put another decent score on the board and she couldn't find it yeah maybe just got a, a little too patient there we did see a take off on a couple of ways but she just couldn't see the scoring potential in it we're still waiting to get word from the judges i, I mean for what this wave is yeah she I think she extracts correctly. all the points on offer yeah no doubt about it uh you know that second turn a bit of extra flare and tail release so uh, i think you're right there wasn't too many more points she left on that ride it's just whether the judges are going to buy into it just being uh, substantially smaller than some of the other scores around that six point ride you know we saw some pretty pretty decent score like height in in some of those waves she got into it with you know two seconds on the clock so there was nothing else for her out there at that point that was the wave that she uh, she had to roll the dice on as we see bronte making her way in here just an incredibly close heat and i think there's a a review of some of those earlier rides unfolding. We know the judges like to really consider these important scores carefully, especially when, uh, you know, the cart is is looming. Well, Bronte's pumping the fist already. The number's starting to roll through, and it doesn't feel like they're going to get there, Rich. It's a 4.4 for Betty Lou, not enough. And she's going to nervously have to wait and watch the rest of this event play out. Dad's happy. Absolutely. Proud dad moment for sure. And, uh, well, let's see how far Bronte McCauley can go in the draw on the women's side. She might, be, she might be the spoiler, the local girl. A strong performance after losing that opening exchange. Bronte McCauley marches on to the quarterfinals. We'll take a quick break. We'll bring in Joe Bugs and Felicity for the call right after this.
What a great day for pro surfing. You're watching the Western Australia Margaret River Pro. So much to check out if you get here locally in the area. And I think Kaipo has found himself with the Rusty Crew. Hey, we're here on site at Main Break. This is the Rusty Retail Store where you're going to find all the official event merchandise. And in addition to that, you can make your own custom tee right here at the Rusty Store on site. Make your custom tea, and you know what? Kyle likes Rusty, doesn't he? <laughs> so great to see the support from Rusty. Obviously, their team rider, Kaiwi Belly, unfortunately went down earlier, but still supporting him this year on tour. Kaip was a lucky man, gets to hang out with all the big brands here on hand. As we watch a brand new heat just get started, a heavyweight matchup. Tatiana Weston Webb and Lakey Peterson have done so many amazing things in their careers on tour, especially here at Margaret River. They have a lot to think about, especially focus on positive results when it comes to stop number five. And now it's a totally different story. Lakey Peterson finds herself in a must win situation to survive the midseason cut. And Tati's back in has produced some high scores out here. So a very big matchup early in the round of 16. Joe Turpel with Felicity Palmatier and Wayne Rabbit Bartholomew. Love talking about surfing with you guys. Felicity, let's uh, break this one down. Tati versus Lakey and their strengths they're going to bring to main break today. Well, look, both of these women have proved themselves out here before. I mean, they're so strong. Tati's got an amazing backhand. I mean, she just muscles her way through these turns out here and she's going to be really hard to beat. But Lakey, she's put in a lot of time over the years into waves of consequence and she's been pretty open about talking about that. So uh, it's going to be a great matchup. Sophie McCulloch taking over with a 7.83 on this one, Bucks. Yeah, there's a big wave, double overhead wave. So she makes this one look pretty easy. Goes vertical. And Sophie just carves out of the lip and she's really got good timing on this wave. She can get this last maneuver in and she cleans it up. Not a super spectacular finish, but the, the first two, she got the hard work done and uh, it's a really good score. So impressed with this Australian, Sophie McCulloch. She's really a rad human being, loves her sport. I saw her playing footy over in the park and behind Pipeline. You could tell she probably could have been an athlete in a lot of different sports as we see through the glare here carissa moore can pick that style out miles away five-time world champ shutting down the end section she's got some work to do chasing a 9-1-6 against mcculloch talked to the judges last night they're seeing stars when they close their eyes this part of the day is really tough on them with that glare as the sun goes down bucks yeah it really is it's always been a thing in the west on the Land the other, and here we see Lakey. Important heat for Lakey Peterson. Just stepping off her opener. Tati only has a 267, so that one is really just getting started. Yeah, you nearly need to uh, get those eclipse glasses out for the, the afternoon. <laughs> you really do. We got to enjoy a partial solar eclipse just the other day here. And that was uh, really exciting. All the surfers got their protective eyewear on and checked it out the late morning just adding to the entertainment that we've had at this event but interesting focusing on the priority heat Carissa Moore uh, chasing a big score against Sophie McCulloch remember Carissa started in yellow this year when she won pipeline as we look at her last wave here flick yeah beautiful opening turn from Carissa nice carve off the top straight into a second one and you can kind of see she knows she has to finish because she needs a big number and um, yeah, it was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful surfed wave there. It looks like it's going to be the highest number of the heat so far, Joe. She is so smooth, so powerful. Always has enjoyed her time at Margaret River. She actually came here nice and early, and she said it was just nice to be able to explore a little bit with her husband, Luke. Luke loves fishing, loves surfing himself. He's an adventurer and obviously the biggest supporter for Riss in her career. Numbers are in. Carissa does, in fact, get the high single score, 8.33 in the glare. And now needs a 6.33 to take out McCulloch. 
But like before, we were saying impressive start for Sophie because she was late this season. Ankle injury, she suffered a preparing for pipeline. Ended up taking her out, missed the Hawaiian leg of the season, and worked incredibly hard and went right into a quarterfinal appearance at Super Tubos. A sore ankle with the ever-changing lineups at Super Tubos. I was really impressed by that. Yeah, I was really impressed by that too. I, I'm a really big fan of Sophie. She's so down to earth, a girl from the sunny coast. And um, as we see, I think we've got a bit of a board change happening for, uh, looks like Carissa. So something must have happened there on that last ride. You could see just having to be super careful on that slippery shelf on the board change. So she's coming to make that switch, Bugs. Yeah, there's a really uh, vital pit, pit, spot, pit stop for uh, Chris Moore because it took her so long to get into this seat. Then she got the 833 at the high market. Before that, she needed a 9 plus. Now she's got it into a comfortable requirement of a, a 633, but. The, the crease board or whatever happened there is going to chew up a few minutes. Yeah, really interesting. Her husband Luke on the board change. Stace, what did you see there? Yeah, just a bit of damage to the fin box there. You can see pretty similar to the uh, situation with Griffin Colapinto. But interestingly enough, the stairway was marching them with coaches and uh, support crew because we couldn't actually tell which athlete was coming in due to the afternoon glare. So uh, yeah. Glenn Micro Hall was actually first to the water. And uh, it was uh, Luke backing you up with uh, Chris's board there in the end. Uh, well done, Stace. Thanks for the insight. Yeah, that glare is severe right now. Interesting how the coaches even are just looking for silhouettes, trying to guess who that was. So Carissa on a board switch there. Potential crease on the bottom of the mayhem. It pretty much says it all when the coaches can't work out who, you know, which, <laughs> which athlete it is. The glare factor is not only, which really means that the judges, they've got to rely on, on knowing their styles. And also the video replay a crucial addition that came to the sport years back now. And they said they were using that heavily yesterday, all through today, and definitely important in that glare. Check, check out that view. So it's a lot of silhouettes. Good thing with all the great camera technology, they can check out in the form and know exactly who's up, especially in this overlapping format. Krista getting back to the lineup, fresh equipment, and she'll be searching for a 6.33. Just thinking of what a special time in this era of pro surfing for women. When you have the GOAT, Stephanie Gilmore, Chris Moore, five world titles, two of the best ever on tour in the same era. And pushing the sport further than anybody on tour with Steph with a record of event wins, but Carissa with 26 CT wins, chasing Lane's record at number two on the all-time win list. Yeah, it's an amazing time for women surfing and uh yeah, we're just so lucky to be here and witness it all and to have Steph and Carissa on tour together. It really is. We're really so lucky. Um, I, I loved watching Steph um, in the finals. I like come back, you know, she went in as number five seed and came out on top with her eighth world title. And it just goes to show, you know, you can come in the last seed and you can't. It's anyone's on that day. You know, is if you have the right mindset, you can make it happen, and uh, Steph did. And Chris has had to move on from title showdowns that haven't gone her way, but nothing like this before, where she was the number one seed, yellow jersey, and just felt that what it would have been a sixth world title slip between her fingers. She told me it was kind of like a grieving process for about a month straight. She said she had all types of emotions from anger to tears. Uh, just like she was having a grieving moment and she shut her phone off, went to an outer island with her husband and just checked out for a while and took some time to really step back into the global spotlight to really battle for another world title again. Yeah, well, it was the second year in a row she'd gone into trestles uh, as the number one and, and, and in a really dominating uh, situation from the tour. She'd got so many big results the year before she got it done. You know, she was dominant. She, she, she made it work. She was the number one seed. The pressure didn't get to her. She dominated. This time, Steph, she could kind of hear the hoof prints coming. And Steph was just on that amazing roll. Chris also said it was just interesting. You know, she's been in both editions of that big championship day at Lowers, and she's still trying to work out what's the best thing to do. Do you, do you watch your competitors coming? Do you try to put the blinders on and just prepare for your heat? And she said she's still working it out. 
Yeah, I mean, at one stage there, I was nearly thinking, you know, that she was just sitting on the beach for so long and watching Steph's every heat. It, maybe she'd just, you know, gone, and got, <laughs> gone into town and got a milkshake or something, you know. Because <laughs> the year before, Steph, <laughs> the year before Steph were, was in number five, but she she didn't do any, you know, she didn't advance. Those milkshakes really helped. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you got us there, Bugs. I love that. Oh, that was good. Oh, Bugwan on fire, Stace. So uh, let's uh, hear from Bronte McCauley. Love you, Bugwan. Bronte, you just mentioned it's still cooking out there. Talk us through like a dream day in WA and are we living it right now? Yeah, I feel like the last three days have been dream autumn um, days, really. You couldn't ask for much more, really, like cold offshore mornings, a bit chilly, and then just therefore the wind just stays like all day. And um, it's like the perfect size out there too. So I feel like you couldn't really ask for much more when you surf in main break. Betty Lou had a strong start. You fought back well. Yeah, she must have, um, yeah, had a really good first one. It was like quite a small wave and I was like, Surely it's not a good one, and I just let it go, and then she was pretty far in, and yeah, she started off really well. I honestly, um, I made a few mistakes, fell off a bit on the inside, and um, yeah, it was a really hard heat. Yeah, she, she's uh, Seth's, she's having an amazing year, and um, it's really cool to watch her surf. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, what's the plan for the rest of the evening? Oh, go to bed at like seven o'clock, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, drive back to Greystown and um, have an early dinner and maybe um, hang out with the family. And um, yeah, early early night for sure. Looking forward to seeing you in the quarterfinals. Thanks, Bronte. Yeah, thanks, Bronte McCauley makes me want to be a better human being every time I hear her speak. She's so kind, welcoming to the West, and she's ripping, taking down big names. As we continue to watch Chris some more. Member making the board change, still chasing a 6-3-3. Oh, nice spray off the top of the lip there and just flowing and fighting a finish. Well done there for Carissa Bucks. Yeah, it's a great fight back by the five-time world champion. An 8.33, she was way behind the eight ball, needing a nine plus. Very hard to come by nine plus rides out here today, but the 8.33 set her up. And then this last exchange, well, she definitely got the better of the exchange. Yeah, that's right, because Sophie was on the first one and Carissa on the second one with the backup board, which looks solid as we now see Tatiana Weston Webb in the non-priority heat going up and down. Yeah, it's been a slow start to that heat. Lakey's had a couple of uh, pretty dud waves that got away on her. Let's uh, see what Sophie did here, Flick. Yeah, nice first wrap off the top. This wave's getting really bowly. The second section looked nice. She throws it up here for the finish, and I think she was a bit late. She couldn't make it, but out the back, right behind her, was Carissa. And uh, this, she just put on a clinic. I mean, the wave just had such a beautiful bowl, and she had nice flow between these turns. You thought it was over here, but she squeaked out one last turn. And yeah, I mean, that's going to be a good answer back. And look, in my books, I think she might be taking the lead after that. There we go. A little wrapping cut back from Peterson Bugs. Yeah, Lakey's uh, got going here. And this is a, a this is a great matchup. Two awesome surfers, forehand versus backhand. Taddy's got the great results here. And so is Lakey, though. Oh, she certainly does. Lakey has accomplished a lot at Margaret River, including a big win just like Tatiana Weston Webb. They both have been in the title race in the past. And for Lakey Peterson, it, it really changed when she showed up in 2018 and got that winning feeling again. She almost forgot that she had won a CT when she was a rookie on tour when the US Open was a championship tour event. Been so long, she was saying, I just can't wait to win my first event. We had to tell her, you've actually done it before. <laughs> But it's just it been so many years where she was just putting in the time. And I guess it's because she's featured in so many CT finals. About 16 final showings for Lakey with five wins. So she was getting tired of those runner up finishes. As uh, numbers are coming in here, Sophie doing a great job out there. 683, 783 back to back. Her last didn't change anything at a 6.0. Yeah, she left a bit on the table on that one, the, the six. She could have got up there into the seven range, but uh, her opponent, Carissa Moore, look at this backup. The eight through three backed up with a seven six and just a leapfrog into, into first place. Now that's championship caliber. Well done for Carissa Moore. Had the board change with the crease, fought back for the lead, and she got it. So Sophie leaving the door open, going on the first wave of the set and not producing a keeper. A tough situation for McCulloch when you focus on the cut. Remember, she missed the first two events of the season. So she's got a great case to plead for her wild cards. 
from here on out, but she's definitely in a must-win situation to do it on her own at this event. It's stop number five. Here's the Harvey Norman recap of our priority heat. Chris Amore versus Sophie McCulloch, and Sophie got started into the sixes. Looking really strong, Flick. Yeah, I, I really love the way she came out of the gates firing, and she was really taking it to Carissa Moore. And uh, here, but Carissa fought back, and you know, even with the board change, I mean, she now is sitting there with an 8.33 and that 7.60, but uh, just showing us why she is that five time world champ and surfing with, with just so much style and grace. I mean, look at how bowly this wave is, and just how beautiful her surfing is to watch. She is so connected to the ocean, especially when she has power to work with here in West Oz. A former champ out here, just loving that end section. And I loved how she turned this one around, kind of was on the back foot for a bit. Sophie was really establishing a great lead, a well-served teat for the rookie. But Carissa fought back, 8-3-3, 7.6 back-to-back. And Sophie, with priority, now needs an 8.11. Exactly. See, 10 minutes ago, it was a, you know, a reverse situation. Uh, Carissa Moore needed nine point something. And now it's a reciprocation. There's an 8-1-1 required by Sophie McCulloch, which would be near the highest score of the heat so far. So she's well and truly capable of getting it, though. Important ride here for Lakey Peterson. So solid at that forehand cutback. Fades that cutty again and steps out. Lakey working with Glenn Micro Hall at this event. They actually spent some time together in the off season on the North Shore of Oahu. And one of the things she told Glenn Micro Hall is she just really wants to get better at heat strategy, making better decisions when it matters the most. And they had a great connection there, signed up for certain events this season and really wanted to focus on the Australian leg. And now with her back against the wall, she's got to really produce as she's in that must-win situation, sitting pretty far back on the rankings. Yeah, she is. And uh, it's hard to watch these women who have been at the top for so long be underneath that cut line, you know. I mean, women like, you know, you've got your Sally and your Courtney and Lakey. And for me, I mean, I've grown up watching those women consistently be in that top five conversation. So... I mean, she's got work to do here, and uh, this is the heat where she's got to make it happen. So this is an important heat for her. That one still with 23 on the clock, but the final minute has started for Carissa and Sophie. Last heat won by the local wild card, Bronte McCauley, as she's off into the quarterfinals. So all these heat winners go into that final series that potentially could be out there first thing in the morning. You see Carissa paddle for that wave. She can kind of take a more of a dig since she doesn't have priority. Yeah, well, they all had a bit of a go at that wave. I mean, there wasn't a serious paddle by Sophie, but they all three surfers right there had a, a good look at that one there. With time running out, we don't know. There looks like there is something coming out the back, Joe. Carissa definitely wanted to get back into yellow with this whole youthful movement that we've been experiencing. She wants to change that around. Here comes the wave for Sophie. Fade and cut back. Doesn't have a whole lot of size on this wave, but she'll feel her way down the inside track. Does she have an end section to work with? And she throws everything at it. Unfortunately, the wave didn't really give her something to work with. Sophie goes down and unfortunately won't make the cut. And Carissa Moore's corner celebrating. Another solid heat win and another trip to the quarterfinals here at Margaret River. A big fight back for, for the five-time world champion. She was under the gun there, 6.83 and a 7.83, and she only had a 5.5. Five. She needed a nine point something, and what a turnaround. Oh, so great to see her answer back and react, but a tough one for Sophie. Had to work hard in a short period of time due to that ankle injury. As she'll be thinking about the Challenger Series and also applying for wild cards as the season continues. Time for our Bonsoy Brew Break. We'll be back with Lakey and Tati to close out the day.
favorite parts of Margaret River, obviously the surf, we come, get great waves, and then the balance of having this wide open space. You get the power of the ocean, which is very significant here, and you also have a powerful feeling of even being on land. It smells good, it feels clean. It's a tough place to leave. There's so much to do when we're not in the water as well. You end up finding yourself at one of the best wineries in the world. It's an unforgettable experience. It's ridiculous how much open ocean you can see. The coastline is unbelievable. There's so many waves around here. You have the freedom to get lost very easily. You can drive down a track with your family and friends, and next thing you know, you feel like you're on your own beach. For me, that makes me feel like freedom. That's exactly why I love this place. It's a special journey for us. It's definitely a place on tour that we will be loving to come to for years on end. I could tell I ate a lot of food that day. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great experience. I love traveling to the West. Oh my gosh, they host you so well here. The, the tourism crew is, are amazing. They're so happy to be a part of this special event. They love the pro surfers. They host them so well, and they're always guiding you on the late days on all the vineyards you can check out. There's so many great choices and a lot of different types of wine. And outside of the wine, dude, great food. Some of the best food in the world that we even had on site here for all the VIPs and the guests as we get caught up with this one. Tatiana Weston Webb battling with Lakey Peterson. She's on the first wave there, Bugs. Yeah, well, it's been a, a lot of throwaways in this heat. And this wave here, it looks like it would be Maybe that's the 267 because um, it wasn't a really strong ride. So Tati with priority. This just in on the live rankings. Tatiana Weston Webb has officially made the cut. And that situation unfolded with Betty Lou Sakura Johnson going down in this round. So Tati might have heard that she had to win this heat to clinch. She's in the water. She hasn't got the news yet. But she'll be happy to find that out when she comes in. That she's surfing a complete year and wants to show back up at lowers that she has done successfully in back to back seasons. What a brilliant, goofy footer and well deserving. Getting that mid season cut. Now that's behind her. Now she could focus on just absolutely ripping flick. Yeah, she can. I mean, she might not know it right now, though. So it's interesting because she's probably surfing like her life depends on it. But here we go. There's a little setup work for Tati, representing Brazil, but raised on the island of Kauai. Looks like she's in attack mode. She's got some speed. How about that slam on the end section? Remember, she was sort of limping around bells a little bit. I was a little concerned about that knee, but wow, I think she's she's back. She's feeling great. I mean, she was in total attack mode there, Bugs. Yeah, this is her first really dynamic ride in this heat. And Tatiana, I don't know if she got word that she's, she's made the cut, but she uh, certainly, you know, it's amazing because her opponents helped her out today. And this is a bigger wave that's been coming through in the heat. It's been kind of a small heat. And this one, this is a real signature move for Tatiana. She's made this work so well for her here at Margaret River. Wow. She really got a board up off the lip line. Just she had a bit of slide in the lip line and then she just powered into the into the base of the wave got ahead of that foam ball and uh, she's going to make that one pay that's going to be a good score well done for tatiana wested webb 4.77 was her previous but i'm expecting a bigger number with a section that big yeah big set coming for lakey and yeah, she's having a look at that one and she didn't go when she might get she might get caught out here. She doesn't seem like she's very far out the back, or is this just a bigger set, Joe? I think it is, Bugs. Yeah, she's still holding her position, paddling just a little bit out the back, maybe looking now. And the Californian will take this wave. Nice setup off the bottom, and she just kind of has to slow down a bit on the redirect. That was a little bit of a surprising section on her first turn. And she's able to make sure she rides out of her finish. So didn't really let her unload on that last wave. Yeah, I think maybe that first wave of the set, I, I, if, I mean, it's easy for us to sit here and say this, but maybe the second one might have been the better choice. Um, that first one would have just cleaned up the line up a bit and the second one might have had a bit more bowl to it. You could see it on her first turn. She kind of baubles halfway through the carve and almost it's almost like she two-staged that first turn a little bit. Um, maybe we'll get to see it on the replay here, but 
if you watch her, she gets stuck into this bottom turn, and then there's the ball ball right there in the face of the wave. Um, so, yeah, there's a, I, I don't know. I mean, it's easy for me to sit here and say maybe she should have gone the second one. I mean, she did finish off the wave, but, um, yeah, this is the section I'm talking about just there. Yeah, well, it looked promising on the takeoff. It looked like a really good wave, but, you know, she finally gets into a stride now, uh, Felicity, and she does finish pretty well, but, uh, you know, she will get probably pinged by the judges for that first, you know, kind of bog and... You know, it, it was she missed the opportunity to, to score points. Really, you couldn't ask for a crazier matchup to close out the day, especially with on the line for Lakey Peterson. These two have had a lot of history, and it's almost even. Lakey leads in one-on-one -on -one matchups. It's six wins over Tati's five wins. Oh wow! So Tati trying to even things up here at Margaret River. The last uh, two wins have gone to Tati. One was a final in Portugal. She won. And then beat Lakey again at G Land last season. Scores in from Tati's big finishing move, 6 1 7. Last of Lakey with the bobble as a 4 6 7, which keeps her in second. Now without priority, needs a 5.45. Remember, Tati just uh, clinched her spot in the midseason cut. She will be surfing the rest of the season. And a tough moment there for Betty Lou. And a hug from Shinobu, her mom. She's been through this emotional roller coaster in back to back seasons. And remember, we still are standing by to get an update for her journey with this midseason cut. Came in on the right side of it. It's a couple of ties there in seventh. But she knows a loss in the round of 16 is going to make it hard because there's a lot of hungry surfers coming for that spot. Yeah, I mean, that one really would hurt because she started with that 7-6-7 seven, seven and it was, she was in such a good position and then just, what, just wasn't able to get that second wave. So tough one there for Betty Lou. We'll keep you posted on the scenarios on the post show and into tomorrow as well, which looks promising to continue, especially first thing in the morning. Tati and Lakey. Five CT wins for Lakey Peterson, four for Tatiana Weston Webb. 75 events for Tati now, and 89 for Lakey. Two big veterans trying to get a spot in the quarterfinals. Yeah, it's, it's all up for grabs. And Felicity, you know, you're the local. These conditions, I mean, Sunday morning, I, I mean, do you think it's going to remain glassy or are we going to go light offshore, light onshore? Yeah, look, um, I've had a cheeky look at that surf line forecast and uh, I've been studying it pretty hard. And I think tomorrow morning, I think we're going to have a window of opportunity there and even potentially through to about 12, 1 p.m., which means that we could see quite another big day of surfing uh, coming up ahead. And I'm pretty excited about it. I think we're going to have light winds. That swell's hanging in there. So, yeah, I think we're up for another day of surfing tomorrow. Great opportunity to get 30% off the Surfline Premium account, which is so useful to get yourself into great waves. Scan the QR code right now and get 30% off. Great timing watching the broadcast and hopefully seeing some great surf this year. Big thanks to Schaller Perry forecasting for this event in West Oz. 1124 on the clock, Lakey. Needing a 5.45. She's got Thomas Allen here, her husband, who's uh, really solid with body work, always making sure she's in really good shape before she paddles out into the lineup. And Lakey's always got a ton of support from her family, close to her siblings, her brother Parker's in the Air Force. Lakey's sister, Whitney, lives in Ojai. A nutritionist now with three kids, so Lakey likes playing ante. When she gets to go home back to that Santa Barbara area. And she's uh, got some legendary humans in her family. Her grandfather invented the egg <laughs> McMuffin. And before her, Peterson came around. Uh, McDonald's didn't open until 11 in the morning. Pioneered the breakfast menu. Her family still has some restaurants to today and uh, really proud of that story. And then her mom uh, probably could have been an Olympian. She was in the Guinness Book of World Records. Amazing swimmer. And uh, next thing you know, the family started building and she kind of put her career on the, the back burner and she was so happy to raise some talented human beings and especially a, another great athlete like Lakey. 
into the sunset with 10 minutes on the clock. And pressure continues to land on the American. Yeah, I, I really back that up, Joe, because, you know, when you see Lucky Peterson in free surfing, you just go, you know, she's so good. And, uh, you know, sometimes she has these heats where, I don't know, that was, it seemed like she rode that way, but a little bit nervously. She only got that four, six, seven. It doesn't really help a score out. She doesn't need a big score. Look at that. She needs a, a five, four, five. So it's well within her, her wheelhouse to, you know, get a six, five or something. But she just needs to sort of bust, bust it open and show what she can do. Yeah, so interesting what goes through an athlete's mind when they understand the pressure. You think about how this season started. Lakey actually had a better position on the rankings after Pipe, uh, an event that Tati's always expected to win. Lakey was the one that had the best result. Started off with an equal third in the semifinals, which he's done in back-to-back -back years at Pipe. But then tough results followed. Let's now hear from one of the best to ever do it, five-time world champ Carissa Moore, saying that with Stace. Thanks, Joe. Carissa, you nearly ended up on Lakey Peterson's backup board there for a minute. Uh, yeah, um, you know, uh, I was I was like in the keyhole for a bit, waving at my team, but they're just, they're so sweet. They were so engrossed in trying to like watch the replay on the big screen that I don't think they saw me. Well, I, I went all the way out, and then that's when I realized that my my fin box had been popped out because I hit the reef. I didn't think it was that bad, and then and so I, I could totally see why they kind of lost me for a second. <laughs> Forgivable, maybe. Oh, uh, no, just having my husband run down and have his big smile and say, babe, breathe, you got time. Um, it just helped to settle me and help me finish the heat strong. Really impressive to chase that mid-range score on a pretty different piece of equipment, two inches longer on the step up. Yeah, I, I just, I'm very fortunate and feel really grateful that Matt Biolis has, you know, shaped me some incredible boards. Um, I've been riding them through the winter on, uh, you know, at, on the North Shore of Oahu, so I feel really comfortable on them. Does he throw the ideas around, or do you go to him with some changes? Uh, we it's it we work together. I pretty much tell him, hey, I like this, or I don't like that, and then he'll translate that into to board talk. <laughs> <laughs> and a quick shout out back home. Uh, hi everybody. Um, thanks so much for watching. I love and miss all my family and friends. Hi guys. Thanks, Reese Bell. Done. Thank you, Stace. Happy Curse some more into another big quarterfinal here in Margaret River. Yeah, you can tell, you know, Carissa, she's going to be a contender for a, a long time to come, that, that power base she's got. And you think about her last world title, the fifth world title, it was backed up by a gold medal. It's not a bad, I mean, it's a, it's a unique thing. It's never happened before. Well, talk about the energy she's felt, you know, in a short period of time, a fifth world title, an Olympic gold medal, you know, getting herself on a beautiful mural in downtown Honolulu with the great Duke Kahanamoku. And then how do you all of a sudden find new motivation to get into the title race? That took some time, but then she engaged and took over the tour and she came so close to a sixth. And you think about that situation. If she would have had the sixth, how close she would have been to Stefan Lane. But then losing it that day now, eight for Steph, seven for Lane, five for Carissa here in 2023. Yeah, look, I, I think Carissa's probably got another few years up her sleeve and, you know, she's she's still quite young. And I think if, if she really wants to push it and if her body's letting her to do that, I think, you know, it's not over. And, you know, I think the opportunity still is there to match it if she wants it. Well, I'll tell you what, one thing about her, you know, her regimentation of her training, Carissa Moore is always the first in the water. It's pretty rad to see how one of the best ever prepares for these events and how hard she is on herself. Really tough for her to walk away from a loss. No matter if it's early in the event or a final. I remember a final out here where she got the score five seconds after the horn in the final. And that was a really tough sting she felt from that one. Always driving for perfection. Down to 5.45 on the clock. Things have gotten quiet out there. Yeah, and Tatiana's got that priority. She knows how to use it. It's been a quiet heat. This is probably one of the sleepy heats we've had all day. There's been a few opportunities when they were paddling out, but no, um, just not those big sets. Sometimes you see it's uh, it late in the Arvo. It's, it pumps, but not the Savo. Let's uh, relive it quickly before we hit the five-minute mark. Here's the Harvey Norman recap. Round of 16, heat number four. Tati officially making it past the midseason cut, and Lakey can't afford to lose, or she's on the Challenger Series. Lakey's best, a 5.5 she got on her third strike out of main break.
Yeah, but it's all it's been about Tatiana here, strong on her backhand. Uh, she's got two nice turns on this wave, I think, and then she finishes it off really nice and strong. And yeah, just surfing to her strengths here. Tatiana's backhand is so heavily scored because she attacks that she had a real bully end section to earn a 6-1-7. Got so much speed, kind of slingshotted herself into a meaty section. There's the snap to slide. And rode away nice and clean. Tati out in front of this one. And now a potential opportunity setting up. And we will see Tatiana Weston Webb try to protect the lineup. Setting up some nice backhand surfing. Second move into the closeout. Big airdrop and she'll lose it. That gives Lakey Peterson some room. The Californian on an important wave. Trying to keep her spot on tour. Down carve, gets out in front, wraps it again. Peterson needs to stay on her feet. Section's not really approaching yet. Now here comes the Whitewater, and she will ride her way through it. She's showing some passion there. She wants to score, chasing a 5.45 bucks. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling positive about that. All right, Flick, how you feeling? I, I really like the first turn. I feel like she just felt a bit more relaxed, and the wave was really great. It allowed her to open up on that first uh, section. The carve was strong followed by a next uh, second turn. And then she had to milk it a bit to get to the inside, but she definitely got the finish. So she, by her body language, she's pumped, she's liking it. We're about to see a replay here of Tati. Tati was able to get this wave and protect the lineup, but fell on the finish. Yeah, she she fell on that one. So that's not going to go into a score. It's a beautiful looking wave though, Joe. It sure is. Flick, what did you see on the first turn? Yeah, beautiful first carve. She kind of got it a little bit short just so she could get to this second section. And the wave gets a little bit sleepy here, but she knows she needs a finish. And you can tell here by her body language, she <laughs> is pumped. Well done for Lakey Peterson. This was that first turn again, really wound up, got to that high line part of the wave and really executed bugs. Yeah, that, that was super clean. And, and, you know, she was able to go on with this. You know, sure, she was making sure of it, but she knew she had the wave to, to get the lead on. And uh, she's done that with a 6.57, so she finishes this wave out. Uh, that, that last maneuver flick was super important. She just had to put that bow on that present. Yeah, no, she, she, she's in do or die right now. She needs, to, she needs to make every wave count. She needs to finish. Lakey Peterson gets the score, 6.57, and the lead off Tatiana Weston Webb. Tati now needs a 5.91 with two minutes to go on priority. But what a clutch performance from Peterson. Her whole support crew on the stairs from her coach, Glenn Micro Hall, her husband, Thomas Allen, who's an incredible surfer, Brent Power from Channel Islands, and, and even Jackson Baker, who suffered a tough loss today. But that's how cool that guy is. Back down on the stairs supporting Lakey Peterson in this one. Yeah, no, look, this is a super close heat. But before that, this heat had been decided on one maneuver. Uh, Tatiana's, you know, dynamic signature move and, and really not much else. So that was the first complete ride. Great call, Bugs. Yeah, putting it together with a few turns and using all of that rail. Here comes a very important wave for Lakey's career. Will Tati go on it? She's going to let that one run through. Yeah, it, fl it flattens out and walls out. There was no A-frame on that one. And remember, we know that Tati's made the cut, but she doesn't know that. So for Tatiana's headspace, she's still looking to make some heats today with the intent intensity of the midseason cut. You know, plus she's got to up, uphold uh, this a great record she's got at Margaret River. Beautiful sunset, intense times for Lakey as she's got some work to do. She's got to stay in the mix. She's basically probably thinking she's just got to win this event to make a clear cut. We'll keep you posted on the live rankings, but if she gets a win, she's still got a shot at making it to the surf ranch and beyond. 30 seconds to go. I think there's going to be a ride. It's a pretty tapered looking wave uh, flick, but this is going to be the one. Yeah, Tati's got priority and she uses it. Weston Webb now setting up that first turn. Needs a 5.91. Trims back to the pocket with the backhand wrap. The wave's kind of bending away, so she needs a big section. She might have found it here. A lot of speed. 
Hits it off the top, airdrop, and Tati's fighting to hang on. Couldn't quite manage to ride out clean, and Thomas Allen, Lakey's husband, gives a high five to Glenn Hall and Brent Power. So they're feeling that it's all said and done, and with Tati falling on the finish, they probably do have reason to celebrate there. <laughs> yeah, you've got to think so. I'm just really interested to know right now if Tati knows she's made it or not. I mean, let's take another look. Any chance of this turn in the heat flick? Uh, it's it's going to be, it's, it's touch and go. I mean, first section was kind of nice. She then followed it with a bit of a cutback. But look, she's kind of wiggling through to the inside here. She really needed to make it happen. And unfortunately, she just falls off in this foam ball. So... I'm not thinking it's going to be the score. I'm with you. Yeah, falling on that finish was tough, and you're thinking about her injury that she suffered at Bells. Tough to hang on, and it is official. Not enough. Lakey Peterson is keeping her dream alive. She moves on to the quarterfinals here at the Western Australia Margaret River Pro, and she'll have a matchup with Carissa Morris. She'll remain in a must-win situation. And for Tati... Even though she got knocked out there, she will soon get the news, if she doesn't know already, Bugs, that she's made the midseason cut. And Lakey just enjoying the moment now with, with Caroline Marks. Yeah, it's a great moment. It, you know, she, she lives to fight another day. It's a, it's a great story. And it's, it's good for, you know, they're both winners. They really are. Tati will have a lot to celebrate, and she'll have a little bit of time off if she is nursing that knee injury. And Lakey's just going to be heating up and will be really fired up after that 6-5-7. Remember how incredible she looked in the opening round with Steph Gilmore. So Lakey's got a lot to show throughout this event. As we enjoy this sunset, let's prepare for a big WSL post show. We'll bring in Ronnie Blakey and Richie Lovett to, in, to join Felicity Palmatier right after this.
Thanks for joining us for the WSL Post Show. So many big moments today. Huge performances from those looking to save themselves on the CT. Big numbers and, well, some unbelievable individual uh, manoeuvres as well. Here on the Harvey Norman host set, Ronnie Blakey with Felicity Palmatier and Richie Lovett. Uh, Rich, the conditions, some of the best we've seen uh, this year when you, you think about what's unfolded so far in 2023 and the surfers, they responded with magic performances. Yeah, they did and we came down this morning, it was strong offshore, the swell had kicked a little bit, it was the perfect canvas today, it was our bluebird day that we were hoping for, the WSL uh, manifested this uh, magic day and, and it, it didn't disappoint, the performances were unbelievable. And I guess, Felicity, it's kind of what we really want at this event in particular it is lots of opportunity for the competitors with the overlapping heats. We're giving them some extra time too to, to chase down those dreams. Yeah, uh, today, Rich, you already said it, but this is ideal size for main break. We had six to eight foot. It was really consistent, light winds all day. And, yeah, so much opportunity out there for such a crucial day of surfing. How crazy was that finish too uh, to, to wrap the afternoon? Tatiana, uh, Joe. Bugs and yourself were talking about it. She shored up her position uh, just with what had unfolded in, in the previous heat. But Lakey Peterson, it, it was a must-make heat for her, and now she's put herself in a pretty good position to potentially make that, that cut in the back half of the year. Yeah, she must be feeling so good about that result. I mean, she went in there and she, she was in do or die. She had to win. She had that nice wave at the end there. She surfed it really smooth, lots of flow. And um, yeah, she took a moment out there. The sun was setting and yeah, stoked for her. And last second I looked up and I was like, priority, second priority on this, like on the board. Yeah. So I was like, oh fuck, like thank God. Cause this was saying, cause I got out there, we got out there pretty similar time. Yeah, too. So. was debatable and they definitely gave me to her. This was telling me, no way. Wow. So uh, a lot to break down there, but <laughs> it, it, it was a, a, an extremely elated Lakey Peterson. She really held her nerve beautifully on, on that final ride. Uh, I'm sure we'll get to see it again in the highlights. But, you know, with all that pressure on the line to take off and still be able to set the rail the way she did was super impressive. Yeah, <laughs> really, really clutch moment there. And it could have gone, you know, one of two ways. And it went the right way. You know, sometimes in those pressure situations, you'll just go over the handlebars and forget how to surf. But she didn't. She kept composure and, uh, you know, rode the, w the wave brilliantly. Maybe not, its, not to its maximum potential, but she did what she had to do. You know, the, the cut it has been a, a big story, but I, I think the biggest uh, story we've been following throughout the, the lead up to this uh, event is certainly the story of Kelly Slater. Below the cut line, needed to make a, a heat today to keep his place on the championship tour. Uh, the crowd, I, I think, is aware that they're seeing Kelly in his twilight years here. He had a really tough draw, Liam O'Brien, doing the best surfing I think we've ever seen him do on the CT in this exchange, which made it even harder for Kelly. Yeah, I mean, Liam was just surfing amazingly. I mean, you couldn't really fault his surfing. His wave selection, too, was really, really good. And he just choosing these waves that just allowed him to just surf with such finesse and really blow the fins out of the back of the wave. And yeah, just timing, like yesterday, absolutely on point. Yeah, Kelly, uh, well, as we've seen him do for the past 30 odd years plus, you know, he brings this energy to the event that is just undeniable. You know, the crowds turned up every single one of the, the uh, competitors who were still on hand. They went down to watch this heat as well. And there were moments absolutely in this heat where Kelly was really shining. He was looking for a particular kind of wave, but you can see here, Kelly was attacking the lip, coming up and under it. He was tagging it, but Lobby was out in front of it. He was dissecting it, carving through it. And I think that was the difference in the end. It was the wave choice, uh, but certainly to see the 51 year old surfing at this level, super inspirational. Yeah, amazing. You know, you, you can tell, and, and Kelly's spoken about it uh, over the years, you know, he. He does have to reach for the motivation sometimes, and it was certainly there today. It was an inspired performance, but not quite enough. Those falling under the cut on screen at the moment. Uh, Sammy Pupo was the only surfer in that top 22 that fell below the cut line, uh, with Baron Mamiya progressing through to the next round, the round of 16. So uh, it was an unfortunate moment there for Sammy. Uh, but all these surfers you can look forward to seeing on the Challenger Series. But uh, let's get a, a replay of what Kelly had to say after losing out to Liam O'Brien. Yeah, thanks, Joe. First things first, Kelly, exciting heat. 
Yeah. Really great wave under priority there. Yeah, that was a good one. I felt like I was. I felt like the all the energy shifted my way there. I thought it was going to turn, and then I I got that big one with the chance to do it. I got a big first carve. I was like, all right, this thing's starting out really nice, and then the wave kind of bent away from me, and I couldn't figure out. It was it, it was a wave where I couldn't take a bunch of downtime and wait for the last turn. So I tried to kind of find an angle and it didn't set me into the last turn with a lot of speed and then I fell on that last turn and um but I thought that was going to be the wave for it and in fact the wave prior to that one I didn't take off on I was like kind of in the foam on the lip and it was a really good one too that would have been a good enough wave to get a score like that but uh I decided to wait and I got the next one which, which I thought was going to be better but it, it sort of bent away a little bit and I fell anyway so <laughs> you got to stay on your feet. <laughs> You've done that over your whole career, switched momentum in a heartbeat. Was that feeling any different to the start of your career? No, it, it really just felt like one of those heats where it was gonna, the magic was going to happen. You know, Baron was in the water and I was like kind of drawn on, okay, I got only three minutes left, but you know, I did this with Baron and, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I just, I was just kind of thinking back on that moment, you know, you just, if you're within a, if you're within 10 points, you got a shot if a wave comes, you know, and that's how you got to think. And um, I felt pretty good. I, I've been surfing a good last couple of days and I felt loose. I didn't feel stressed about the situation. I just was, I was actually really enjoying the day and it's like perfect day. So <laughs> I'm whatever, you know, we're breathing. Absolutely, we are. Some of us are breathing a bit faster than others up here, Kelly. Tell me, plans for the future? Plans for the future? I want to get really barreled somewhere. I'm looking over your shot. I'm not even looking at you. I'm looking over at the box right now. It's barreling like six feet still. Um, actually, there's a, there's a perfect wave. So I don't know. Figure it out. Let's see how, thing, let's see how things uh, turn out. Pretty good relationship with the next event on tour, right? Eh? What's that? Oh, is that Surf Ranch? Oh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I know the I, I know a guy, you know, mm. but uh, we'll see. I mean, Medina and Felipe got a pretty good relationship with that place. It's funny. I've, all these years, I've heard people, oh, it's unfair. He designed it. I'm like, I haven't won the thing. I didn't even make the set. They let top uh, eight last time, so I think he designed it for a goofy footer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It seems like it. But uh, Felipe broke the uh, curse finally after Medina won the first two or three events there. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah. look, it is what it is. The, yeah. Everyone's surfing good on this tour. Everyone knows how to surf a heat. And, you know, I'm really stoked to see where surfing, where the level of surfing's at. And it's, yeah. it's awesome. Cool. Really appreciate your time, Kelly. Speak to you soon. Thank you. Yeah, interesting, that interview. I've I got to get your reaction to it, Rich. Uh, Kelly, for, for someone who's just uh, missed surviving the cart by, by one heat win, he seemed incredibly jovial. <laughs> he seemed incredibly jovial and, and in true Kelly fashion, uh, incredibly engaged in the moment as well. Uh, you know, there wasn't any kind of signs of animosity or sadness or, or regret or anything. It was like any other heat uh, post heat interview that we've seen him give over the last 10, 20, 30 odd years where he's breaking it down and what happened. And again, uh, also in true Kelly fashion, it was very <laughs> non-committal <laughs> as to that. what his plans are going to be uh, going into the future. But, you know... Um, one thing is undeniable, and that's just how amazing this man is, you know, and his contribution to professional surfing is will never be top, never be matched. Yeah, you, you had a great uh, moment on the stairs today when Kelly was surfing, and, and you said, you know, uh, Kelly's performance level hasn't dipped. Everyone else's performance level has come up. For, for three decades, he's been surfing at this incredibly high level. And you also added to the point by saying in waves of consequence, the heavy water locations on the championship tour like Pipe and Chopu, when it's A1 conditions, if someone had to surf for your life, Kelly is the person you'd choose. So, you know, that, that just sort of says something uh, about how incredible this guy is, Felicity. Yeah, uh, absolutely amazing. And I, I just echo everything both of you have said. I mean, what's left to do that this guy hasn't done yet? I mean, maybe... Figure out what he's going to do. <laughs> That's what we've got to do. Uh, but he... Good luck. No, he's the man. He said a lot in that interview, yeah. and he also didn't say too much at all. Uh, it, but it, he is in a good place, you can tell. I know he's had a niggling hip injury, so obviously he's going to address that. But, uh, yeah, it looks like he's ready to enjoy his time in the West, even though he's not going to be alive in this draw. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, he, he actually said in, a, in an interview not too long ago that he kind of felt like he was in a year-long slump. But uh, let's have a look at some of these stats here. Yeah, have a look at this. Uh, you know, Kelly, always mentioned in the same sentence as summer sports greats, uh, the greatest of all time, Tom Brady there. 
I mean, only seven Super Bowl championships. <laughs> Kelly's got 11 world title. No comparison. Uh, Kelly's rookie season, 91. I mean, he was winning world titles before many of the surfs on the championship tour were even born. Uh, and he's still here. And just last year, won a, a Pipe Masters event. He's a remarkable human. Oh, it's absolutely incredible. Look, we would need, uh, I, I feel like, 50 post shows put together if we were to really dive deep into all the contributions that he's made and all the performances the heat wins the world titles everything he's done in and out of this in and out of the water for the sport so yeah i, I feel like it's you know this chapter's not over yet it's let, still, let, still let me, being written let me ask you this then uh you know do you think this is the end of the road for kelly because like that that interview just suggested to me that we're going to no. see him again no <laughs> I, I don't i don't believe for a second that that's it it's um there would have been uh, something in that conversation where Kelly said, OK, I'm done, I've, I'm, this is my plan. The fact that he didn't commit to anything uh, just tells me that he's back. He's going to come back. I Second like that. I like it, Rich. I like what you took away from that interview. Uh, Baron Mamiya, he was the one surfer below the cut line that has managed to save his place on the CT. You've got to give him props. I, I mean, he didn't look at his best in the early stages here against Kaio Abeli, but he rallied much like Lakey Peterson in the last heat of the day. Yeah, he really did. And it was exciting towards the end of this heat. And it was a do or die heat for Baron. And like you said, he was the only one to jump up ahead and make that cut. And you know, um, Kyo, you know, this event, he's looked a bit not too stoked with all of his performances, I'd say. And maybe that was just playing with his head a bit. He was a, not, a couple of priority things didn't quite go his way. But yeah, it was all about Baron, really, just making this big comeback here. Yeah, this was a great heat, Ronnie, and I actually watched it in the competitors' area, and there was there was 15 of his colleagues all watching the screen uh, to see how this one was going to play out. And you know, for me, Barron's performance hasn't quite eclipsed where he was last year. I feel like he's still trying to get back into that form, but certainly did enough in this high-pressure situation, and great to see him progress. Yeah, he's been driving around on flat tyres, but. <laughs> <laughs> That'll pump him up a little bit. And, uh, yeah, he's made the cut. And here is the, the, the cast that you can enjoy watching through this back half of the season. And now the, the battle for the, the top five, the final five, is going to be underway. And what a battle it's going to be. Some real form at the top end. Obviously, there's an opportunity for Felipe, for Felipe Ethan, Griffin, Cola, Pinto to, to make up uh, some, some ground on Jack Robinson, who's sadly not here. But... Yeah, it's going to be awesome and some real talent holding their places at uh, the back uh, of the, the ranks as well there. Yeah, it's a good mix actually and, and you know, traditionally surfers aren't in a position where you think they'd normally be but one thing for sure, it sets up an incredible run to this final five and, and uh, well, it's on, you know, as of right now, as of today, you've got to reset the goal, reset your sights on, on where you want to be and that's the final five. And I'm really relieved too to see Ian Gentile yeah. uh, survive the cut Agreed. because he didn't get the opportunity to surf his heat today and he's looked really good through the last few events so uh, congratulations Congratulations, Ian, and all the best for a speedy recovery. Right now, though, let's feel the buzz. Let's feel the energy from Lakey Peterson, who just got through the last heat of the day. Couple close ones, Lakey. That must feel good. Oh, my God. <laughs> it does. Yeah, I feel like this whole year I've been in the really, really close heats, and none of them have gone my way, and that one did fall my way. Um, so I just feel really grateful for that, and I'm obviously fighting to stay on tour. So, um, yeah, just got to keep making heats here. And uh, yeah, just really thankful. I didn't surf the best heat. I didn't surf great, and I made a few bad mistakes. But um, a win's a win, and I learned a lot from it, so I can kind of take that into the next one. The next one will be against Chris Moore. What do you make of that matchup? Yeah, bring it on. Um, I love that. I think I surf my best when I have Chris or someone of that caliber. I mean, everyone on tour is of that caliber, really. But um, I love surfing against Chris, and I've beat her a few times out here. So I'll give it a good crack. I like the headspace, Lakey. Best of luck for when you're next surf. Thanks for your time. Oh, she's buzzing, Lakey Peterson, and for good reason. They're, they're the heat wins that, that Rich no doubt feel better than any other. Oh, yeah. You know, when you're, when you're progressing and one step closer to making that cut, that's, you know, that's big stuff. And we saw some of the, uh, you know, opposing emotions today when, when surfers actually dipped out, and it's heartbreaking. And also, Felicity, just holding your nerve when, when the pressure's on like that and, and still being able to deliver the score you need to get ahead of your rival. Yeah, I mean, and 
Lakey made it happen in the back end of that heat too. You know, she needed a score and she was, she remained composed and that's what the best, that's what you have to do if you want to make this cut. And she took off, she had a nice wall ahead of her and yeah, she got the score, which is pretty nice. And then she got to soak it in right on sunset. One of the stars of the opening round of competition was Betty Lusakura Johnson dropping the second highest heat score total and matching Tyler Wright with the single highest score, wave score of the opening round. Had her hands full with Bronte McCauley. We knew it was going to be the case, but she started so beautifully, Rich. Yeah, she did. It was it was an incredible opening ride. And, and at this point, we were thinking, oh, Betty Lou's just going to build here and just take full domination of this heat. But uh, she got a bit sleepy, a little bit maybe, you know, selective in her wave choice. And that allowed Bronte McCauley to just pick up a couple of absolute gems. Uh, great pace to the wave on her backhand, just jamming some of those really vertical turns and obviously feeling super comfortable out here. There's wild cards uh, that can be unpredictable and a little daunting just because you don't know too much about them. And then there's surfers like Bronte, Felicity, who have great CT experience and they're just so tough to overcome. Oh, well, you know, you got to know coming up against Bronte here that she has had good results in the past. I think it was last year she got a third and, you know, it, you know what to expect. She's got so much experience. So even though Betty Lou had that one good wave, I mean, Bronte just came back firing. These are the surfers that have been confirmed as making the cut. Molly Picklam, Carissa Moore, Tyler Wright, Caitlin Simmers and Tatiana Weston Webb. Despite the fact that she lost out in that last heat of the day, she has done enough to keep her place on the tour and she'll be campaigning through that back half of the season and obviously on into 2024 but uh, we've been lucky enough to catch up with Tatiana Weston Webb with Stace. Tatiana, long day down here, lots of uh, heats being run. That one unfortunately not going to plan for this event. However, you have made the cut, so congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, definitely didn't go according to plan that heat. I wanted to finalize all those maneuvers that I fell on and it just killed me every time. I barely slipped off, but uh, what was the most important was that I was surfing uh, pressure free because I kind of felt like I already made the cut. Um, so yeah, really, really grateful because the cut is never anything anyone wants to go through. It's really difficult and obviously there's 10 women on tour after the cut, which is like nothing. <laughs> so yeah, just happy to be part of that group. That's right. The talent on tour is massive and we're stoked to see you a part of it. Congratulations and uh, best of luck at the next event. Thank you. Yeah, Tatiana, she, uh, she's got a lot more to give and she'll throw away uh, a bad result from this first half of the season and really look to, to campaign hard to get back into that final five. She hasn't missed that opportunity to have a crack at a world title yet. No, it was interesting. She actually said she kind of thought she did had already made the cut in that heat and she was surfing pressure free. I was wondering that the whole time watching. Does she know that or not? And so it was kind of clear she did know and maybe it allowed her to kind of free her surfing up and, you know, even though she didn't get the win, she still made the cut. Yeah, she, you can tell there was some relief there too, though, Rich. Uh, it, it wasn't the, the normal Tatiana reaction after losing out early in a contest. That was the happiest losing <laughs> interview I've ever seen from Tatiana. But, yeah, you know, she, she's obviously come within a manoeuvre of winning the world title. So that's where her head's at now, and, and she'll have her sights firmly set on it. We saw some big combinations today, but as far as individual turns, we didn't see anything better than what Italo threw our way, the 2019 world champ, kind of getting back to what seems like an event-winning form. This is the Boost Mobile wave of the day. Have a look at this thing. Oh, oh man. Just the, the distance covered. <laughs> Yeah, you'd have to say that he, he possibly travelled about 10 or 12 feet in the air, possibly even more, maybe 15 feet. Uh, but it was just one of those critical uh, aerials that you just didn't expect him to make. Uh, and really, the celebration lasted for quite a while, basically as long as he could have <laughs> stayed on this wave. And for good reason. I mean, that's one of the, the better airs we've seen from Italo in competition ever. Full Whitewater Rapids as he rode out of that turn. And we made the comment, Felicity, uh, that... It would have been treacherous just to take off on that wave and <laughs> ride in a straight line over the, the reef, but he did the big rotation over the top of it. Oh, man, I couldn't even imagine, like, coming down from being 10 foot in the air, looking down, seeing those bricks there with, like, shallow reef, and then, oh, OK, I'm just going to casually land right here. I mean, far out. It was amazing surfing, and like you said, Rich, I think this is probably the best surfing we've seen from Italo in contests for a long time, so I'm here for it. Yeah, it's awesome, and he really did uh, light up the Red Bull athlete zone. Or I think it's the, the benchmark for those big individual progressive manoeuvres, and hopefully everyone else steps up to meet him. But uh, let's now have a look at the surfline forecast. We knew today was going to be magic. It delivered. 
but what can we look forward to, Rich, over the next couple of days? Uh, well, tomorrow's going to be interesting. And uh, Flick, you can back me up on this one. <laughs> you know, well, there's shades of this world starting to die off a little bit this afternoon. I think, yeah, look, it is going to get a little bit smaller, but from what I've been looking at on the Surfline forecast, I think tomorrow morning we're going to have waves up until around lunchtime, and we're going to have light winds as well, which means that I think we're on for comp competition tomorrow. Um, after that, though, we're seeing a different uh, change within the swell. We're going to have a lot of swell and a change in the wind too. Big winds, big swell, and possibly off maybe for a couple of days. We'll see. Looking ahead here on, on the, uh, you know, four-day forecast, I'm seeing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at some of the wineries and possibly some competition <laughs> tomorrow. So, uh, you know, we'll be down here bright and early. Uh, and then on the other side of that, it looks like it's cleaned up again. So um, we could be here for the duration. You might need a chin strap for that hat, Rich. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> pretty blowy over the weekend. But uh, let's dive into some unbelievable highlights from today as we get stuck into the top five moments. John John Florence came Coming in at number five. Uh, I think he's up to 42 excellent rides <laughs> in, in this event now, banking an 8.5 to kick things off here in the round of 32. Oh, yeah. just amazing stuff. You call it a Roman, uh, so you take it. <laughs> no, this is just crazy. I mean, I just can't believe how many variations this guy has of the layback. It's incredible to watch, and I keep saying it, but this is the romance, and I can't look away. May break and jo John John. Yeah, it's a, something special, isn't it? Molly Picklam at number four really survived this heat, Rich. Uh, she showed us that even when she's not at her best competitively, she could formulate a strategy to overcome tough customers. Yeah, it was a really gutsy effort from uh, from Molly, and you know, you know, she, in her self-assessment, you know, not one of her best performances, but uh, did what she had to do. Uh, really laid into some nice turns, didn't overcook it because she just knew that she had to get some good work done on and, and get the win, and she did it. Hasn't missed a final series this year, can you? believe it. Coming in at number three was the just devastating backhand of Yago Dora. That first turn, absolute money. He dropped the nine. This was a, at the start of the heat when he didn't have any priority. Yeah, amazing to do that under a priority. And I love watching Goofies on this right at Margaret River. I mean, he just looks so on point. His timing's perfect too. And really showing us that variety as well, which I love to see. Yeah, totally. I feel like these Goofy footers in particular, Yago and and uh, and uh, Ryan Callan and Connor O'Leary, and then also let's throw uh, Bronny Bacoli into the mix too. They've found out they've found out how to really inject a lot of power into their surfing and match the natural footers, who have kind of had the lion's share of of uh, big scores at uh, the right-handers here. But this was an amazing display as well, and just really tenacious from the from the local making the use of the wild card opportunity. Bronte in at number two, but it is. Italo owning the day, the Boost Mobile wave of the day, and also our number one moment in the top five with this huge punt. Just incredible speed down the line. Ah, look at how far he travelled, and then to land on the bricks there, and yeah, he knows it. Look at that claim. Massive punt, massive score. Yeah, and, and it's great to see the smile back on his face, Rich, yeah. because he's kind of entered that sort of very focused, very serious, intense kind of competitive mode. But uh, it just feels like when he's having a good time and, and celebrating those big moments, that, that's when he's at his best. Yeah, and uh, it, you get the feeling that if, if Italo catches fire, then he's really going to start pushing uh, up the ratings there. But, um, you know, it was an amazing display. And, and I, the only reason I feel like it didn't go to a 10, because I've been asked why it wasn't at a 10, is that perhaps there is mer there, there's opportunity for him to do one or two big turns outside and then finish with one of those. So the judge is just showing a little bit of restraint. Yeah, I don't mind it. Happy with that. Yeah, happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's going to be awesome to, to see the big matchups coming together for the quarterfinals uh, on the women's side and for the round of 16 for the men. You can check all those out at worldsurfleague.com. Right now, though, we're going to leave you with amazing highlights from a very special day in 2023. <laughs> and we'll see you bright and early tomorrow morning to potentially get competition back underway. Enjoy the show. Good morning, a beautiful Saturday morning here at Margaret River. And we are looking at beautiful conditions. We've woken up this morning and the swell is well and truly here. It's going to be amazing. A victory for the local boy. Just into the air. Emrod will be heading to Sapper Rocks for the Challenger Series. 
killers on the loose, but what can you do? Canoa trying to stay on tour past this mid-season cut. Oh, ain't it a Like setting himself up. Absolutely laying the board on rail there. Some heartbreak there in April 21st position. Pupo out of the mix. Jackson is out of the mix. But this wave just completely bottoms out down the gurgula. Chianca, world number one. He's turned up with a tomb raid. 783 out of the gates. Time world champion to take on Liam O'Brien. Can he match Kelly on the opening exchange? Kelly needs a 7 7. He has left nothing on the table. And Kelly Slater has not made the cut. Screaming down the line here, looking for it. Massive backside reverse. He's hanging on for the finish. Gets out in front. Like a whole new level of commitment. It's party time. John John Florence just hit the one. Massive layback jam in the pocket. Absolute mastery. This copyrighted event broadcast is produced by the World Surf League for broadcast around the world and may not be retransmitted, reproduced, rebroadcast, or otherwise distributed or used in any form without the written consent of the World Surf League.